since then, and as she was here to open all but three of them, as parliamentarians, we have celebrated with her for silver, golden, diamond jubilees, and of course, marked her platinum jubilee this year, in which the lamp standards have been unveiled in New Palace Yard. In this place, her reign saw 10 different speakers occupy the chair during her reign. There were 18 general elections, and I'm sure the Prime Minister will remind of us how many of her predecessors she welcomed to, and always, I'm sure, with quiet wisdom. As the longest serving monarch country has known, she would have been assured of a notable entry in our history books, even were it not for the magnificence in which she undertook the role as Queen, but for a magnificent service and what a service that entailed, not just as head of the nation, but head of the Commonwealth, head of the armed forces and supreme governor of the Church of England. Over a reign, she has seen unprecedented social, cultural, technological change. Through it all, she was the most conscientious and dutiful of monarchs. But while she understood the inescapable nature of duty, which sometimes must have weighed upon her heavily, she also delighted in carrying it out, for she was the most devoted monarch. As well as queen, she was a wife, a mother, a grandmother and great-grandmother. Roles she carried out with the same sense of vocation as well as human kindness as the role of Queen. Her life, without unhappiness and troubles, but her memories of her will be filled with that image of a gently smiling dedication that showed throughout her life. Indeed, while this is a time of very considerable sadness, those memories of a noble, gracious lady who devoted her life to her family, the United Kingdom, and those nations around the world whom she served as Queen will bring us some consolation and joy. My deepest sympathies are with His Majesty, the King, and other members of the Royal Family to whom I commend all our sincere condolences and support at this very, very sad time. Yay. Order. We are meeting today for tributes to Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth. I would like to inform the House that we will sit today until approximately 10 p.m. for tributes. At approximately 6 o'clock, the House will be suspended while His Majesty the King makes his broadcast to the nation. Members present will be able to watch the broadcast on screens in the chamber. We will then resume our proceedings to continue with tributes. The House will then sit again tomorrow at one o'clock. The first business will be all taking for a small number of senior members. Members to be invited to take the oath tomorrow are being contacted by my office. All other members will have an opportunity to take the oath when the House returns. After oath taking tomorrow, tributes will be continued the House is expected to sit till approximately 10 pm. The House is not expected to sit on Sunday. I now call the Prime Minister, Elizabeth Truss. Mr. Speaker, in the hours since last night's shocking news, we have witnessed the most heartfelt outpouring of grief at the loss of Her Late Majesty, the Queen. Crowds have gathered. Flags have been lowered to half-mast. Tributes have been sent from every continent around the world. On the death of her father, King George VI, Winston Churchill said the news had stilled the clatter and traffic of 20th century life in many lands. Now, 70 years later, in the tumult of the 21st century, life has paused again. Her late Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II, was one of the greatest leaders the world has ever known. She was the rock on which modern Britain was built. She came to the throne at just 25, in a country that was emerging from the shadow of war. She bequeaths a modern, dynamic nation that has grown and flourished under her reign. 
The United Kingdom is the great country it is today because of her. The Commonwealth is the family of nations it is today because of her. She was devoted to the union of England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. She served 15 countries as head of state and she loved them all. Her words of wisdom gave us strength in the most testing times. During the darkest moments of the pandemic, she gave us hope that we would meet again. She knew this generation of Britons would be as strong as any. And as we meet today, we remember the pledge she made on her 21st birthday to dedicate her life to service. The whole house will agree. Never has a promise been so completely fulfilled. Her devotion to duty remains an example to us all. She carried out thousands of engagements. She took a red box every day. She gave her assent to countless pieces of legislation and was at the heart of our national life for seven decades. As Supreme Governor of the Church of England, she drew on her deep faith. She was the nation's greatest diplomat. Her visits to post-apartheid South Africa and to the Republic of Ireland showed a unique ability to transcend difference and heal division. In total, she visited well over 100 countries. She met, she, she met more people than any other monarch in our history. She gave counsel to prime ministers and ministers across government. I have personally greatly valued her wise advice. Only last October, I witnessed firsthand how she charmed the world's leading investors at Windsor Castle. She was always so proud of Britain and always embodied the spirit of our great country. She remained determined to carry out her duties, even at the age of 96. It was just three days ago at Balmoral that she invited me to form a government and become her 15th Prime Minister. Again, she generously shared with me her deep experience of government, even in those last days. Everyone who met her will remember the moment. They will speak of it for the rest of their lives. Even those who never met her, her late Majesty's image is an icon for what Britain stands for as a nation, on our coins, on our stamps, and in portraits around the world. Her legacy will endure through the countless people she met, the global history she witnessed, and the lives that she touched. She was loved and admired by people across the United Kingdom and across the world. One of the reasons for that affection was her sheer humanity. She reinvented monarchy for the modern age. She was a champion of freedom and democracy around the world. She was dignified, but not distant. She was willing to have fun, whether on a mission with 007 or having tea with Paddington Bear. She brought the monarchy into people's lives and into people's homes. During her first televised Christmas message in 1957, she said, today we need a special kind of courage so we can show the world that we are not afraid of the future. We need that courage now. In an instant yesterday, our lives changed forever. Today, we show the world that we do not fear what lies ahead. We send our deepest sympathy to all members of the royal family. We pay tribute to our late queen and we offer loyal service to our new king. Amen. His Majesty, King Charles III, bears an awesome responsibility that he now carries for all of us. I was grateful to speak to His Majesty last night and offer my condolences. Even as he mourns, his sense of duty and service is clear. He has already made a profound contribution through his work on conservation, education, and his tireless diplomacy. We owe him our loyalty and devotion. The British people, the Commonwealth, and all of us in this house will support him as he takes our country forward to a new era 
of hope and progress. Our new Carolean age. The crown endures. Our nation endures. And in that spirit, I say, God save the King. I now call the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Today, our country, our people, this House, are united in mourning. Queen Elizabeth II was this great country's greatest monarch. And for the vast majority of us, it feels impossible to imagine a Britain without her. All our thoughts are with her beloved family, our royal family, at this moment of profound grief. This is a deep and private loss for them. Yet it's one we all share, because Queen Elizabeth created a special personal relationship with us all. That relationship was built on the attributes that defined her reign, her total commitment to service and duty, her deep devotion to the country, the Commonwealth, and the people she loved. In return for that, we loved her. And it is because of that great shared love that we grieve today. For the 70 glorious years of her reign, our Queen was at the heart of this nation's life. She did not simply reign over us. She lived alongside us. She shared in our hopes and our fears, our joy and our pain, our good times and our bad. Our Queen played a crucial role as the thread between the history we cherish and the present we own. A reminder that our generational battle against the evil of fascism or the emergence of a new Britain out of the rubble of the Second World War do not only belong to the past, but are the inheritance of each and every one of us. A reminder that the creativity, the hard work, the enterprise that has always defined this nation is as abundant now as it ever was. A reminder that the prospect of a better future still burns brightly. Never was this link more important that when our country was plunged into lockdown at the start of the pandemic, her simple message that we would see family again, that we would see friends again, that we would be together again, gave people strength and courage when they needed it most. But it wasn't simply the message that allowed a shaken nation to draw upon those reserves. It was the fact that she was the messenger. COVID closed the front doors of every home in the country. It made our lives smaller and more remote. But she was able to reach beyond that, to reassure us and steal us. At the time we were most alone, at a time we'd been driven apart, she held the nation close in a way no one else could have done. Yeah. For that, we say thank you. On the occasion of the Queen's Silver Jubilee in 1977, Philip Larkin wrote of her reign, in times when nothing stood but worsened or grew strange, there was one constant good, she did not change. It feels like we are once again in a moment in our history where, as Larkin put it, things are growing strange, where everything is spinning, a nation requires a still point. When times are difficult, it requires comfort. And when direction is hard to find, it requires leadership. The loss of our Queen robs this country of its stillest point, its greatest comfort, at precisely the time we need those things most. But our Queen's commitment to us, her life of public service, was underpinned by one crucial understanding, that the country she came to symbolise is bigger than any one individual 
or any one institution. It is the sum total of all our history and all our endeavours, and it will endure. The late Queen would have wanted us to redouble our efforts, to turn our collar up and face the storm, to carry on. Most of all, she would want us to remember that it is in these moments that we must pull together. This house is a place where ideas and ideals are debated. Of course, that leads to passionate disagreement. Of course, temperatures can run high. But we all do it in pursuit of something greater. We do it because we believe we can make this great country and its people greater still. At this moment of uncertainty, where our country feels caught between a past it cannot relive and a future yet to be revealed, we must always remember one of the great lessons of our Queen's reign, that we are always better when we rise above the petty, the trivial, the day-to-day, -day, to focus on the things that really matter, the things that unite us, rather than those which divide us. Yeah. Our Elizabethan age may now be over, but her legacy will live on forever. And as the children of that era, it falls upon us to take that legacy forward, to show the same love of country, the love of one another, as she did, to show empathy and compassion, as she did, and to get Britain through this dark night and bring it into the dawn as she did. We join together today not just to say goodbye to our Queen, to share in our mourning, but to say something else important. God save the King, because as one era ends, so another begins. King Charles III has been a devoted servant of this country his entire life. He has been a powerful voice for fairness, and understood the importance of the environment long before many others. As he ascends to his new role, with the Queen Consort by his side, the whole house, indeed the whole country, will join today to wish him a long, happy and successful reign. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the emotions we see across the nation today are echoed across the Commonwealth to which our Queen was so committed, in the church to which our Queen was so devoted, and in the armed forces which she led and her family served. Around the world, people will be united in mourning for her passing and united in celebrating her life. We've already seen beautiful tributes flow from across the world. It will be impossible to capture them all here. But each one is a reminder of the esteem in which she was held, of what she achieved on behalf of her country, of the shared values we treasure. The reason our loss feels so profound is not just because she stood at the head of our country for 70 years, but because, in spirit, she stood amongst us. As we move forward, as we forge a new path, as we build towards a better future, she will always be with us. For all she gave us and all she will continue to give us, we say thank you. May our Queen rest in peace. God save the King. I now call on the Father of the House, Sir Peter Bottomley. <coughs> Constituents will wish me briefly to record their love respect and gratitude to Her Late Majesty. We can give continuing life to her values and virtues of kindness, aspiration, perseverance and pride. We thank her, we miss her, and we should say what she would wish, God save the King. Yeah. I now call on the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It is, of course, with great sadness that we unite to offer our prayers, focus our sorrow, and gather our collective thoughts on the passing of Her Majesty the Queen. 
On behalf of the Scottish National Party, I would like to offer my condolences as we hold the Queen and our family in our thoughts and prayers at this difficult time. The grief and mourning which reverberates around this chamber and across the world will be all the more acute for the King and members of the Royal Family. Only they can understand the deep personal loss of a close family member. And people across society who have similarly lost loved ones will understand the pain that they must feel as we ensure our heartfelt condolences are with them today. Over the coming days, people up and down these islands will seek to come to terms in their own private way with the loss of one of the true constants in all our lives. In that regard, my thoughts are also with our own Prime Minister, just days into office and having to come to terms with the enormity of the loss of the Head of State and show the leadership that is now required in her position. We can also help but dwell on the late Queen who, right to the end, fulfilled her duty by appointing the new Prime Minister. But of course, many will feel this as a deeply personal loss. For the Queen's continuous and abiding presence and the leadership she has shown over seven decades will be the enduring marker to the remarkable tenure as our Head of State. <coughs> Her Majesty the Queen has been Head of State for longer than most of us have been alive, and the majority of us have never known a public life without the Queen at the helm. For many, she has been a steady hand guiding the ship and the perpetual symbol of stability. Fifteen Prime Ministers and five First Ministers of Scotland have benefited from her institutional knowledge and, of course, her wise counsel. As the figurehead of the Commonwealth, she was a unifying force, recognised the world over, visiting at least 117 countries, and was committed to celebrating the diverse values and cultures around the globe, all born out of a duty to serve. During her reign, the world has changed immeasurably, through the good times and the bad times, through war and peace, through boom and bust, through the advances in technology and communication and the dawn of the internet age, to many she was a guiding light, ever present as she bore witness to the evolution of these islands into the modern era. A thread of continuity running through the fabric of the Commonwealth, at once tying societies to our shared histories and making new history. I, like many others in this chamber, was fortunate to meet the Queen on a number of occasions and was always struck by the strength, the intellect, the modesty, the humility, and often the humour with which she approached her royal duties. And while I have always met her in a professional context as monarch, I'm struck with just how many people across Scotland, and indeed across the United Kingdom, have had a first-hand encounter with the Queen. Whether they have been invited to her Holyrood garden parties or had the pleasure to meet with her in the many hundreds of events, walkabouts and official openings, including that at our Scottish Parliament, or whether she had taken them wholly by surprise <coughs> with chance encounters on the countryside or villages near Balmoral, people the length and breadth of Scotland have their own tales of their individual meetings with the Queen. Because she was a monarch who reigned with compassion and integrity and established a deep connection with the public. And the affection which the Queen had for Scotland <coughs> and that Scotland had for the Queen cannot be underestimated. <laughs> on the Queen's first visit to Scotland following her coronation, the moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland said to her, Today, you and I are Scotland, greeting with all that we have to offer of love and duty our gracious young Queen. We can today look back on these words and say that for as long as Her Majesty reigned, both she and Scotland held true to these values of love and duty for one another. Speaking when she reconvened our Scottish Parliament in 1999, Her Majesty set out the obligation on members to set lasting standards of vision and purpose, of debate and discussion, not just for our own generation, but for future <coughs> generations. And it is clear that members across the Scottish Parliament, and I trust in this place, from all walks of political life, have moved forward with that sense of vision and purpose in mind. There is a deeply held sense of responsibility across political parties to govern for the betterment of future generations, in our case to uphold the values of the Scottish Parliament, which are inscribed in the ceremonial mace. Wisdom, justice, <coughs> compassion and integrity. The values that set the aspirations for a modern Scotland, the values that so often embodied by Her Majesty herself. And in what was sadly 
Her final ever address to the Scottish Parliament, her love of Scotland and its people, was clear when she said, It is the people that make a place, and there are few places where this is truer than it is in Scotland. The relationship between Scotland and the Queen was one of shared admiration. Indeed, whilst she was everyone's Queen, for many in Scotland, she was Elizabeth, Queen of Scots. Her Majesty's roots in Scotland run deep. She was descended from the Royal House of Stuart on both sides, and her family, of course, her mother, was from Glam's and Angus. It is clear that these family ties gave way to a great and enduring affection, and Scotland was a place that was truly held dear to her, not only in an official capacity, but in a private capacity as well. It is well known that Balmoral, with its beautiful and atmospheric scenery, was the Queen's favourite home. Balmoral was a place where she was able to enjoy freedom, peace, and the ability to indulge her love of the great outdoors, whether that was walking with her dogs, riding with horses, hosting picnics and barbecues, or from behind the wheel of her Land Rover. Oh. <laughs> it is clear that Balmoral has been a place of peace and sanctuary for her throughout her whole life, and perhaps particularly so following the death of her husband, life companion and love, His Royal Highness Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. <coughs> It is therefore perhaps fitting that she has met her final peace at Balmoral, a place where she found such enjoyment and comfort. And as someone of demonstrably strong faith, she will now have enduring peace with herself and, of course, to be reunited with Prince Philip. Her Majesty was a life of grace and wisdom, defined by its service to the public and by the lives that she touched. Her legacy and her enduring presence will live on, God bless the Queen. May she rest in peace. God bless the King. Boris Johnson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I hope the House will not mind if I begin with a personal confession. A few months ago, the BBC came to see me to talk about Her Majesty the Queen, and we sat down, and the cameras started rolling, and they requested that I should talk about her in the past tense. And I'm afraid I simply choked up and I couldn't go on. I'm really not easily moved to tears. But I was so overcome with sadness that I had to ask them to go away. And I know that today there are countless people in this country and around the world who have experienced the same sudden access of unexpected emotion. And I think millions of us are trying to understand why we are feeling this deep and personal and almost familial sense of loss. Perhaps it's partly that she's always been there, a changeless human reference point in British life, the person who, all the surveys say, appears most often in our dreams, so unvarying in her pole star radiance that we have perhaps been lulled into thinking that she might be in some way eternal. But I think our shock is keener today because we are coming to understand in her death the full magnitude of what she did for us all. And think of what we asked that 25-year-old woman all those years ago. To be the person so globally trusted that her image should be on every unit of our currency, every postage stamp, the person in whose name all justice is dispensed in this country, every law passed, to whom every minister of the Crown swears allegiance, and for whom every member of our armed services is pledged, if necessary, to lay down their lives. Think what we asked of her in that moment not just to be the living embodiment in, in her DNA of the history and continuity and unity of this country, but to be the figurehead of our entire system, the keystone in the vast arch of the British state, a role that only she could fulfill because in the brilliant and durable bargain of the constitutional monarchy, only she could be trusted to be above any party political 
or commercial interest and to incarnate impartially the very concept and essence of the nation. Think what we asked of her and think what she gave. She showed the world not just how to reign over a people, she showed the world how to give, how to love, and how to serve. And as we look back at that vast arc of service, its sheer duration is almost impossible to take in. She was the last living person in British public life to have served in uniform in the Second World War. She was the first female member of the royal family in a thousand years to serve full-time in the armed forces, and that impulse to do her duty carried her right through into her tenth decade to the very moment in Balmoral, as my right honourable friend has said, only three days ago, when she saw off her 14th Prime Minister <laughs> and welcomed her 15th, and I can tell you, in that audience, she was as radiant and as knowledgeable and as fascinated by politics as ever I can remember, and as wise in her advice as anyone I know, if not wiser. And over that extraordinary span of public service, with her naturally retentive and inquiring mind, I think, and doubtless many of the 15 would agree, that she became the greatest statesman and diplomat of all. And she knew instinctively how to cheer up the nation, how to lead a celebration. I remember her innocent joy more than 10 years ago after the opening ceremony of the London Olympics when I told her that the leader of a friendly Middle Eastern country seemed actually to believe that she had jumped out of a helicopter <laughs> in a pink dress and parachuted into the stadium. <laughs> and I remember her equal pleasure on being told just a few weeks ago that she had been a smash hit in her performance with Paddington Bear. Yeah. And perhaps more importantly, she knew how to keep us going when times were toughest. In 1940, when this country and this democracy faced the real possibility of extinction, she gave a broadcast, aged only 14, that was intended to reassure the children of Britain. She said then, we know, every one of us, that in the end, all will be well. She was right. And she was right again in the darkest days of the COVID pand pandemic when she came on our screens and told us that we would meet again. And we did. And I know I speak for other prime ministers when I say ex-Prime Ministers, when I say that she helped to comfort and guide us as well as the nation, because she had the patience and the sense of history to see that troubles come and go and that disasters are seldom as bad as they seem. And it was that indomitability, that humour, that work ethic and that sense of history which together made her Elizabeth the Great. And when I call her that, I should add one, Elizabeth the Great, I should add one final quality, of course, which was her humility. Her single bar electric fire Tupperware using refusal to be grand. And unlike us politicians, with our outriders and our armour plated convoys, I can tell you, as a direct eyewitness, that she drove herself in her own car with no detectives and no bodyguard, bouncing at alarming speed <laughs> over the Scottish landscape to the total amazement of the ramblers and the tourists we encountered. And it is that indomitable spirit with which she created the modern constitutional monarchy. An institution so strong and so happy and so well understood, not just in this country, but in the Commonwealth and around the world, that the succession has already seamlessly taken place. And I believe she would regard it as her own highest achievement, that her son, Charles III, will clearly and amply follow her own extraordinary standards 
of duty and service. And the fact that today we can say with such confidence, God save the King, is a tribute to him, but above all to Elizabeth the Great, who worked so hard for the good of her country, not just now, but for generations to come. That is why we mourn her so deeply. And it is in the depths of our grief that we understand why we loved her so much. Welcome to Mother of the House, Harriet Hamm. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And what an excellent speech from the Right Honourable Member for Uxbridge, which I'm sure will have resonated in every member of this House and indeed everyone in this country. It was a brilliant speech. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to make my tribute to the Queen and to do so on my own behalf, but also on behalf of my constituents, particularly those who, coming from Commonwealth countries in Africa and the Caribbean, held the Queen in such high regard. We're a constitutional monarchy, and for we MPs, the Queen was ever present in the interwoven relationship between the monarch and her parliament. She underpinned our democratic system for over 70 years, underpinning it, but never intervening in it. She was always salient, but never meddled. She avoided controversy, not by staying in the background, far from it. She performed her role to the utmost, but she did it by respecting the boundaries. She carried out her duties and gave us her full commitment for us to carry out ours. When many denigrated, she always respected and supported Parliament, and we should be very grateful for that. Between her ministers, and not just prime ministers, there was regular contact. After Labour won the election in 1997, I went up to the palace where, like the other new secretaries of state, she appointed me to the Privy Council and bestowed on me the seals of office. They are actual seals which are given to you and you take back to your department to be locked in a safe. But when just a year later I was sacked, (laughs) and the seals seals taken out uh, of the safe and taken back to Buckingham Palace, uh, my diary was empty and my phone stopped ringing. Uh, My office was astonished to get a call from Buckingham Palace. No one else wanted to have anything to do with me, but the Queen wanted to see me. I was invited to take take tea with the Queen for her to thank me for my service as Secretary of State. My point is that the relationship between our Queen and Parliament and our Queen and Government was never just on paper, but was always active and always encouraging. She radiated British values of duty, patriotism, internationalism, charity and service. But while she embodied British values, she never intervened in politics. And that is constitutional alchemy, nothing less. It's evident that everyone, even those who don't agree with the hereditary principle of the monarchy, cannot but marvel at her personal qualities. And I want to marvel at how she could do all this flawlessly not just over so many decades, but as a woman starting her reign in what was emphatically then a man's world. We have to remember what attitudes were at the time. The order of the day was men were in charge and women were subservient. The man was head of the household and the role of a woman was to get married, have his children and support him. In the 1950s, when she was crowned, I was a child and I remember my mother warning me that people thought men knew more than women, that men's views were valuable whilst women's were to be disregarded. And so it was in that atmosphere that she stepped up as a 25-year-old married woman with two children to take her place at the head of this nation and play a huge role on the world stage. What determination and courage 
that must have taken. Yeah. The Prime Ministers she dealt with were mostly men, mostly twice her age. <laughs> Things were very different. A huge change has taken place during her reign. Things were very different when, six years ago, she threw open Buckingham Palace for us to celebrate the 70th anniversary of BBC's Woman's Hour, to celebrate how much women had achieved. As Sir Tony Blair said, she was the matriarch of this nation, a matriarch for us on the world stage and a matriarch too at home in her own family. <coughs> as well as being our monarch, she was the mother of four children, had many grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And it is to her family that I extend my deepest sympathies for their loss and condolences for their grief, which we all share. Theresa May. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It is with great <coughs> sadness that I rise to pay tribute to Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II on my behalf and on behalf of my Maidenhead constituents. Yesterday was a day that we all knew would come some time, but in our hearts of hearts we hoped never would. But as we mourn a beloved monarch, we must always remember that she was a mother a grandmother and a great-grandmother, and my thoughts and prayers are with King Charles III and the whole of the royal family. Yeah. And I also remember the close members of her royal household. <laughs> Queen Elizabeth II was, quite simply, the most remarkable person I have ever met. I am sometimes asked, among all the world leaders I met, who was the most impressive, and I have no hesitation in saying <coughs> that from all the heads of state and government, the most impressive person I met was Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. She gave a lifetime of service as she promised to do when she was 21. Her selfless devotion to duty was an inspiration and example to us all. She was respected and loved not just here in the United Kingdom and in her other realms and the Commonwealth, but across the world. And that love, respect and admiration was born not out of her position, but because of the person she was. A woman of dignity and grace, of compassion and warmth, of mischief and joy, of wisdom and experience, and of a deep, understanding of her people. Like so many until last evening, I had never known another monarch. She was a constant throughout our lives, always there for us, uniting us at times and difficulty. And as others have said most recently during COVID, when she gave us hope that we would once more come together. Her passing marks a generational change not just because of the length of her service, but because of what she lived through. When we marked the 75th anniversary of the D-Day landings in 2019, she was with the world leaders not just as queen, but as someone who had worn uniform during the Second World War, an experience which, quite apart from anything else, had taught her how to strip an engine. <laughs> the queen was always interested in people, when she walked into a room, the faces of those present were lit up, and her magnificent smile would calm nerves and put people at their ease. As I said on her Platinum and Jubilee, I saw that at Chogham in 2018, when there was a reception at Windsor before a lunch, and uh, the leaders were gathered and talking amongst themselves, and I knew Her Majesty was going to join the reception, but they didn't. The minute she walked into the room, the sense of love and respect was palpable, and they all turned, and they all wanted to speak to her. They loved her, and she loved the Commonwealth, and the Commonwealth today is a significant part of her legacy. But I also saw that on other occasions, including on what was one of her last, if not the last, appearance she made in public, when she came to open Thames Hospice in my Maidenhead constituency in July. The moment she walked through the door, the atmosphere in the room changed. 
You felt the love and respect of the people there for her. And as she spoke to staff and patients, she exuded a warmth and humanity which put people at their ease. She was queen, but she embodied us. Across the nations of the world and for so many people, meeting Queen Elizabeth simply made their day and for many will be the memory of their life. Mm -hmm. Of course, for those of us who had the honour to serve as one of her prime ministers, those meetings were more frequent with the weekly audiences. These were not meetings with a high and mighty monarch, but a conversation with a woman of experience and knowledge and immense wisdom. They were also the one meeting I went to, which I knew would not be briefed out to the media. <laughs> what, uh, what made those audiences so special was the understanding the Queen had of issues which came from the work she put into her red boxes, combined with her years of experience. She knew many of the world leaders. In some cases, she had known their fathers. <laughs> and she was a wise and adroit judge of people. The conversations at the audiences were special, but so were weekends at Balmoral, where the Queen wanted all her guests to enjoy themselves. And she was a thoughtful hostess. She would take an interest in what books were put in your room. And she didn't always expect to be the centre of attention. She was quite happy sometimes to sit playing her form of patience while others were mingling around her, chatting to each other. My husband tells of the time he had a dream. He dreamt that he was sitting in the back of a Range Rover being driven around a Balmoral estate, and the driver was Her Majesty the Queen, and the passenger seat was occupied by his wife, the Prime Minister. <laughs> and then he woke up and realised it was reality. <laughs> Her Majesty loved the countryside, and she was down to earth and a woman of common sense. I remember one picnic at Balmoral which was taking place in one of the bothies on the estate. The hampers came from the castle and we all mucked in to put the food and drink out on the table. I picked up some cheese, put it on a plate and was transferring it to the table. The cheese fell on the floor. I had a split second decision to make. <laughs> I picked up the cheese, put it on the plate, and put it on the table. <laughs> and I turned round to see that my every move <laughs> had been watched very carefully by Her Majesty the Queen. I looked at her, she looked at me, <laughs> and she just smiled. <laughs> and the cheese remained on the table. <laughs> This is indeed a sad day, but it is also a day of celebration of a life well spent in the service of others. There have been many words of tribute and superlatives used to describe Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, but these are not hype. They are entirely justified. She was our longest serving monarch. She was respected around the world. She united our nation in times of trouble. She joined in our celebrations with joy and a mischievous smile. She gave an example to us all of faith, of service, of duty, of dignity, of decency. She was remarkable, and I doubt we will ever see her like again. May she rest in peace and rise in glory. Sir yeah. yeah. so Ed Davy. It's a real pleasure to follow the Right Honourable Lady and can I congratulate her on her lovely, heartwarming speech. Yes. Yes. Mr Speaker, Liberal Democrats join members from all sides of the House in expressing our deepest condolences on the passing of Her Majesty the Queen. We are mourning a profound loss. The Queen was a formidable monarch who faithfully served our country for all her life and was loved the world over. She represented not only duty and courage, but warmth and compassion, 
and she was a living reminder of our collective past, of the greatest generation and their sacrifices for our freedom. For many people, myself included, Her Majesty was an ever-fixed mark in our lives. As the world changed around us and politicians came and went, she was our nation's constant. In challenging times, she was always a source of calm and comfort. And she tied our nations together, embodying an unwavering pride in our country, showing us that patriotism is not defined by political allegiance, and reminding us of the many things that bind us all together, even when it doesn't always feel that way. We saw this so vividly during the Platinum Jubilee celebrations in June. I'm proud to represent the oldest royal borough in England, Kingston-upon-Thames. And our Jubilee Street party certainly lived up to that status. It was truly wonderful to see such an outpouring of affection from people across Kingston from all walks of life, school children who baked Jubilee cakes, neighbours who shared bunting, choirs who sang hymns of praise. And it was incredibly fitting, wasn't it? That after so long kept apart by COVID, it was the Queen and a celebration of Her Majesty's reign that brought our communities back together so joyfully. Just as the whole country is united today, so sadly, in grief. The deep mourning across the country now, just like the celebrations of her jubilee a few months ago, comes not from a sense of duty, but from genuine and heartfelt affection, love and admiration of Her Majesty. It was not because we were her subjects, but because she was truly our Queen. What she meant to us is perhaps best summed up by a phrase on so many people's lips over the last 24 hours. I can't imagine our country without her. For almost everyone in our country, she has been there our whole lives. Times of national grief and national jubilation. She has never not been there for us. So it's hard to accept that she is gone and hard to see how we go on without her. But we will. Our great United Kingdom has a great future because the Queen's spirit of strength, grace and resolve lives on in her people. One of the greatest privileges of being a member of this house was the chance to meet Her Majesty. Like when she visited Kingston on the occasion of her Golden Jubilee, or when I was deeply privileged to sit next to her at lunch at Windsor Castle. I was initially confused by a silver cylinder beside her place sitting. I wondered to myself what treasures it might hold. I had my suspicions when, as dessert was served, her beloved corgis were let in and nestled themselves around her feet. And the queen lifted up the lid of the cylinder, plucked out some digestive biscuits, <laughs> and began sneaking them to her grateful dogs. <laughs> Whenever I met her, I was struck by her warmth, her wisdom, and her humour. And I'm looking forward to hearing similar stories from honourable and right members across the house as they give glimpses of the wonderful person beneath the crown. Her Majesty will remembered with honour as the monarch who guided our country out of the shadow of a terrible war, who helmed us calmly through troubled waters and brought us safely into a new millennium. And she will be remembered so fondly as the monarch who leapt from a helicopter with James Bond and showed Paddington where she kept her marmalade sandwiches. And for the royal family, she will be remembered simply as a beloved mother, grandmother and great-grandmother. Our thoughts, prayers and condolences are with them all as they bear this terrible loss. Our life, after a lifetime of dedicated and tireless service to our country and our Commonwealth. Her Majesty has gone to her eternal rest. May God rest her soul, and may God save the King. Amen. Now come to Sir Ian Duncan Smith. Amen. 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 Mr. Speaker, I'm grateful. Um, so much has already been said, I don't intend to repeat it. 
much. Uh, but I just want to say that it is a sad day for all of us. It's tragic news, bringing to the end a remarkable career spanning 70 years, endless prime ministers and endless leaders of the opposition, too. <laughs> But uh, for those 70 years, Her uh, Majesty carried out her duties with charm, humility, not often mentioned, real humility, and also endless humour. She was quite remarkable in a way, and she learned that uh, from somebody that we haven't mentioned today, her father, who in his own way, someone who never expected in a way to be the monarch, who suffered a very significant problem in a speech impediment, and yet he showed her that it was possible to rise above the challenge and to deliver your service to your country at an incredible time. And that service and duty, there is no question she learnt at the knees of her father overcoming his own difficulties and putting his country and their service first, something quite often forgotten about. And a couple of things that come to mind because, in fact, so often we've taken Her Majesty for granted. We expect her to be there. Uh, the way the crowds, whenever anything is good or bad in our country, they gather at Buckingham Palace. Whether she's there or she was there or not there, they gathered. It was almost as though they could touch the, the railings and draw some succor or some support or some sort of mystical help. And there they were again last night in pouring rain outside Buckingham Palace. Well, quite often in all of that, Mr. Speaker, we often forgot that she was also a human being with her own family issues and problems. And I remember particularly during that period when two of her sons were facing marriage breakups, which were being widely reported in the newspapers, in the media, with everybody speculating in public about all that was going on. I wonder how many in this House could ever have borne something like that in such public domain, such a sad tragedy uh, for their mother. And then, to top it all, Windsor Castle burns down, a place she loved deeply and felt responsible for. And nobody <coughs> seemed to take her, in a way, into consideration until when she approached a speech with a interesting cold, and she said that the year for her had been her annus horribilis. I think the public stopped. We all paused and we realised, actually, that we had forgotten that we owe as much duty and service to her as she had shown us without complaint. I thought that was a remarkable moment, really, when the country came back from where it was to recognise that duty and service. And the other was when Diana, then Princess of Wales, tragically died in that terrible car accident. <coughs> and everybody again gathered outside Buckingham Palace. And they demanded that the Queen should come. It got more and more shrill with the newspapers banging on about how she had to come back. But there she was in Balmoral trying to do what almost any single mother, grandmother wanted to do, which is to put her arms around her grandchildren, comfort them and protect them from what she knew was going to descend upon them. And finally, when she came down, I grew to the realization that actually, it wasn't that they were angry that she wasn't there. It was that the British public needed her there to be able to show their own emotion as she was the focus for all of that. And when she came, everybody cheered and applauded because she was there and now they could grieve properly because she was the focus for that grief. And uh, of course we have anecdotes about uh, what we did and I remember when I had ceased being leader of the Conservative Party, it, it happens quite a lot, really. <laughs> uh, I think she was pretty used to it, actually. Yes. <laughs> uh, but she uh, kindly asked me to take leave of her officially, uh, which I thought was pretty kind, really, as uh, 
said earlier on, nobody else wanted me to do it, so <laughs> it was decent of her to do it. Um, and uh, I remember uh, when I came to the palace and I was ushered into her drawing room, small personal sitting room, I was struck by two or three things. One was the two-bar electric fire, which had a very strange piece of cardboard cut out in the shape of flames, coloured with crayons, I suspect by some, uh, somebody in the palace, yellow and red, surrounding the two-bar fire, which I thought was peculiarly dangerous, but <laughs> notwithstanding that, I'm sure it had a purpose. The other one was the Tupperware radio sitting next to her, which uh, I hadn't seen since my parents smashed their last one. <laughs> and then she very sweetly asked me how I was, uh, being clearly sympathetic <laughs> about what had happened. Uh, and I just shrugged and said, well, ma'am, uh, nobody died and I'm still here. <laughs> Whereupon she roared with laughter. And the funny thing was, uh, as she did, she paused, looking at me, not sure whether I'd actually made a joke or whether I'd not. <laughs> I laughed too, and then she laughed again. <laughs> Whether at me or with me, I couldn't figure that out. <laughs> that was uh, something to relish. And uh, The other uh, anecdote I just wanted to share with the House for a second was slightly different. It was when I was in one of those Privy Councils, and for some reason uh, we were offered drinks to have at the end of the Privy Council. It didn't happen very often, uh, so I took full advantage and ordered a whisky. And uh, while we had finished the Privy Council, she came round to talk to those of us in the Privy Council and chat. And she came to me and, uh, like everybody else, nervous as anything, I, I stumbled through and then I said, oh, ma'am, I remember I'd just been doing, uh, reading some stuff about one of Churchill's speeches and I suddenly recalled something that he had said um, at the time. It was 1941 uh, and President Roosevelt had sent a note over with the person that he had just defeated in his third election. And in it, as Churchill said, he had written in his own hand a verse from Longfellow. Now remember, in 41, we didn't know whether we would survive or not. Uh, and Churchill read it out. And I started to speak it, and she started speaking it as well. And I just want to share it with the House. It was, sail on, sail on, O ship of state. Sail on, O Union, strong and great. Humanity, with all its fears, with all its hopes for future years, is hanging breathless on thy fate. She said it perfectly. She smiled slightly, and I did detect a little dampness in her eye, and then she moved on. And in a way, it suddenly struck me that that was exactly her. She is, was the ship of state. We look to her for everything, good and in difficult times. She loved the Union with a passion. And she loved Scotland, I think probably most of all. The track was, that was who she was. She was that ship of state. And somehow we have too often taken her for granted. But she has never complained. And she always gave us service. And now for that Union of Hearts, if the House would indulge me, I want to quote from W.H. Auden with a few changes. <laughs> Stop all the clocks, cut out the telephones, prevent the dogs from barking with a juicy bone, silence the piano, and with muffled drums, bring out the coffin, let the mourners come. She was our north, our south, our east and west our working week and our Sunday rest, our noon, our midnight, our talk, our song. We thought that love would last forever. We were wrong. May God bless her and keep her and hold her in her hands. And may we bless the royal family. God save the king. Yeah. Yeah. I'm now going to bring Sir Geoffrey Donaldson in, but can I just warn others that I would hope to get so many in today that please, if we can use up to three minutes after Sir Geoffrey Donaldson. Sir Geoffrey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On behalf of uh, my colleagues in the Democratic Unionist Party and on behalf of many across Northern Ireland, 
I wish to offer our sincere sympathy to His Majesty the King and to other members of the royal family on the passing of our dear sovereign, Queen Elizabeth II. In counties Antrim and Armagh, Down and Fermanagh, Londonderry and Tyrone, individuals and families will gather in their communities to remember a great monarch, a monarch who stood with us in our time of trouble. Her Majesty the Queen has been a steadfast and unshakable head of state for the United Kingdom and for the Commonwealth, and her gracious approach has been, as others have said, a constant throughout our lives. In 1952, during her first Christmas broadcast, Queen Elizabeth asked the nation to pray, and I quote, that God may give me wisdom and strength to carry out the solemn promises I shall be making, and that I may faithfully serve him and you all the days of my life. She certainly fulfilled her promises. And today we mourn her passing. But we do so with tremendous honour for one who served God and her people faithfully. Her Majesty led by example in Northern Ireland and reached out the hand of friendship to help with the reconciliation process. We are duty bound to build on that foundation. The royal visit to the Republic of Ireland in 2011 was groundbreaking, and the warmth with which Her Majesty was received demonstrated that she was revered and respected far beyond this United Kingdom. I remember with fondness her speech during that visit, where she again referred to her Christian convictions and reminded us that forgiveness lies at the heart of her faith and that it can reconcile divided communities. Her visits to my own constituency in Lagan Valley, to the city of Lisburn, to Dromore, and of course to Royal Hillsborough, invoke precious memories for the residents and for all of us. And I know that her death will be felt acutely in Hillsborough and in the surrounding communities. During the most traumatic of days of our troubled past, in Northern Ireland. Her Majesty visited with us many times to show solidarity with her people in their darkest of hours. Her presence conveyed a deep sense of stability and offered hope to so many. One such visit was in 1976, in one of the most violent years of the Troubles. In her Christmas address later that year, her Majesty spoke of the need for an end to the conflict and pointed the way to peace and reconciliation. She reminded us that the following year was her silver jubilee and expressed in hope that, and I quote, the gift I would most value next year is that reconciliation should be found wherever it is needed. A reconciliation which would bring peace and security to families and neighbours at present suffering and torn apart. Yet just a few short years later, Her Majesty too was touched by the violence of the Troubles, and her family endured the hurt and the deep pain of losing a loved one following the assassination by the IRA of the Earl Mountbatten at Mullock Moor in County Sligo, in August 1979. She shared the sense of loss felt by countless victims, and her empathy and understanding offered comfort to so many from all backgrounds. She rose above that sense of loss to reach out across divided communities in Northern Ireland and to offer hope. This is real leadership. Yet it took us almost 20 long years to complete our journey to a peace agreement, an agreement that offered the prospect of bringing about that reconciliation that Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth yearned to see. Some 25 years on from that agreement, in truth, Mr. Speaker, we still struggle to deal with the legacy of our troubled past. Your Majesty, 
On an island driven by conflict and division, you were a bridge builder, reaching out to those from opposite sides of the divide, and your work of reconciliation helped to heal wounds and to encourage change. Your historic visit to the Republic of Ireland was a cathartic moment in British-Irish relations. The way you conducted yourself, the language you used, and the message that you brought helped to lay to rest many of the ghosts of our shared history that have cast their shadows over relationships on these islands for centuries. It is my hope that your passing and the example you set will inspire us to even greater heights and to complete the journey that will bring true healing and reconciliation to our troubled land. Your Majesty, this United Kingdom has been truly blessed to have you as our head of state, a sovereign whose dignified and faithful service has inspired a nation. I can do no better than quote the words of a book that contains the values you sought to uphold throughout your reign. Well done, good and faithful servant. Our United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland is stronger for your reign. And to His Majesty King Charles III, I say this. We must all work to build this kingdom that it is even stronger and more united. And we on this side will use all our endeavors to achieve these objectives. God save the King. Speaker, I associate with many of the very passionate comments that we have heard already this afternoon, Mr. Speaker. And there have been many thousands of moving and heartfelt tributes from across the world. Our Queen was loved, cherished, respected, and admired for her deep devotion to public service and to the people. And of course, we meet in circumstances that we all knew would happen one day, but of course, none of us wanted to see. And Mr. Speaker, it was so poignant yesterday that the heavens opened and cried with the country as the devastating news broke that this period of national mourning began. For most of us, if not all in this chamber, and of course, people across the country and the Commonwealth and across the world, but in you, our Queen, as the head of state, one sovereign, a lady, one monarch. And the late Queen Elizabeth II's life was one that, of course, was dedicated to public service, but was deeply, deeply inspiring. And of course, she held that dignified presence, that ability, the charisma that this House has heard so much of already this morning, to lead our nation through dark periods, but also through the most joyous moments that we have celebrated as a country. And of course, from the horrors in the world wars to the fears of the pandemic, she was one who never, ever faltered in her duty. And of course, as my rotable friend has already said, she was that rock. But she was there as that model of assurance, that pillar that would give us the strength and support that we would need through the darkest times. But of course, Mr. Speaker, for each and every one of us, and for all of our constituents in particular, a royal visit was one of the most joyous moments and occasions that we would all celebrate. They were wonderful, they were memorable, they were great events, and in particular, when the visitor, of course, was Her Majesty the Queen. And a few months after my election to Parliament in 2010, I, of course, witnessed that excitement when Her Majesty the Queen visited that very famous village of Tiptree in the Whitton oh, constituency, yeah. where the Royal Warrant holding Wilkin and Sons jam makers to mark their 125th anniversary. The affection and warmth that was shown towards Her Majesty, of course, was astonishing to see. Not astonishing to see, I should say. And, of course, Queen Elizabeth reciprocated where she touched everyone's hearts, taking the time to see everyone, to speak to everyone as well. Also, when including the famous inspections of the world-famous jams, including the production lines of the Christmas puddings that so many people in this house in particular have recently <laughs> enjoyed. And of course, despite those huge undertakings year after year, each and every person that she touched felt special. And that was a tremendous mark of her own humility 
And that day, now nearly 12 years ago, remains fresh in the minds of my constituents, who are mourning, sadly, with the entire nation today. And of course, it's not just royal visits that marked Her Majesty and gave us all that moment of excitement to have seen Her Majesty the Queen. For those of us that enjoy horses, and enjoy racing in particular, she herself was well known across not just the country, but also around the world for her love and passion of horses. Whether it was the famous visits to Ascot or Epsom, the Derby itself, all of those who attended wanted to just snip that moment with her, to get that glimmer, hoping to get that royal wave, or recent a famous racing tip as well. And of course, no one did more to champion horse racing in this country than the late Queen. She loved the sport, she loved her horses, and in return, the whole racing industry loved her and will miss her enormously. Her late Majesty led a remarkable life, Mr Speaker, and delivered an era and reign that will stand out as being the most magnificent in the long and great history of our nation. As we mourn the end of her 70th year reign, we commemorate the great life that she lived and, of course, the long service, the distinguished service that she gave to our country. We reflect on the importance of the monarch in our public life, of course, and at this particular time, a moment in time, our thoughts and prayer are naturally with her family. And we offer our wholehearted support and, of course, our commitment to the King, King Charles III. In the years ahead, while we face, of course, while the faces on our notes and coins and stamps will, of course, change, her late majesty will always occupy a special place and an affectionate in the hearts of our nation. God rest her soul and God save the king. Dame Margaret Beckett. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I've heard it said that on occasions like this, most of us talk about ourselves, and that's inevitable because we're talking about the links we have in our memories with the person who is gone. But I think perhaps I'm one of the few in, in this house who does remember when the Queen's father died. I must admit my memories are twofold. First, how surprised I was that people thought 25 was young. <laughs> <laughs> and secondly, that when she came to the throne, we all got a bar of chocolate. <laughs> I first encountered Her Majesty at one remove, soon after I was first elected to this House in October 1974, and I do recognise that many honourable members here were not born then. Uh, by 1975, I was a junior government whip. We had a small majority and a large legislative programme, and there was a duty that usually fell to a very senior whip, one of writing every day, by hand, direct to Her Majesty the Queen to tell her what was happening in her Parliament. I was told this had probably originated with the first Prime Minister who wrote to the King to tell him what was happening in the House. And I was asked to undertake this duty to help my colleague. It seemed to me, uh, I was told by the way, this is very important, that this was a personal message from a member of the government to Her Majesty for her eyes only. That is relevant. Uh, and uh, it seemed to me that there was very little point in telling her the things she knew from her red box, or that she had read probably in the chat column in the, in the Daily Telegraph. So what I wrote to her about was the stuff that I thought she wouldn't get from either of those sources. I wrote to her about the gossip in the TV. <laughs> <laughs> Occasionally slightly edited. Um, and I wrote to her about the rows that people were having behind the scenes in committee rooms or in corridors. There was no feedback, but there wasn't any rebuke either. <laughs> but then a day came when the Queen went on an overseas visit. Now, I knew, of course, that official correspondence always goes through official channels when the Queen is out of the country. But uh, I was a very new MP. <laughs> And I thought that something that was marked from me personally to the Queen personally, that no one would have the impertinence to read that. Some busybody in number 10, however, did. <laughs> Perhaps a little unfortunately, and, and not unknown to members in this House, there was something of a dispute going on at the time about the issue of our relationship with the European community. <laughs> 
and, and I told the Queen what we thought about it and what we were saying about it and where, where I thought the ministers of the day were sometimes getting it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and the House may not be surprised to learn, I, I will not sully your ears, but there's a short, pithy phrase, that, common usage, that encapsulates, encapsulates really exactly what happened next. But suffice it to say that I was summoned to the Chief Whip and after a brief and spirited discussion, <laughs> um, the job returned to the person to whom it originally was. <laughs> it was many years later, but rather typically, that I heard very indirectly and subtly that perhaps Her Majesty had slightly regretted a return to <laughs> normal service. <laughs> um, and I, I thought that was, that was comforting. I was pleased <laughs> about that. Uh, it was many years later, um, after a short involuntary um, uh, break in my service in this house, um, <laughs> that I returned for my present constituency, where we have had the great honour to uh, entertain Her Majesty on many occasions, not least in everybody's memory, um, when she opened our new football stadium uh, and indeed our brand new uh, hospital, um, to which she was gracious enough to agree we could give the title of the Royal Derby Hospital, um, which, in which it rejoices um, to this day. And over the years, three years, for example, as President of the Council, I was fortunate enough to have many encounters um, with Her Majesty and can absolutely endorse everything that has been said and will be said, no doubt, about her intelligence, her awareness um, and her attitude. I was also fortunate enough to be present um, after the death of uh, our colleague John Smith, um, at the commemoration of D-Day on the 50th anniversary, and to be in the Queen's company and observe her, and her <coughs> utter respect um, for the veterans and for the sacrifice of those days over that period. But as I said, I had many encounters with her as President of the Council, and indeed, as Foreign Secretary accompanied her on state visits, where, like the uh, Right Honourable Lady, the former Prime Minister, I heard, uh, for example, her observations about the comments made to her by the mother of a former President um, uh, about the, the then uh, present incumbent. And very interesting it was. <laughs> <laughs> so I would just testify to the qualities that, of which everyone else has spoken and to which I'm sure uh, everyone else will give, tes give testimony of her intelligence, her knowledge, her sense of humour. One of my abiding and favourite memories is fairly, not, not very recently, but so of recent years. Um, people will probably recall it's often been on the news. It's one of my favourite clips of, I think, the Duke of Edinburgh was being chased by a persistent bee and there's a picture of the Queen coming through an archway, giggling uncontrollably, and clearly quite unable to suppress how hysterically funny she found it. And I think that very much sums up the person that you could see and admire. She was a remarkable person, a remarkable monarch, and we are the poorer for her going. Douglas Ross. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Often this place can be criticised for the debates we have, but I think it has risen to the occasion today in memory of the late uh, Her Majesty the Queen and the contributions from uh, all sides of the House show the heartfelt uh, thoughts of members who have had close experience and those of us who have met uh, the Queen very infrequently. Uh, I met uh, the late Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth at the opening of the Scottish Parliament last year uh, and I had a, a short conversation with her as the leader of the main opposition party and she moved on to the other party leaders. Uh, but I have a picture uh, of the Queen shaking my hand with the beaming smile that we saw in her last picture uh, that was taken uh, at Balmoral on Tuesday. And Her Majesty the Queen loved Scotland and Scotland loved Her Majesty the Queen. And I think it is right that that picture it was taken by an excellent Scottish photographer, Jane Barlow, who captured Her Majesty uh, looking very calm, very happy and very at home in Balmoral, which she loved. Uh, I also want to, to speak briefly on behalf of my constituents in Murray, who enjoyed meeting the Queen 
on many occasions. Uh, the most recent visit, and her last visit to Murray, was in November 2014, when she arrived on the Royal Train at Elgin Train Station, and she went to meet our armed forces at RAF Lossiemouth and at Kinloss Barracks. Because it has been mentioned today, but the armed forces uh, are important and were important to Her Majesty and are important to King Charles III uh, and will play uh, an extremely important role in the coming days and weeks. But that visit in November 2014 was accompanied uh, with the late Duke of Edinburgh, and it was her 67th wedding anniversary. And it showed that the public commitment to service and the dedication of both Her Majesty the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh it meant that they went about their duties when others would be celebrating uh, a milestone uh, anniversary. But that was what the Queen provided. Commitment and dedication at every opportunity to deliver for people across the country. We will, over the next few days uh, and weeks, uh, remember that commitment from Her Majesty the Queen. And we will, in our thoughts and our prayers, think about King Charles III and the royal family who are grieving the loss of a loving mother, grandmother and great-grandmother. But as we join together uh, to grieve and mourn, we also unite to give thanks and to celebrate. To celebrate a life well lived, to celebrate a life committed and dedicated to public service. Uh, a life which has shone uh, a light throughout the United Kingdom, the Commonwealth and around the world and the tributes we've heard in this place today and from leaders across the globe show the respect rightly held for the late Her Majesty the Queen. May she rest in peace and God save the King. Amen. John Cryer. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I think probably unlike every previous speaker, I only met the Queen once, and that was when she visited, appropriately enough, the Queen's Theatre in Hornchurch, which was then my constituency. And when she left, she went on, as she always did, to go from strength to strength, I left to be ejected from Parliament by the voters at the following election. So we had slightly different experiences after her uh, visit. As the, as the leader of the Liberal Democrats has said, it's difficult to imagine the world without her, and that's absolutely true. But it's worth remembering something that is very rarely remembered, and that is that in 1936, after the abdication crisis, the monarchy teetered on the brink. And according to most polls at that time, most British voters thought the monarchy might not survive for very long. Now, since 1945, the monarchy has been the most popular institution in Britain and has polled something like 80%. There's no institution that's polled anything like that level of popularity over such a sustained period of time. Now, that's not an accident. It happened for two reasons, both because the Queen and her father, George VI, had that iron dedication to public service, which possibly started in the most spectacular way when George VI decided to remain in London during the war, instead of following the advice to leave London and go elsewhere, perhaps even to Canada, as one advisor told him. That started then. But the second reason is that both George VI and Elizabeth II had an absolutely clear understanding of the constitutional parameters of the role of the monarchy, and neither of them ever strayed outside that role. And in the case of the Queen, despite repeated attempts to pull her into uh, political controversies, including the, one, the first one I can remember was in 1974, we had a hung parliament. And there, were, there was article after article in the press in those days <laughs> saying that the Queen should intervene, should pull the parties together, the two big parties, perhaps the three big parties, to form some sort of coalition government, and she refused to do it. And she was absolutely right to refuse to, to, to do it. And she was persistent in that all the way through. And that's her great legacy, that the monarchy has survived as that popular institution because she observed those absolutely correct constitutional parameters. And I think we can all hope that if the new king, as I'm sure he will, obse observes those parameters and has that dedication to public service, which he's already demonstrated, he can reunite and draw together a nation which is as bitterly divided as I can remember. Dame Andrea Ledson. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. 
Today was strange to wake up to the first day without our much-loved and hugely respected Queen Elizabeth II. There is a sense of personal loss as well as shock. Somehow her long years of service, commitment and duty felt as if they would never come to an end. As one of the older members of my family told me just this morning, things changed so much in her and our lifetime and sometimes we feel hopelessly out of date and rather uncomfortable. She was our figurehead, and for that we are truly grateful. Yeah, yeah. The Queen's reign was somehow timeless. Listening back this morning to her first televised Christmas broadcast in 1957, and then to her broadcast to the nation during COVID, Queen Elizabeth II proved continuity right from the post-war years through 15 different Prime Ministers, from Sir Winston Churchill to my Right Honourable Friend, the Member for South West Norfolk, and to the extraordinary, heartwarming Royal Digital performances with James Bond and with Paddington Bear. For me, her handbag will now always contain a marmalade sandwich. I always remember being sworn in as a Privy Councillor. It was the same day as my Right Honourable Friend, the Member for Uxbridge, and we were given the uh, usual briefing on how you kneel on a footstool with your right with, with, with your right hand by your side, your left hand holding a Bible, and, uh, and my right honourable friend and I looked at each other and we were like, what? What if you fall off your footstool? And we were told, very straight-faced, don't worry, the Queen will find it very amusing. <laughs> Which we didn't find reassuring, but luckily it didn't happen. As Lord President of the Council during the hung Parliament of 2017 to 2019, I had the honour of regular audiences with the Queen ahead of Privy Council meetings. On those occasions, I was always struck by the warmth of the welcome and the frankness of the conversation. The Queen was always interested to hear updates on the progress of legislation and the mood of the House. She was very well informed and also quite challenging at a time of extraordinary events from Brexit to Donald Trump's visit to behaviour scandals here in Westminster. Once a year, the leaders of the Commons and Lords would be invited to Windsor Castle for lunch with the Queen and Prince Philip. These occasions felt quite overwhelming, but at the same time, after a pre-lunch drink in the sitting room and getting into a conversation about how well the restoration of Windsor Castle was presided over by Prince Philip compared to our own efforts to restore <laughs> the Palace of Westminster, <laughs> Baroness Evans of Bowes Park and I were very soon distracted as we sought to defend the indefensible. A happy memory for me is going to Sandringham for Privy Council 1 January, with log fires burning and the Queen's corgis pottering around. I recall the Queen saying what a very busy Christmas she'd had, and I suggested, well, at least her family don't need to pause Christmas lunch for the Queen's speech, at which she told me they most certainly did. <laughs> As for all of us, her family would pause lunch and watch the Queen's speech, and Princess Charlotte had run over to the TV screen and said, look, there's Gangan. <laughs> very heartwarming. At each of the audiences, it would strike me anew that Privy Council meetings were just one of the many daily duties of the Queen, and that her cheerfulness and her twinkling eyes were always a constant. Truly, she was a monarch who put the comfort of others above herself, and she never faltered in her promise to spend her life devoted to service. And as we've prayed every day sitting in this place that Queen Elizabeth I may always incline to thy will and walk in thy way, so I believe we can now pray with confidence that after this life she may attain everlasting joy and felicity through Jesus Christ our Lord. Queen Elizabeth II spent her life building relationships in our nation, our Commonwealth and across the world. In her achievements we can all take comfort and know that as the crown passes to our new king, we will have the example of her legacy to unite us in loyal allegiance to her successor, King Charles III. God save the king. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dame Angela Eagle. Thank you uh, very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. And it's an honour to um, pay a tribute to Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II on behalf of my constituents in Wallasey, who were in shock and mourning uh, today. Uh, one of the things that strikes uh, everyone contemplating this sad news is the sheer span of the length of time of her reign, uh, the longest ever reign in UK history, 
uh, someone who lived through an era of profound upheaval and change, but who represented continuity and certainty amidst the tumult. Uh, when she was born, it's uh, hard to remember that uh, in 1926, only 10 women had ever been elected uh, into this place, into this House of Commons. Uh, and at that time, women did not exercise the vote on the same terms as men. Thankfully, that has now changed, though I always say that uh, work to achieve equality is never done. But she, uh, as the mother of the house said earlier, led just by example. She led by being. She demonstrated as our head of state, who was clearly, obviously, a woman and a wife and a mother, uh, how possible it was, uh, even if that had been granted to her by fate, by destiny, to combine the roles of uh, the uh, pressure uh, that she had on her uh, with uh, a family life. Her coronation was the first to be televised. Uh, now the monarchy has a presence on social media platforms seen by billions. Um, her reign has seen the transition from empire to commonwealth, from conflict to peace in Northern Ireland, but also from complacency to climate emergency, which demonstrates to all of us that uh, we have much to do and many problems to confront us. The values she personified um, are clear uh, and have been clear from the comments in this House. Utter commitment to public service and duty uh, a woman who dedicated her life to the service of our nation. And when she said at 21 in a broadcast, I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service, that is a vow that she delivered, uh, as we now know, um, faithfully right up until the very end. She personified wisdom and experience, but she did, as uh, the Honourable Lady who's just uh, spoken, um, has just said, have that twinkle in her eye. Whenever uh, you were waiting in line to meet Her Majesty, you could see the twinkle and it put you at ease. She first visited Wirral in 1957, um, but during my time in this house, she first came to Birkenhead when she opened the Europa Pool in 1996, and finally uh, came to Wallasey uh, for the second time in 2011 <coughs> to uh, open the uh, newly rebuilt floral pavilion in New Brighton. Thousands upon thousands of official duties, many, many thousands of my constituents uh, looked forward uh, to, to her visits and have fond memories of them. She was always interested, always engaging, and always smiling and reassuring when she interacted uh, with people who lined the routes to see her on these fantastic occasions. Uh, so her loss will be mourned. It's a terrible but inevitable loss. She left us in a place where we know uh, we can survive the transition because of the strength she gave to the institution. So may she rest in peace, Madam Deputy Speaker. And uh, we all wish um, the greatest condolences to the royal family who are going through such terrible loss now. Uh, and we look forward uh, to supporting the new king as much as we've supported our now sadly lost Queen Elizabeth II. Yeah. 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 It's, a, it's a pleasure to follow the Right Honourable Lady. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm filled with great sadness as I rise to pay tribute to the life and the memory of Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Our thoughts are with the royal family, and uh, who have lost a mother, a grandmother, and of course a great-grandmother. Her Majesty lived an extraordinary life of service, and the touching tributes that we have already heard from right honourable and honourable members so far, along with the outpouring of emotion from across the world, including from my own constituents in Bromsgrove District, reflect the deep affection and love in which she was held. For over seven decades, she was a source of our strength and comfort, a representative of our closest held values and beliefs, a defender of faith and an embodiment of the very best of public service and duty. She was our North Star, a symbol of strength in difficult times. To put it simply, she was our Queen. 
Right Honourable and Honourable Members, uh, many have shared their, their times of when they were privileged to meet uh, Her Late Majesty. And, and I was able to do so on many uh, occasions, and I always welcome the, the huge wisdom she would share, the advice, and of course the, the good humour. I will never forget during the occasion of the final Privy Council meeting of 2017, as the formalities ended, Her Majesty suddenly said, gin and tonic, anybody? <laughs> and proceeded to press a buzzer. And with that, her staff promptly burst through the doors of the 1844 room in Bucking Palace, armed with trays of G&T and nibbles. Now, I'm not much of a G&T drinker myself, but I certainly was not going to turn down the opportunity of enjoying one with Her Late Majesty. I later learned that she'd like to make the last Privy Council meeting of the year extra special so that she could wish everyone a Merry Christmas. Madam Deputy Speaker, our country faces immense challenges and at home and abroad, and the person that has always been there is there no longer. However, in the wake of this terrible loss, it is an opportunity for parliamentarians from across this House to renew their commitment to the values that were embodied by Her Late Majesty, public service, duty, the national interest. If we can leave this place having achieved but the smallest fraction of what Her Late Majesty achieved, our country would be the better for it. After a lifetime of service, Her Late Majesty is now at rest. May she rest in peace and God save the King. Yeah. 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 And on behalf of Plaid Cymru, I would like to offer my sincere sympathies and condolences to Her Majesty the Queen's children and her extended family as they come to terms with their grief. Queen Elizabeth II has been a constant presence throughout all our lives. She stood as a figure of stability in a world that is changing at a rapid and sometimes frightening pace. The loss of the continuity that Her Majesty embodied is a source of sorrow and anxiety for people across the world. Up to her final days, she conducted her duties with an extraordinary dedication that has been an inspiration for so many of us. Her values of duty, service, reconciliation and forgiveness are values that the people of Wales hold very dear. In Wales, we respect people who embody that sense of dedication to society and to public service, who put their public duty first. Her Majesty the Queen personified that duty for so many people for so many years. And Her Majesty had a canny ability to put people at ease in the midst of palace formality. When I was appointed, fortunate to be appointed, to the Privy Council three years ago, I remember being, being nervous, being intimidated by the protocols and the rules that govern interactions with the royal family. Your mind, as it would do, tots up an infinite checklist of everything that could possibly go wrong. And what struck me was something she said. She said, you may well be worrying that you'll do something wrong or in the wrong order. Don't worry, whatever could possibly go wrong, I've seen it all before. There's nothing that you could do that would shock me now. Even among all the pomp and ceremony, there was that characteristic warmth and courtesy to the Queen. And Her Majesty was a magnificent role model for older women across the world. Historically, of course, older women have disappeared from public life. The Queen was a constant, visible figure throughout the 70 years of her reign. From historic buildings and charities to football, she always showed an interest in Wales. People of all walks of Welsh life have been touched by the Queen's keen interest and constant support of Welsh organisations. She attended every official opening of the Senate and showed due respect for Wales's nationhood and our growing democracy. She was patron to organisations as diverse as the Royal Welsh Agricultural Society, the Football Association of Wales, Cardiff Royal Infirmary and the Welsh Pony and Cobb Society. Her love of horses, from thoroughbreds to native ponies, shone through. You see it in those sparkling smiles. Everyone in public life knows you have a public smile. But the photos with the horses, that was her real smile. <laughs> we now see one era drawing to a close and a new one at its very beginning. For now we will say, Diochen Varian, thank you very much, Your Majesty. Kus Kman may she rest in peace. Bendith Dew, Ara Brennan, God's blessing on the King. Matt Hancock. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. 
I rise to share gratitude for the life of Her Late Majesty the Queen, her family, and also sadness for the country and the world at the loss of the greatest statesman of our time. I also want to mark my own personal gratitude uh, for the advice that Her Majesty gave me, <coughs> for her role in particular, as has been mentioned by the most recent former Prime Minister, for her role in the bringing the country together and giving hope in dark times during the pandemic. And I'd also add for taking the rare step of going public with her health status when declaring that she'd taken a vaccination and showing further leadership. She was much loved, of course, and loved across my West Suffolk constituency, but perhaps no more anywhere than in Newmarket, which she visited so often. Newmarket, of course, is the jewel in the crown of horse racing, certainly domestically and probably across the world. And on her many, many visits there, she showed that she could walk with sovereigns and the general public alike. She visited many times. It was where I first met her. The first time I met her, I was, uh, I was lucky to be with my small daughter, who handed her a posy. And it's my daughter's uh, first memory, and no doubt will be an abiding one for the rest of her life. And it reminds me of the many times that I've seen Her Majesty meeting the public and been impressed and inspired by her sheer ability to ensure that each person she meets understands that she is focused entirely on them and she listened so well to them, knowing, no doubt, that for each person she met, it was a moment that that person would remember for the rest of her life. Her fortitude at continuing to do that well into her 90s was incredible to behold. Now, we in Newmarket are not always known for our humility, but the one thing we do know <laughs> is that the reason that Her Majesty loved to come to Newmarket was not because of us two-legged beings, but because of the four-legged beings. And the lo her love of horse racing was perhaps her greatest love outside her duty to her family and her country. Uh, the twinkle that we've heard so much of uh, and the genuine uh, smile that came on her face was probably, the smile was probably broadest when at a race course, as she demonstrated in what was probably her last social public occasion at uh, Ascot. I remember it particularly <coughs> at a visit when she came to open the National Horse Racing Museum, which is in uh, Newmarket. Uh, she went down the line of dignitaries, she went down and met the public, she gave them her customary focus, but she was clearly doing her duty because the museum is full of retired racehorses, and it was only when she got to the horses that she really lit up. <laughs> this was Her Majesty at her best. Uh, we have lost a great uh, servant. We, she is replaced by another great servant of our nation. God save the King. Yeah. Yeah. Dame Margaret Hunt. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I think what's been so remarkable in the words that have been spoken since uh, Her Majesty's the Qu uh, Queen Elizabeth's death is just how many people's lives she uh, she touched. It wasn't just simply the length of her reign, nor her complete commitment to duty, but I think it was her character and the way in which she did her work that meant that she was loved by so many and will be missed by us all. Many of us here today had the privilege of meeting her and talking to her. And like the Right Honourable Member for Chingford and Woodford Green, I too had the drinks at Christmas and wished I knew a bit more about cocktails, but went for the safe gin and tonic at the time. Um, I want to remember her at the start of her reign and then recall two of the times when I was with her. I was eight when Queen Elizabeth was crowned. Um, just to say to the, uh, right, my right honourable friend, the member from Derby South, we were still rationed in those days, if she remembers. Mm. So the reason that the chocolate was so uh, welcome was it was rationed chocolate. We didn't care about the eggs and the meat being rationed, but the chocolate being rationed was really important. We didn't have a television in our home, uh, so we huddled and crowded around a small black and white television in one of our neighbours' houses. But I really remember seeing the coach, 
seeing the glittering jewels on her crown and seeing her stunning white dress, it was simply like a fairy tale, a Cinderella or a Snow White coming true. And that magical moment of beauty, hope and goodness has stayed with me all through her long reign. Uh, there were two occasions when I met her that also remain strong in my memory. Firstly, in the early 80s, when I was leader in Islington, the Queen visited Sadler's Wells, and we laid on a session for her with a group of old-age pensioners, women, living in Finsbury, and we were running there a keep-fit dancing class under the tutorship of Sadler's Wells teachers. The Queen walked into the room, and the warmth of her smile as she entered the room and the utter joy of the women at being watched by Her Majesty and the calm way that she put them at ease when she talked to them was just simply brilliant. And for the Queen, I think it was probably just another day, but for the women, it was probably one of the most eventful days mm -hmm. in their lives. The second was when the Queen came to visit Barking and Dagenham in July 2015 when she was nearly 90, to mark the 50th anniversary of the creation of the borough. She spent almost the whole day there, opening a community centre, launching a lo uh, lunching in a, lo a local theatre, she visited schools and uh, she watched a swimming display. Thousands of my constituents came out to see her and many met her and she did enjoy a rapturous reception. And the fact that she's chosen to spend so much of her time with us on what must have been a tiring day, if she was getting on for 90, demonstrates, I think, her total commitment to duty, to us, to her people. And among the sea of Union Jacks that uh, met her, I just remember the placards which said, welcome our Queen, we love you. Madam Deputy Speaker, at a time of constant change, Queen Elizabeth II gave us stability. At a time of uncertainty, tension and conflict, she always provided a path to reconciliation. And as a nation and community, she provided leadership that brought recognition, respect and status and love to all of Great Britain and all of our people. Yes. We will miss her. Yeah. 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 Nigel Adams. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, it is with great sadness that I rise to speak in the tributes to Her Late Majesty the Queen, not only on my behalf, but on behalf of my constituents in Selby and Ainsty. The news the whole nation had been dreading brings the reign of the longest serving monarch in British history to an end. As we've heard, as a child, she was not expected to be Queen, but her destiny and that of our nation changed when her father acceded to the throne as King George VI. She, as we have heard, um, as a 21-year-old young woman, pledged to live a life of service. There, there can be no one anywhere, Madam Deputy Speaker, that can say she did not deliver on that pledge. I vividly recall the celebrations for the Queen's Silver Jubilee in my village and across the nation. It's also incredible that she has also celebrated her golden, her diamond and platinum jubilees. Her life spanned some of the most amazing milestones over the last century, from the discovery of penicillin, the moon landings, and the invention of the World Wide Web. She was also a monarch that circumnavigated the world, visiting hundreds of countries, including those Commonwealth countries which she held with such affection. And Madam Deputy Speaker, the Queen also visited Selby in my constituency alongside her beloved husband, the Duke of Edinburgh. This was in 1969 when they came to present Maundy money to 43 men and 43 women at Selby Abbey. 10,000 people lined the town streets that day to welcome and catch a glimpse of their monarch. Now, like many honourable and right honourable members, I've had the privilege of meeting the Queen uh, both times at the palace, and I cannot tell you, Madam Deputy Speaker, how nervous I was uh, as we lined up to meet her. All my nerves were becalmed, however, once I'd been greeted by that beautifully warm smile and her welcoming words. That warmth, that smile, 
is what has comforted our nation over the decades, through good and challenging times. The word constant has been widely used, and that is exactly what her late, la late Ma Majesty was. It would be difficult to imagine life without her, and it feels like we have all lost a grandmother. My right honourable friend, the member for Uxbridge, in his touching speech, referred to Her Late Majesty as Elizabeth the Great. He is absolutely right to do so. She was a truly great monarch, and in some ways, the greatest monarch. Her Late Majesty was also a mother, grandmother, and great grandmother, and my thoughts and prayers are with her family especially with King Charles III, who succeeds her to the throne. And as my right honourable friend has also said, it is a tribute to her that we can say with great confidence, God save the King. Yeah. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, we owe Her Late Majesty a great debt of gratitude. May God bless her and keep her. May she rest in peace. And if I may paraphrase a small bear from darkest Peru. Mom, thank you for everything. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, the warm tributes that have already been paid to Queen Elizabeth II by honourable and right honourable members today tell their own story about the great respect and deep affection that so many from such diverse and different backgrounds had for her. It is an affection and a respect that transcends mere political difference and speaks to her position as a leader and an example of public service. As others have already said, the Queen was one of the most consequential civic figures of the last century. As political leaders came and went, as public opinion ebbed and flowed, she remained a constant an unyielding and limitless source of strength and comfort for her people in times of national pride and sorrow. The scale of her reign, lasting more than 70 years, spanned the embers of conflict following the Second World War to the peace process between our islands and our peoples. During that time, she forged a legacy that will outlast all of us uh, here. But I hope that lays the foundation for enduring relations between these islands, in spite of the challenges we now face. As leader of the SDLP, I had cause to meet with Queen Elizabeth on a number of occasions. Believe me when I say this, uh, it is difficult to think of two people uh, more divorced from each other in terms of background and aspiration. But in any dealings I had with her, I can only recount a person of great warmth, character and an enduring passion for the interests and needs of people. That, I think, is the reason for the longevity of our support among the British people. But as a leader of Irish nationalism, I want to place on record my deep appreciation and respect for the Queen's role in forging new bonds of friendship uh, between our islands and between our people. It is also easy to forget now, but she was also a victim of the conflict that the people of these islands were subjected to for 40 long years. I know that the murder of her cousin Lord Mountbatten in Mullock Moor in August 1979 had a profound effect on her and on her extended family. She experienced the sharp pain of loss, but in common with the people of Ireland, she took risks for peace and played an enormous role in reconciling the traditions that share our islands. At no time was this more visible than during her 2011 visit to Ireland. I believe that Queen Elizabeth's visit to the Gardens of Remembrance in Dublin and the way she stretched herself to be an example of a good neighbour to Ireland in those moments contributed in a very significant way to healing the wounds of our past. Those couple of fuckle, those uh, few words of Irish, a hooked on August Akarja, President and Friends, was a symbolic embrace of the Irish people and it was deeply, deeply appreciated. The blessings of a long life doesn't make the burden of saying goodbye any lighter. My sincerest condolences are with the Queen's immediate family, with Right Honourable and Honourable members here today, and most particularly with those in Northern Ireland for whom she held a cherished place in their lives and in their hearts. 
I know how difficult it is to lose your hero, but there is comfort in the lasting legacy that she will leave, having helped shape our common history. The story of our peoples is fundamentally and inseparably intertwined. We all live in each other's shadow. I hope that we continue to build on the legacy that Queen Elizabeth II helped forge. May she rest in peace. Yeah. Yeah. Order, just a reminder that the speaker's guidance was uh, three minutes in order to be able to get in as many uh, people as possible. Uh, David Jones. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. And as other Right Honourable and Honourable Members have mentioned, it is impossible for virtually all of us and our constituents to remember a time when Her Majesty the Queen was not there. I was born a matter of weeks after she acceded to the throne, and throughout my life, and indeed all our lives, hers has been a continuous, reassuring presence, providing wise guidance for the country through good times and bad. She was both an anchor and a lodestone for our nation, and it is indeed hard to contemplate life without her. For seven decades, she was there for us, and I think that many of us thought that she always would be. She had a rare, innate ability to generate affection, respect and loyalty, not only from the people of this country, but from countless millions throughout the Commonwealth and beyond. Hers was arguably the most recognised face on the planet, and it's not only here that she will be missed, but in other lands across the world, even in the few countries that she never visited during her long reign. At the time of her Platinum Jubilee, the BBC broadcast a remarkable documentary called Elizabeth, the Unseen Queen, which was part narrated by the Queen herself. And in the documentary, she spoke the following words of an Australian Aboriginal proverb. We are all visitors to this time, this place, we are just passing through. Our purpose here is to observe, to learn, to grow, to love, and then we return home. And Madam Deputy Speaker, while we and our constituents feel the most profound grief at her passing, and our mourning will undoubtedly continue long beyond her funeral, we must find comf comfort in the knowledge that our Queen, strong in the Christian faith that sustained her throughout her life, has returned home and is at peace. God bless the lovely memory of Her Majesty. God save the King. Yeah. 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 Edmund. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I, I rise at a time of great sadness for our country, and I do so on behalf of my constituents in Doncaster North, and I know, Madam Deputy Speaker, I speak for you, and your constituents in Doncaster Central, indeed, right across Doncaster. I, I would say also, Madam Deputy Speaker, the House has been at its best today uh, with some wonderful speeches and memories of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. I, I was uh, leader of the opposition, as the House will know, and I know that it is noted that the uh, Queen experienced 15 prime ministers. I think perhaps it has been lost count of how many leaders of the opposition uh, she went through, which says something about leaders of the opposition, uh, perhaps. But, but it is in that spirit, in my experience, that I want to talk briefly uh, to the House, because I think one thing that has come through so much since Her Majesty's passing last night is the words public service. And I want to reflect on some qualities, some extraordinary qualities that she showed in terms of public service. First of all, her ability to bring people together and unify our country. I was at the state banquet in 2014 for the President of Ireland, a state banquet attended by Martin, by the late Martin McGuinness. It showed extraordinary selflessness, courage, and an ability to heal that Her Majesty invited Martin McGuinness, given the history of what happened to Lord Mountbatten. But it was the person that she was her duty to our country, her duty to bring people together came first. Secondly, I think she taught us about kindness in leadership. 
The right honourable member for, for Chingford, who is not in his place, talked about his experience when he was deposed <coughs> as leader of the opposition. I, I was deposed by the British people rather than uh, my party. Uh, uh, but, but, uh, and and I, I, should, um, I, I should say that, uh, to the House that, uh, as my career nosedived, nosedived, my wife took off, and she became uh, a High Court judge in 2019 uh, and became uh, a dame. And so we were both invited to um, the palace to meet Her Majesty. And Her Majesty fixed me with her gaze as we saw each other and said, oh, it's you, she said. <laughs> what are you doing here? Knowing full well, knowing full well uh, why I was there. And we had a wonderful conversation. And there she was at 93, still full of vim, vigor, uh, and humor. And there is a lesson for us all in the kindness she showed to me and to other members of this house. And, and thirdly, I want to say something about her sense of humour, because I, I go back to a time in 2008 when I had been recently appointed uh, the, Minister, the Secretary of State uh, for Climate Change, and I went to my first ever Privy Council meeting, and Her Majesty uh, was reading out um, uh, laws that had, uh, were, were being passed. And as she did so, she paused for a moment and said, because she was having trouble reading, and she said, yes, it's these new long life light bulbs that we've introduced. <laughs> <laughs> and she fixed me with a beady gaze <laughs> and a twinkle in her eye, and I smiled. <laughs> and that was a sense of humor that, that she showed. She, she was an extraordinary monarch, but I do also want to say a word about King Charles III. And, and here, again, I speak on behalf of my constituents. He has been an extraordinary warrior on the issue of the environment, long before it was fashionable. And when I was Climate Change Secretary, I always thought of him as an extraordinary national asset on this issue, and he remains so. But he's not just a fighter for big causes. He is also someone, and here he has inherited this from his mother, of extraordinary kindness, generosity, and compassion. We see it in his work to heal social divisions in our country, but I've also seen it in my constituency, which was hit by floods in both 2007 and 2000. And, 19. and on both occasions, including on the first when part of my constituency was still underwater, King Charles III came to, to see us, to see my constituents, to talk to them, to be with them, including on the second occasion just before Christmas, because he knew that his presence at this time of anguish and grief and anxiety for my constituents would make an enormous difference to them, and indeed it did so. I say to the House, we have lost an extraordinary monarch who has had an extraordinary and distinguished reign for seven decades. She is followed by someone who I know will live up to all of the hopes of our country, will bring that same sense of unity, that sense of compassion and that sense of public service. Long live the King. Yeah. Chris Crayley. Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, I'm very grateful to be able to participate in this solemn occasion, one that we all knew would happen, but one we all really in our heart of hearts hoped wouldn't. Uh, it is a day of mourning for all of us individually, for us collectively as a house and for the whole nation. And not just the whole nation. I was struck last night to see a picture of an American baseball diamond with the teams lined up in a minute's silence in recognition of the loss of the Queen. Uh, and of course she was a, a global figure. I remember when I hosted the Global Law Summit in 2015 and the Queen very kindly hosted a reception at the palace. Uh, the US Justice Secretary, a powerful man in that country, coming up to me after he'd been introduced to the, the Queen going, I feel like a nine-year-old. It's just amazing. I'm here. It's extraordinary. Uh, and that's what the world thinks of her, thought of her, and that's why 
they will all be mourning with us now. And I have a particular reason for mourning, two reasons actually. My constituency is one of the places she came to every year uh, as a committed racing watcher to attend the derby. Uh, and she will be much missed there in the future. And I had an email from a constituent this morning saying we will miss now that moment every year when she drove up the road at the end of our street and we could all see her and wave as she went past. She'll be missed by everybody in Epsom. But I'll particularly miss her because I had the privilege of serving for five years, first as her Lord Chancellor and then as Lord President of her Council. Uh, and in those two roles, one gets to spend uh, not as much time as the Prime Minister, but a considerable amount of time with her. And she was an extraordinary, welcoming, kind, smart person. I remember the moment when the current, Lord Ch uh, the current uh, uh, Archbishop of Canterbury was sworn in. And we've been through the formula uh, that you go through on these occasions. Uh, and then when we finished, she and the Archbishop, who used to work for Shell in Nigeria, embarked in this extraordinary conversation about the politics of Nigeria. And she knew it inside out. She was incredibly knowledgeable about what was going on in this country and elsewhere. She was incredibly welcoming for all those of us who've had the privilege of spending time working with her in, in our various capacities. We know she was a kind person, or a warm person, always welcoming, always that uh, a twinkle in the eye that the Right Honourable Member referred to a moment ago. Uh, always a, a light-hearted conversation, uh, sometimes about great issues, sometimes about simple matters like how you manage all the dogs at Sandringham at Christmas time. Uh, I remember so many occasions going in with this incredible global figure and being made to feel welcome, being made to feel that she was interested in what I and we were doing uh, and to feel incredibly proud that she was our monarch. Uh, and I join the Right Honourable Member in wishing all the very best to King Charles III. He has had a long apprenticeship. He will, I believe, be a great monarch. And I know everyone in this house will wish him all the very best for what is a very difficult time for him. We'll also want to extend their condolences to all members of the royal family who've lost their grandmother and their great-grandmother. It is a very sad occasion for them. But I particularly today think back to one conversation I had with her. We were, before a Privy Council meeting, talking about the way technology is changing the world. And I said, yeah, it's extraordinary. The world's changing so fast. Who knows where we'll be in 30 years' time? And she said, the only thing I know is I won't be there. And sadly, Madam Deputy Speaker, she isn't. And we all miss her. Hilary yeah. Bell. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. I rise on behalf of my constituents in Leeds Central as we together mourn the Queen's passing, offer our heartfelt condolences to His Majesty the King and to the Royal Family on their private grief borne so publicly and to mark an extraordinary life. It was at my first meeting of the Privy Council that I came to understand that the Queen was determined that things should be done correctly. We were waiting outside the door and one of the footmen opened it to see what was going on and as he closed it, he turned to his colleague and said, she's moving the footstools again. <laughs> to which he received the reply, she's the Queen. If she wants to move the footstools, she can move the footstools. <laughs> now hers was a life that above all else embodied constancy. We have known no other, and we feel the Queen's passing so keenly precisely because she was always here. Her devotion to duty, to service and to representing our country ran like an unbroken thread through the decades and through each of our lives. Like the passing of time and the changing of the seasons, she was always here. And although, as we have heard, so many things changed during her reign, she did not change. Above the noisy clamour of politics and public debate, she carried on and showed us what service means, carried out with grace and with humour. And now the day has come, as we long feared but knew it would, that she is no longer here. And as the people of Leeds and of Yorkshire and of the country come to terms with their deep sense of loss at this moment in the history of our nation, our United Kingdom, 
Let us give thanks for her uniquely long and well-lived life. And just as faith, hope and love abide, so will our memories of the Queen, her constancy, her service and her profound sense of duty. Thank you for everything that you did, ma'am, and may you rest in peace eternal. Andrew Stevenson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I had the very great privilege of serving as the Vice Chamberlain of Her Majesty's Household between July 2018 and April 2019, a role and a title given to the fourth most senior government whip. It's a role that um, the Right Honourable Member for Derby South spoke about earlier in her fantastic contribution. It's a role that most Honourable and Right Honourable Members don't know even exists, apart from when they see one of the government whips stood at the bar of the house wearing a tailcoat and carrying what appears to be a snooker cue. It's it's also a role that only people hear about when they realise that somebody has to be held hostage at the palace before Her Majesty would come to Parliament for the state opening. However, the role is much more than that, in that alongside your day-to-day activities in the whip's office, you would write a daily note to Her Majesty, keeping her updated with parliamentary business, giving her all the gossip, and then going to Parliament to discuss those matters. I'm just very glad that, unlike the Right Honourable Member for Derby South, the Chief Whip nor the Prime Minister ever read my notes. (laughs) (laughs) Given my period in office coincided with some of the most acrimonious Brexit debates, a confidence vote in our Prime Minister, my Right Honourable Friend, the Member for Maidenhead, and the 2019 vote of confidence, there are very few issues Her Majesty and I have not discussed. Indeed, my final week in office as the Vice-Chamberlain included nude protesters gluing themselves to the glass in the public gallery and the chamber being suspended after water started pouring through the ceiling into the press gallery. Perhaps it was quite symbolic as to how broken our Parliament was at that time. However, despite this being an immensely stressful and politically charged period, on every occasion I met Her Majesty, I found her calm, warm and reassuring. Like all who have spoken today, I was struck by her interest in current events and her lifelong service to our nation. As our longest reigning monarch and the world's longest serving head of state, she had an incredible insight into current affairs and was a great symbol of continuity in a rapidly changing world. I remember vividly a discussion we had about the online abuse that many members across the House face on social media. Her Majesty recalled a conversation she'd had with Sir Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web and talk knowledgeably about the subject, despite social media being something most people in the 90s wouldn't know or care anything about. We also discussed interviews uh, that she'd watched on the BBC News at 10 the night before, demonstrating that Her Majesty's desire to stay on top of current affairs stretched well beyond the papers she received in her daily red box. All these meetings took place with Her Majesty standing throughout and were often sandwiched between multiple other official engagements that she was undertaking. I I last met Her Majesty the Queen on the 19th of July at her last ever ever Privy Council meeting when I was sworn into the Privy Council and presented with a Bible which I carry with me today. I believe that made me the 1,336th person and final person to be sworn into Her Late Majesty's Privy Council. It is an incredible honour as a minister for the past five years to get to meet a remarkable, caring, informed and witty monarch who has overseen huge change during her reign but never stopped working day in, day out for our country. And it is an incredible honour for me as a Lancastrian MP to see the love felt towards Her Majesty, Duke of Lancaster, by so many of my constituents in Pendle, who I will be joining with in remembering and celebrating her life over this period of national mourning. May she rest in peace, and God save the King. Drew Hendry. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. I never had the pleasure of meeting the late Queen personally, but I have met her son, the new King, on uh, several occasions. And I can testify personally to his deep love for the Highlands. And I know that my constituents in Inverness, Nairn, Badenoch and Strathspey will want to join me in holding him in our thoughts as he deals with this most personal of losses 
that of his mother. But of course, as we know, the late Queen was also a grandmother and a great-grandmother, and she acceded to the throne as a young woman at the age of 25 and was an inspiration and icon for many uh, young women, and as we've also heard this morning, became an inspiration and an icon for many older women uh, too. She was someone, as we can see from the tributes uh, internationally, who was respected and admired far and wide. The vast majority of my constituents, whether they be monarchists or Republican or anything in between, have never known a time when she was not our head of state. Our sympathy goes to her family and all of those who are so deeply affected by her passing. Yeah, yeah. Sir Bernard Jenkins. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And on behalf of the constituents of Harwich and North Essex, I rise to pay tribute to Her Late Majesty, whose whole life was the greatest example of public service we shall ever witness, whose kind heart, sharp intellect, huge wisdom was such a gift to the nation, and who had love in her soul for everyone and a serenity which even now calms the nation in these troubled times. She inspired so many good causes. I single out one, the Commonwealth. In 1952, a mere eight nations, which she led from being an emerging relic of a lost empire to become a network of nations representing two and a half billion people in the network world we now live in. Just one of her achievements, but what an achievement. What a legacy for future generations, including may I say, the Commonwealth Youth Orchestra, whose foundation she supported, about which she spoke to me with such passion, knowing that we both had such interest in music. Her devotion brought her to every corner of the kingdom where she would show her humour and humanity. When in 2004 she came to Harwich to commemorate the 400th anniversary of the town charter, when Ivan Henderson was still the Member of Parliament, her programme included seeing the historic carvings in the town jail. But when the late Andy Morrison, the mayor, announced, you will now be taken to the jail, Your Majesty, a pall fell over the royal party. So he attempted to rephrase the invitation. But Prince Philip just retorted, that wasn't much better. And she threw back her head and roared with laughter. Later that day, as she stepped into the crowd on Harwich Quay, she said to the mayoress, Pam Morrison, my dear, don't let me miss any children. A three-year-old boy was duly lifted over the barrier who gave his flowers to the mayoress at first. But Her Majesty unfazed chatted to the boy and charmed him and he saw her take the little bunch of flowers which he had given her into her own hands and she carried them for the rest of the tour. So she combined global leadership, such principle and dedication with such humanity and care. She has gone to the light who some call God, who inspires us all. God rest her soul. May he comfort all those who are closest to her. God save the King. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. It is an honour to be able to pay tribute to Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II and to offer my condolences and those of all of my constituents to King Charles and the whole of the royal family as they uh, face their personal uh, loss. Honourable and right honourable members have rightly praised Her Majesty's admirable work ethic, her sense of duty, which has never wavered, and her unparalleled dedication to public service. Her Majesty served us right until the very end, forever committed to her people and her country. She lived and symbolised the very best of our constitutional system, the value of a royal family, what it gives to our country and the part that they play in our national life. One of the proudest days of my life was when my dad was awarded an OB at Buckingham Palace. My whole family, we just could not get over that we would get the chance to hang out in the Queen's house. On that day, it fell to the Queen's daughter, the Princess Royal, uh, to hand out the honours. But the whole occasion was made magical because it followed precisely the exact example of the Queen herself. And I will also never forget arriving in this place for the very first time in 2010, standing in front of the Speaker's chair, taking hold of this House's copy of the Holy Quran, upon which I swore my loyalty to Her Majesty the Queen as one of this House's first ever female Muslim Members of Parliament. 
Her relationship with Birmingham was strong, and, and in return, we Brummies had a deep affection for her and gratitude for the time that she devoted to us, to us in the 70 years of her reign. Over the years, she visited Villa Park, the Bull Ring, many of our railway stations, the NEC, the International Convention Centre, Pebble Mill, and the Hippodrome. And of course, we have just hosted the Commonwealth Games, an important moment for our city that has such a deep connection with the Commonwealth and which is inextricably linked with the Queen herself. Like so many thousands of Brummies, as much as I am a child of Birmingham, of England and of Britain, I am also a child and grandchild of the Commonwealth. Millions of British citizens have a similar family history, making them a part of the Commonwealth family. And we recognise Her Majesty as the loving matriarch of the Commonwealth, its guardian and its guiding light. Her commitment to the Commonwealth and her championing of it recognised and respected our heritage. She gave institutional and spiritual meaning and the heart and soul of belonging to those of us who are citizens of our great nation, equal before the laws of our land, but who do not have centuries of birthright claim upon these, our islands, and we thank her for it. Um, for me, her Christian faith also is something that always stood out. She was a committed Christian, as we know, Supreme Governor of the Church of England. It might surprise some that her commitment to her Christian faith could mean so much to those of us who practice, observe and belong to other faith communities. But in a speech at Lambeth Palace to mark her Diamond Jubilee, the Queen said, and I quote, the concept of our established church is occasionally misunderstood and I believe commonly underappreciated. Its role is not to defend Anglicanism to the exclusion of other religions. Instead, the church has a duty to protect the free practice of all faiths in this country. She was defender of the faith, but she was a queen for those of us with other faiths and indeed for those of none. May God make it easy for her. May he give her loved one strength. And if I may offer this house an Islamic verse, which Muslims recite when someone dies, and which I hope will resonate with the Queen's Christian faith too. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. To God we belong and to God we all return. Madam Deputy Speaker, I rise on behalf of, uh, well, to make my own tribute, but also on behalf of the constituents of North East Hertfordshire in Royston, Baldock, Buntingford and Letchworth. Uh, the Queen was very much loved and admired uh, in our area, uh, a remarkable woman and a wonderful head of state. She knew our area well from visiting her mother's family who live in a village near Hitchin, St Paul's Walden. We were lucky that the Queen was able to be with us for some of our most important events. She opened the new North Hertfordshire Leisure Centre at Letchworth Garden City, and later in my first year as MP in 1993, she came to open a new housing uh, development at Beach Hill and a sheltered housing scheme at Tabor Court in Letchworth. Uh, and Letchworth was also proud that she chose the Marmot Pram uh, as the baby carriage for the new king uh, made in Letchworth. Uh, on these occasions, what struck me was that the Queen was able to put people at their ease and, and to get them to talk to her, and she was kindly and had that dry sense of humour. Uh, on the sense of humour, I do remember one Privy Council meeting uh, when the country was having difficulties, uh, similar but at a different period to those that the uh, Right Honourable Member for Derby South mentioned uh, with the European Union. But at this particular Privy Council meeting, uh, she approved the High Hedges Order for Guernsey. And then afterwards, uh, she said with a twinkle in her eye, well, I'm so pleased we've sorted out those High Hedges in Guernsey. Is there anything else going on? <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, <laughs> uh, people in North East Hertfordshire loved the Queen. Uh, and we will miss her. Our thoughts are with the royal family and long live the King. Yeah. Dame Diana Johnson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I think there have been some wonderful tributes 
to Her Late Majesty the Queen. Particularly, I just want to comment on the uh, contribution from the, my honourable friend, the member for Birmingham Ladywood, who talked about the Commonwealth and the importance of faith to the late Queen. Um, yeah, yeah. I think this is my opportunity just to say a few words on behalf of my constituents in Hull North. I was very pleased indeed that the leader of the opposition, my right honourable friend, uh, referred to the words of the adopted son of Kingston upon Hull, the poet Philip Larkin. He penned those words 45 years ago for the Silver Jubilee celebrations. And as with all great poets, the words resonate as much on this day as they did in 1977. And I'm just going to repeat them. In times when nothing stood but worsened or grew strange, there was one constant good. She did not change. Now, my city uh, of Kingston-upon-Hull has a rebellious history with the monarchy, <laughs> slamming the city gates against the king in the Civil War. But the city took Queen Elizabeth to our hearts. And I would say we were very firmly in the royalist camp during this second Elizabethan age. Her Majesty visited the city many times and met the people of the city. During her reign, she was in Hull on some of the most important days in the life of the city and the region. These include the opening of the iconic Humber Bridge in 1981, celebrating the city's 700th birthday in 1999, and visiting Hull in 2017 when we were the UK City of Culture. Her first visit to the city was actually to Hull Royal Infirmary in 1957, and she came again 50 years later to open the Queen's Cancer Centre at Castle Hill Hospital in 2009. The city will miss her. And although the Sovereign's passing is a historic moment for the United Kingdom and our Commonwealth and for many others around the world, at this time we must remember, above all else, that a family has lost a beloved mother, a grandmother and a great-grandmother. And like many others, this loss to the nation resonates very personally with the loss of one's own parents or grandparents. And in particular, I remember my Auntie Betty, a staunch royalist who loved the Queen and was also born in the same year as the Queen, 1926. So on behalf of the people of Hull, my thoughts and prayers are with the royal family at this saddest of times. I also want to express condolences on behalf of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, which I sit as a member. And although there is great sadness at this time, let us also remember a long life of service, so well lived, devoted to this nation, a life that should be celebrated. The Queen was a member of that greatest generation who herself, as we've heard, served in uniform in World War II, helping to secure our democracy's survival against tyranny. This was also a queen who embraced change throughout her life and saw us into the digital age. And I just wanted to end by saying it was a special honour uh, to be sworn in as a privy councillor uh, over Zoom during the COVID pandemic. So I didn't have any of the worries about the footstool and falling over. <laughs> and so the queen was on a very large screen in front of me. She looked entirely at ease and was taking this new technology completely in her stride, perhaps rather more so than the Lord President of the Council at that time, the Right Honourable Member for North East Somerset. <laughs> so to conclude, like the vast majority of Britons alive today, I have known no other monarch. But sadly, uh, it, we now have the point where uh, change has come. And we, alongside the condolences uh, to the royal family, we look to the new King Charles III. One era is ending, a new one is beginning. Queen Elizabeth II would want us to go forward as a great nation in all our faiths and beliefs, proving that she was never mistaken in hers. God save the King. So Roger Gale. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, in paying tribute to Her Late Majesty, may I, on behalf of my constituents in North Thanet, um, <laughs> simply say that our condolences are with His Majesty King Charles, the Queen Consort, and all the members of the Royal Family. The then Prince Charles, uh, speaking at the Jubilee, 
opened his remarks by saying, Your Majesty, mummy. And I think we all need to remember that this family has lost a mother, a grandmother, and a great-grandmother. And we all feel their pain, and our thoughts really are, and prayers really are with them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I was nine years old when King George VI died. I can remember it fairly vividly. And uh, rather like the Right Honourable Lady, the member for Derby South, the next, I think, most memorable event in my connection with the royal family was the bar of chocolate <laughs> um, that we were all given at the coronation. And I seem to remember we got a coronation mug as well. And for 70 years, so far as I am concerned, this great lady has been my lodestar, my monarch. I was listening on the wireless, I think some people call it a radio, <laughs> <laughs> this, this morning, um, on my way up from Kent, uh, to a caller who said, if we really want to honour Her Majesty's memory, then it would behove us well to emulate the way that she lived and served in her <coughs> life. And I think that's something actually that in this house we might all bear in mind. But uh, those of us who had the privilege of meeting Her Majesty face to face, without exception, I think all remember what has been referred to over and over again this morning is <coughs> the twinkle in those beautiful eyes and the smile that is now lighting up heaven. May she rest in peace. God save the King. Yeah. Yeah. Caroline Lucas. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. It is a privilege to speak on behalf of the Green Party of England and Wales and pay tribute to Queen Elizabeth II. Above all else, she was a mother, a grandmother, and a great-grandmother. And I know I speak for the people of Brighton Pavilion when I offer my sincerest condolences, in particular to her immediate family and to her loved ones. They've lost someone very dear to them on a deeply personal level, and our thoughts are with them all. But we have lost her too. Perhaps the most recognisable public figure in the world today, the Queen has been a uniquely enduring part of the fabric of our lives for nine remarkable decades. In moments of national crisis and in moments of national pride, she was always there. Through turbulence, through uncertainty, she was always there as a fixed point, as a steadying, guiding figure that we all felt we knew. And of course, for most of us, she is indeed the only monarch that we have ever known. I too was drawn to the lines of Philip Larkin, and I find it symbolic that so many in the House have been drawn to the words that he wrote, and which are engraved on a memorial in Queen Square in Bloomsbury, Bloomsbury erected to mark Her Majesty's Silver Jubilee, and I hope the House will indulge me just when I bear repetition to them again. In times when nothing stood but worsened or grew strange, there was one constant good. She did not change. Listening to the radio, watching the news over the past 24 hours or so, I've been struck by just how much that dependability and stability meant to people, by how many people's lives she touched in a very direct way, by the memories from those who met her of her deep humanity. And I know that there are millions of people in Britain who are not necessarily monarchists, but who are nonetheless deeply mourning the Queen, who feel a profound sense of loss, and who also had huge respect and admiration for her. They, we, saw in her an extraordinary work ethic, a deep stoicism, and an extraordinary wisdom gained over so many years. We saw the values of selflessness and sense of duty, and also, of course, the personal side of her character, that humility, kindness, and the famous sense of humour that has been spoken about so much today. From the marmalade sandwiches allegedly secreted away in her iconic black handbag, to joining James Bond on the zip wire, she was a queen unafraid to be playful. And so many speak of the twinkle in her eye and of her genuine interest in the world across which she travelled so extensively. That determination to be seen, to connect with people, saw her become the most travelled monarch in history, making over 285 state visits. She broke many other records too, not only our longest serving monarch, but as the one woman from the British royal family to ever have served in the armed forces, 
and the only modern head of state to have served during World War II, all of which speaks to her driving purpose, that deep sense of duty. Today, young and old, people of all faiths and none, royalists and republicans across our four nations, the Commonwealth and the world, are united in that recognition that she worked so tirelessly and did so until the very last days of her remarkable life. From all walks of life and all corners of the globe, people want to pay their respects. And Her Majesty did inspire genuine respect as well as admiration, love and affection. She is part of the world's collective understanding of Britishness, the epitome of faith and steadfastness. So I want to thank her for her devotion and for her dignity. Her enduring legacy will be as multifaceted as she was herself in life. But I believe that she would want the most abiding aspect of that legacy to be hope and solidarity, as symbolised by the double rainbow that stretched across the skies above Buckingham Palace yesterday, shortly after the announcement of her death. Rest in peace, Your Majesty, and thank you. Mel Stride. Madam you. Deputy Speaker, um, and I rise to pay tribute to a very remarkable and wonderful uh, lady. Uh, not just on my behalf, but on behalf of the constituents of central Devon. Um, Queen Elizabeth II, our longest reigning monarch, a passionate head of the Commonwealth for which she did so much, loved, admired, and of course recognised throughout the world. A life that spanned so much. When she came to the throne, of course, World War II was a very fresh memory that was still rationing. Man had yet to walk upon the moon. She reigned through Suez, the Cuban Missile Crisis. She saw the Beatles, a solitary football World Cup victory. She saw <laughs> Concord fly. She witnessed industrial unrest on an industrial scale within her own family. She suffered, of course, great personal tragedy. She was there alongside us for the dawn of a new millennium. She joined James Bond for the opening, as we have heard, of the London Olympics and Paddington for the Jubilee. <laughs> and she said of the lionesses and their recent triumph, you have all set an example that will be an inspiration for girls and women today and for future generations. That could equally be said for her. Elizabeth, as we have heard, was, has always been here. She's always been a part of our lives, a part of our world, and perhaps in essence, that is why she will be so sorely missed. She was certainly with us in Devon and the West Country, Madam Deputy Speaker. She would have known my constituency well, along with, no doubt, the constituencies of all of us uh, in this House. She was a frequent visitor to the South West, as recently as the G7 summit, where she first, for the first time, met uh, President Biden, one of 13 presidents of the United States with whom she was to make an acquaintance all of them since Harry S. Truman, with the, accept the exception of Lyndon Johnson. When she was 13, she accompanied her family, including her father, King George VI, to the Britannia Royal Naval College mm -hmm. in Dartmouth. And she was to remember this as the first time that she met a then young cadet, her future husband, Prince Philip of Greece and Denmark. Now that is something, Madam Deputy Speaker, of which Devon can be particularly proud. And as Queen, she returned to Dartmouth with Prince Philip, of course, before the coronation. Many of us have shared uh, today our personal reflections of the contact that we have had with Her Majesty. Mine came through being the Comptroller of the Royal Household in our Whip's office, and also briefly as Lord President of the Council. My impression of her in the small number of private meetings that I had with her, was that she was sharp, that she was kindly, that she was humorous, she had that twinkle in her eye, and indeed, before I went in to see her for the first time, the equerry turned to me and to put me at ease, I think, told me a little anecdote about an ambassador that had gone in to see her for the first time, and on approaching her, his phone, to his horror, had sprung into life and started ringing, and he looked panicked. And after he turned it off, she turned to him and said, well, perhaps you should have answered it. It might have been somebody important. <laughs> <laughs> I thought perhaps that Her Majesty could be a little mischievous on occasion. I didn't know her well enough to be sure of that, but I was certain of the fact 
that she could be great fun. That was something that shone through when you met her. And wise, of course, based on her huge experience of life and the world. And just as everybody told me, she was somebody who put you at your ease, somebody it was good to be with. She made you feel special. It was the honour of my life, Madam Deputy Speaker, to have spent just that little time with her. Queen Elizabeth, thank you. You gave us all so much. Rest in peace. God save the King. Miss yeah. yeah. Bryant. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Ring out the old, ring in the new, wrote Tennyson on the death of his much-loved friend. And we proclaim, the Queen is dead, long live the King. But it feels too sudden, too soon, too sharp a turn in our lives because the death of the Queen is painful. It hurts. We don't have to ask, oh death, where is thy sting? Because we know the nation feels that sting of death. It is as if a, a member of our own family has departed. And weirdly, we feel as if we ought to tell the members of our part family who've already long departed the news. Even Google, with its brightly coloured logo, is grey today, which is sort of ironic for Her Majesty, who wore every colour under the sun at some point in her life. The poet, priest and Member of Parliament John Donne said uh, when preaching to Whitehall in 1627 that the best protection against a fearful death was a life devoted to a calling. Well, that's exactly what it was, wasn't it? A life devoted to a calling. How often must she have thought, not another opening, <laughs> not another royal variety performance, not another unfunny comedian, not another prime minister. <laughs> um, yet she did her duty. In, in the words, perhaps, of the Boy Scouts and the Guides um, promise, to do my best, to do my duty to God and to the Queen. She did her duty to herself. Um, I pledged my allegiance to her ten times as a clergyman and as a member of parliament, and of course we all have, and to her heirs and successors. And in one sense, that's not personal at all. Our allegiance was to her as head of state, the embodiment of our shared life as United Kingdom. But I suspect we all also felt we owed allegiance to her personally, because she had earned her moral authority. She donned a uniform to do her bit to fight fascism. She could not lead us into battle or give us laws or administer justice, but she gave us her heart and her devotion to these old islands and to all the peoples of our brotherhood of nations, as she herself faithfully promised in 1957. There have been, there are other queens. Uh, I've met a few. <laughs> um, <laughs> But then again, too few to mention. <laughs> but we, and I note also the President of France, only call one the Queen. Um, her face was on the coins my constituents started producing at the Royal Mint in Llantrescent uh, in 1953. But to mix my poets, she knew our little systems have their day. We are dressed in a little brief authority. I know some people deify the monarchy, but I think that's to miss the point. The point is the humanity of the monarchy. Richard II, under whose great hammer beam ceiling Her Majesty will lie in state in a few days' time, is given a great speech by Shakespeare, which ends, you have mistook me all this while. I live with bread like you, feel want, taste grief, need friends. Uh, not just bread, of course, marmalade sandwiches as well. <laughs> Most movingly of all, I think, she was as human as any other widow in losing her husband, her consort, her life companion. None will forget her sitting alone at Philip's funeral. It is a sign of their enduring love that her and Philip's deaths came closer in time than any other reigning monarch and their consort in our history. And I thank God that it was in her reign that men were able to declare their love to one another and women were able to do the same. 
I end with words that have never felt more appropriate, I think, than for our longest reigning monarch, who lived through Holocaust and war and led us through years of unimaginable turbulence. The weight of this sad time we must obey. Speak what we feel, not what we ought to say. The oldest hath mourned most. We that are young shall never see so much, nor live so long. God save the King. I do want to remind honourable and right honourable members that the um, speaker did ask that remarks be confined to three minutes. David Mandel. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II had a lifelong and deep felt love for Scotland, which we've already uh, heard about. And that was reciprocated by the people of Scotland, who held her and indeed still hold her in deep affection. And I had the opportunity myself to see that close up, both as a member of the Scottish Parliament uh, when it uh, reconvened in 1999 and subsequently as Secretary of State uh, for Scotland. And I do recall at the opening of the Scottish Parliament uh, the Queen declaring, I have trust in the good judgment of the Scottish people. I have faith in your commitment to their service, and I am confident in the future of Scotland. And it was a belief and a commitment in Scotland that she reaffirmed on each subsequent opening of the Scottish Parliament, although she told me that she always found it very amusing that as soon as the Scottish Parliament was formally opened, it went on recess or as holiday as she uh, referred uh, to it. As we've heard, she was also somebody who was extremely well informed about everything that was going on in politics. And in my first a substantive conversation with her as Secretary of State. There had been a major incident in Parliament when rather more members of the Scottish National Party had been elected in 2015 than might have been anticipated, and there was a little bit of conflict about who should sit on the bench uh, opposite. And the then member for Bolsover and some other Labour members were not so keen on uh, SNP members occupying uh, those positions. So the Queen uh, was very familiar with this situation and sought to uh, interrogate me on uh, the rights and, and wrongs uh, of uh, the issue. And I found myself blurting out, Oh, Your Majesty, that's buttock gate. <laughs> and I thought. <laughs> In my first meeting with the Queen, I have said the word buttock. <laughs> what is to happen? But rather than me be taken off uh, uh, to the tower or to uh, uh, some other uh, place, the Queen just laughed. She found it all very amusing, but also you know, she was interested in what was happening in Parliament and, and the day to day. Uh, events. She had many uh, connections with my own uh, constituency, from opening the Dumfries uh, Royal Infirmary to visiting the town of Lockerbie after the devastating effects of uh, the air disaster. But I think most tellingly, I, I found a clipping from a uh, 19, uh, uh, 1956 uh, edition of the Glasgow Herald newspaper, and it stated. Previous royal visits to Scotland, having neglected to include bigger in South Lanarkshire, the Queen decided to make amends in October 1956. As the paper observed, a thoughtful gesture by Her Majesty added 90 minutes in time and 35 miles in distance to her programme, but she felt that bigger was the only county town omitted from recent royal tours. And that was the Queen. She wanted to include every community across the United Kingdom. And of course, the people of Bigger turned out in their masses to thank her uh, for uh, that uh, very uh, generous gesture. Madam Deputy Speaker, Scotland as a, and the whole of the United Kingdom has lost not just the Queen, but we've lost a dear and true friend whose like we shall not see again. God bless her and God save the King. Ian yeah. Murray. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, and it's a great pleasure to follow the Honourable Gentleman's buttocks. Um, I'm very. <laughs> First time he's heard that as well, I think. I'm very grateful for the opportunity, Madam Deputy Speaker, to pass on my condolences to the Royal Family, but also 
to pay a tribute to Her Late Majesty the Queen on behalf of my own family, constituents in Edinburgh South and from people all over her beloved Scotland. Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth was a mother, a grandmother and a great-grandmother to her own family, but she was also the mother, grandmother and great-grandmother to the nation. We will all remember where we were when we learnt of her death yesterday. We will always remember that it was in Scotland where she spent her last weeks and days. And as we've heard already, she loved being in Scotland and particularly the Balmoral Estate, the tranquility, the great outdoors and the complete absence of any speed limits. The Queen <laughs> loved Scotland and Scotland loved the Queen. The ties between Scotland and our longest reigning monarch are plentiful. From her very first public speech as a young princess in Aberdeen at the opening of the British Sailor Society and the yarn of her wedding dress being woven in Scotland to her Royal Yacht Britannia being built on the Clyde and retired to the Forth, the opening of the first Forth Bridge and the second one 53 years later. And she always looked forward to the Royal Week in Edinburgh each year. Scotland was, as she described it, her special place. She said at the opening of the Scottish Parliament in 1999 that, and I quote, if I may make a personal point, Scotland occupies such a special place in my own and my family's affections. I remember my own childhood, the traditions which revolved around Her Late Majesty. Every Christmas she was part of her family, as much as the rituals of the tree and the turkey was every generation of her family crowded round the television for her three o'clock Christmas address. She transcended every generation, all the way to my two-year-old daughter, who now knows who that was drinking tea with Paddington. I've yet to explain to Zola that Paddington's friend has passed away. Over the last 24 hours, I've tried and struggled to find the language to describe her. But the one word that a constituent said to me late last night was iconic. And she's the very definition of iconic. She was in every pound I ever spent, admittedly less than fewer than many others, because I'm a Scot in every letter that I've ever sent. <laughs> her name is on dozens of plaques and buildings all over my constituency and tens of thousands all over the country. She embodied what it means to be British. She epitomised public duty, decency and dignity. She picked us up when we were down. And when our grandchildren and their grandchildren look back at this time, it will be Elizabeth II, above all else, they will remember as the thread through every part of our post-war history. She was truly our greatest monarch. I'd love to tell a humorous anecdote, and I hope someone else will tell it, about the visit to Balmoral that she had with Dick Griffin, one of our former protection officers. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, there's no time to do that, but someone else may tell that uh, shortly. I never met uh, Her Majesty, but we all think we did, because she was such an integral part and influence on our lives. And everyone thinks they did meet her, because anyone that did never stops telling you. That's the impact that she had on each of their lives. Finally, Madam Deputy Speaker, I can only imagine the pain and grief the Royal Family are having today, and that pain and grief compounded by the duty that King Charles, Charles III now has to lead this nation. I, the people of Edinburgh South and the people of Scotland, simply say thank you for everything, ma'am. Rest in peace, and God save the King. Please, yeah, yeah, yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, I feel I can't match the eloquence of, of the many wonderful speeches we've heard today, but I do want to share for a few moments my personal sadness at this terrible loss. And I'm sure that sense of sadness is shared also by my constituents in Chipping Barnet. Her late Majesty was a woman of remarkable charm, warmth and kindness, typified by that lovely smile that adorned so many hundreds of millions of images published of her during her 70-year reign. She could um, come out with rather unnervingly direct comments sometimes on the news, uh, on matters on the news, often with a twinkle in her eye, deploying that mischievous sense of humour about which so many this morning have spoken. I have to say, when I met her, I was so starstruck in her presence that I scarcely felt able to string a sentence together. If she noticed, she was far too kind and polite to mention this. Her enthusiasm for Northern Ireland is something which featured in many of our conversations during my time as Secretary of State. At an audience she kindly granted me at Hillsborough Castle, she remarked gleefully that she always felt a sense of such excitement flying into Belfast and catching sight of the Harland and Wolf cranes. She said, you know there is only one place in the world you can be when you see those landmark cranes. As Northern Ireland Secretary, I and my team had provided some suggestions on the itinerary for the 2014 Royal Visit, 
and I felt they might be a little more daring than uh, what had been um, the, the previous plans for the visit. So it was with some nervousness that I arrived at the first stage of the programme at St George's Market, which saw Her Majesty mingle amongst the crowds in a way which would have been inconceivable in Belfast just a few years previously. Mm. Later, a walk by Her Majesty around the set of Game of Thrones in the Paint Hall Studios <laughs> was a social media phenomenon. But politely and probably wisely, she declined the invitation to sit on the Iron Throne. <laughs> <laughs> but history, I'm confident, will record her role in promoting peace and reconciliation on the island of Ireland as one of the greatest achievements of Queen Elizabeth II. As we've heard and as we all know, she herself suffered personal tragedy at the hands of the provisional IRA. And yet she was willing to shake hands with the late Martin McGuinness and even welcome him to her home in Windsor. And her visit to the Republic of Ireland in 2011 was a truly landmark moment. Britain and Ireland share hundreds of years of contested and often violent history and for centuries to come, I'm sure people will recall that 2011 state visit as a turning point which played a significant role in moving us on from a conflicted past towards a better future. In conclusion, Her Majesty was the last head of state anywhere in the world to have donned a uniform in World War II. As our new Prime Minister said, Queen Elizabeth was the rock upon which we built the modern nation we are today. She has been an unchanging constant in all our lives, there for us in good times and bad. As we move on from the Elizabeth to a new Carolingian age, this loss truly marks the end of an era. Without her presence, life in this country will never be the same again. God save the King. Well done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Catherine McKinnell. My thoughts, prayers and condolences and those of communities across Newcastle North are with His Majesty the King, the Royal Family and the country as we mourn, remember and celebrate the incredible life of Her Majesty. As I learned the news of her passing yesterday, as I'm sure is the case for many, I shed a tear. I was asked by one of my children what the Queen meant to me. And it was only when I thought about how I would answer that question to them that I realised the profound impact that her ever presence had had. A strong, steadfast matriarch, unwaving in her calm, measured, dignified approach, no matter the challenges thrown at her or at our nation, and there have been many. So often she captured the mood of her country, shared our joys, provided comfort. Her intervention during the pandemic, a time of such anxiety and unease, was pitch perfect and soothed the nation. The tributes have been global, as was her reach, yet at the same time so deeply personal. A unique, unrivalled and personal connection to millions of people across the globe. As I'm sure with many members across this House, on every school visit I make, I'm asked, whether I know the Queen. Oh, and whilst Newcastle can seem a very long way from Buckingham Palace, Her Majesty is felt very closely. We've been privileged in Newcastle to have had many visits from Her Majesty over the years. Images of her visits show sheer joy that she brought every time she came, whether it was opening Newcastle's Eldon Square, visiting the Millennium Bridge, or her visit to the City Library. Indeed, I was only just in Eldon Square buying new school shoes for my children, and we stopped and remarked upon the plaque that is very prominent there of her visit when she opened it in 1977. Her legacy will live on for many years to come. Her Majesty had a particular connection with our metro service, first opening the Tyne and Wear Metro in 1981, which included naming the Queen Elizabeth II Metro Bridge over the Tyne and travelling on the 4020 Metro car. For the Golden Jubilee and for this year's Platinum Jubilee, the original Metro car from 1981 received a makeover. And in the Golden Jubilee, she got to travel in a Golden Metro car. <laughs> but it's her love and knowledge 
of horses that is, of course, legendary. So we were really honoured to have Her Majesty visit Newcastle Gosforth Park Racecourse in my constituency for the famous Northumberland Plate Race Day. The photos from that day show her beaming from ear to ear, only in the way that racing can bring about. There is such a rich life of duty, of service, of deep faith to reflect on. There is so much to learn from her life and her example, and there is so much to do to ensure her legacy ensures. May perpetual light shine upon her. May she rest in peace. God save the King. Mr Edward Lee. I'm sure I speak with our, for other colleagues when I say that when a debate has been going on for three hours, one feels more and more inadequate about what one's going to say and how one can do true justice to this magnificent tapestry. The Speaker, when he opened the debate, said there's only a score of members who were alive in the previous reign. I must confess I was one of them, but my memories of the previous reign are very dim indeed. I was so young when the present Queen came to the throne. And she has been, as so many people have said, an extraordinary guiding star to us. I think some of the best parts of the debates have, of course, been wonderful literary illusions, um, but also personal memories. And uh, I, I remember when I, w when I was talking to her once during my time on the Public Accounts Committee, I was very nervous because we were trying to abolish the Royal Train, uh, a train which was so expensive and so slow that it could only travel during the night. But when I raised it with her, she immediately diffused the whole issue. Uh, she was charm itself, and despite our efforts, I think the Royal Train carried on running for many years after that. <laughs> still does. And still does. <laughs> and I remember at a, a Privy Council meeting, I was quite nervous, uh, although quite proud, uh, to, to mention to her that my father, many well, decades before had been clerk of the Privy Council, I was particularly nervous because when I mentioned that as a young man, very proudly, the Duke of Edinburgh, he said that the whole Privy Council was a bloody waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, it's quite formulaic. I think when Nick Clegg was leader of the Council, uh, he, he actually turned over two pages of orders and nobody noticed apart from the Queen, who immediately stopped the proceedings. But when I mentioned my father, how kind she was, the present clerk, of course, had no memory of one of his predecessors four decades before, but she immediately remembered my father and thanked me for his service. So what a wonderful, kind and superbly astute person she is. Before I sit down, may I just mention one thing? And I was very struck by the wonderful speech from the Honourable Member for Ladywood, who talked on behalf of Muslims. Yeah. Now, I'm not an Anglican, and indeed, uh, under the first Elizabeth, us Catholics had a bit of a torrid time. <laughs> indeed, one of my ancestors was hung, drawn and quartered merely for being a Catholic priest. And we didn't do so bad well under the second Charles either. But I think she has played, if I may put it this way, an absolute blinder in the way that she has carried out her role as Supreme Governor of the Church of England. We all know that so many uh, top politicians just don't do God. They're embarrassed to talk about religion. They feel they're putting themselves on the pedestal. They'll be dragged down. But I think what she realised and what she epitomises is when so many people talk about service, it comes from her deep faith. Yeah, yeah. That unlike all the rest of us who have spent so many years trying to get into this place and serve the public, she never asked for this job, but she has been sustained for all her life by her deep and abiding faith. Yeah, yeah. And she, when people are sad or mourning or in difficulties, when she gives that Christmas broadcast, she appeals and comforts to, pe to people of all faiths and none. I think we should really thank her for that because it's so difficult. And in one of those Christmas broadcasts 50 years ago, she said, wise men, since the beginning of time, have studied the skies. Whatever our faith, we can all follow a star. Indeed, one must follow one if the immensity of the future opening before us is not to dazzle our eyes. Dear colleagues, she has been our guiding star for all that time. Remember her first broadcast was, yes, 80 years ago to children displaced by war. She has been our guiding star. Eternal rest grant unto her. 
May perpetual light shine upon us. Mr. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I'm grateful to have the opportunity to stand here and give a tribute to the late Queen on behalf of my constituents in East Renfrewshire. I know that East Renfrewshire Council has opened a book of condolence this morning, and I know that very many local residents will want to use that opportunity to pay their respects and share their memories of meeting the late Queen and what she has meant to them. And I know that for so many people in my community and people far beyond, she was simply a constant. She was, after all, Queen for longer than most of us here have been alive, and she's the only monarch that we have ever known. Her reign has stretched across society that has changed so much in the many intervening years. But the thing which has not changed and never changed was her focus, which <coughs> remained unchanging on her duty throughout all of that time. And that sense of service and duty and her resolve to persist was a hallmark throughout her reign. And I don't think anyone will fail to have been moved by the knowledge that she continued, even this week, dealing with the installation of a, a new Prime Minister. In fact, during her reign, the late Queen saw 15 Prime Ministers, five First Ministers, 13 US Presidents. And I think that that puts this into perspective. In every way, this is the end of an era. And her sense of public duty, which spanned all of that era, was very close to everyone who came into contact with the late Queen. I'll always remember the great regard that my gran had for her. She always followed the Queen's movements with great interest. They shared a birthday, and this was seen to her to be very significant. And she was very pleased to get herself into the situation where she attended a number of royal visits. Now, I grew up in Angus, which um, means that my home was not very far from Glam's, and I think that her interest actually stemmed very much from knowing that there was that local connection, and the Queen was known to have spent many happy times in the local area. And of course, the late Queen was involved in so many different local areas, so many places, so many organisations, so many charities, and that means that she will be missed in all of these spheres too. And I think that people will feel that loss very personally because they have had that personal connection to her and feel that this loss is also their loss. And I know that many will take comfort from the words that they've heard today. But I think that for all of her public presence and for all of her influence, it's obvious that most of all, she will be missed by her family. And I hope that in time, they are able also to take some comfort, perhaps by looking back on a life of duty that was well lived and reflecting on the memories that people across the world will have shared. I'm sure we all know from our own lives that very deep sense of grief and loss that the King and the Royal Family will be experiencing just now. It's very difficult to lose a loved family member and my thoughts and the thoughts of people in East Renfrewshire are with them today. Thank you, thank you uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. I returned to Westminster after the dreaded news from our home at Upton Crescent in Shropshire, having told, this, having told this morning our Hanover Bell, struck in 1701 in respect of the Act of Succession, I struck it 96 times in respectful memory of Her Majesty. Farewell, our longest and most loved and devoted sovereign in the history of our country and the Crown in Parliament. <coughs> she loved her people and they loved her, as did my constituents in stone for whom I speak. They showed this in those heady days of her 70th Jubilee, which they joyfully celebrated with her, never to forget the profound loss of her dearly loved husband, Prince Philip, only a few months before. As she requested, God helped her keep her vow of service, which she made on her accession to the throne in February 1952. Born as I was on the 10th of May 1940, the very day that Churchill became Prime Minister, I so vividly recall the age of 11 
At that moment, as the headmaster declaimed to us, the king is dead. God save the queen. I watched her coronation with wonder on a small television screen in black and white on the 2nd of June 1953, just as Hillary climbed Everest and we won the ashes and it was a triple whammy because of the coronation itself. She was graceful in her majesty and in equal parts she was selfless. She had Christian faith and integrity. She was constant. She was wise. She had an extraordinary spontaneous beauty. She had the kindest and most expressive eyes and her gentle and humorous smile. I was honored and privileged to meet her and speak with her several times. What she said to this lowly backbencher was more poignant than I deserved. We read you in Hansard, she said once. <laughs> your Majesty, your Majesty, I, your Majesty, I replied, I'm very surprised, very few do. <laughs> I said, particularly on the issue of Europe. <laughs> she thought that was very amusing. <laughs> I was proud to be knighted by the Queen herself at Windsor, one of the greatest honours of my life. She was the mother of our nation and of the Commonwealth. She was the supreme diplomat for our country and, as many have said, also in Ireland. She lived in the hearts of her subjects who will always remember her and for them she will never die. All our prayers are with the whole royal family, mother, grandmother, great-grandmother. May she rest in peace and God save the King. Yeah. Malhotra. Madam Deputy Speaker, at this very sad time we remember the life of Queen Elizabeth II with gratitude for her love and service to our nation. Her Majesty lived her life guided by a deep sense of duty, a duty to her people, her country, her family, an overwhelming sense of public service. She carried out her duties without stint, without complaint, and through the toughest of times and the darkest of hours. As a politician, I have also appreciated her stability and constancy that she has brought through recent difficult and tumultuous years, how she has been so attentive to adapting through periods of social change through her time and her respect for our democracy. That's why we mourn our Queen, because her sense of duty, her humour and her warmth has touched the hearts of the nation and indeed so many across the world in her beloved Commonwealth and beyond. She has lived a truly remarkable life. She was purposeful in all that she did. Young and old loved her. And I know I am already not the only MP to know that probably the first and most important question we will always be asked in a visit to a primary school yeah. is, have you met the Queen? <laughs> Madam Deputy Speaker, today I laid flowers at Buckingham Palace on behalf of my constituents with our thoughts and prayers for King Charles III and all his family. My constituents are sharing in the national grief, and I have been receiving moving and thoughtful messages from them. One said, news of the passing of Her Majesty deeply saddened me. Her reign spanning over 70 years was a celebration of leadership, of courage and dedication. She led the nation with exemplary steadfastness, even while battling with her own personal grief. Another said, rest in peace to an amazing icon. She was the face of Britain, and was loved by all. Locally, we recall the special memory of a visit by Her Majesty to open the new wing of the Gudwara Siri Guru Singh Sabha on Alice Way in Hounslow in October 2004. This Gudwara has a wonderful library, classes, and community wellbeing and support services, all of which she saw. Her visit was just one example of her deep and genuine interest in communities across our nation and in all faiths that saw people from all backgrounds feel at ease, respected and connected to her. Her visit left a mark and a deep sense of the local community and its story being recognised and valued. Her Majesty's passing also caused me to reflect how just in June we came together to celebrate her Platinum Jubilee. I attended over 10 street parties and events over those few days. She, even at 96, had the power to bring people together she was the inspiration for parties in Feltham, in Heston, in Bedfont, in Hanworth, and more widely, organised by residents, local businesses, and our Royal British Legions. 
People shared their lives after two years of COVID, and the events reunited friends and neighbours, still building their confidence to connect after so much isolation. Madam Deputy Speaker, the loss of a mother is truly the most painful of moments, and as King Charles III takes on the role of monarch, we know he will be leading in supporting the grief of his whole family just over a year after the sad passing of Prince Philip. They do not grieve alone, and we stand with them at this time. Her Majesty was admired, loved and respected and revered. She was the best of us and brought out the best in us. Today we thank her, we mourn her, we celebrate her. God save the King. Yeah. Sir John Hayes. Yeah. Most people who uh, possess power first seek it. Indeed, we know in this place many people crave it. <laughs> Her Majesty, <laughs> the Queen, neither sought power. Uh, indeed, you might say it was thrust upon her, truly. But when she wielded authority, she did more fundamental good. She brought more benefit than almost anyone here, and of course for much, much longer. Most people with influence expect plaudits. But for Her Majesty the Queen, acclamation, when it became obvious, when it was clear to her just how much she was loved, was greeted on her part with humility and with grace. Most of those who lead expect to bring change, but for Her Majesty, constancy was the most fundamental thing she could bring to the nation, a permanent part of who we are as a people, each of us and all of us. It's not that she was behind the times, she was beyond the times. And I remember meeting her a number of times, but particularly 20 years ago, when she said to me in Buckingham Palace, do you use computers in your office? I said, well, well yes, we, we do, Your Majesty. She said, yes, she said, but I have such trouble printing things out. She said, sometimes pages get missed altogether. I've been caught out making speeches like that twice. She went on to say that when her husband, Prince Philip, printed things out, or when he couldn't, in her words, the air turns blue. <laughs> her sense of humour was a, was a part of a charm which was so obvious, so palpable, that she was able to charm even those who weren't intuitively, instinctively, in favour of the monarchy. I met her, but I didn't know her. Few people knew her well, but we knew she was there. She was in our consciousness. Not many people think of the sun and the moon. I suppose astronomers and astrologers do. I'm thinking they're a sort of fusion of Herschel and Russell Grant. But we know they're there. We expect the sun to come up in the morning. We expect to bathe in the light of the moon. And so it was with Her Majesty. Well, now our days are a little dimmer. And our nights are a little colder for her passing. For Her Majesty the Queen was in all of our lives for so, so long. She wore the crown, but of course she wasn't the crown. The crown has a permanent life. It goes on. The institution she graced is secure in the hands of her heir, her son, our king. This woman, this woman who lasted so long in her life, who personified dignity, who was grateful, gracious, and by the way, who brought a beauty to her job. For there was, as my right honourable friend for Stone said, a beauty about her grace, a quiet and enduring and palpable beauty. Now that uh, the crown passes to her dear son, our wonderful king, we must hope that he, in his grief, will know that he shares that grief with everyone in this house and with all her people, for whom she will remain not merely as a memory, but as a presence in the crown itself. May God as he welcomes Her Majesty to heaven, keep and bless her successor, our King Charles. God save the King.
Dan Jarvis. Thank you, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It is a solemn honour to pay tribute to Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, and I want to begin by offering my condolences on behalf of my Barnsley constituents and myself to His Majesty the King and all of the royal family in their time of grief. It's hard to believe that Her Late Majesty the Queen is no longer with us. For nearly all of us in this place and beyond, her presence is all we've ever known. There is a sense of loss in the country so profound that it will take time to mourn and to come to terms with. She was not only our Queen, she was someone embedded in our hearts. This special place was earned by her devotion to each and every one of us. She embodied dignity, dedication, duty, and a service that was unwavering throughout. Her long life and remarkable reign saw our country through the best of times. But our late Queen was also a source of strength in the worst of times, not least in recent years during the pandemic. Her address to the nation in April 2020 was the tonic to a fear and hopelessness that seemed almost insurmountable. She said, we will meet again, and we did. We will miss her deeply. Madam Deputy Speaker, all of those who've had the privilege to serve in our armed forces know there will be a distinct sadness amongst the armed forces community. This is because, as our head, the late Queen cared about us deeply. Indeed, of course, during the Second World War, as a princess, she chose to serve in the Auxiliary Territorial Service. That closeness to and affection for the armed forces was reciprocated by all who have served. It wasn't just because we knew she was formidable. We also knew that she had a great sense of humour. Many of us, uh, the Honourable Member for Edinburgh South nodded to it, have enjoyed the story that was told during the Platinum Jubilee celebrations by a former Royal Protection Officer, Richard Griffin. Whilst accompanying Her Late Magister, Majesty on a walk near Balmoral, a group approached, asking, have you ever met the Queen? Her response was no, before pointing to the Protection Officer and saying, but he has. <laughs> People did not have to be close, close to the late Queen to appreciate her sense of humour, and the world remembers and will always remember the opening ceremony of the 2012 Olympics, when she famously was seen to parachute out of a helicopter with Commander James Bond. And who could forget, of course, her double act with Paddington? <laughs> I am certain, Madam Deputy Speaker, that history will judge Her Late Majesty as an extraordinary monarch adored by her people, but it will also note that while the world changed at a rapid rate, the Queen struck the balance perfectly between stability and tradition versus change and modernisation. A new era now begins, and at this testing moment we must now support the King who is grieving for his mother while leading our nation through a time of mourning. He has already lived a life of service to others in so many ways, serving in the Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force, establishing the Prince's Trust and being the patron of many, many charities. Just one example is his role as the Colonel-in-Chief of my old regiment, the Parachute Regiment. Recounting the time he took the parachute training course at RAF Bryce Norton, he said, I felt I should lead from the front or at least be able to do some of the things that one expects others to do for our country. It is clear that the King will follow the example that has been set before him to serve to lead. The torch has been handed to a new monarch and that sense of duty will continue to burn brightly. Rest in peace, Queen Elizabeth. God save King Charles. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I must urge colleagues again to try to um, stick to the guidance of the speaker, which a reminder was 
three minutes, just so that we can think of each other and make sure that we get everybody in. Dame Maria Miller. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And it's with great sadness that I rise to pay tribute to Her Late Majesty the Queen on behalf of my constituents in Basingstoke. The late Queen was held in the highest esteem in my constituency and throughout the borough of Basingstoke and Dean. And our Mayor, Councillor Paul Miller, said only today that the commitment that Her Majesty made to her role and public service, uh, the service that she has given, is matchless. My constituency has a proud loyalist history. In the siege of Basing House, our, our ancestors, as committed royalists, supported an earlier King Charles. Um, and we proudly, but with sadness, welcome our new King Charles III as our sovereign. As we all come together to grieve the loss of her, her late Majesty the Queen, we remember the remarkable woman that she was, an inspiration for a nation, um, and a person who made us proud to be part of a united kingdom. Uh, her loss will be felt not only at home, but abroad, and particularly um, by the uh, people who are, make up our Commonwealth. And just two weeks ago, uh, the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association met in Halifax, Nova Scotia, for its annual meeting, and we toasted Her Late Majesty as our patron, and we will remember her fondly. Madam Deputy Speaker, it uh, helps at times like this to share some of our personal memories um, by way of grieving. And I will always remember the first time I had the privilege of meeting Her Late Majesty. It was at Balmoral uh, in September 2012, being appointed as a Privy Councillor. Um, as many have already referred to, there are a number of briefings when you have these sorts of encounters. Um, and perhaps knowing my shared love of dogs with Her Late Majesty, I was warned not to encounter the corgis too closely. Um, because they can, Madam Deputy Speaker, be quite selective in who they like mm. and demonstrate their feelings towards strangers quite uh, overtly. Um, I kept my distance, but my right honourable friend, the member for Chipping Barnet, did not. Um, she uh, was far more daring with me uh, than me, but left with all her fingers intact. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I also remember uh, the great honour that I had in hosting Her Majesty on Remembrance Sunday uh, on two occasions as Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport. Walking with uh, Her Late Majesty through the Foreign Office can be a nerve-wracking uh, task in its own right. If you know the layout of the Foreign Office, it's quite complicated. Right. We reach the top of the final set of stairs to encounter the most enormous countdown clock, uh, showing that we had a matter of seconds to get out to the Cenotaph. Uh, Her Majesty, of course, uh, trying to lighten the mood, simply said, I hope you've adjusted the timings. I'm getting a bit older and it takes me more time on the stairs. Um, her usual sense of humour at play um, and trying to put everybody at their rest, uh, at their ease. I was humbled to receive a damehood from Her Late Majesty's final birthday honours list to mark her platinum jubilee, um, and I will treasure that. Yeah, yeah. Each of us here today yeah, yeah. took an oath of allegiance to Her Late Majesty, um, to her heirs and successors. So may Her Late Majesty rest in peace. And God save the quick king. Yeah. Yeah. Julie Elliott. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And it is a huge honour to be able to take part in this tribute session this afternoon and on behalf of my constituents in Sunderland Central. And ha as has been said before, it, we must remember that Her Majesty's family are grieving the loss of their mother, grandmother, and great mother, grandmother. And the loss of someone in that position in a family to those who've been through it is huge, immense, and changes people's lives forever. And my sincere condolences go to the family. The, the role of public service we all chose to do, the Queen did not. The Queen was born to serve, and how she has served for her 96 years. To have seen that photograph the other day, receiving the new Prime Minister, um, she looked very frail, um, clearly not in the best of health. But did any of us really think that a day or two later she wouldn't be with us? So serving to the very end has been her life, and I think we are all grateful for that. And her wisdom and the way she has done that has been immense. I just want to mention a couple of um, 
of, of things in my life uh, and memories of the Queen. The first time I saw the Queen was in the Silver Jubilee, when um, the Queen was travelling from Gypsies Green Stadium in South Shields to Sunderland. And the village I am from is right in the middle of those two places. And we all went to the coast road, and we only saw her for probably seconds, but it felt like a lifetime. We would stood there an hour. But it was so exciting and so uplifting. And over the years, every time Her Majesty has come to Sunderland, you get hundreds and thousands of people just standing, just to see her car pass. I never dreamt in those days that I would get to meet Her Majesty, but I have had the privilege of meeting her twice in her Diamond Jubilee uh, year. And the, when she came to Sunderland that year, she came off a yacht, and as she came off the yacht in the port, because it was the most secure place for her to have slept, a Vulcan bomber went past, and she came off and she engaged, and as everyone has said, that smile, that engagement she had with everybody, as if you were the most important person in the world. And I'll never forget that. And finally, I just want to mention the, uh, the occasion I visited London with my twin daughters to, uh, to visit a concert. And the traffic stopped when we were at Trafalgar Square, and we thought, oh, who's coming past? And it was the Queen. So in our family, the nursery rhyme of when you go to London to see the Queen, my daughters say, when we went to London, we saw the Queen. Um, but she's visited Sunderland many, many times. The first time as Princess Elizabeth, and uh, she, she launched a ship because I think it was just after the Second World War and we were the most productive number of ships built in Sunderland of anywhere in the world. But I don't want to repeat everything that's been said, but her comforting calm presence when she addresses the nation is I think the thing I will miss most. The calming feeling that you got when she addressed the nation, as has been said lastly in the pandemic, of thinking, well we're all going to be all right. I think that is the thing I will miss most, that calming, nurturing feeling that we all had as if we were one of her own. So I think losing her at the age she was we have to celebrate a life well lived and thank her for her life of service. We remember her and we hope that she rests in peace eternally. Alan Kerr. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. And on behalf of the constituents of the Vale of De Morgan, I rise to pay tribute and to give thanks for the life of Her Majesty uh, Queen Elizabeth II. Amongst all the recollections of Right Honourable and Honourable Members, I will remember her for her service, duty, humility and faith. We have witnessed many years of her service as our longest reigning monarch through unrecognisable change. The length of her reign means that only 12% of the population has lived longer than the time that she has been on the throne. Her duty to communities in all nations of the United Kingdom to the Union of the United Kingdom and to the Commonwealth was recognised across the globe. In spite of the ad admiration in which she was held and her standing here and around the world, her humility was obvious in the way she acted, the way she spoke and the way she related to us all. This demonstrated her understanding of, uh, of the challenges we all face. And at a time of increasing secularisation of society, she is someone who turned to her faith for inspiration in challenging times and to give thanks during the better times. Faith was something that she celebrated rather than hid away, something that was reflected on by the Honourable, Lady for Bur uh, Honourable Member for Birmingham Ladywood and my right honourable friend for Gainsborough. Now, I had the privilege of meeting Her Majesty on many occasions. At one time, the issue of pronunciation of Welsh place names came up in conversation. <laughs> to my amazement, she said that the one she recalls best was Coed of Heda Glyn, uh, a property within my constituency that even locals wrongly pronounce as Cadriglin. It turned out that she spent many summers during her childhood playing on the estate of the late Sir Kenneth Traherne, Coed of Heda Glyn and she'd said that she was determined during her childhood to learn to pronounce the place properly. At these sad times, we now owe the service and commitment that she showed to us, to her son and to King Charles III. Madam Deputy Speaker, 
God save the King. Yeah. Yeah. Tim Farron. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, Cumbria mourns the loss of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, and I personally and all of us in our county want to express our genuine and deep condolences to the royal family. We have lost our Queen, and it touches every one of us. We can tell in the uh, the contributions so far today that this is a personal loss for us, but how much more is it a personal loss for those who have lost a mother, a grandmother, a great-grandmother? We grieve with them and we thank her uh, for her service. The news reached us yesterday as we were winding down the Westmoreland County show. The news was devastating and yet it caught us while we were together. And it feels like an honour that that was the case. There had been a, a tremendous couple of days of thousands of us being in the same place, in those same muddy fields, enjoying time together. And then that moment of dismal unity came about. But I am glad it happened when we were all together. The landmarks of her reign have been the landmarks of each of our lives, many who are even older than me. Uh, will, of course, remember her acceding to the throne. But I remember the Silver Jubilee dancing around a maypole uh, at the age of seven in 1977. Uh, as a, a father of a, a new young child with the Golden Jubilee, we think of the Diamond Jubilee and the joy earlier this year of the Platinum Jubilee. Her life was our life and her history has become our history. They are inseparable, indivisible, and we will ever be touched by it. Um, her reign united us, her passing must also too, and I believe it has and it will already as we transfer our allegiance to her beloved son, King Charles III. Cumbria, the lakes and the dales were loved by Her Majesty the Queen and we loved her in return. Her visits to Cumbria were always massively special to us, uh, and m relatively recently her visits to Kendal and Windermere, where she was uh, presented with Westmoreland wildflowers to honour her, uh, with Lakeland wool to warm her, and Kendal mint cake to sustain her. Um, my times of uh, spending time with the Queen was rel relatively few, but one in particular I recall where I'd been an MP for a very short period of time at this stage, and she offered me some advice about uh, what you do when a constituent uh, who has had a letter from you thanks you for it and you don't remember the details. And she said, that happens to me all the time. <laughs> and I always say, it's the least I could do. Which is a wonderful get out phrase and I confess to a few of my constituents, I have occasionally uh, deployed it. And as has been said, Her Majesty did not seek her office. She practiced it with utter humility. The most famous human being on planet Earth and yet she acted with a grace and humility that none of us here, no offence, please, has ever managed to match. So she was a constant to us all, and has been said already, but the constant in her life was her faith in Jesus Christ. Now, let's remember this, that for many people, you know, it may have been, but for her, it was not a perfunctory ceremonial faith. It was a living, active faith in a living saviour. Let us remember this, that we have sung for 70 years, God save the Queen. If her faith is accurate, I am certain it was. God has saved the Queen. We now uh, transfer our allegiance to King Charles III, who I am proud and honoured to serve. God save the King. Yeah. Robert Jenry. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I'm grateful to you for permitting front benches to speak from the back bench, although in my case it's sometimes hard to keep up. <laughs> I'm aware that my appointment with others was one of the last acts of Our Late Majesty, and that is a thought that will lie with me every day that I go about my duties, because she really was the last of a generation that has now passed, a generation marked by stoicism, humility, modesty and service qualities too often neglected in our politics and our public life, and ones that I, like all of us in this House, seek to emulate. I am here to represent my constituents in the loyal borough of Newark-upon-Trent, loyal because in May 1646 we were the last town to hold out in the English Civil War, 
a town that only surrendered when the king himself, a forebear of Her Majesty, another Charles, said that we must do so. And at the end of the war, the town was wracked with disease and pestilence, but all of the contemporary accounts show that no one regretted their decision to stand by the monarch. And that to me shows that even in a hereditary monarchy, and certainly in our modern democracy, loyalty of the people to the crown is not something that anyone or any monarch can take for granted. It has to be earned. And from the speeches made across the chamber today, we can see that Her Majesty the Queen, over the course of her long and remarkable reign, earned the respect and admiration, indeed the love of her people. She really has been the golden thread that has run through the weave and the weft of our national story. My grandmother stood in the crowds on the Mall and watched her and her family celebrate on VE Day. My dad watched, like others have spoken, on a small rented television set. The coronation marvelled at her beauty. Afterwards, he went and created a bonfire on the street, and it took the council years to fill in the pothole. So some things clearly never change. <laughs> I, I met Her Majesty only a few times. One, as has been said by other members, on Zoom at a Privy Council meeting. And as we all experienced during the pandemic so many times, the Zoom failed. And then out of the darkness, suddenly a voice emerged. And it was Her Majesty the Queen, and she said, well, thank goodness someone kept a landline. <laughs> Just the other day, I went with my family, my children, who are the great-grandchildren of Holocaust survivors, to see Anne Frank's house. And my children came to me, they were ahead of us in the, the tour, and they said that in the secret annex ahead, amongst the images on the walls, were photos of Her Majesty the Queen, Princess Elizabeth, and her sister, Princess Margaret. And I later researched with my daughters, why was that? And Otto Frank, their, mother, their father, is recorded later in life in saying, Anne Frank loved the royals, but it wasn't just that. He wanted to put some photos on the wall that would give the children strength. And Anne Frank said, it was also the beautiful smile that kept her going. May she rest in peace and God save the King. Yeah. Valerie Thanks. Madam Deputy Speaker, and it's a pleasure to follow the Honourable Member for the loyal constituency of Newark. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, it falls to our generation to tell of the passing of our gracious Sovereign, of the passing of a platinum Elizabethan age, of a young woman with responsibility thrust on her, but without a manual. She wrote her own story and, in doing so, wrote the story of our nation through which we have all lived. We have known her as the young woman who actively supported the war effort and danced in the street when it was over, jumping out of planes showing her, us her sense of humour at the Olympic ceremony in 2012 that showed us we were more than just medals. I was in Walsall yesterday when I heard the sad news of Queen Elizabeth's passing. I know my constituents in Walsall South are grieving. The owner of Fortune Cookie, our local Chinese takeaway, was in tears. And again, like every other member, every school I have ever visited, the question is always asked, have you met the Queen? And Lorna, based in Walsall South, makes her handbags. I hope that link will continue, especially now that we know, thanks to a refugee from Peru, she used to keep her marmalade sandwiches to keep her going. As a lawyer, all I ever knew was a Queen's Bench Division or Queen's Council. That, like our stamps and notes, will change to herald a new era. Having been born in Aden to go in parents, I had never imagined I would meet Queen Elizabeth. But I did, in the gallery in the other place, the British Museum, or at the Privy Council. Those who've had an audience with her can testify to her wisdom and generosity of spirit. She had the ability to speak with you as though she'd known you forever, whether to a winning jockey or a little girl with a posy, or working to the end to welcome her 15th Prime Minister. Like all of us, she knew life is a roller coaster, but she never complained, and only ever mentioned one year as an annus horribilis. Our Queen carried out her duties with dignity, grace and love for us and her country, and yet embraced different countries and cultures through the Commonwealth. 
while always respecting differences and dealing with changes, acknowledging past mistakes, knowing that life and history moves on. Queen Elizabeth reminded us that we are human beings first and members of a race second, and our duty is to help each other make this world a better place and live in peace, just as she said in her first broadcast. And how we will miss those quiet, reassuring messages to the nation at Christmas and at difficult times. Duty, service, defender of the faith and love for her United Kingdom, a constant that brought us all together. The bright full moon shone down last night and there was a rainbow over Windsor Castle and it reminded us of God's promise to his faithful. We pray for her grieving family to get through this difficult time and for, especially for King Charles III. Eternal rest grant unto Queen Elizabeth Alexandra Mary Windsor. May she rest in peace. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. These are indeed the saddest of times for us to gather here today to pay tribute to the late Majesty the Queen. I suspect that we all will remember where we were yesterday when news came that doctors were gravely concerned about Her Majesty's health. Our world was suddenly put on hold, and then came the announcement that we had dreaded to hear. Our rock of stability, the one person who came to symbolise the very best of Britain, was no longer with us. Her Majesty's sense of duty to serve was especially appreciated by our armed forces. That phrase for Queen and country is not just a catchphrase, it's the allegiance you pledge when you join Her Majesty's armed forces. The Queen was our Commander in Chief, and she was only too aware, having served herself, of the sacrifices personnel were willing to make all done in her name. This emptiness that we now feel is a testament to the admiration, the respect and the affection that we all had for her. We have not known a Britain, indeed, without her. Perhaps we can consider ourselves fortunate that the nation was able to come together this year to mark the Queen's Platinum Jubilee and celebrate with her a most incredible life of service. From the street parties across the country, including in my constituency in Bournemouth East, to that wonderful celebration outside Buckingham Palace where the Queen and Paddington Bear stole the show. Only on one occasion did I have cause to formally write to Her Majesty, and that was to ask her if she would agree to Parliament's clock tower to be renamed the Elizabeth Tower, to mark the Diamond Jubilee ten years ago. I was truly honoured when she accepted. That name was formally changed, and we now have a constant parliamentary landmark honouring Her Majesty. As we now mourn the person we knew, we should reflect the constant is also the monarchy itself, the British monarchy that has matured over centuries and allowed our great, great country to advance, to mature, to thrive as a democracy. Her loss does, of course, leave a mark, the end of an era. But in our new king, who is well prepared to serve, the monarchy will continue to play its role in how our state functions. So yes, we do mourn the loss of our Queen, but we also transfer our faith, our allegiance to our new King, His Majesty Charles III. Long live the King. Yeah. Angela Rayner. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and thank you to colleagues across the House for their moving words today. Like other members, I have found the outpouring of affection from both our shores and across the world for our Queen deeply heartwarming. I hope the Royal Family finds solace in this over the coming days and weeks. I have always taken great inspiration from our Queen. She was a woman who found herself in a position of leadership at such a young age, a woman who threw herself into service as not just the most recognisable, but also the most admired of global leaders. 
a woman who stayed those of us through loved times of joy, darkness, and always drawing on her own experience and inner strength to help those that most need it. And I'm in awe of the way she took on this unimaginable responsibility. She got on with the job. She never stopped, and she has set an example for all of us. One of the most proudest moments of my life, and also for my family, was when I was sworn into the Privy Council. These kind of things don't happen to a girl like me. It was surreal to meet Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth II herself via Zoom. She could put anyone at ease, adapting to the challenges and the circumstances and the change. Most of all, though, she was a loving grandmother. And for me, as a grandmother myself, I know and understand the complete love that she had for her family. Her children and her grandchildren were the centre of her life, and I know the whole house shares in both their pain and their pride. Mm. To us, she was our queen, our national figurehead, and the greatest and longest serving monarch in British history. To them, she was also granny. The loss of such a loving presence will be heartbreaking and my heart goes out to them. Her Majesty the late Queen was a constant figure of strength, integrity and service throughout our lives. She was an inspiration to women across the world with complete devotion to her duty, her family and her country. She set an example of leadership for women everywhere. The outpouring of condolences from leaders across the world is testament to that. More recently, we will never forget how she guided us through the despair and loneliness of the pandemic, and her values of public service and dignity never wavered. It is appropriate today that I speak from the backbenchers because our Queen was greatly loved and admired by the people of my constituency. She visited Greater Manchester many times and was always welcomed with love by the local community. And she was last in Manchester a year ago to visit Coronation Street, where she, the cast greeted her at the Rovers Return pub to celebrate the show's 60th anniversary. And it's just three months since the streets of Ashton, Dralson and Failsworth were decked with Union Jack flags as we came together to celebrate the Platinum Jubilee. Our local papers were proud and our local community was proud. She's now gone, but she will be forever missed and always in our hearts. May she rest in peace. God save the King. Yeah. Alex Chalk. Dear Speaker, and I pay tribute to the extraordinarily warm and moving uh, tribute just paid by the Honourable Lady, right Honourable Lady. Queen Elizabeth II famously referred to her late husband as her strength and stay, but although she would never have claimed it for herself, it was she who was the strength and stay of an entire nation, and indeed the Commonwealth. The constancy and humble commitment to duty were the hallmarks of her life. She embodied, embodied values that are the best of our country. In a world of increasing noise and self-promotion, she provided that counterpoint of quiet poise and dignity. We in Cheltenham are proud of a lifetime's connection with Queen Elizabeth II. It was as a young princess that she came to our town. She gave her name to Princess Elizabeth Way, which remains a major Cheltenham thoroughfare, and she did so by planting an oak tree in 1951 to mark its completion. Later that same year, she was at the races, the Cheltenham Gold Cup with her mother. Now, history doesn't relate which Cheltenham event she joined more, opening the road or going to the races. We may have our suspicions, but she was far too professional to ever let on. Mm -hmm. Prince Philip was back in 1957 to open an extension to what is now the University of Gloucestershire. And in 2004, she was in Cheltenham to open GCHQ, or the Donut, as we refer to it. Indeed, she was a strong supporter of the intelligence agencies and unveiled the plaque in 2019 at GCHQ's first London home. She had a quick mind, as many have observed, and was very much up to speed on current events. And so when in Cheltenham in 2004 she observed the magnificent hanging baskets which then decorated the front of the municipal offices, she recalled a recent media story about a hanging basket landing on someone's head elsewhere. She noted that Cheltenham's display was so magnificent it could wipe out the entire council. 
Like many people, I sat down with my children yesterday, aged 10 and 8, and I tried to convey the scale of what had happened. Children cannot and probably should not bear as we do the aching pain of this loss. But as we mourn, let us explain to them what Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II meant to this nation. Just as Her Majesty the Queen dedicated herself to the service of our country in 1952, let us dedicate ourselves to immortalising her values, duty, integrity, selflessness, country and kindness. As a woman of faith, I hope she will have approached the end with peace. And yesterday, as her death was announced, I thought of her family and those who were close by as, in the words of a young RAF pilot in 1941, she slipped the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God. God save the King. Amen. Ali. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. On behalf of my constituents, I rise to pay tribute to Her Majesty the Queen. We mourn the passing of an icon. She was admired across the world and touched our lives in so many positive ways. The Queen was a constant example of service, of duty, of wisdom, of dedication to her people, her country and the Commonwealth. These were her civic virtues, needed now more than ever. She began her life of service as a child and worked until the final days of her life. The tone was set during World War II when the then King and Queen chose to stay in London during the Blitz and the young Princess Elizabeth joined the Auxiliary Territorial Army. When their home, Buckingham Palace, was bombed, the Queen Mother famously said that she could now look the East End in the face. Ever since then, EastEnders have embraced the Queen and her family with a particular bond of love and loyalty. Of course, today's East End is different, is a very different place, more diverse and more connected to the rest of the world and in particular the Commonwealth countries. Her Majesty reimagined Britain's post-colonial place in the world and the Commonwealth has grown to 54 nations with nearly 2.5 billion people. Mr Deputy Speaker, I can personally relate to the story of the Commonwealth as a child born in a Commonwealth country, Bangladesh, which joined in 1972. And I remember in 1983 watching with pride the Queen visiting that very, very new country uh, with Prince Philip. It was a state visit and a big moment for a new nation. And it was a time and a moment that made us feel proud to be British, made us feel we belonged not only to this country, but also to the Commonwealth family. And across the Commonwealth, people are remembering when the Queen came to town with a great sense of warmth and affection. And here at home, in my constituency, I had the honour of receiving the Queen during the Royal London Hospital visit when, it, when the new facilities were opened, the hospital that was at the heart of our national life and at the epicentre of coping with the pandemic. The Queen's words during the pandemic was so necessary to give hope and comfort when constituents like mine were in constituencies like mine were hit so hard. And others have mentioned the Olympic ceremony when when one of the highlights was when it seemed that the that Her Majesty and her most loyal servant, James Bond, were parachuting into the Olympic Stadium in London's East End. Mr Deputy Speaker, we pride ourselves in being the coolest part of the country. Her, <laughs> Majesty, her Majesty made us the coolest place on earth with that stunt. <laughs> on behalf of my constituents, we, 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 our thoughts are with her children, her grandchildren, her wider family and her heir and successor, His Majesty King, George, King Charles III. Mr Speaker, Her Majesty was unique. She radiated warmth. She embodied decency. We will never see her like again. We will never know such a paragon of civic virtue and a shining beacon of public service. May she rest in peace. Long live the King. Yeah. Stephen Crabb. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's a pleasure to follow the excellent speech from the Honourable lady for Bethnal Green and Bow. I rise on behalf of all of my constituents in Priscilla, Pembrokeshire to convey our condolences to His Majesty King Charles III and all members of the royal family at this sad time and to say thank you for a wonderful long and full life and an extraordinary reign that's been a blessing to our nation for seven decades. 
Queen Elizabeth II was loved and respected all across the historic county of Pembrokeshire, where her family, of course, had ancestral roots through the Tudor line. And we enjoyed her visits to Pembrokeshire, to St David's Cathedral, or to visit so many of the excellent charities and community groups that we have in the constituency. For millions of adults, and certainly for children, certainly when we meet them in, in constituency school visits, um, Queen Elizabeth absolutely had something of that mystique and magic that we perhaps associate with an earlier Queen Elizabeth or with a Disney fairy tale queen. But her reign was also an extraordinarily human and personal reign, as we've been hearing so often today, shaped as it was by her amazing capacity to touch people at a very individual level, to raise their self-esteem, to touch their hearts in a very, very special way that left lasting lifetime memories. And for now, Mr Deputy Speaker, that joy that she gave to the nation, to people in all of our constituencies that she met, for now that joy gives way to grief and sadness. In time, we will remember the rain with joy once again. But in the meantime, we ask God to bless her and to save King. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Griffith. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Deputy Speaker, for giving me this opportunity to speak in tribute to Her Late Majesty uh, Queen Elizabeth II. I would firstly like to begin by expressing my most sincere condolences to her family on my own behalf and on behalf of the people across the constituency of Llanelli. Our thoughts are particularly with the King, Charles III, her other children, her grandchildren, their families. For them, this is a deeply personal loss. And whilst they've always had to share the Queen, their mother and grandmother, with the public, that is particularly hard at this time of immense grief. And for them too, this follows so close on the loss of their father and grandfather, the late Prince Philip. I would like to set on record my huge appreciation for the way that the Queen carried out her duties, shouldering an enormous workload and responsibility from a young age for a full 70 years, including working right into this week, appointing the new Prime Minister. The Queen was absolutely exemplary in her dedication and commitment, an example to all of us in public life. But she went above and beyond that, taking a personal interest in matters and showing real empathy with people. And in Wales, we were very privileged to receive her visits on many occasions, and she's been with us for important moments in our nation's history, opening the National Assembly for Wales in 1999, and last year, opening the sixth session of the Senate. In relation to that visit, I would like to tell you about a young woman, Fionn Gwither, from my constituency, who at the opening of the Senate was tasked with presenting Her Majesty with a bouquet of flowers. But as you can imagine, as that moment approached, she was very, very nervous. But she need not have worried. The Queen looked at her and immediately understood the situation and put her at ease, asking her gently, are those flowers for me? How beautiful. They match my outfit. That's a moment that Fionn will never forget and is just one of countless examples of how the Queen was always so kind and thoughtful in her approach and knew exactly how to handle the occasion and put a young woman at ease. And during her reign, she would have touched millions in the same way. But it's not only on happy occasions that the Queen has visited Wales. She will always be remembered for her visit to Aberfan in the aftermath of the terrible tragedy of 1966, when a slag heap buried the school. This has been put on record by Jeff Edwards, the last child to be rescued from the school. Speaking about her visit, he stressed the community's appreciation, saying that people felt comfort from the fact that the Queen, who was head of state, had come to a small mining village and had shown direct interest and concern for her subjects who had gone through this enormous event. But the Queen's role goes far beyond Wales and beyond the UK to the Commonwealth. There we have seen huge changes, a complex transition from the Empire to today's Commonwealth. With such a range of nations, each with its own particular circumstances, it is no wonder that sometimes tensions have arisen. And we must recognise the crucial role that the Queen has played in maintaining what is a unique family of nations. There is no doubt that her wisdom and professionalism, her personal rapport with individuals and the very high esteem in which she is held have been pivotal in helping to smooth that transition and keeping the Commonwealth together. And now, Mr Deputy Speaker, going forward, the best tribute that we can give is to follow her excellent example and to try and serve our communities with the same dedication and fortitude that she's showed throughout her life. 
So as we turn to the future, long live the King. Yeah. Robin Walker. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. As someone with the honour of representing the faithful city of Worcester, I want to pass on the love, prayers and good wishes of constituents, faith and civic leaders to all the royal family, and especially His Majesty the King, at this sad and historic moment. I can associate myself with so many of the superlatives uh, we have heard from across the House today, but I want to focus on two things. Um, Her Majesty's uh, faith uh, and uh, her profound uh, connection, uh, as the Honourable Lady who just spoke was speaking about, uh, with children. Uh, her late Majesty swore at her coronation to be a defender of the faith, and in so many messages over the decades, she not only defended, but enhanced and gently protected the role of faith in our society, not only for her own Church of England, but as we've heard from people of all faiths and denominations, uh, for people uh, across the whole uh, of the United Kingdom of all faiths uh, and none. When Princess Elizabeth first visited Worcester in 1951, she was already the mother of two small children, and the beautiful princess was greeted by flower girls and a parade of scouts and guides outside the cathedral. As a lifelong patron of the guides and former girl guide herself, as well as the fount of so many Queen's Scout Awards, she has inspired millions of young people. She returned as Queen in 1957 and visited New Road, the most beautiful cricket ground in England, with her consort Prince Philip, touring the boundary in an open-top Land Rover to the cheers of 5,000 local schoolchildren. After more visits in the 1980s, when she distributed Maundy money and celebrated the anniversary of the city's charter, her final visit to Worcester, and the proudest moment of my life, was at her Diamond Jubilee. Her Majesty opened the Hive Library, a joint city and university library, which is the first of its kind in Europe, and a fabulous repository of children's books. And I was fortunate enough to be among the welcoming party on that visit, to join some volunteers from local charities and children from local schools uh, at the event and being presented to Her Majesty the Queen. And what struck me, as so many have already reported, was her smile, her bright, humorous eyes, her genuine interest in the people to whom she was introduced, and the instant connection she formed with the children. Most recently, children in schools up and down our country were able to celebrate and learn about Her Majesty at the remarkable Platinum Jubilee, and they joined children in successive generations in singing, dancing, and making wonderful art to celebrate a jubilee of this longest-serving uh, sovereign. She was described by one of our former Prime Ministers as a matriarch, and of course uh, that is right. But I think uh, we have also uh, lost the world's favourite granny. Um, I would join uh, with my uh, honourable friend, for, my right honourable friend for Pendle, uh, and with Paddington there, in simply saying on behalf of us all, thank you, ma'am, for everything. Yeah. Yeah. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'm here to offer my and the condolences of the people of the Glothian on this very sad occasion. And amidst the ebb and flow of people, politics, and power, Queen Elizabeth has always been there, a steadfast figure in our shared history. With quiet dignity, she made her mark in momentous global events, but perhaps more importantly, she touched people in a very personal way. Across these aisles, the Queen is part of the backdrop of the stories of all of our lives. The Queen brought grace, warmth, dignity and humour to a role which in turn brought respect from people across political divides. And her passing brings an unsettling time, a time of grief and reflection, and for many a reminder of loved ones lost. People across the nations may feel understandably they have lost a, a loved one of their own. Yet already preparations are underway and the duty occupies the new King Charles III, showing them the immortal words of Terry Pratchett that truly the only thing known to travel faster than ordinary light is indeed monarchy. But regardless of her views on monarchy, the Queen is respected for her remarkable dignity with which she held herself throughout trying times. And we appreciate the twinkle in her eye, her humour, her love of animals and the humility with which she held from far from humble, humble office. She was the first Queen Elizabeth in Scotland, of course with lineage stretching back to the Stuart dynasty and Mary Queen of Scots. And in Scotland, hosting barbecues in the hills of Balmoral, it said that was where she was happiest. Older generations will fondly remember the royal tour of Midlothian back in 1961, where she was out and about across the county, viewing aspects of everyday life and visiting in Roslyn Chapel or the rural housing schemes at Temple the carpet factory in Bonnerig and to the Lone Head Memorial Park. There was no standing room left in the streets of Dalkeith at this time, with crowds climbing on the roof of the bus station seeking a glimpse of the young Queen. And more recently, she was warmly welcomed back to Midlothian for the reopening of the Borders Railway, 
unveiling a plaque at the station in Newton Grange, where she was welcomed with a wonderful performance by the Newton Grange Silver Band, who expressed their condolences at this time. People from all walks of life in Midlothian wish to convey their respects and make it clear just how fondly the Queen is remembered. Condolences have been expressed online by community groups across Midlothian, in addition to Midlothian's Lord Lieutenant and Provost, who have already held local tributes, and in line with many other places have opened up a book of condolence across council venues in Midlothian to allow people to pay their own tributes. And Mr Deputy Speaker, as a, a previous member and the current chair of the All Party Group for the Boys Brigade, I have always been keenly aware of Her Majesty's role as the organisation's patron. And, uh, and know that the, the boy, all in the, the Boys Brigade world wish to pass on their thoughts and prayers of the entire Boys Brigade family at this time. We are all now getting our heads round the changes that this will make to the basic things that we all took for granted. The ground has shifted beneath our feet and the lads at my local post office in Lonehead said, every day we send hundreds of letters and parcels burning the Queen's head and this will now be no more. May she rest in peace. Yeah. Andrew Morrison. Mr yeah. Deputy yeah. Speaker, I rise with the deep and profound condolences of my constituents in South West Wiltshire. A good and gracious lady has been taken from us, and we are all the poorer for that. A lady who has shaped the contours of our national life for 70 years has gone, but her legacy endures. And if you doubt that, uh, just see the pictures of His Majesty in the hour of his grief greeting the crowds that have gathered outside Buckingham Palace yeah. today. Mr Deputy Speaker, grown men don't cry, do they? Well, they do. And I've cried twice in my adult life, once when my father died and once last night. For a woman that I had only met once at the aforementioned gin and tonic opportunity that a number of <laughs> honourable right honourable members have uh, cited today. But unfortunately, on my, in my case, there was no uh, gin and tonic. And the reason it is so profound for most of us is for most of our lives, all of our lives, she has been a constant, somebody who has always been there, a rock, a stable place, someone to look to and to admire, and like many colleagues around the House today, when I go to primary schools, I'm asked two questions usually, uh, one more difficult to answer than the other. Uh, have you met the Queen and how much are you paid? <laughs> Last night I called my mother because I knew she'd be upset, and she was. In June 1953, she, like many of her generation, lined the streets of London uh, to watch another young woman go to her coronation. Uh, that was a profound moment uh, for her uh, and an extraordinary moment in the life of our nation. And very soon we will do something again under altogether more sombre circumstances. But her sense of profound loss is certainly uh, replicated right across this land and by people of all generations. And if I can say particularly, since I remain a member of His Majesty's Armed Forces, by the armed forces of this country, who have lost their Commander-in-Chief, many of whom live in the towns and villages around Salisbury Plain, that I have the honour and privilege to represent. Now, in 878, Alfred the Great uh, secured the future of what became Wessex and ultimately the nation-state we know today. The great is a descriptor that should not be used lightly. But Queen Elizabeth II is the benchmark for monarchs in this age and ages past. She is Elizabeth the Great. As the Elizabethan age closes and the Caroline era dawns, we have to understand that it will look and feel different. We will look and feel different. But drift difference will bring renewal and it will bring opportunity, as His Majesty has demonstrated today. Rest well, Your Majesty. God save the King. Yeah. Chris Elmore. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy oh. Speaker. It is a privilege to offer the condolences of my constituents to His Majesty the King uh, and indeed to all members of the Royal Family. 
My constituency is privileged to be able to thank Her Late Majesty, and indeed, at the time, His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales, and now, of course, the King, for securing SOMI being, uh, being developed in my constituency. As the Managing Director of SOMI UK told me today, thousands of my constituents have benefited from the direct intervention of Her Majesty, and indeed now His Majesty. The site was opened by the late Queen in 1993, and it was in fact the King in 1974 on a visit to Japan who said to the then Chief Executive of Sony, if you consider putting something in the UK, please put something in my country, Wales. I think of Her Late Majesty in the forms of fun and friendship, and just like the member for South West Wiltshire, I'm frequently asked whenever I go to a school visit, be they teenagers or primary schools, have you ever met the Queen? To which the answer is, sort of. I've seen her. Um, I've been at the, at the box in the Lords for the, for the Queen's speech. I once was asked, following the question, <laughs> have you ever touched the Queen? <laughs> I'm not sure who was more shocked, me or the head teacher who genuinely looked like he was about to faint. <laughs> the Queen had a healthy obsession with trees and I can recall fondly the talks that she held with Sir David Attenborough that has been running on clips over the last few days about the Queen's canopy and the work that he was doing to talk about delivering this right across our United Kingdom. And she joked that we, her and Sir David, would not see that tree come to its 50-year life. They both laughed. And it's her humility that so many of us will think of so fondly. I have had the privilege, Mr Deputy Speaker, in my brief time in this House, to have met now King Charles III twice. The first five days after I was elected in a by-election in 2016. I was lined up by the Secretary to the Lord Lieutenant and told, just stand there Mr Elmore, he'll be along shortly. When he arrived, he came out the car, I was the second person to greet him, to which he said to me, you're the new one. <laughs> and he said, and I was quite nervous, yes, your, yes, your Royal Highness. I wouldn't worry about it, I'm terribly nice. <laughs> and I think that common touch is what he has picked up from the late Queen. And I know he will go on to serve this country well, to serve the Commonwealth well. God bless and keep the Queen and all who mourn her. And God save the King. I'd like to thank Chris Elmore for keeping well within the three minute limit. So please, could people look at their contributions, keep them as short as you can, because we want to get as many in as we possibly can. Esther McFay. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. There has been so many wonderful, moving tributes today. It's been a real pleasure mm. to be in the chamber to yeah, listen yeah. to them yeah, all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And with your permission, Mr. Deputy Speaker, yeah. I will make my tribute through the eyes of the schoolchildren of Tatton. For as so many MPs have mentioned here today, the curiosity those children have of the late Queen Elizabeth II. And the question they do ask, particularly in primary school and junior school, is have you met the Queen? And when I say yes, there are literally squeals of delight, gasps of disbelief, uncontainable excitement ripple through the class. Such was the impact that this lady had on all the people of this country, of all ages and of all parts of the country. She loved children and children loved her. And the clatter of questions that followed. Were you nervous when you met her? How was she? What's she like? Where did you meet her? So I try and describe the Queen to them as they sit and listen, eyes wide open. Well, I say she's diminutive, or she was diminutive, yet she was imposing. She was gentle, yet steely and that powder puff grey hair, she was radiant and she shone. But it was her eyes that were remarkable and memorable. They were penetrating and bottomless, the knowledge behind them limitless. You can almost feel what she had seen and what she had experienced. You were in the presence of wisdom, and they are kind too. She was a curious blend, quite disarming, and yet incredibly caring. And was I nervous? Without doubt, you're in the presence of greatness, whose life has spanned war and peace. And that nervousness is amplified by the royal protocol, which she lives through and by. So when you're made a privy councillor and you've got steps to take, 
kneels to bow. It's meticulous choreography, the timing, quick steps, kneels, precision of words, and taking oaths. And the seal of office too at Sandringham. It was magical. It was a whirl of rooms and doors opening. It was brevity, but intensity. And as we left, we were all handed a packed lunch. And all I could say, it was thoughtful, but simple, no frills. I think it was nutritionally balanced. There was no, <laughs> there was no fuss whatsoever. It was all bother and nonsense. And as Deputy Chief Whip, Chief Whip, I was also treasurer to Her Majesty's household. But what she did love, and where I met her and spent more time with her was at Windsor Castle with her horses uh, in her stables, which she absolutely loved. And she confided that one of her best memories was the day that Estimate won the Ascot Gold Cup at Royal Ascot, trained by Sir Michael Stout. And she spoke to her trainers without fail every week, Nicky Henderson and John Gosden. But that was what she loved. So I'm absolutely delighted that the St. Ledger is going ahead this weekend, not least because the Queen won the St. Ledger in her Silver Jubilee year, with Dunfermline ridden by Willie Carson, one of her favourite jockeys. But kind and finally thoughtful. And my final conversation with her, she questioned social media and the impact it had, and she said, could anybody these days keep a secret? She talked about Operation Mincemeat, the deception that fooled Hitler and helped us win the war. And she said, can people keep things to themselves or do they feel that they'd sooner tell everybody and maybe spoil what should be done? So when I leave children, I say, have you got discretion? Can you keep a secret? Are you selfless? Can you think of the greater good more than you can think of yourself? And if you can, then the Queen has done her job and her spirit and her qualities will live on in all of us. God bless the Queen. God save the King. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's a pleasure to follow the Honourable Lady from Tatton. Um, Queen Elizabeth was just 10 years old when her uncle abdicated and she became heir to the throne. She was just 13 when war broke out and in the six years that followed, we saw the pattern of her whole life to come. Standing with her people in those dark hours, at home and across the Commonwealth, sharing in their grief when her own uncle fell in service, leading our national celebrations when victory and freedom was finally secured, and throughout the war, setting the perfect example by rolling her sleeves up and doing her bit for the collective effort. Yet while the Second World War inspired millions to incredible feats and brought out the very best in our country, what we saw in those years from the young Princess Elizabeth was what we would come to understand as her normal. For the next seven decades, she continued to set the perfect example of dedicated, selfless, timeless service and embody the values that unite our people. She continued to share our grief when tragedy struck the nation, whether it was Abervan or Dunblane or 7-7 when so many people in Islington were killed. And she didn't buckle when it touched her own family. She continued to stand with us in our darkest and most fearful hours, and more so when, uh, when she gave those messages of hope and courage that inspired all of us at the start of the pandemic. And she continued to lead our national celebrations right up to the point in recent years when the biggest, most united celebrations of all were to mark her own birthdays and jubilees. She did all that for us. She lived her life for us. And while she may have visited 200 hospitals or 2,000 schools, she may have cut 5,000 ribbons, awarded 20,000 medals, shaken the hands of hundreds of thousands, she never forgot for one moment that while on those, those were daily duties, were nothing out of the ordinary for her, they were deeply special, deeply special for everyone that she met and that she, enjoyed, she ensured that each of those individuals would go away with a unique memory of what she had said to them, how she had smiled at them, and the interest that she took in their service to the country, which is for so many, so many people, those encounters with the Queen will be remembered as the greatest moments in their lives. 
And I know that in Islington there are at the, this moment lists being compiled of the visits that she made to our borough and, 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 and stories being shared of the many times that we had the opportunity to see her and to experience mm. a meeting with her. And so we join today to thank the Queen for nine decades of devoted service, every one of them filled with setting the right example, filled with giving her people courage, sympathy and joy, filled with making others feel special and doing it all day, after day, year after year, right up until the very end. That record of duty would be unfathomable, astonishing and worthy of celebration in this house, even if she had been a humble librarian or a long-serving charity volunteer. But to do all that in the pressure of her roles as heir to the throne and head of state places her public service on a pinnacle, which is unmatched in the history of our country and the like of which we will never see again. On behalf of the Honourable Artillery Company, the Charter House, Farringdon Cross Rail, with all of whom she shared a particularly <coughs> strong links, and on behalf of the people of Islington South and Finsbury, who loved her so dearly, I thank you, ma'am. God save the King. Yeah. Stuart Andrew. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And it is with sadness that I uh, offer my tribute to uh, Her Late Majesty the Queen on my behalf and, and, of course, on behalf of the people of Pudsey, Horsford and Airborough. I suppose the first time the Queen came into my consciousness was as a small boy standing outside the house waiting for some lady in a big posh car to go past as uh, she marked her uh, uh, Silver Jubilee in 1977. And from then on, there were many occasions where we would enjoy re royal occasions. Those jubilees, the royal weddings, all uh, helped us to enjoy street parties uh, on our estate. And I thought about those street parties when the Queen's 90th birthday was coming and thought, I haven't seen one in our community for some time. And so we decided, a group of friends of ours, to organise one. And we were staggered when thousands of people in the community came out to celebrate Her Majesty's 90th birthday. And we saw it also reflected in the Mall uh, just recently in the Jubilee, where literally hundreds of thousands turned up. And why? Well, because they respected and they loved her. Yeah. Because they recognised that this was a woman of great dedication and who wanted to serve her country in the best way that she could and that she would work to the very last day as she committed to do all those many years ago. And last night, a couple of us went up to the palace and again, people were there meeting, strangers talking, all sharing conversations and memories about the late Her Majesty the Queen. The public, the British public, showing how much they loved her. And then she was there when we needed her most. Many have talked about the pandemics, but also when our country has had those awful terrorist attacks. And she has always given warm words, comfort to those victims and to their families. And we will remember that amazing speech she made in the hospital in London, where she said that they will not change our way of life. Yeah. 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 I don't know about anybody else, but whenever I visit a constituent who's celebrating their 100th birthday, the card from Her Majesty the Queen is front and centre uh, in the living room. Because, of course, why wouldn't they do it? It's such a proud thing for them yeah, yeah. to have. And many have also mentioned about school children. Uh, asking, have you met the Queen? And for many years in this place, I was unable to say that I had until I was uh, honoured to be appointed as the Vice Chamberlain of the Household. Uh, and I remember my moment when I was going to be, I was being introduced to her, waiting for these doors to open. And when they finally did, realising that I actually had become that little boy again, standing there with my knees knocking and wondering how I might address Her Majesty. But as others have said, she put me at ease and she made me feel incredibly welcome. Uh, and as the Vice-Chamberlain, uh, I also had to write the daily reports from this place. Uh, just to say that she liked the gossip, I understand, uh, is, is, is heartwarming, but also, as Vice-Chamberlain, I was hostage. 
So I was taken hostage up there while she came here to open Parliament, uh, and I was offered a drink, and they said, would you like tea or coffee? And one of them looked at me and thought, you look more like a champagne man. I said, well, I'm never going to do this again, so why not? Well, it was a big bottle of champagne, and I had a good time. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of months later, we had the general election, and I had to do it again. And as Her Majesty was leaving Buckingham Palace, she turned to me and she said, and you have a good time again, won't you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, to conclude, Mr Deputy Speaker, that during uh, the awful attacks of 9-11, the Queen said to the people of America, grief is the price we pay for love. Well, we, are, we all loved her, and that is why we are grieving. And we send our thoughts and best wishes, wishes to His Majesty, the King, and his family. And we say, God save the King. Yeah. So say, please look again at your contributions so that they are sticking to the three minutes. Alistair Carmichael. Thank you very much, Madam, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. <laughs> um, I'm grateful to you for the opportunity to try and articulate the uh, very keen and profound sense of loss that there is felt across the Northern Isles today. Her Majesty made a number of visits to Orkney and to Shetland over the years of her reign, all of which built a real connection between Orkadians and Shetlanders and their monarch. One of the best remembered is in 1960 when she took the Royal Yacht Britannia into Stronzi and Sandy in, in uh, sorry, into Stronzi and Westry in Orkney. Prince Philip uh, was given the job of driving her around Waystry in their then most suitable available vehicle, the new 12-seater school bus. It produced one of the best pictures of Her Majesty that I think any of us will ever see. She is sitting in the passenger seat laughing uproariously while Prince Philip is in the driver's seat shall we just say, with a look of grim determination on his face. I don't know what it was exactly that caused that look of grim determination, but having been there myself with my wife on occasions, I can only guess. Her Majesty also visited Shetland in 1981, as Shetland's oil came on stream through the Sulemvo terminal, and she opened the terminal then. That was remembered in Shetland, unfortunately, because it was a day when the IRA detonated a bomb in Shetland in the, in the power station there. I mention that because while we all speak about her quite remarkable record of service, we should not forget that that service was one which often came at personal risk. Like others, I had my moments uh, meeting Her Majesty, which I treasure as very private uh, and special moments. I served as controller of the household from 2010 to 2013, and as such had a walk-on part in the state opening of Parliament. It's fair to say, in 2013, we had the misfortune of a state opening of Parliament which clashed with the first day of the Windsor Horse Show. Oh. And when we returned to Buckingham Palace at the end of the, the, the state opening, we were left in no doubt that should this unfortunate diary mismanagement happen in the future, it would not necessarily be the Windsor Horse Show that would lose out on that occasion. <laughs> Mr Deputy Speaker, I, I think back to my, the very first time I saw Her Majesty in the flesh, and it was when she visited Isla, where I was growing up in 1977 as part of her Silver Jubilee tour. She often visited Isla privately as a guest of the Morrison family. And in passing, I would like to pay tribute not just to Her Majesty, but also to the Honourable Mary Morrison, who served for many, many years as one of Her Majesty's ladies in waiting. On that occasion, she visited Beaumore Distillery. The, that was the first time she had visited a distillery, and it came back to me in 2014 when I was President at Secretary of State for Scotland at the naming of the aircraft carrier HMS Queen Elizabeth. On that occasion, as the aircraft carrier was named, there was a bottle of Beaumore whisky for, uh, smashed on the side of the boat, and the smell of that malt whisky drift, drifted across Rosyth, and it took me back to that day in 1977. I mention that because I think, like so many people, these are the threads that Her Majesty interwove throughout our lives that enriched the fabric of our country 
That is why we miss her, and that is why we now pledge our new allegiance to, to His Majesty the King. God save the King. Yeah. Yeah. Richard. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I rise to pay my own personal uh, tribute uh, to the late Majesty Queen Elizabeth uh, II and on behalf of all my constituents throughout the Reeking constituency. And Queen Elizabeth visited uh, Shropshire many times over her long reign. In particular, her visits to the Reeking are still remembered with abiding fondness and deep affection. Her visit to Reeking College in 1967 her visit to the 13th century Buttercross in Newport in 1981, her visit to Donington during the Falklands War in 1982, and passing through High Arkell and other nearby villages, and her last visit to the Reekin in 2012 to RAF Cosford as part of her Diamond Jubilee pageant, where a huge crowd of over 35,000 people turned out to greet her. The late Queen Elizabeth was the personification of duty, integrity, selflessness, steadfastness, and resoluteness, and always with a superb sense of humour, observation, and wit. Yes, born out of her own decency and exemplary character, but also born out of her deep and abiding Christian faith, something she quietly attested to throughout her long reign and so often heard through comforting and unifying Christmas Day messages, which we will all miss. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Reekin loved the Queen. Shropshire loved the Queen. She will abide in all our hearts and memories. May she rest in peace and rise in glory. Long live the King. Marsha de Cordova. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, it's an honour to not only speak um, on my own behalf, but also on the behalf of my constituents in Battersea and also pass on their condolences. The passing of Her Majesty the Queen is a great loss for the royal family and for our country. Our remarkable Queen dedicated 70 years of our life serving our country <coughs> as our longest reigning sovereign and devoted her life to the betterment of this country. And today we celebrate her service and express our thanks for her steadfast leadership. The Queen was a role model and someone who touched the lives of so many in her own unique and distinguished way. Now over the course of her reign, there was great transformation and progress in the world, yet she served as that constant and reassuring figure during periods of change that provided us all with a sense of security. The Queen was incredibly resolute and principled and she had a work ethic and commitment to the duty and service which she placed above all other considerations. And we can say even in her 90s <laughs> and the days before her death, she was still working and serving our country. Amen. Now her strong and abiding faith in God was the golden thread that guided her work and her commitment to respecting everybody and appreciating difference and serving people. Now across Battersea, people will be reflecting on her selfless service and leadership of our country. And the Queen visited the constituency on many occasions, including the then children's home on the Winstanley estate, and of course, Battersea Dogs and Cats Home. We all know how passionate she was about animals and their welfare, and this was shown by her patronage of the home. And as they have already said this week, that they were so lucky to have had such a valuable relationship with, with her. She wasn't just our clear queen, as she was seen globally by all the contributions and tributes that have come her way. Now, as I close, my thoughts and prayers are with His Royal Highness King Charles and the Royal Family. May she rest in peace and rise in eternal glory. God save the King. Yeah. Greg Hans. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I rise to add uh, my tribute to uh, Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II on behalf of my Chelsea and Fulham uh, constituents at a time of great sadness for the whole country. 
Um, she was much loved in the royal borough of Kensington and Chelsea, and as much so amongst my Fulham constituents as well. She came at least once a year to my constituency, to the Chelsea Flower Show. Indeed, the first time and the last time that I personally met her uh, was at the Chelsea Flower Show in 2010, and then this year, just three months ago. The Chelsea Flower Show was one of her absolute favourite events. She rarely, if ever, missed it. She may have been to it more than 70 times. But in 2010, it was my first Chelsea Flower Show, and I was third in the Royal Receiving Line, and I was exceptionally nervous. This wasn't helped by the receiving line taking around two hours, as almost the entire royal family comes at ten-minute intervals. It started with Princess Alexandra, I think, and eventually the Queen arrived, and all passed well. I had bowed in the right place and extended her my hand at the right time. We had a brief, and charming and pleasant conversation. I could relax, except I had forgotten one thing. As she wasn't the last of the royal family to come, there was still the Duke of Edinburgh moments after. And I realised my mistake, and I almost fell over, having messed up my bow, called him Your Majesty, <laughs> to which the Duke smiled and said, Are you new? <laughs> And I pay tribute to, to him today, to the late Duke of Edinburgh as well, the Queen's beloved husband. And the last time I saw her was at this year's Chelsea Flower Show, which she toured with great enthusiasm at age 96 uh, in a golf cart. Uh, she was radiant and, as ever, fascinated by the displays, and it was simply amazing to see her at the age of 96. She was much loved by my Fulham constituents as well, Indeed, one of the iconic pieces of video footage uh, from the 1977 Silver Jubilee was a clip of a group of women on Kingwood Road in Fulham, arm in arm, in Jubilee hats, singing all together, maybe it's because I'm a Londoner. She will be grieved and warmly remembered the length of the King's Road and, as appropriately, along the new King's Road as well. I also met her, Mr Deputy Speaker, in my role as the Government's Deputy Chief Whip. Many in this House will know that the Deputy Chief Whip is also the honorific Treasurer of the Royal Household, and the role comes with a wand of office, which looks like a long billiard cue which unscrews in the middle, referred to earlier by my right honourable friend, the Member for Pendle. The day came in October 2013 for the transfer of the wand of office from my predecessor, Sir John Randall, now Lord Randall, to me in a ceremony at the Palace. I was once again nervous, once again it all started well. Sir John handed the Queen the wand of office, she handed then to me the wand of office. But I started fidgeting with this wand of office. I found it a fascinating article as Sir John carried on speaking with Her Majesty. And I started absent-mindedly, Mr Deputy Speaker, unscrewing <laughs> the wand of office. I had an alarmed look from Her Majesty and an alarmed look from Sir John Randall, who told me, stop it. <laughs> and I was told afterwards, Mr Deputy Speaker, that if I had unscrewed entirely the wand of office, it would have meant rejecting the office, and it would have meant that Sir John would have had to come back here still as the Government's Deputy Chief Whip. But that wasn't the worst. A minute or two later, the Queen suddenly said to me and Sir John, bear in mind this was in 2013, at around the time of growing European rebellion in the Conservative Party, the Queen suddenly said, I do think Mr Barron has a point, <laughs> with reference to my honourable friend, the member for Billericay. By now, Mr Deputy Speaker, I was a total wreck. The Queen was seemingly pronouncing on the greatest political issue of the time, and I had to give her an answer on behalf of the government. But fortunately, she saw my difficulty and clarified it was with reference to one of the honourable gentlemen, the member of Billericay's many other rebellions, in reference to regimental mergers, nothing to do with Brexit at all. <laughs> Mr Deputy Speaker, I conclude by just saying I think the Queen's historic significance, the length of her reign, everything that she's seen, the fact she's met every US president except one, the fact that her first Prime Minister was Sir Winston Churchill, born more than 100 years 
before my right honourable friend, the member for South West Norfolk. The fact that Joseph Stalin uh, was still in the Kremlin at the time that she came uh, to the throne shows her historical significance. I pay tribute on behalf of my constituents of Chelsea and Fulham uh, and wish uh, 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 many, many years of a happy reign to King Charles III. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I know many people have got great stories and we do want to hear them, but I have to say that if we have multiple stories and it goes on, then there are a lot of people who are just simply going to be disappointed even at 10 o'clock tonight. So please be mindful of your colleagues. John Jonathan Ashworth. Um, grateful, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise to express my personal condolences to His Majesty the King and the Royal Family, to associate myself with the remarks that we have heard in the debate so far, and to express on behalf of my constituents in Leicester South and the City of Leicester our tribute to Her Majesty, her, the, the late Her Majesty. Leicester is proud of its radical tradition. But notwithstanding our history as a parliamentarian stronghold, across Leicester, Her Majesty was held in deep affection, with deep reverence and deep love, and we are united in our grief today. Leicester's story today is one of diversity. We have welcomed families from across the globe, from across the Commonwealth, to our city. Sometimes families who were fleeing persecution <laughs> with nothing but a hastily packed suitcase. And Her Majesty's leadership of the Commonwealth not only stands as a reminder of the bonds of solidarity between the different nations of the Commonwealth, but it is also stands as a symbol of inspirational hope for families who were fleeing persecution, hope for a better future for themselves and their children, something that we have been reminded of recently in Leicester just last month, as we recalled the 50-year anniversary of the expulsion of the Asian community from Uganda. And Her Majesty herself celebrated our diversity in Leicester also. She was proud of our different faith groups. And today in Leicester, if I may say so, our mosques at Jummah Prayers have been recognising Her Majesty's death and expressing their thanks. Our Hindu temples have been placing garlands over pictures of Her Majesty's. There are prayers in our synagogues, our Gurdwaras, our Jain temples. And we were particularly proud ten years ago to host Her Majesty for the start of her Diamond Jubilee tour in Leicester, and all of our communities came together. Indeed, for the start of that Diamond Jubilee tour, my honourable friend from Leicester West, we had the privilege of welcoming her to De Montford University in my constituency for the start of that tour. And as we were queuing up to greet Her Majesty and His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh, and we were waiting nervously, and I think I caught, uh, just in the corner of my eye, her Majesty looking somewhat bemused, if not slightly askance, at our husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, who had asked me and the uh, member for Leicester West whether we were reds or blues. <laughs> I don't know what his opinion was of our answer, frankly. But not only did we uh, celebrate Her Majesty for the start of the Diamond Jubilee tour, a few months later we, had, we were nervous in Leicester because it was a few months later that we discovered the remains of the last Yorkist monarch in a Leicester City Council car park. This provoked all kinds of knotty constitutional questions for the palace today and what we were going to do with Richard III. But Her Majesty, with the usual aplomb and diplomatic skill that we have heard so much of, let it be known that she was following developments with great interest and a couple of years later visited Leicester Cathedral, the final resting place of Richard III, to hand out Maundy money on Maundy Thursday. Let me finish with this point, Mr Deputy Speaker. In February 1952, when this House debated a motion on the loss of His Majesty King George, Winston Churchill from the dispatch box said he hoped that the accession of Queen Elizabeth would usher in a golden age. In response, the former Prime Minister and then Leader of the Opposition, Clement Attlee, said that he hoped the accession of Queen Elizabeth would lead to another glorious Elizabethan era more renowned than the first one. My God, she more than surpassed the aspirations and hopes of those two great Prime Ministers. Rest in peace and God save the King.
Yeah. I know everybody's keen to get in as well, so there again, look at the time limits, but please don't approach the chair either. I mean, every time I choose somebody, it means I'm cho not choosing everybody else. And I know there's a lot of pressure, and I know you all want to get in. So, Gary Streeter. Thank you very much, yeah. Mr Deputy Speaker, and it's a privilege to bring a tribute to our late Queen on behalf not just of myself, but of course my constituents in South West Devon. And I want to focus in on her excellent Christmas broadcasts every year, which have been mentioned by some colleagues. Her ability to connect uh, with the whole nation was never better expressed than through her Christmas Day broadcasts. In our household, as in many others, they were unmissable events, and in recent years the whole day was shaped around them. And each year, as we know, she spoke with great warmth and insight about the events of the year with ever more personal reflections. And she never shirked from touching on painful events, not just the positive, knowing that all of our lives are made up with ups and downs. And in particular, she used those opportunities to remind the nation of the true meaning of Christmas, namely the birth of her Saviour, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. On the 3rd of August this very year, she said this, Throughout my life, the message and teachings of Christ have been my guide, and in them I find hope. It was, Mr Deputy Speaker, a simple but clear explanation of the influences that had shaped her life. And in our celebration of her greatness as a monarch, she would not want us also to, she would want us not to, rec she would want us to recognise the significance of the gospel message that produced such fruit in her. If she was the rock on which modern Britain was built, it was because she stood on the true rock, the rock of ages. And in our pluralistic society, containing citizens of all faiths and none, her declaration of Christian faith never jarred nor grated or alienated, as we heard from the Honourable Lady from Birmingham Ladywood, because it was authentic. And this was demonstrated through her magnificent Christmas broadcasts. But I believe, in my final point, Mr Deputy Speaker, I believe it is also possible to discern in her broadcasts another deep quality that she possessed. That even in her 80s and in her 90s, she did not stand still or remain static. She was moving forward, learning, developing year on year. She became more intimate with her subjects during those broadcasts, more personal, ever more bold. She had an appetite for progress and advancement to the very end. So an authentic life, shaped by her sincere faith, that produced in all the vicissitudes of life a remarkable woman and a great monarch. On behalf of the people of South West Devon, thank you, Your Majesty, for your life of service on our behalf. May you rest in peace and rise in glory. Yeah. Yeah. Steve Reid. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker. Yeah. We've heard some really wonderful uh, anecdotes and stories this afternoon of members' meetings uh, with Her, Her Late Majesty the Queen. But for most people who met her, those moments would have been more fleeting. But they lodge in the memory because of the huge importance the Queen has played in our life as a nation and our sense of who we are. I first saw her as a schoolboy during the Silver Jubilee walkabout in Windsor, feeling so excited, as so many other children uh, will have done over the years, simply to snatch a photograph of her with my little plastic camera. It would be an iPhone today, of course. Uh, another was when she came to open the Lambeth Academy in Clapham. The students were besides themselves with excitement that the Queen had come to visit their school. And it's these little moments like these, through these little moments, that the Queen has been a constant presence who lit up our lives for as long as most of us have been alive. The stability of her presence eased our country through periods of drastic change as Britain moved from being the centre of an empire to becoming the modern, diverse and more inclusive country that we know and love today. She really was in T.S. Eliot's words, the still point of the turning world where past and future are gathered. My constituency of Croydon North is one of the country's most diverse. People who came there from the Commonwealth feel a special bond with Her Late Majesty as a connection between their past and their future. Many others who arrive from outside the Commonwealth would consider their citizen citizenship ceremonies, where they swore allegiance to Her Majesty to be among the most important moments in their lives. 
During the Platinum Jubilee celebrations, we saw a great outpouring of love for Her Late Majesty. In Croydon North, as elsewhere, our diverse communities came together to celebrate a woman who united us as a community and as a country in a way that nothing and no one else could do. Her loss will be felt keenly and it will be felt personally. Three months ago, my father died and the next day a rainbow appeared over his house and we took that as a sign that he was at peace. I take the rainbow that appeared over Windsor Castle in the same way uh, and as a sign that Her Late Majesty has been taken into the arms of God and has found her eternal peace. On behalf of the people of Croydon North, I offer my deepest thanks to Her Late Majesty for a lifetime of service. My condolences to the royal family on their loss and my loyalty to our new King Charles III's as he ascends the throne to meet his destiny and ours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mark Francois. <laughs> Mr Deputy Speaker, we have lost our sovereign, the most remarkable woman, the longest reigning monarch in British history, who in 70 years barely ever put a foot wrong. She was perhaps the most famous person in the world and possibly the most popular too. If the House will indulge me, it's almost a year since we lost our great friend Sir David Amos. I mention him because I think it's fair to say he was rather keen on the monarchy <laughs> <laughs> and on Her Majesty the Queen in particular. I well remember how he was bursting with pride when the Queen knighted him with an investiture at Windsor. He subsequently told our local paper, The Echo, who would ever have thought that a boy from the East End of London would one day be knighted by a queen in a castle. If he were here today, he would pay the most fulsome tribute to Her Majesty. So perhaps I could do that for him in lieu. From my own perspective, I also had the immense privilege of serving Her Majesty as Vice Chamberlain when I served in the Coalition Whips Office from 2010 to 12. It's an ancient office, but it essentially has three modern functions. Firstly, to act as the Queen's messenger to Parliament. And on the first occasion I had an audience with her, I was completely terrified. <laughs> I think it's to the Queen's credit she well understood that people who met her, especially for the first time, were extremely nervous. And she had that most wonderful manner in asking you one or two extremely gentle questions which even a Member of Parliament couldn't get wrong, to settle nerves. It was a wonderful skill with people, which I think was but one of the reasons why her subjects loved her so much. Secondly, each evening when the House was sitting, the vice Chamberlain's duty is to compile the royal message, a one-page summary for Her Majesty of what's taken place in Parliament, printed off on special paper, to be collected by royal courier at 6pm precisely. All went well until one evening, as the message was just about to be printed, there was a complete IT failure in the Whips office, which led to a state of pandemonium. By about 6.30, the Royal Courier, by now drumming his fingers, looked at me and said mischievously, you do realise, sir, that if it's more than an hour late, you'll have to go down there and apologise to her in person. <laughs> at which point my blood ran cold. <laughs> Mercifully, the Lord was kind, and five minutes later, a scream of a... Delight emanated from the Whip's office when Claire, the senior Whip's assistant, emerged with a look of absolute triumph and said simply, we fixed it. And when I wished the courier Godspeed, I meant it. <laughs> Thirdly, following a rather unfortunate misunderstanding with Charles I in the 17th century, on the day of the state opening, the vice chamberlain has to go to the palace to be held hostage as surety for the monarch's <laughs> safe return. When I once asked, what would actually happen if something was went wrong, the courier, sorry, the royal courtier smiled at me and said, oh, they'll probably just cut your head off. <laughs> this was vaguely in the back of my mind on both occasions when I performed the duty. On the first, the Duke was unfortunately unwell, but on the second, he accompanied the Queen as they came down the steps. I was standing there in morning dress with my wand of office, and suddenly he walked up to me and said, who are you? I was stunned, but before I could reply, the Queen said with slight exasperation, he's the hostage. <laughs> <laughs> to which the Duke replied, oh, jolly good. <laughs> they got in the coach and went to Parliament. I was there when they came back, and as they passed me, I bowed my head and said, well done, Your Majesty, when the, the Duke turned on his heel and walked straight up to me and said, I bet you're bloody relieved to see us. <laughs> <laughs> Mr Speaker, on the 21st 
<laughs> Birthday, the Queen famously, or Elizabeth famously proclaimed, my whole life, be it long or short, will be spent in the service of my people. In modern parlance, she then did exactly what it said on the tin, and my constituents in Rayleigh and Wickford and the whole country loved her for it. We have lost our Queen, but her legacy lives on. God save our King. Carol Moynihan. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. On behalf of my constituents of Glasgow North West, the people of Glasgow and my fellow Glasgow MPs, I wish to pay tribute to Elizabeth, Queen of Scots. Her passing is a time of profound sadness. Queen Elizabeth was a constant in our lives, the only head of state we have known. Unlike most of the other speakers this afternoon, I've never met the Queen, although as a young girl, I did go to see her at her Silver Jubilee when she came to Glasgow and was visiting Kelvin Grove Art Gallery. Of course, the crowds are so big I couldn't see her, and my dad put me up on his shoulders and I was able to, to wave at this beautiful big car and the Queen as she came out. And many people in Glasgow have similar memories as this. And it's right that we remember and pay tribute to Her Majesty's tireless work, her dedication to her role, and her strong sense of duty. For members of the armed forces, she was their commander in chief. And my husband's commissioned parchment from Her Majesty hangs proudly in our home. Like many in Glasgow, I have strong Irish connections. And many members this afternoon have spoken of her wit and her ability to view a situation with clarity and wisdom. And I'm reminded of her visit to Dublin in 2011, in 2011, the first by a reigning monarch for a century. The Queen understood that this was a historic event, but also that it required some delicacy. She wished to address the President, Mary McAleese, in Irish, but had been warned against attempting this for fear that she might make a mistake and the gesture be misinterpreted. Undaunted, she began, Auchteron, Agasakorja, President and Friends. Instantly, all tension was lifted. President McAleese mouthed the word, wow, and the audience at Dublin Castle burst into applause. Wisdom, understanding and respect such as this was why she was loved by monarchists and republicans, people of all faiths and those of none. I'd like to finish by extending my sympathy and that of my constituents and the people of Glasgow and indeed our prayers to the entire royal family who will most acutely feel the, this loss of a much-loved mother, grandmother and great-grandmother. May she rest in peace. Yeah. 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 Tracy Crouch. Yeah. Mr Deputy Speaker, I rise humbly and with great sadness to pay tribute to Her Majesty the Queen on behalf of my constituents of Chatham and Out Aylesford. The outpouring of love and respect for her is heartfelt and genuine, demonstrating her reach into the most local of communities across the nation. Given the length of her reign, it is no surprise she has visited my constituency several times, most recently in Aylesford in 2019, but she has an ever-presence in a variety of ways. Before the news broke yesterday afternoon, I was at a Chatham Town Football Club celebrating their receipt of the Queen's Award for Voluntary Service, bestowed upon them for their work in the community in this year's Platinum Jubilee Honours List. Just one of a number of people and organisations who have been honoured for the service they have given. It was Her Majesty's love of sport that I wanted to briefly comment on and by doing so refer the House to my entrance in the Register of Interests. Her love of horse racing is well known. Her first runner was in October 1949 and her first winner three days later, which was in fact her first of more than 1,000 British winners. She would have delighted in every single one, but many will remember her pure thrill when her horse, Estimate, won the Gold Cup in 2013. This joy extended to other sports, and the sports reports of her death carry countless photos of her smiling face 
with sporting superstars and globally recognised and coveted trophies. Tributes to her have flooded in from the world of sport, her value to which should never be underestimated. She was patron to numerous sporting bodies, crucial to the success of London 2012, hosting all the world leaders before the opening ceremony. She's authored countless messages of luck and congratulations and hosted numerous receptions celebrating victorious athletes. But she was also the proud mother and grandmother of Olympians. I have been lucky enough to meet her several times, all of them because of sport, and most involved a conversation about horses. The respect that racing, football and others continue to pay to her is a measure of their appreciation to her and the support she has shown to them. Like many colleagues, I visit primary schools and have been asked the question, have you met the Queen? It is often followed with the question, have you met Harry Kane? Um, <laughs> when I tell my primary school children that I have indeed met the Queen, there is an audible sigh and they are keen to hear more stories about her. I tell them the story that I first met her and my curtsy was <coughs> awful. It was embarrassing. And I get all the children to stand up and practice their curtsy and bows just in case they ever get to meet the sovereign. I stepped to speaker last night as we sat as a family and watched the news break of her death. Tears openly rolled down my cheeks and that of my other half. Our six year old mm. took my hand in his and said, don't worry, mummy. <coughs> The king will look after us now. Oh. He is right. God save the king. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise humbly to pay tribute to Her Majesty the Queen on my, on my own behalf and on behalf of my constituency, Birmingham Perivar. I came to this house in 2001 and I was placed on an esteemed committee of Commons Media and TV Committee. Uh, which was chaired by the on Right Honourable Member for North Thanet, not in this place at the moment. The only privilege I think we had, and only, any, anybody knew us, was that we had got an invite to the Christmas reception uh, at the palace. So as a new member who had just come in, uh, I turned with, uh, to, to the palace along with my colleagues. Uh, and luckily, uh, as, as the Queen was circulating, I was able to meet her first. Uh, and obviously introduced myself, and she was very pleased to do that. But then took it upon myself as the school monitor to be the representative for the whole of the committee uh, and started taking them across to the Queen and introducing her uh, to them. The petulance of that didn't occur to me until I'd come back home and thought about what had happened. But her greatness was that she wasn't irritated by what I'd done. You know, she wasn't annoyed by what I'd done. She must have realized that I must be a newbie uh, in Parliament and just decided to encourage me to go along and never saw a, a harsh expression on her face or anything else. That was the endearing memory that I have when I first came in uh, to this place as a member of Parliament. She was the head of the church. And as a lot of people have said, she supported all of the religions. Yeah. She does that. But she also supported a lot of other beliefs as well, the Maoris, the Aboriginians, and some of the African tribes. But she also, above all, supported people who had no faith at all. She supported people. She had trust in people. She gave her life to service in dignity, in humanity. If anything that we are to do today in paying tribute to her is that we should rise, not just speak about the eloquent speeches that I've heard today, but actually rise our own levels and standards to at least, not if to emulate her, to try to get somewhere close to see how bet much better we in this place can be. Mm -hmm. That, to me, Mr. Deputy Speaker, would be the endearing tribute to her. As I said, she wasn't just the monarch for the United Kingdom, she was also head of the Commonwealth. And in that process, only last week, 
She wrote a letter to the Pakistanis who were suffering huge tragedy, a climate tragedy of floods, and that was given out. And she actually wrote a letter to the, Prime Minister, the President to tell her. My last word is a Muslim prayer, which has already been recited by my friend, uh, honourable friend from Ladywood. Indeed, to God we belong, and to God we shall turn. May she rest in peace. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. If I was asked by primary school children, have you ever met uh, her late master, the Queen, I would sadly have to say no. So there will be no practising of bows and curtsies, as my honourable friend from uh, Chatham um, described. Although perhaps this afternoon I've learnt finally what the attraction of being a government whip is, uh, in, that, in that it seems to be... Well said, well. It seems, not only does it seem to uh, increase the, the likelihood of you being called early in a debate such as this, uh, but you certainly uh, got to spend a great deal of time with Her Late Majesty. Uh, Badgett described our easily understood constitution as the uh, distinction between the dignified and the efficient. Uh, the efficient supposedly uh, is the government, but I will let uh, new ministers uh, discover that in due course. But the dignified is the monarch. And in Her Late Majesty, there can be no greater embodiment of the dignified. Much has been said of anecdotes, but if I could just briefly quote uh, from Her Majesty in her Christmas broadcast of 1974, because what she said then, I think, more than enough sums up where we are today. Here in Britain, she said, we hear a great deal about our troubles, about discord and dissension, and about uncertainty of our future. Perhaps we make too much of what is wrong and too little of what is right. The trouble with gloom is it feeds upon itself mm. and depression causes more depression. There are indeed real dangers and there are real fears and we will never overcome them if we turn against one another with angry accusations. We may hold different points of view but it is in times of stress and difficulty that we most need to remember that we have much more in common than is dividing us. May Her Late Majesty rest in peace. May God console her family in their time of grief. And may he, may God, save the King. Yeah. And that was within, look, two minutes, so it can be done. It can be done. Thank you, Mr. Rag. And David Lamb is going to follow suit, aren't you, David? <laughs> 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 Mr Deputy Speaker, I rise on behalf of the people of Tottenham who mourn the late Her Majesty's loss very, very greatly. Uh, and on reflecting about Her Majesty, I want to begin by evoking my parents' generation who arrived and are described as part of the Windrush generation. My mother was the kind of woman for whom there were only two important people in our house. One was Jesus Christ, and the second was Her Majesty the Queen. And anything to do with the royal family, many will understand this, involved a lot of memorabilia in our West Indian front room. But it's also the grace and the dignity uh, and the strength with which the Queen approached the Commonwealth that I think she should be remembered. Uh, she guided the Commonwealth from a community of countries that had been colonised to a voluntary association of 56 countries. She travelled to 117 countries over the course of those 70 years. Uh, and while she was assiduous uh, in her duties, there was a sense that she knew right from wrong. In 1979, she went to Zambia. Uh, it was controversial uh, at the time, and it heralded the independence of then Rhodesia and what we now know as Zimbabwe. And of course, she was rumoured to be very concerned about the apartheid regime in South Africa, and she had a long-standing uh, friendship with Nelson uh, Mandela. All of that is noted 
in her duty and her commitment to the Commonwealth. But as I said, it's also important to remember her supreme governance of the Church of England. She did this quietly, but right up and down the country, in every constituency, her at the head of that very important uh, English, British institution, Anglican institution, is something that we should hold very, very dear uh, indeed. I have my own small story, uh, if you'll let me, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and that is the Privy Council, of course. It was the most important day of my life. It was on the no November the 5th, 2008. Uh, and on that day, I was very, very sleepy indeed. I was sleepy because my friend, Barack Obama, had become President of the United States the day before. I had not slept when I got to Buckingham Palace at six o'clock in the evening. I knelt on the footstool, my eyes closed, I bowed, and I headed towards the Queen's lap. <laughs> she reached out and put her hand on my bald head. <laughs> She was generous and she was gracious in all of the Privy Council meetings that I attended afterwards, for which I'm grateful. She understood the importance uh, of Barack Obama becoming uh, the 44th President of the United States of America. She carried herself with great dignity. Yesterday, I was at Dumfries House when I heard the news and, and Prince Charles was unable to meet with us. We were there to discuss the Commonwealth. We were there to discuss his commitment <clears throat> to skills and young people. He will be a very, very good king indeed. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much. Yeah. Stephen Hammond. Thank you, Mr Deputy yeah. Speaker. I rise on behalf of the constituency of Wimbledon, New Malden, sorry, M uh, Morden, uh, <laughs> Rains Park, Botsford Park, and I want to stay on behalf of all of my constituents. I wish to pay tribute uh, to our beloved monarch and all that she has done. I also want to express on behalf of them our sincere condolences to King Charles III and the whole of the royal family on the loss that they've suffered. Uh, for many have today spoken of not only their ceremonial but of course their personal loss. Her reign has transcended, as many, people have already, as many colleagues have already said, including my uh, friend from Stockport, times of turbulence and times of gloom. It's transcended the usage, mass usage of automobiles, telephones, jet travel and the digital age. And surely we reflect as we mourn today, it was her steadfast commitment to duty, to loyalty and to our country and to our people that helped us not only overcome and embrace those changes, but shape in a way that we now see is so much for the better this country we live in, modern Britain. Many people as I go around Wimbledon tell me that they are grateful for the visit she made to my constituency. In the Diamond Jubilee year, many, much has been spoken of the fact she is a fan of horse racing. She came to the All England to watch tennis. It's not exactly the Queen's favourite sport. She hadn't been for 25 years before. <laughs> she watched a game. And after she left, I said to one of the members of the committee, well, that went well. He said, well, she was charming, it was wonderful. I said, she even appeared to be interested in tennis. He said to me, well, she did ask to know the result of the 420 from Ascot. <laughs> <laughs> On behalf of all my constituents, my, thought, my heartfelt thoughts uh, and prayers are for our new king. My thanks for the life and reign of his mother, our beloved monarch, Queen Elizabeth. God save the king. Yeah. Carla Lockhart. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I join with members across the House in expressing my deepest sorrow and that of my constituents in Upper Ban on the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. To His Majesty King Charles III, Her Majesty the Queen Consort, and to the entire royal household, our love, thoughts and prayers are with you as you mourn the loss of such a special mother, grandmother and great-grandmother. All of us in this place and right across the country have been a blessed people to live under the second Elizabethan age. We have benefited abundantly 
from her leadership, her wisdom, her discernment, and the grace of one who for over 70 years devoted her life to the unstinting service of this nation and the Commonwealth. When the United Kingdom faced dark moments, her radiance and fortitude shone through, guiding her people to better days. In times of celebration, she led the nation with a sense of fun, warmth of style, and a sparkle in the eye. Prime Ministers were to come and go, but Her Majesty remained constant, steadfast, and sure. And that sense of surety for Her Majesty came from her faith, her love for Christ that she often spoke of in her Christmas message. That faith gave her the strength to fulfil her earthly vocation. And whilst we thank her for her service today, she receives her heavenly reward for service to her King. Mr Deputy Speaker, this country is the poorer for the passing of Queen Elizabeth II. The depth of grief is reflective of the love and affection in which she was hailed. To our adoring, loyal subjects in Northern Ireland, we hold fast to the wonderful memories of Her Majesty's visit. These were often symbolic and a testament to her commitment to a better future for everyone in Northern Ireland. Importantly, she also ensured that those who served her in our most troubled times were sure of her appreciation for service and sacrifice, and those victims of terrorism knew the caring spirit of the Queen. Mr Deputy Speaker, every corner of this Kingdom has now embarked on a new era. We commit to the service of our new King, His Majesty King Charles III. His too a life of service, his too a record of commitment to duty. To close my remarks on Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, I quote a Bible text which is fitting for her life of service to our nation. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I pray that God will grant King Charles III wisdom and good health in his reign over us and that he too will keep the faith as his beloved mum before him. Mm-hmm. God save the King. Yeah. Victoria Prentice. Thank you. Yeah. In her address to the nation during the pandemic, resplendent, you remember, in her NHS scrub coloured dress and brooch, Her Majesty praised, and I quote, the attributes of self discipline, quiet, good humoured resolve, and of fellow feeling which she felt characterised our nation. These are qualities which she modelled for us and for which we loved her. But to these she added a less definable quality, a presence, a splendour, which came from her deep faith and her certainty that the Crown is at the very centre of our Constitution. This, combined with her considerable beauty and charm, meant she lit up every room. I'll never forget the day she came to Banbury in 2008, on the 400th anniversary of the town's charter. Later that day, she opened the Oxford Children's Hospital. My largest donors were corralled for really quite a long time for security reasons before she appeared. The excitement in the room and some very healthy competition meant that that was the most lucrative hour I have ever spent in (laughs) fundraising. It's clear from the speeches today that we saw in the Queen a reflection of our own passions for diplomacy, for charity, for institutions, for the countryside, for racing. We feel that she loved every one of our constituencies. The combination of service and majesty is unbeatable, and this will endure. God save the King. David. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Soon after the, the general election of 2001, there was a reception in Buckingham Palace. I had just been elected, and I attended along with several hundred others. Soon after I arrived at the banqueting hall, it was announced that the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh had arrived, and after her entrance, the Queen moved around the hall, politely speaking, to a number of assembled guests. I was chatting to a Labour colleague 
but when I became acutely aware that there were hundreds of eyes focused in my direction. But was because the Queen had moved to my side and was obviously intent on speaking with me. I introduced myself to her in an uncomfortable way and we exchanged a number of pleasantries. I then expected her to move on, but no, the Queen was obviously intent on having a conversation with me. And what a conversation that was. With me slightly awkwardly uh, talking about the Royal Yacht, and then going on to talk about the Royal Train, and how I recalled to Her Majesty how, as a schoolboy, I was excited to see the Royal Train pass near my home village of Kevin Cribble. The Queen was delighted by these comments, and then realised by this time that I was a thorough South Wilian. The Queen then proceeded to ask me about how Welsh devolution was progressing. <laughs> These were the early, early days of devolution, and I gave a diplomatic answer. <laughs> the Queen was pleased with her answer, but then moved on to ask me how I saw things with regard to the Assembly in Northern Ireland. Given that the Storbont Assembly was at that time suspended, and the situation was extremely delicate, I gave a general response, explaining how difficult things were. I will not say what her responses were, <laughs> but suffice to say I was extremely impressed by her. Her Majesty showed her overwhelming desire to seek peace and reconciliation in Northern Ireland, but more than that, her comments showed an impressive knowledge of complex issues and also a real decency, integrity and compassion. These qualities were in evidence throughout her long reign and were clearly seen in all parts of the United Kingdom. A few years ago, the Queen visited Astrid Manich in my constituency of Caerphilly. The people of the area will always remember her real warmth and genuine interest in them. But my memory of Her Majesty will always be how she had time for the children who met her. The Queen loved those children and the children loved her. Undoubtedly, Queen Elizabeth II was an exceptional monarch. We will miss her enormously. May she rest in peace and God save the King. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Marcus Jones. Thank you, <coughs> Mr Deputy Speaker. I uh, speak for all of my constituents in the Neaton when I speak of our deep sadness at uh, Queen Elizabeth's passing. Uh, and our gratitude for her long and distinguished reign. On behalf of my constituents, I would like to convey our deepest condolences to King Charles III uh, and our late Queen's family. Like a number of Right Honourable Members today, I've had the absolute honour and privilege uh, of being the Vice Chamberlain to the Household uh, and a controller to the household. When I was made uh, Vice Chamberlain, I was dispatched off to the palace uh, with my uh, right honourable friend for Pudsey, who spoke earlier. We did the exchange of wands of office with Her Majesty. Uh, I was as nervous as a kitten, but it went extremely well, and I was very pleased with myself. <laughs> Moments later, I was handed a humble address uh, that I was to ask Her Majesty to sign and then I would bring it back to the House and deliver it in the House as per norm. I went back into the room and handed Her Majesty the humble address. She looked at me and said, I don't have a pen. I'm then searching around inside of my jacket frantically and it seemed like for an age, but it was only a few seconds. Uh, and I said, Mom, I'm afraid I don't have a pen either. Um, she then, quick as a flash, said, don't worry, follow me. And all of a sudden, I'm on this surreal journey, trailing in the wake of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, along this long corridor, stopping on the way to give a bit of a fuss to one of the corgis. <laughs> we then uh, come to the Queen's study, and you could see the volumes of papers, the number of red boxes. This was two weeks before the first lockdown, so you could see the number of things that the Queen at that time was doing on our behalf, the work she was doing. 
She signed the humble address with her own pen. She then started to speak to me and ask me about my wife and my family, and it was fantastic. I came out of that room feeling on top of the world. Now, I feel that whether it probably a president, a prime minister, a school child that the Queen was speaking to on a school visit, or a patient in a hospital or a hospice, all of those people will have gone away with exactly the same feeling. That was one of Her Majesty's abiding qualities amongst many others. Thank you, ma'am, for your dedication and service to our nation. God save the King. Yeah. Alison McGovern. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And on behalf of everybody in the Wirral, particularly in my constituency, I extend our profound condolences to the royal family. We have all lost our Queen. They have lost a beloved family member, and we hold them in our hearts. As my friend, the Right Honourable Member for Wallasey, uh, mentioned earlier, the Queen first visited my constituency in 1957 where she visited the famous Port Sunlight villages and the cottages named the Duke of York Cottages, named after her father. Since then, many in the Wirral have felt strongly about the Queen and have supported all that she has done. And Mr Speaker, I want to talk above all else in favour of the Queen's constancy. The news of the end of Her, Majesty, Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth's reign has felt like the ground we stand on shifting beneath our feet. Yeah. All that we have known is changed. Down the years, our country has been drawn together in celebration and in sorrow by Her Late Majesty, and it simply feels impossible to know how to react without her. She had a peerless understanding of the country that we love, hard won through her life, which saw our country's growth, but also its emergence from the darkness of war. And I reflect on what her generation saw in awe of them. They knew not only the pain of loss, but also the overwhelming de devastation of war. And we've heard so often about that profoundly important visit to Ireland in 2011 and her role as a peace builder. The, the Queen's example to us all is that patient constancy and that that is the best path to change. In her 20s, she said she could not do what the men before her in her role who preceded her could do, but that unlike them, via modern communication, she could broadcast across nations. I think she was a fan of new technology. Whether it was speaking to us all from the dawn of television, or whether it was just recently, again as we've heard, on Zoom, working from home during the pandemic, she was a marvel. And in politics, it seems so often that change comes too slowly, and when it does come, we fall back. So I ask myself, in, with relevance to the Queen's legacy, how is it that our country makes progress? And I think it's not that any individual can make progress by themselves, but rather it's in our institutions, those institutions that persist when individuals fail, that really shifts our country from darkness to the light. That's progress. And it's what Her Late Majesty made with the constitutional role that was hers. She could always see what the future had on offer, and she built a path for us all. It has been utterly humbling to hear from leaders across the world, and I trust that global outpouring brings her family comfort. Our country is not perfect, but in Her Late Majesty's example, we have seen not only the model of service, but also the never-ending hope in our future that sprung eternal on these islands through her reign. Long live the King. Yeah. Thank you, Mr yeah. Speaker. Today marks the end of an era, the modern Elizabethan era, the only monarch that I and almost everyone in this chamber and most of our nation have ever known. I join those who have spoken so movingly from across the House in mourning the death of our longest serving sovereign, Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, and pass on my condolences with those of my constituents from South Shropshire to members of the royal family who grieve her loss. We reflect today with a mixture of great sadness and sense of loss, but also remembering with great joy the inspiration which she gave in devoting her life to the service of others. Her first of 15 prime ministers heralded her accession to the throne as launching a golden age, a signal for a brightening salvation of the human scene. 
and so it proved in so many areas of human endeavour and achievement by her and her subjects over these past 70 years. As others have mentioned, we shall probably all remember where we were when we heard the news of Her Majesty's death yesterday. Although she was 96, this still came as a lightning bolt of shock in the midst of the thunderstorms raging across her kingdom yesterday. I was with members of the Environmental Audit Committee at a half-full reservoir in Cornwall, surrounded by trees. And this seems strangely fitting, as I wish to touch very briefly on the commitment Her Majesty showed to the environment. Through her love of nature and animals that others have mentioned, she and her devoted husband, Prince Philip, the late Duke of Edinburgh, and undoubtedly planted the seed of their family's enthusiasm in championing nature and leading the crusade to combat climate change decades before this became fashionable. Only last November, in her message to international leaders and delegates attending COP26, she said, the time for words has now moved to the time for action. We saw her love of nature whenever she was walking or riding in the countryside around uh, Balmoral or Sandringham. Her love of animals was legendary and one of those characteristics which connected her to her people. In particular, horses, as has been mentioned. It was no accident that the Royal Windsor Horse Show was the event she enjoyed the most each year. And we all knew, even if we couldn't always comprehend, her particular love for corgis. But it was her love of trees that will be a lasting physical legacy. I suspect she planted more trees than anyone else in public life anywhere around the globe. The Platinum Jubilee Queen's Canopy, canopy has seen a million trees planted this year alone in her honour, and this will be a lasting reminder of her for decades, if not hundreds of years, to come. Her only visit to the Ludlow constituency was in the year after her Golden Jubilee, when she came by royal train to Telford and visited Much Wenlock with Prince Philip to take in the Wenlock Olympian Games, an early precursor to her role in London 2012. She then showed that her priorities lay with her people by having lunch in the Discovery Centre in Craven Arms rather than the gourmet delights of Ludlow. She went on to do a walkabout in the Market Square in Ludlow, where thousands turn out to welcome the first visit by a reigning monarch in more than 300 years. Most visits by predecessors before that had been at the head of an army. And while these tributes have been made today to his mother and matriarch to the nation, His Majesty King Charles III has been doing a walkabout among well-wishers outside Buckingham Palace her example of engaging with us all, already being carried on by her successor. God rest Her Majesty. God save the King. My facts. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I want, of course, on behalf of myself and my constituents and the citizens of Sheffield, uh, to pay tribute to the Queen and to associate myself with the wonderful comments that have been made from both sides of the House during this session. But I want to particularly relate to my own personal experience. I've had a chance to meet with uh, the late Queen on a number of occasions as a Member of Parliament, but I want to refer back to the first time I met her, back in May 1991, when I was Leader of the Council in Sheffield and she came to open the Sheffield Arena. Now, to do the opening, we had to build a raised walkway which went into the middle of the arena and I walk, had to walk alongside her down to the microphones. Before doing the walk, royal officials came to me and said, Councillor Betts, uh, there's a rather steep drop on one side of the walkway. Make sure you're on that side of the Queen when you walk along. But before we began the official opening, she had a chat. She talked to myself and others with knowledge and understanding about what was going on in the city, about the loss of jobs in steel and engineering and the effect on people's lives and unemployment. And she showed an empathy for what was happening in our city. And when we walked out to do the opening, we do things properly in Shenfield, so we had a, a trumpet voluntary went off. And the Queen stopped after a little bit and said, um, do you think they've seen us come in? And I said, uh, Your Majesty, they don't normally do trumpet voluntaries for leader of the council. <laughs> uh, 
and then she said, well, do you know what we do next? And I said, well, I'd rather hope you'd done this sort of thing before. <laughs> but she had a laugh. She enjoyed it. She just put me at ease and relaxed. So my very simple memories of the Queen from that occasion on future occasions were someone with a very real understanding of and interest in the issues of concern to her subjects and my constituents. Someone with a personal warmth and a lovely sense of humour who put me at ease with the way they approached this at a time when I was, quite frankly, extremely nervous, but she just took it in her stride. What I would say very simply on behalf of my constituents is thank you to an incredible sovereign for an incredible life of service. God save the King. Yeah. John Lamont. Um, I too want to reflect on the immense loss we have sustained as a United Kingdom and the Commonwealth with the passing of Her late and Majesty the Queen. Like every other member of this House, I can say with pride that the Queen knew my constituency in the Scottish borders well and visited it many times over her seven decades of service as our Sovereign. I treasure my own memories of two of Her Majesty's most recent visits um, to Scotland. In 2009, Her Majesty the Queen came to the seaside town of Eyemouth in Berwickshire, and on the 9th of September 2015, seven years ago to today, Her Majesty the Queen opened the Borders Railway, the day the Queen became the longest-serving monarch in our history. On both of these days, the crowds were large, probably much larger than the organisers had expected. I remember the enormous anticipation steadily building as the time for her arrival approached local residents of all ages and all backgrounds. And the thrill of excitement, like an electric pulse rushing, rushing, running through the crowd when they saw Her Majesty. The joy, the disbelief, all to see a global icon, the face on every coin and stamp, there in the flesh, a smiling and radiant lady, here to visit them in their own community. Those memories will last a lifetime. As a member of the Scottish Parliament for a decade, I had the privilege of meeting Her Late Majesty on, in more informal settings. After each election, the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh would host a reception at the Palace of Holyrood House for the newly elected MSPs. As she moved around the room, the Queen clockwise, the Duke of Edinburgh anti-clockwise, there was a real sense of, of anticipation, the same sense of anticipation we experienced when she visited the borders. It was amusing to see how some of my new MSP colleagues shall we say, some of them might not have been the most instinctive royalists, suddenly <laughs> re were reduced to a bag of nerves. But as the Queen joined our group, we were all immediately put at ease by her twinkly eyes and warmth. Mm. After brief pleasantries, the Queen immediately launched into detailed and informed questions about our respective constituencies. Now, given there were 129 MSPs plus various other guests, how she was ever able to remember such detail and knowledge was quite remarkable. But it was her kingdom, and it had been her kingdom for longer than most of us had been alive. Mm. The Queen was always fully prepared for whatever her duty demanded of her. She never spared herself, as we saw this week, when she fulfilled her last act of service, appointing my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister. In good times and bad, we have always looked to the Queen for guidance and leadership, and were never left wanting. Her life spanned the end of the British Empire and the start of the age of the internet. Few of us can remember a time without the Queen on the throne. Our great nation is feeling a tremendous pain at the loss of our beloved Queen. As we come to terms with that loss, let us give thanks to our good fortune that she reigned over us happily and gloriously for so long. And let us give our sympathy and support to His Majesty to King, to the King. In years to come, those children waving flags in the Scottish borders will tell their grandchildren of the day the Queen came to town. Each of them, each of us here, and all of our constituents will forever be able to say with pride that we are Elizabethans. God save the King. Yeah. As Mr Speaker announced at the beginning of proceedings today, at approximately 6 p.m. the House will be suspended while His Majesty the King makes his broadcast to the nation. Members present will be able to watch that broadcast on screens in the chamber. We will then resume our proceedings to continue tributes. The House 
will now be suspended while the King makes his broadcast to the nation. The House is suspended. Order.
God save the King. God save the King. What a very moving address from our new monarch. And how privileged we are to sit here together in this chamber and witness his ascent to the throne. Let us continue now with tributes. Order. The sitting is resumed. <coughs> the next tribute comes from Rosanna Allen Khan. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I am truly humbled to follow what was, quite frankly, one of the most beautiful outpourings of love I have ever had the pleasure of witnessing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I rise to add my tribute to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II on behalf of the people of Tooting who are united in grief. So many have been in touch with their own memories and stories, yet one word shines through again and again, and that is duty. This sense of duty underpinned everything she did. Some recall her service in the British Army when at a time with invasion imminent she could have fled to Canada. Instead, she stayed in London and put on a khaki uniform and a tin helmet. I remember best 
her service during the pandemic, suffering the grief of the loss of her dear husband, Philip. She cut a lonely figure at his funeral as she observed social distancing. She embodied the pain that so many people were experiencing at the same time, and she led truly by example. She was a shining beacon of light in that dark moment and never once deviated from her duty. It is almost 20 years since Her Majesty visited St George's University in Tooting to see the work of aspiring doctors, nurses and meeting NHS staff. And I often see the plaque she unveiled of two hands clasped in friendship and mutual support when I'm there. We all need to hold each other's hands a little tighter and to hug our loved ones a little closer. I'm reminded very deeply of the story told by trauma surgeon David Knott after his return from the horrors of fleeing war-torn Aleppo. Meeting the Queen, the doctor was deeply distressed and could not face making polite conversation over lunch about his work. Sensing this in that special way that she did, the Queen touched his hand and brought forth a silver barrel of biscuits. These are for the dogs, she told him. And they proceeded to spend the lunch feeding the corgis under the table. There, she said. That's so much better than talking, isn't it? <laughs> such intuition, such emotional intelligence, such kindness. I mentioned Her Majesty's role in the war. As a young princess, during the darkest hours of World War II, she gave a BBC radio broadcast and said, when the peace comes, it will be for us all. The children of today, to make the world of tomorrow a better place. And she did. She made our world a better place. She showed strength as a woman and the strength to shape modern Britain. So let us commit to carry on that spirit of service and above all, duty. Duty to our constituents, duty to our country, and to making the world a better place. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Andrew Salou. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. And uh, tonight, the good people of Bedfordshire are grieving so deeply because they loved their Queen so dearly. And some of them, like me, were hugely privileged to be with Her Majesty and the Duke of Edinburgh when she visited the, the Elephant Care Centre at Whipsnade Zoo in April 2017. Her Majesty had a deep uh, interest in uh, wildlife and uh, she fed some of the baby elephants bananas and uh, that was something they were very pleased about. And afterwards she visited the, the Independent Living uh, Centre in Dunstable, opened by Central Bedfordshire Council. And she had a deep interest in passion in how older people were looked after and that they shouldn't be isolated and lonely uh, in their later years. As many of us have said this afternoon, she was our rock. But I want to look at, in my brief contribution, who was her rock. And I would commend to uh, all honourable members here the book that was uh, published in honour of her 90th birthday, uh, The Servant Queen and the King She Serves. It's published by the Bible Society, and the, the clue is rather in the name of the book. She lived out her faith, and she did so with humility and with grace and with kindness. But she also wasn't afraid to speak about it either, as she did in her Christmas broadcast in 2002, when she said as follows, I know just how much I rely on my faith to guide me through the good times and the bad. Each day is a new beginning. I know that the only way to live my life is to do what is right, to take the long view, to give of my best in all that the day brings, and to put my trust in God. I draw strength from the message of hope in the Christian gospel. And it was her faith that enabled her to take the long view. And as the daughter and uh, wife of a naval officer, she had the attitude that this storm too shall pass when she was facing current difficulties, which can seem to overwhelm us sometimes, she took the long view. And it was her faith that enabled her to face her end calmly, because she knew that thinking death is the end is the great lie of the evil one. So may she rest in peace 
and rise in glory. And I look forward to the reign of His Majesty King Charles III, who cares passionately for the well-being of all peoples across these islands and who has been way ahead of his time on issues like climate change and the environment. God save the King. Yeah. 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 Colleen Fletcher. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Can I rise to pay tribute to Her Late Majesty the Queen Elizabeth II on behalf of myself and the people in my constituency in Coventry? For all of us, individually and collectively, this is a moment of great sorrow and profound national sadness as we mourn the loss of Queen Elizabeth II, our longest reigning and most remarkable monarch who always displayed an unwavering commitment and steadfast devotion to our nation and the Commonwealth. For over seven decades, the Queen has been a symbol of stability and continuity, an ever-present part of the fabric of national life. For so many of us, me included, she was the only monarch we have ever known and was a constant presence throughout our lifetime. Indeed, as our society, our country, and the wider world has changed beyond all recognition around us, she was a reassuring presence of solidity and constancy. Throughout her reign, the Queen certainly made her mark on the city of Coventry. She first visited Coventry in 1948 to inaugurate the new city centre and lay the foundation stone of the new shopping precinct as the city recovered from the devastation of war and the blitz on Coventry. Thereafter, she visited Coventry on several other occasions, most notably for the consecration of the new cathedral in 1962. I remember that very well as a child. We all went along from school. The opening of the newly refurbished Walsgrave Hospital in 1970, and latterly for the home front exhibition at the Herbert Art Gallery and Museum in the year 2000. It was on this occasion that I met the Queen. I was a councillor in Coventry and took along my elderly mother-in-law, Val, to meet her too. Even though Val was extremely nervous, she was able to chat to the Queen about life in Coventry during the war. Val never forgot that day for the rest of her life and spoke about it often. And watching Val, I strongly sensed people's allegiance and love for the Queen and her family. So during those visits and the many others the Queen made to the city, she left a lasting legacy in the city of Coventry and enduring memories for its residents who I know will feel an overwhelming sense of loss following her passing. Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II was a devoted wife, mother, grandmother and great-grandmother and a much-cherished monarch. Her life was one of extraordinary dedication and service and her loss will be felt in every corner of our nation and right across the world. Rest in peace, Your Majesty. Yeah. Vicky Ford. Madam Deputy Speaker, I remember as a child being given a large pair of scissors, a huge stack of well thumbed magazines, and being asked to make a massive collage of pictures of the Queen and her family. It was the Silver Jubilee, and there didn't seem to be any arrangement for a party, so my mother had decided to fling open the doors and hold a fate. We wrapped up presents to put in a lucky dip. I think we even arranged to have a candy floss machine and somebody bought some ponies for pony rice. But we didn't know if people would come. And I wanted to tell this story because this was in Oma, in Northern Ireland, in 1977, in the middle of the Troubles. And the people came. And they came in their hundreds. They came from all walks of life, the Protestants came, the Catholics came, and they came because they loved our Queen. And people love our Queen. She has been the rock beneath our feet in Trouble's time and the light that has shown us the way in the darkness. They love her in Chelmsford, they love her across the country, and they love her across the world. During my political career, I've had the opportunity to travel to many countries, and especially so in the past year. 
and I have felt that love and fondness again and again. But it is in particularly in many developing countries where I have felt the love and respect and gratitude. Because at every Christmas message, in so many of those visits and events, she has used her voice to speak out for the most vulnerable and make sure their voices are heard. And as the development minister that she appointed earlier this week, it is that legacy that I pledge to continue for her. Yeah. But I also know how much love and respect there is for our new monarch, King Charles III, especially for his work on the environment and climate change. My condolences, my thoughts, my prayers are with him and with his family. And I look forward to his reign. God save the King. Yeah. Jess Phillips. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, very much like the Prime Minister, I was not raised in a house of monarchists. Um, and yesterday, when the first news came of the Queen's ill health, I was on um, Bill Committee in the Security Bill. And I, I was surprised by how deeply affected I felt by the news. Yeah. I um, was uh, extremely emotional immediately, and it felt to me like that phone call that almost everybody who has lost somebody close to them gets yeah. that says get here soon now's the time yeah. and that's what it felt like and I it made me reflect why do I feel like this and it was because it feels as if the Queen was a member of every one of our families yeah. even a family like mine <laughs> um, <laughs> She, it, we can project our own life, no matter how different that life is to the one that the Queen had, we all feel able to project our own life. Her universal experience feels like ours, and she feels like she is with us all. And that made me reflect on all the stories that we've, I'm sure we've all been reading. And there is a story about the Queen's grace for everybody. <coughs> And anyone, no matter what your political persuasion, your religion, whatever you, floats your boat, you can find something, a story going around at the moment about the Queen that leads to your bias. Um, and uh, she was that, like yeah, that. she was clever like that. That's a credible <laughs> skill um, and shows what an icon and a diplomat she was. You can see her as a traditionalist. You can see her as a modernist. You can see her as um, uh, somebody with deep faith. You can see her as somebody who represented well people without a faith. Uh, but what I have found is that the Queen was a feminist. <laughs> um, and this is uh, the, the brilliant story about the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia being driven around very, very quite roughly by the Queen uh, around the Balmoral Estate when um, women in Saudi Arabia were not allowed to drive is one of my top stories. But uh, I saw this story and it said, when the Queen came to open the Rolls building, she was ushered into a room in which we were waiting, uh, in which waiting were all the judges. She looked at the ermine-clad ranks of chancery judges, smiled and crisply said, where are the women? <laughs> a look of panic crossed multiple faces until someone saw three fe female Chancery District judges in a dark corner. There they are, he shouted. So the Queen went to talk to them. <laughs> what a woman. What a leader. That everybody, no matter what sort of family they grew up in, no matter which bit of the world, everybody feels that they have a tiny little bit of her with us. God rest the Queen. Yeah. Alberta Costa. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. In April 2017, as MP for South Leicestershire, I had the honour of meeting Her Late Majesty the Queen and His Late Highness Prince Philip when the Queen hosted lunch for a small gathering at St Martin's House in Leicester following the Royal Monday Service in Leicester Cathedral. 
Along with the Prince, she was extremely gracious, listening with interest to the issues affecting Leicester and Leicestershire, and thanking those within our local community who do so much in the many charities in our area. It was a moment of great joy to have personally witnessed the late Queen at work. By placing duty at the forefront of everything she did, she was a role model of how public service should be conducted. Madam Deputy Speaker, on behalf of the Chairman and Councillors of the Town and Parish Councils of South Leicestershire, the Chairman of Harbour District Council, Councillor Neil Bannister and his fellow Harbour Councillors, the Chairman of Blaby District Councillor, Councillor Ian Hewson, the Leicestershire County Councillors of my constituency. On behalf of all my constituents and of my family, my wife Maria, daughter Sophie and son Alexander, as the Member of Parliament for South Leicestershire, I want to give thanks for the seven decades of public service given by our late Queen and may I express my sincere condolences to His Majesty the King and the Royal Family. God save the King. Yeah. Liz Kendall. Yeah. On behalf of the people of Leicester West, I would like to send our deepest sympathy and condolences to His Majesty the King and the Royal Family. They have lost their mother, grandmother and great-grandmother as well as their sovereign. And I hope the fact the whole nation grieves alongside them provides some small comfort at this difficult time. Queen Elizabeth was a simply remarkable public servant, unparalleled in our lifetime, who always put her people and country first. She dedicated her life to duty and to others. It was never, ever, about herself. Yeah. And I think it is this selfless service why she holds such a unique place in our history and hearts and what she'll be remembered for most of all. Her astonishing reign saw changes unimaginable 70 years ago. Her constant calm presence gave us stability through turbulent times and her words of wisdom provided perspective and strengthened our resolve. I think in particular of her address to the nation during the COVID pandemic. Yes. The Queen reminded us how families had been separated during the Second World War, that this was painful, but the right thing to do. And she also rightly said, this challenge was different from the war, because in this instance, we would join with nations across the globe in a common endeavour to beat the virus. There is nothing more powerful than hope for a better future and that better days lie ahead. And that is what the Queen gave us so many times. Finally, many honourable members will know that I represent a very diverse constituency. And as my honourable friend, the member for Leicester South said, we were absolutely thrilled when the Queen decided to begin her Diamond Jubilee tour in Leicester 10 years ago. Her Majesty's loss will be felt in every community and by those of every faith, as well as those with none. Christian, Hindu, Sikh, Muslim, Jewish and Jain, the Queen stood for the values we all share, for what we hold in common, not what divides us. As does His Majesty the King. I saw this when he visited the Narborough Road in my constituency, often called the most diverse street in the country, mm -hmm with more than 20 different nationalities along the way. It was a huge day, and he was welcomed with excitement, joy, and open arms, as I'm sure he will be as our new king. It just remains for me to send my constituents' thoughts and prayers to the royal family. Our thanks to the late queen for all she gave, and to say on behalf of us all, long live King Charles III. Yeah. Helen Wakeley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. On behalf of my constituents of Faversham and Mid Kent, I will echo the moving words we just heard from King Charles III. Your late Majesty the Queen, thank you. May you rest in peace. 
a rest truly earned through a lifetime of service. Most of us across our country cannot remember a time before Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. She has been a constant in a changing and often dangerous world, a source of strength and steadfastness. A leader by example with the courage to carry on whatever the storm. And she showed us that strength and courage need not be at the expense of kindness or indeed humour. And she touched the lives of so many people in the UK and around the world, old and young alike. I am sure we have all been asked when visiting primary schools, have you met the Queen? In fact, more often than we're asked, have you met the Prime Minister? <laughs> Sadly, my answer to the first of those questions has always been no. But I do have something that I'm very personally grateful to her for. During the pandemic, Her Majesty the Queen addressed the nation. It was a dark time and I remember her address very well, not only for the compassion and hope she expressed, but for one particular detail. As care minister, I was endeavouring to get social care staff thought of and talked about on a par with staff in the NHS. When I heard the Queen was going to make an address, I sought to get a message to her. I don't know to this day if it reached her, but what mattered is when she got to that section of her address, when she spoke of healthcare staff, she spoke of health and social care staff in the same breath. And she realised how important her words would be to those care workers across the country. And that brought tears to my eyes. Mm. After the bleak time of the pandemic, she then brought our communities together for her jubilee, a joyful celebration of what we have in common. As a nation, we mourn her, but her family are first and foremost in my thoughts as they mourn a mother, a grandmother, and a great-grandmother. I wish them strength and solace in a life so long and well-lived. And our thoughts are with our new king. We know he will serve with passion and dedication, and on behalf of my constituents, I wish him strength and good fortune as he takes on the responsibilities of our head of state. Long live the king. Barry Gardner. This morning I was walking to the station at Wembley Central and an Afghan lady stopped me. Her English was, um, well, let's just say it wasn't much better than my Pashtun. Um, but through her accent, I heard her say, you are MP, yes? I said I was and asked if I could help her in any way. She shook her head and left me confused because I thought I heard her say, I at Green Party. Sorry. Then she moved on. It took me a few moments to work out what she was actually saying. She wasn't making a statement about her political affiliation, but saying that she had been at the Queen's Party, one of the glorious street parties we held in Brent for the Platinum Jubilee. And in that simple word, sorry, she wanted to express her condolences and share her own sorrow at the death of Her Late Majesty the Queen. In Brent, we like to claim that we're the most diverse place in the world. It may even be true. We speak more than 160 languages around the dinner tables. We've welcomed generations of immigrants, people who came to build a better life for their children, asylum seekers like that lady from Afghanistan. She spoke for every one of my constituents in Brent when she said, I at Queen's party. Sorry. Every year for more than 40 years, my family has had a ritual. No matter whether the turkey is ready or not, Christmas dinner has to be finished in time to watch the Queen's speech at three. I hope it doesn't seem disrespectful, but we used to grade them. Was it as good as last year's? Would she focus on something new this time? There would be mentions of charities and visits to communities celebrating significant anniversaries or suffering from disasters. But two things were constant. The Commonwealth 
and her own deep, very personal faith in Jesus Christ, which was the guiding principle of her life. Many have spoken of her life as a pattern of duty and service, and it was. But the virtues which, in my view, her life so manifestly displayed are what Christians call the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, temperance. And as St Paul says, against such there is no law. Integrity is not a very fashionable thing in public sphere these days, but her life was one of real integrity. We thank God that she brought all those virtues together in her life. It was a life that was selfless, it was a life that was whole, and now it is complete. May her soul rest in peace, and may God save the King. Amen. Amen. James Cartledge. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And it is an honour to be called to speak on this sombre day. Um, and on behalf of the people of South Suffolk, I send my condolences to the royal family uh, and His Majesty King Charles III. Now, like our previous Prime Minister, I want to start by making a confession because I've never had the great honour to meet the Queen in the true sense, um, but I did work for her once because in my student days, my student holidays, I was a kitchen porter for Gardner Merchant. And one Christmas uh, in the early 1990s, I was recruited to do a 19-hour shift at Buckingham Palace for the Queen's staff Christmas party. <laughs> it did not end well. Because in the early hours, luckily no one else around, concluding the tidying up, I managed to upend an entire bottle of red wine over one of the Queen's presumably very expensive carpets. <laughs> now what does one do in this situation? Total panic sets in. Fear of being sent to the Tower of London. <laughs> so I did the only thing you can do in that situation. A few metres away was a very large Ming vase, and I simply relocated it. <laughs> for, all, for all I know, because I've heard nothing since, it's still there. <laughs> Sorry, Mum. So I pledge uh, my loyalty to His Majesty and I hope that uh, he is merciful and resists the temptation to put an invoice for cleaning costs <laughs> in the post. And I just want to say one thing above all else, which is to express the great privilege that I feel to have lived in the reign of Queen Elizabeth II. The great fortune I feel that my four children lived as Elizabethans and knew what it was like to live under this extraordinary sovereign, deservedly loved and adored the world over, for her total devotion to our nation and our commonwealth. May she rest in peace, supported in her sleep by our eternal love and affection. God save the King. Yeah. 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 Leila Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And it is a true honour <clears throat> to be able to pay tribute to the late Queen Elizabeth II on behalf of my constituents in Oxford West and Abingdon. And I restate the deep sorrow and sadness that many have already expressed. The ties between the Queen and the community were strong indeed. In every milestone of her reign, Abingdon celebrated with an eccentric and much-loved bun throwing. And she was a regular visitor to our area. She inspected a military parade at RAF Abingdon in 1968. She opened Sophos at Abingdon Science Park in 2000 and for and reopened the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford after its refurbishment in 2009. One constituent remembered the following when he attended the official opening of the jet fusion facility at Cullum. He said, it was opened jointly by the Queen and President Mitterrand. And as I recall, the Queen spoke first, first in English <coughs> and then in very polished French, a wonderful way to open a European project. Another constituent remembered, we were privileged to meet the Queen in Malaysia when we lived there. I took my six-year-old daughter, who was so excited to meet the real Queen and held a bouquet for her. And when the Queen approached, 
My daughter, reluctant to release the flowers, asked, Are you sure you're the real queen? You're not wearing a crown, only a hat. And the queen replied, I am sorry. The queen was a little heavy to wear today, but I hope you like my hat. And my daughter, now convinced, released the flowers. I will always remember her warmth and humour while handling my daughter's mistake. And what these stories, I think, show is not just her gargantuan work ethic, but also how her humility and humanity earned people's loyalty. I'm really struck by how many people have been saying, I'm not a monarchist, but I loved her. The fact that she held people's respect despite, not because of her title, is testament to the genius that she brought to the role and is an example to us all. Now, I'm sure many haven't got their heads around what life is going to be like without her. And people have mentioned stamps and coins. For me, as a Brit who grew up abroad, actually, it's the portraits. When we lived in Ethiopia in the 80s, we'd gather as a community at the British Club or at the embassy, and there she was, glorious in oils, gazing down on our festivities from some ornate framed picture. And in Jamaica in the 90s, I remember visiting other schools as part of an orchestra, practicing both the British and Jamaican national anthems in preparation for her state visit, where, of course, she too was head of state. And there she was again, on the walls, the pictures smaller often and more humble, but always there. Through time and space, she was always there, taken almost for granted, binding her people together. Until yesterday, when she wasn't anymore. And like many others, I'm sure, I cried. So my thoughts today are firmly with her family, and especially King Charles, at this incredibly difficult time. Now our loyalty transfers to him, and after his pitch-perfect address just this afternoon, yeah. I think that shows we have absolutely nothing to fear. So may our beloved Queen rest in peace, and God save the King. Yeah. Here, here. George Freeman. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. On behalf of the people of Mid-Norfolk, I want to send our deepest condolences to all the Royal Family, Her Late Majesty's many friends and the Royal Household, and echo the comments of the previous speaker and pay tribute to the King's spine-tingling tribute to his mother we heard a little earlier. Uh, this news has stopped the country in its tracks. All of us, as many colleagues have said, whether we were lucky enough to have met Her Majesty or not, feel that we've lost our own much-loved grandmother, but also something very precious, a part of us, a part of our nation. We stop the clocks and the political debates out of profound respect for our longer-serving monarch, who, as head of state on the throne, has guided our nation through the most extraordinary 70 years, celebrated in the Jubilee so sincerely by a grateful nation earlier this year, and how wonderful that she had a chance to see that gratitude. But our nation also mourns a remarkable woman who has become, quite simply, as my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, put it, this nation's rock. As the mother, grandmother, great-grandmother and figurehead, not just of the royal family, but to all her subjects, regardless of faith, race or any other creed, across this great nation, through tumultuous times, she has been a shining beacon of dedication to duty, office, public service and nationhood the exemplary spirit and embodiment of the very best of the United Kingdom, a unifying sea anchor stabilising our ship of state in often turbulent seas, always cheered, as today, by massed crowds wherever she travelled, nowhere more, may I say, than in her beloved county, royal county of Norfolk, where, through her home at Sandringham, she and her family have always been held proudly in very close affection and esteem not least by the many serving and former members of the armed forces in our county and country, and which it's been the privilege of my life to represent in her parliaments and serve as a Minister of the Crown under her last three Prime Ministers. Who among us will forget the wry smile with which, uh, in 2012, she remarked at her Golden Jubilee address 
to, you will remember, both houses assembled in Westminster Hall and to a wry chuckle uh, addressed as, uh, addressing as she was six former Prime Ministers on the front row when she said she'd had the privilege of having been served by 12 Prime Ministers and doubtless, she said over the top of her glasses, there will be many more to come. Perhaps she could see the next decade coming. <laughs> the many eloquent tributes, in particular from my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, Member for Uxbridge, Maidenhead, Rhonda and Peckham, have highlighted the many virtues and legacies of our dear late Queen Elizabeth, indeed the Great. I won't repeat them. I wanted to highlight three very particular legacies close to my and my constituents' hearts. The first, children. The Queen understood and believed deeply that all of us in public office have a special duty to the children who are our future. They can't vote or make their case in this chamber. They need us to speak for them. And as she famously said, Til children teach us all a lesson, just as the Christmas story does, that in the birth of a child there is a new dawn with endless potential. And her duty in the cause of children around this country is legendary. Secondly, horses and hounds on the countryside. As a countryman and MP for a rural constituency, I want to thank Her Majesty also her son and her grandsons, for always championing our rural heritage and way of life. From her love of the wilds of her native Scotland to the high seas, the skies of Norfolk, and her time especially with her beloved horses and hounds, she was indeed the monarch of the Glen, and may I say the Fens. And if the House will indulge me a personal note, it's a great personal of mine that her love of racing and deep expertise in thoroughbred racing, my late father had the great honour of being the retained royal jockey to her late mother, uh, over fences in the 50s. And finally, the unsung heroes of voluntary service. Her late Majesty's commitment to the unsung heroes of this country, the charity workers, the community helpers, those selfless servants, embodied the spirit of selfless public service that she always did. Let us take this moment to renew our commitment to them, but let us also renew our commitment to strive to renew fragile public trust in our democracy. Her Majesty the Queen took on the monarchy in the wake of the abdication crisis and the world war it's a remarkable and unprecedented legacy that after 70 years she leaves the monarchy stronger than she found it and stronger perhaps than it's ever been. God bless your majesty. May she rest in eternal, in eternal peace and may God save the king. Yeah. Rebecca Long Bailey. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. On behalf of my constituents in Salford and Eccles, it's an honour to pay tribute to Her Late Majesty the Queen Elizabeth II and to send our heartfelt condolences love and prayers to her family, the royal household, all who loved her and the nation at this sad time. It's undeniable that she served us with unrelenting duty, dignity and kindness. Her dedication to uniting us all was a beacon of goodness through her long reign and she never failed to lift us up through the hard times and through the good times. We've heard tonight that on her 21st birthday as a princess, she said, I declare before you that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service. And she never broke that promise, keeping her pledge with love and warmth for over 75 years. She really was a shining example of the best of us. May she now rest in peace and may we extend our love and support to His Majesty the King as he assumes his new office at what can only be a period of profound pain. God save the King. Yeah. I have to say, the reason for my hesitation is that there are several people who I had intended to call and I find that they're not present, which is most unfortunate for them. Uh, most unfortunate for them. There are four people. I will tell them later who they are. So instead, we'll go to Hugh Merriman. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I rise at this sombre time to represent my constituents in East Sussex to send our condolences to the Royal Family for their deep loss of Her Late Majesty the Queen. East Sussex was a county that Her Majesty visited many times. She helped to commemorate the 900th year of the Norman invasion, visiting Pevensey Bay, where William the Conqueror first landed, and then going to Battle Town, where the Battle of Hastings took place. For many, we are not just mourning a glorious reign of public service for the last 70 years. We are also mourning the loss of the one constant to have glued together our past and the present. 
This encapsulates the service of Her Late Majesty. She represented the historic traditions of the past, but she also sought to champion and support the ideas of the future yeah. and the generations to come. And perhaps I can use Her Late Majesty's link to transport in this regard. There are many modes to which she is, to which she would be remembered in land, air and sea, but I would like to go to the London Underground. As a 13-year-old in 1939, then Princess Elizabeth joined her sister Princess Margaret for her first trip on the London Underground. According to the network staff magazine Penny Fair, they reported both princesses were greatly interested in the escalators automatic ticket machines and automatic doors. Despite their status, the princesses sat in the third-class smoking carriage of the district line train. A further trip 30 years later on the underground was to mark the opening of the Victoria Line. There she operated the controls in the cab of the first train on that line, going from Green Park to Oxford Circus. It being the first tube line to be automatically operated the Queen could be said to be its very first driver. The late Queen took the controls at the front of the train on both the opening of the Piccadilly Line extension and the Docklands Light Railway. And only this year we remember her with those amazing photos as she was operating an Oyster card at the opening of the Elizabeth Line. She truly was an innovator and always interested in innovation. Many in this chamber and across the nation and the Commonwealth would not met, have met the late Majesty. That matters not. What matters is that we all remember and keep a part of us, celebrating her duty to public service, her graciousness, her kindness, her devotion. And we don't just keep that with us. Every day we demonstrate it and we become better in her memory. May Her Late Majesty rest in peace. God save the King. Yeah. Judith Cullens. Yeah. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, I rise to speak with great sadness to pay tribute to Her Late Majesty the Queen on behalf of myself and my constituents of Bradford South. As our Head of State for 70 years, our longest serving monarch, with an unrivalled sense of duty in serving her people, and it is that great sense of dedication and devoted duty to her people for which she is loved, cherished and remembered. Her late Majesty had a role in so many events that defined our lives, both as head of state and also as a symbol of the values that we hold so dear as a nation. Her late Majesty was more than our Queen. She was part of our everyday lives, visiting cities and towns across Britain, the Commonwealth and the world, including her five visits to Bradford. She was woven into the very fabric of our society. In my constituency, the Queen will be remembered for representing the very best of Britain. She provided the glue that held the nation together through these difficult times, providing continuity and certainty to the nation, often through turbulent and changing times. A Queen for all people, regardless of faith or culture. The grandmother of a nation, a loving mother, grandmother and great-grandmother. A family and a nation mourns the passing of a much loved, admired and dedicated public servant who was our Queen. May she rest in peace. God save the King. God save the King. Damien Hines. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. And on behalf of my constituents in East Hampshire, I want to convey our sincere sympathies to the Royal Family and express our heartfelt thanks for the life of Her Late Majesty. My own first consciousness of the Queen, like many others who have spoken of roughly my age, was 1977. Although, unlike others who have spoken, I wasn't actually in the same place as the Queen at the time. My consciousness was just through the street parties, the bunting, the mug, which, by the way, I still have, and those little, if you remember them, the little round badges we got to sew onto our, to our cub uniform. I didn't yet quite know how, but for the first time I got that sense that as Britons we are especially blessed. I could not have known possibly that decades later I would have that rare uh, opportunity, as others have mentioned, to meet, uh, to meet the Queen. 
and it was the honour of my life to be admitted to the Privy Council, but most especially to be able to attend one of those lunches at Windsor Castle, which have come up a few times and have the opportunity to talk directly with our monarch about the subject which I was representing, which was education. And I have to say, it was remarkable the level not only of knowledge that she had about current issues, but also her level of interest to discuss it further. Now, speaking of education, I find when I visit primary schools in East Hampshire, actually there are three questions that are guaranteed from the kids. The first is, what is your favourite colour? Uh, the second is, what's the Prime Minister like? And of course, the third is, have you met the Queen? I love that opportunity because I think it's wonderful to talk to those children, the next generation, about her values. And I always come away uh, taking a lot from it too. We've heard some, some wonderful tributes today, some beautiful tributes actually, to Her Late Majesty. But I, I think probably the, the biggest tribute of all that, that any of us could make, and I think particularly for us in this place, is to seek to learn from uh, and to emulate her her example, her selflessness, her steadfastness, her commitment, above all, to service, her readiness to forgive, her appreciation of every individual that she met, her valuing of custom and tradition, but equally her adaptability and openness to change. Madam Deputy Speaker, our constitutional monarchy is unique and special. And I found myself last night trying to explain to my own children exactly why and how. This family that, through no choice of their own, carry a great burden in the unity of nationhood and a much, much wider uh, world role. And of course, with her passing, that role carries on, the crown endures. So we mourn our beloved Queen Elizabeth and we celebrate too her life of service. Eternal rest, Grant unto her, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon her. And may the Lord bless and guide our sovereign, King Charles. God save the King. Long may he reign. Yeah. Yeah. Alan Dorrance. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It is a privilege for me to have the opportunity to be able to express my sincere personal sympathies and condolences and those of my constituents in Ayr, Carrick and Cumnock on the death of Her Majesty the Queen. The late Queen will be remembered with great affection, especially for her service, duty, humility, humour and faith. Our thoughts and prayers are with King Charles III, the Queen Consort and the wider royal family at this sad time. Madam Deputy Speaker, I met the late Queen in 1973, when as a 17-year-old police cadet in the Metropolitan Police, when along with others, I was invited to attend a royal garden party in the grounds of Buckingham Palace. Her Majesty chose to speak with me, probably because I was in uniform, as we all know how much she valued her uniform services. Her royal presence, her smile and gentleness left a lasting impression on me. A few years later, when I was attested as a police constable, I took an oath of allegiance, which contained the words, I will well and truly serve the Queen <coughs> in the office of constable with fairness, integrity, diligence and impartiality, upholding fundamental human rights and according equal respect to all people. Madam Deputy Speaker, those words for me encapsulate many of the values and virtues and leadership qualities so clearly displayed by the Queen throughout her long and illustrious reign. The oath also greatly influenced my service as a police officer and I'm sure many other generations of police officers in the feeling that every action I took, I was somehow acting personally on behalf of the Queen for, for the betterment and benefit of our country. I am sure that everyone who has ever served as a member of our armed services will also be able to relate very closely to that sentiment, and will, as will anyone who has proudly served in any capacity in the name of the Queen and all that she stood for. Madam Deputy Speaker, it is with both sadness and joy that we celebrate the unparalleled contribution the Queen made in her 70 years as Sovereign and recognise her devotion to duty 
and the decades of public service she gave to the people of the United Kingdom, the Commonwealth and the world. Madam Deputy Speaker, there is a distinct and profound sense of loss on the death of the Queen throughout Scotland, to where she is bound by close ties of ancestry, affection and duty. Her Majesty is descended from the Royal House of Stuart on both sides of her family, and she has always held a very special place in the hearts of the people of Scotland. And I know Her Majesty also held a similar affection for Scotland, its culture and its people. Madam Deputy Speaker, the next three weeks are a time for reflection and remembrance, and to give thanks to God for the life of an extraordinary individual, the like of whom we will never see again. Thank you, Your Majesty, for your life and service. God bless you, and may you rest in eternal peace. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Richard Drax. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I stand here most humbly at the heart of our democracy to represent my loyal constituency of South Dorset and family and friends who don't have a chance such as this to say farewell. And thank you to the Queen for more than 70 years of service. The rich contributions in the House today just show how she has touched every single one of our lives. It's absolutely extraordinary. And if I may end the story about David Knott, mentioned by the Honourable Member for Tooting and her touching speech, what she didn't say was, because I know David very well, the Queen rang him four months later and said, because of the difficulty we had last time, do come back and have lunch again. And he did. That is the lady we are talking about. One such friend is Admiral Woodard, the last Admiral to serve in the Royal Yacht and who knew the Queen extremely well. Sadly, he lies very ill in hospital, but I know that both he and his devoted wife, Rosie, want me to tell you just what a kind, remarkable and dutiful woman the Queen was and how she will be sorely missed. None of us will forget what happens at momentous events where we are. I was returning from Birmingham from a meeting with the Defence Committee where we went to go and see Boeing. I felt like everyone in this House and all the eloquent and excellent speeches I've heard and millions across the world, an overwhelming feeling of loss. It was personal. We've heard that so many times tonight and shockingly real. I was fortunate enough to have the honour to serve the Queen for nine years in the Army, meeting her twice participating in her unique birthday parade on two occasions. There was not a guardsman that would not have followed the Queen to hell and back had she ordered it. Such was the affection they had for her. And on that note, allow me to tell you a very short story. As I returned to Wellington Barracks one morning, I looked into the company office and the company clerk was sitting behind his um, typewriter. He was covered in bruises. It looked as if he'd run into a brick wall at 90 miles an hour. I said to him, what on earth happened to you? In a deadpan voice, the clerk explained he'd taken his wife out to the pub when three troublemakers entered. During the evening, these troublemakers picked a fight with the couple and began to insult his wife. I intervened and I said, I quite understand. I can understand. I see what happened. He said, no, no, sir, you don't understand. My wife and I could take that. But when they began to insult the Queen, that's when I got stuck in. <laughs> <laughs> I gave him the day off. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it was not just the military who adored Her Majesty. The outpouring of grief from every corner of the world is testament to the level of respect and affection Her Majesty was held in. The Queen has been an integral part of my life and all our lives for so long she has been the linchpin of our country, and her devotion to duty and country has been so extraordinary that I suspect many of us have taken her for granted. And like so many things we take for granted, it's not until we lose them that we fully, fully appreciate their value. And as I drove up today in the car, I couldn't help thinking that her party reminds us all to hold dear to those we love and to keep saying, we love them. So on behalf of my constituents, my family, my friends, rest in peace, Your Majesty. God save the King. Sarah Jones. Thank you.
Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I rise on behalf of my constituents of Croydon Central to offer our condolences to the family of the late Queen Elizabeth and to offer our loyalty to the new King. Queen Elizabeth II, who reigned for 70 years, was the only sovereign that most of us have ever known. She was our constant in a changing world, our cornerstone at times of crisis and our comfort when in sorrow. My nana was a big fan. My mum, who's 70 this year, remembers as a child being read books about the young princesses and looking at photos of them all the time. I think the war years made that generation feel particularly close to the young queen. The queen was a friend to Croydon. She visited many times in her reign. I remember precisely how exciting that was as a brownie lining up with my flag to welcome her when she opened the Queen's Gardens in the middle of my constituency. Few things in my suburban childhood topped a visit from the Queen. Of course, it's not just Croydon and this country who are mourning. The world is in sorrow. The front page of the New York Times this morning simply says, Queen and spirit of a nation. And many of us find it hard to imagine Britain <coughs> without her. It feels bleak. But then I think, what would she do? And what did she do when her own father, King George VI, died? And I know she would stand tall, face the day, pray to her God, and do the best job she could. Yep. And as the King has said this evening, she would fearlessly embrace progress. Mm -hmm. And that is the spirit we all keep alive. Heavy is the head that wears the crown, Quite literally, as it turns out, she was once heard to say that wearing a crown is like wearing a 10-pound salmon on your head. <laughs> but she bore the weight well. Her service, her humility, her constancy is what we can all strive to achieve. The Queen's death comes at a time of real challenge for our country. If ever we needed to be more like her, it is now. So let one of her legacies be that we will all try to be a little more like her. Service, steady progress, humility, constancy, and some fun along the way. None of us will see another queen in our lifetime. So we say thank you to Her Late Majesty, and God save the King. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Steve Bryan. Madam Deputy Speaker, can I just concur with what you said after listening to our new Sovereign King? What a privilege it was to sit here together in this House of Commons chamber and listen to that address, and uh, it gives a whole new expression to, to not a dry eye in the House. I thought he, he put it beautifully, as always. I, I just want to say a few things on behalf of my constituents in Winchester and Charles Ford. Um, yesterday was, of course, the, the saddest day imaginable. Of course, we all knew it was coming. For a while now, I think, we have known it was, it was coming, not, not least, of course, after yesterday's announcement from the palace commenting on Her Late Majesty's health, which, which they, they never do. But the sense of shock we all face today is, of course, palpable. And the sense of loss for our great country and the Commonwealth, and I too was at the Commonwealth uh, Conference in Halifax, Nova Scotia last month, is vast. This is a national moment, of course, but as my honourable friend, speaking a couple of speakers ago, said, it feels intensely personal, and, and it is. Her late Majesty spoke very movingly of her, of her late husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, as her strength of stay, as my honourable friend from Cheltenham said earlier. But the, the truth was that, that she was our strength and stay, and that's why we're going to miss her so greatly. I was extremely honoured to, to meet uh, the late Queen in 2012 as a relatively new MP at Buckingham Palace, and we all lined up with our partners, nervous as you can possibly be, and those who were, were there will remember that too. But as so many, almost every speaker, and I've sat through pretty much every speech today, has said, nerves went and disappeared as soon as they interacted with Her Majesty. Um, so we needn't have worried. She asked me what constituency I represent. So I said Winchester, of course. And we briefly discussed how the city was, still is, searching for the remains of King Alfred our most favourite son. The Queen loved this, and with that trademark smile and much-mentioned twinkle in the eye, she said to me, they've just found one of my ancestors under a car park in Leicester. 
which was not, which was not untrue. Um, and she was, of course, referring to, to uh, the remains of Richard III. Our, our late Queen visited Winchester many times, including officially opening Elizabeth II Court in 1959, the home of Hampshire County Council, and for the Maundy service in April 1979 in our great cathedral, which has been the, the, the scene of several services today and will be many more over the weekend, and it's the focal point of our county uh, and the diocese, of course. And we had the new king in Winchester just a few months ago unveiling, which is a mark of how I think he will hold the crown, wear the crown, unveiling a statue to a very famous Jewish figure in Winchester history called Licaritia. And it was a pleasure to have yeah, yeah. him yeah. in Winchester that day. Now, I often remind my constituents that MPs, backbench MPs, and maybe even some on the front bench, and I've been there too, don't really have that much power. But we do have quite a bit of influence. And the longer we do this job, I think the better we get at using that influence for the benefit of our constituents. And our late Queen, of course, as a constitutional monarch, didn't hold any executive power. In fact, she, she couldn't even vote. But boy, did she wield great influence mm. through yeah. her vast experience, which we've heard about from her prime minister and her former prime ministers, <coughs> her knowledge and the commanding respect she had all over the world. And there's been a lot of replaying overnight of the words spoken by the young Princess Elizabeth on her 21st birthday while in South Africa. And the famous section of that speech, of course, was whether my life be long or short, should we devote it to the service of our imperial family, but she then went on to a lesser known passage which said, but I shall not have the strength to carry out this resolution alone unless you join in it with me as I now invite you to do. And I've always been struck by that comment as incredibly revealing and brave because I think our then future queen was saying, I don't embody the divine right of kings and queens, so fabled of course in British history. I have to earn it and I have to keep it. I need your support. And I think she reigned in that spirit every single day of her 70 years, never lost in the majesty of it all as some of her very famous predecessors, always knowing that she had to draw that strength from the support of her people and always knowing that she had to constantly be seen to be believed. And maybe those two famous appearances on the balcony of Buckingham Palace at either end of the fabulous Platinum Jubilee weekend earlier this summer showed that right until almost the very end, she knew that she had to be seen to be believed. And I'm so glad that the country and the world had those incredible moments. Yeah. We've heard a lot today, just finally, Madam Deputy Speaker, about school children and how they ask us if we've ever met the Queen. And I, I get that too. But I had a school here probably a decade ago when I was a relatively new MP. And as we were leaving, one of the school children said to me, Mr. Bryan, can I just ask you a question that I didn't want to ask in front of all the children? And I said, yes, of course. And this young, young lad said to me, how did God save the Queen? Um, and I still maintain it's the best question I've ever been asked. And for those who want, the, the answer was, that's one for your teachers. But, but maybe, maybe our, our late Sovereign Lady now knows the answer to that. As a Christian in this house, I believe everyone, whether they live on this planet a matter of hours or 96 hugely influential years, um, as one of the most famous people ever to walk the planet, I think they change our world by their presence in it. We are so, so lucky, as people have said today, to have had Queen Elizabeth II in our lives, and we are changed by it and will ever more be so. So thank you, Queen Elizabeth II. It's been a privilege. God save the King. Yeah. Toby Perkins. Thank you uh, very much, <coughs> Madam Deputy Speaker. I rise to speak on behalf of the people of Chesterfield and Staveley, who share the shock, sadness and pride at the passing of our beloved late Queen Elizabeth II, uh, and to send our condolences to King Charles III, who spoke so well just a few moments ago. Last night, prayers at St Michael's Church in Brimington were dedicated to Her Late Majesty, and the bells on the famous Crooked Spire will be ringing muffled tones of mourning. Books of condolence have already been set up in Chesterfield Borough Council's contact centre, and others are appearing across the borough as our town citizens come out to send their respect and regards to a truly remarkable woman who has embodied our nation as our monarch for 70 years. I've, we've heard from so many people here who've had personal experience of meeting Her Majesty, but last night a friend's son posted a video which has gone viral of the moment that his grandmother sat in the Toby Carvery restaurant heard of the Queen's passing. 
Uncontrollably, she sobs. In the background, you can hear her son's bewilderment. But you never even knew her mother. But the British people didn't have to meet our Queen to feel that we knew her or to feel bereaved at her loss. She was indeed a friend to so very many of us. She's been the constant throughout our lives, at every celebration and grand occasion naturally, but more crucially in times of peril, worry and heartbreak. It was Her Majesty the Queen that we looked to. The Queen promised on her coronation to serve our nation faithfully, and the dedication, wisdom and fortitude that she's so shown throughout every day of that service has inspired so many of us. She loved our country, the four nations that make up our United Kingdom individually and collectively, yeah. and she took great pride in the Commonwealth as she helped lead our nation through its changing place in the world, from being the head of the British Empire to the Commonwealth to a prominent nation at the head of the EU and subsequently into our post-Brexit future. She led us through two painful and divisive referendums without ever breaking her famous political impartiality. And she was there when our nation was tortured by the cruel pandemic, bringing us together as so many of us sat there afraid and alone. An image that said so much about her dedication to duty was the image of her sat alone at her beloved husband's funeral. No one would have begrudged her being sat with a family member, but it was typical that she would want the world to see that she was also subject to the same restrictions so painfully being observed by her people. In closing, I'd like to say that we should all remember that Her Late Majesty's family are grieving right now, yet forced at this most painful moment to grieve in public. Those organs of the press who believe they are defending Her Majesty the Queen by attacking her children or her grandchildren, or claiming to know better than they do how her family should grieve, do our nation and our royal family a huge yeah. disservice. Yeah. 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 The people of Chesterfield will always take pride in her selfless devotion and wish her Ma His Majesty King Charles III a long, happy and successful reign. God save the King. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> Rebecca Park. Thank you, uh, yeah, Madam yeah, Deputy yeah, Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm absolutely honoured to be able to pay tribute for the remarkable life of Her Majesty, who has touched all of our hearts in so many ways, bringing comfort and guidance to all of us whenever it is needed. Now, Queen Elizabeth II holds a very special place in the hearts of the people of Taunton Dean, my constituency, because she made a visit in 1987, and it was the first visit by a monarch for almost five hundred years wow. since the Monmouth Rebellion and the infamous Battle of Sedgemoor, where the royals were almost overthrown and the monarchy. Now, it's a well-known story in my constituency that Queen Victoria was passing uh, down through the West Country on the train heading to Devon, and when she was passing through Taunton, she asked for all the blinds to be put down because she didn't want to see rebellious Taunton. <laughs> and that was following the Monmouth Rebellion, which was absolutely years before. Um, and the train stopped in Taunton and a civil party was waiting for her, but she refused to alight. Now, many, many years later, this incident was related to the Duke of Edinburgh, and he was absolutely furious. So, of course, he shared the story with Her Majesty the Queen, and she determined to set the record straight. And that's why, in 1987, she made that visit to Taunton. And we still thank her for it. We're back in the good books. Hopefully that can happen to the rest of us. Uh, similar uh, things going on in this place. I, th I think it demonstrates, doesn't it, uh, just that power that Her Majesty had, how she always wanted to set the record straight, to be fair, and I'm delighted that since then she's made other visits to um, Taunton and to Somerset. I just wanted to recount a very small um, personal story about Her Majesty. Now, I can't lay claim to any of these bowings and going to 
going to Buckingham Palace with all the big um, uh, titles that one may get in this place, although the stories have been absolutely brilliant that we've heard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it was back a very long time ago, in 1985, I was working for the National Farmers Union in Taunton, and I ran an organisation called The Taste of Somerset, which was uh, all sorts of small, independent food and drink producers belonged to it. It was the first such um, initiative in the country. And I had to set up a big marquee for The Taste of Somerset, running at the Royal Bath and West Show, of which Her Majesty was a patron. And I then was given the honour of presenting her with a taste of some set hamper. And I was absolutely beside myself with nerves. As so many colleagues have said, you know, when you think you're going to meet the Queen, I'd had the outfit made, I'd had the hair done, I'd practiced the curtsy, and I was beside myself. Um, but anyway, along she came, and she was utterly charming and delightful, and all she had to do was that smile. And she made me feel so comfortable, I forgot all my nerves. And we've still got that photograph my mother has on the mantelpiece, on the sideboard at home, of the beautiful um, smile uh, and, and the handing over of the basket. Now, beside that picture on my mother's sideboard is a picture of Prince Charles with my uh, walking through the family farm at home because it was a duchy farm on which I grew up. Oh. And that's a treasured photograph on our sideboard as well. And I remember that day so well. We were all invited walking across the farm, talking about trees, cows, the countryside, everything Prince Charles was so passionate about. And the remarkable thing I also remember about the event was we had lunch together and he ate my pudding. <laughs> <laughs> and I would tell this story because beside that letter right now, uh, that photograph, is a letter that Prince Charles himself, uh, now the king, sent to my mother just at the beginning of this week. And it was a letter, and he was then Prince Charles, to my mother, uh, giving condolences for my dear father, the farmer, who died and we buried him last week. Oh. And it was the most wonderful, personal, emotional letter, remembering all the visits to the farm that you could ever wish for. And that's the mark of the man. And how sad, Madam Deputy Speaker, that now the tables in literally three days have turned yeah. and now we are offering our condolences to the Prince Charles, who is now our wonderful king. And I'd like to give those deepest condolences, condolences from the people of Taunton Dean. Now, just briefly, Her Majesty, of course, has been a cornerstone in all of our lives, head of state for 70 years presiding over us through all of our ups and downs. And everybody across this house and even outside has just used a list of words that I think uh, none of us can disagree with. Um, the, the epitome of goodness, steadfast, honourable, warm, humorous, strong, uh, engaging, understanding, inspirational. Most of all inspirational, I think, Madam Deputy Speaker, you'd agree, for women. And I just want to say thank you Thank you, thank you. How fortunate we are to have lived with this person, head of our state, and she passes on so many of the attributes to King Charles III. He treads in giant footsteps, even though Her Majesty had tiny feet. But I know that he is going to, in his own unique way, take the nation and the Commonwealth forward in an exceptional way just as his own mother, the late Queen, did. So may Her Blessed Majesty rest in peace and God save the King. Yeah. Yeah. Order. We're going to sit till around 10 o'clock this evening, so that's another two and a half hours. Um, even if everyone who is here takes just under three minutes, not everyone who has ex expressed a desire to speak this evening will have an opportunity to do so. Um, the remedy rests with you. Mr Speaker asked, and Madam Deputy Speaker asked earlier, if people could please keep their contributions to under three minutes. Now, contributions have crept up to well over three minutes. Um, I might gently hint that there is no need now to repeat the things that have already been said 122 times. Um, there are many emotions which we are all feeling and they have already been expressed. So I make a plea to everyone who is now going to speak 
have a look at the notes you have, <laughs> cut them in half, and you will be loved by your colleagues, always remembering that brevity is the soul of wit. Chion <laughs> Mora. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The people of Newcastle have always held a strong and proud sense of our own identity as Geordies, as working people, as citizens of the United Kingdom, and for seven decades as subjects of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. Her death leaves us bereft in ways we cannot fully comprehend. Queen Elizabeth cared about the things that we Geordies care about. She was, like so many Geordies, a veteran of our armed forces, devoted to our service men and women. I am proud that the Queen's own yeomanry is headquartered in my constituency. The Queen loved her sport, as we do, and we remember with great affection when she presented Newcastle United with our last FA Cup trophy in 1955. We look forward to King Charles III making a similar presentation in the near future. I never met her, her late majesty like the majority of my constituents, but her presence graced our city. She first came to Newcastle Central in 1954, <coughs> a day she said she would never forget. I remember when she opened Eldon Square in 1977 and our Metro in 1981, and I regularly look upon the plaque commemorating her opening of our beautiful city library. As head of state, Queen Elizabeth was a profoundly important global figure. She could have tried to retain the imperial aura of the monarchy's past, all faded into the background as a distant symbol. Instead, she found a way to be a constant stability for our parliamentary democracy, a forceful presence, reassuring us that our unwritten constitution had a human embodiment beyond those of us who sit for a time here in Westminster, and that should it come to it, our ancient liberties and our modern rights had a formidable guardian. For me personally, I can say that when I heard the news, I was disorientated, in awe of her service and unable to understand my country without her. But I also thought of when, as a young woman in the 1980s, I was devoted to the cause of ending apartheid in South Africa, yeah, yeah, yeah. at a time when many British institutions were entangled with that evil in a way which made me doubt whether I belonged in the country of my birth. The Queen stood in solidarity with the Commonwealth in the face of apartheid South Africa. Her love for the Commonwealth as a community of equals, her fundamental understanding that racism and fascism are evil, ensured esteem from Newcastle Central to Newcastle KwaZulu across our Commonwealth. But I end where I started in Newcastle. Her platinum jubilee celebrated with enthusiasm in our leafy avenues and less cared for council estates. I remember particularly a tea party in Holly Court retirement home, Blakelaw. The love, respect, enthusiasm and laughter we shared that afternoon in the Queen's honour was so sincere, so genuine and made all the more poignant because the organiser, Mrs T, had just received a British Empire Medal for services to the community and was so, so proud. We miss the Queen, we are grateful to her, and we say, God save the King. Yeah. Alex Burghardt. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's a real honour to be called in this debate on a day in which there have been so many moving contributions from both sides of the House. Indeed, can't help but feeling that, once again, Her Late Majesty has brought out the best in all of us. I, uh, it's also a real honour to be uh, representing my constituents of Brentwood and Ongar in Essex. There may be more fervent royalists out there, Madam Deputy Speaker, but they are not to be found on this earth. The, uh, I, uh, I've been thinking over the past 24 hours of, um, of my great-grandmother, uh, who lived with me when I was growing up. Uh, because uh, the feelings I'm experiencing are similar to those that I experienced when she died. Uh, it's, um, it's a strange sensation because it reminds you that family is not limited to blood. It's not limited to the people you know, the people you've met. Indeed, one of the powerful things about the chemistry of nationhood is that it gives you deep affection for and deep loyalty to people you've never met, people you will never meet. And this is true both 
across the nation as it is today, but across the nation through time. Uh, this is something that Her Majesty, in her 70 years on the throne, her 96 years uh, of life, uh, really embodied. You see, uh, she connected us not just with one previous generation, but with many. She had known uh, her grandfather, George V, who had known his grandmother, Queen Victoria, who, as an infant, had met George III. And George III had spent his youth surrounded by people involved in the glorious revolution of 1688. And so it is within four conversations that the whole modern scope of our constitutional monarchy was brought together. Four pecks on the cheek that brings those generations to one point. We can take things further. You see, today is the 935th anniversary of the death of William the Conqueror in 1087. So I'm sure the House is aware. And um, it, when one thinks that her life, her late Majesty's life, encompassed more than one tenth of that time, it me makes you realise how close the centuries are. When we think of our union, the great union between England and Scotland, 315 years old this year, 22% of that time saw her on the throne. She was not just a witness to history, she was a part of it. She left it to us as her legacy. A nation may chase after its past, Madam Deputy Speaker, but it will not catch it. What it can hope to do is imitate it and use its strengths to fight the monsters of today and the future. This Her Late Majesty knew. This we will do in her memory. God save the Queen. Yeah. Carolyn Harris. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And as we collectively mourn the loss of our Queen Elizabeth II, I join others in sending my prayers and condolences and those of my constituents to the King, the Queen Consort and the whole of the Royal Family. And as Deputy Leader of the Welsh Labour Party, I send our condolences to all of the Royal Family. Yeah. Yeah. We all have our own memories of the Queen. Mine stretch back to the 1960s, but as a young child, I stood outside my primary school in Brahavrid to watch her car drive past. I can't quite remember the purpose of her visit, but I do remember the buzz of excitement amongst my classmates and how honoured we felt to just catch a glimpse of her. And I also remember the honour of receiving an invite to the Queen's Garden Party. <coughs> Years before I entered this place, I was heavily pregnant at the time and had no interest at all in going anywhere. But I wasn't going to miss the opportunity to be part of something so special as Her Majesty's Garden Party. Because she was special. Her dedicated service for more than 70 years will be remembered forever. She served our country with loyalty, with dignity and with grace. And even as her health began to fail in recent years, her commitment never faltered. She will be missed immeasurably by this country, the Commonwealth and indeed across the world, but nowhere more so than amongst her own family. And our thoughts remain with them foremost at this time. It was an honour to see her as a little girl. It was an honour to be invited to the garden party. And it's my greatest honour to pay tribute to her today on behalf of the communities across Swan's East. She served us well and it's as her and her sleep. Rest in peace, our Queen. God save the King and God bless the new Prince and Princess of Wales. Yeah. Maggie Thru. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's with the deepest sadness that I rise to speak on behalf of the people of Erewash to pay tribute to our late Sovereign Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. In an era of unprecedented change, Her Majesty has been a constant beacon of strength and stability, whose sense of duty and public service remained until the very last moment of her life. While today Britain mourns the passing of our Head of State, we must first and foremost remember that the King and his family have lost their beloved mother, grandmother and great-grandmother. A sense of grief and sorrow that will be familiar to all of us who have lost loved ones. I therefore want to wish to extend my sincere and heartfelt condolences to the King and the whole royal family at this sad time. It is estimated that around one third of the country has either met or seen the Queen during her reign. It is fair to say that she will have touched each and every one of us in some way or another. 
For me personally, I'm immensely proud to achieve the Queen's Guide Award. I know the values I learned en route to that award helps me to serve as a Member of Parliament today. Yeah. As a woman born in the first decade of the Queen's reign, I, like so many others, view Her Majesty as an icon and a role model. Not only a beautiful lady in mind and spirit, but also someone who approached the heavy burden of the crown with grace and good humour in order to serve us, her people, perhaps aided by one or two marmalade sandwiches at times. Although not originally destined to ascend to the throne, in 1952, our new queen stood out as one of the few married working mothers and certainly the only female head of state of any major Western power. Seven decades later, and following Her Majesty's example, women have firmly cemented their position in the workplace, represented every sector from construction to government, and perhaps the most poignant reminder of which was the appointment of my right honourable friend as the Queen's third female Prime Minister just four days ago. Mm. Now, as the second Elizabethan age draws to a close, our new Carolean era begins, our country, the Commonwealth <coughs> and its people stand ready for whatever challenges may lie ahead, better prepared for having been led by Her Majesty for over 70 years and united behind our new sovereign, King Charles III. God save the King. Yeah. Yeah. Stella Creasy. Thank you, Madam Deputy yeah, yeah. Speaker. We've heard some glorious stories today about gin, cheese, fiddling with wands and what it was like to work with the Queen. But as I came into this place today, and saw the trains full of people carrying flowers on their way to Green Park. It struck me, for most people, it was just the Queen herself, not to work with her, that was inspiring. And I saw that when she came to Walthamstow during the Diamond Jubilee. The civic pride was evident, not least because we felt we'd won the competition with other nearby boroughs because we were going to get to feed her. <laughs> Even the most cynical, uncertain about royalty or put off by pomp could not help but bask in the glorious sunshine and the joy that came that day. Indeed, as she was driven round the fountain to the cheers of the schoolchildren, the Queen later told our late council leader, Chris Robbins, that the noise was deafening and like a pop concert. After all, she sat through enough to know what they sounded like. It was surreal that day, but it embodied that sense of excitement, the awe that we all felt when we were finally able to pass that MP rite of passage have you met the Queen? Mm -hmm. And look the school children in our communities in the eye. I've no doubt that King Charles will face the same set of questions. And that interest was returned. It was so clear to me that day that what she cared about was not the pomp of the politicians or the officials, but the people that she got to meet. So it is only fitting in paying tribute to her on behalf of the people of Walthamstow that I use their words. From the borough commander, Simon Crick, who speaks on behalf of our local police and how for them she was a constant reassuring presence in an often turbulent world. Or our local council leader, Grace Williams, who remembers her devotion and service to our country, the Commonwealth and our people in a time of extraordinary change. Or Dr. Kenneth Swanee, who speaks on behalf of our local NHS, that she will remain a source of energy to many of us in the years to come to enable us to move forward together. Or Libby, a local volunteer who was born in 1953 and therefore named after the Queen and can honestly say she is so proud to have been named after this incredible woman. Or Donna, who said she carried herself so elegantly yet felt like everyone's grandma at the same time. <laughs> I represent a community with links across the world, so many of them reference that. Martin, who says that her visit to Ireland, standing up and opening her speech in Irish was a stunning moment and her contribution to peace cannot be understated. He wanted to write more, but he could not just find the words. Or Pastor Anthony, who records his appreciation for her work in the Commonwealth and defence of religious freedom around the world. Dorte, a dual Danish and British citizen, who said that during the pandemic she sent a ray of hope, believing that one day we would see each other again. Or Philip, who reflects how she bookended his life, seeing those postage stamps change and watching a TV for the first time to see her coronation and now her passing. And that general sense of how, as we contemplate life without her sparkle and without her cheer to bring us together, that people from all walks of life in communities like mine were inspired by her. 
Let us put on record our thanks too to those people in the coming days who will help us commemorate her, the police, the officials, the volunteers who will help us in the days ahead. One queen beloved, one king with well wishes, all of us brought together, all of us in mourning. God save the king. Yeah, yeah. Just before I call uh, the next colleague, I'd like to briefly make my own tribute on behalf of the people of Epping Forest, whose voice will otherwise be unheard, uh, simply to say that uh, Her Majesty was held so dear in all our hearts for her kindness, her cleverness, her dedication and her grace, and that as a role model for women of future generations, she was unsurpassed. We have all been so fortunate to live and to serve during her reign. Eddie Hughes. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I rise to speak on behalf of the good people of Willanore, Bloxwich and Walsall North, and curiously, also on behalf of the good people of Tombridge and Malling, because their excellent MP will be unable to speak this evening as he's sat comfortably on the front bench. But we will be <laughs> united in our thoughts, conveying our strongest condolences to His Majesty the King at this time of intense sorrow for him his family and for the entire country. However, Madam Deputy Speaker, I make no apology for the fact that I'm going to be slightly more upbeat with the rest of my contribution, because we are, after all, celebrating an incredible life, as the King himself said this evening, well lived. Wherever she went, the Queen spread joy and happiness, and that was reflected back to her. And so it is that that joy and happiness was also spread, I'm delighted to say, to Warsaw. In 1962, she came to visit a big local employer in Warsaw, Crabtree Electricals, and then from there she headed over to Willenhall, one of the towns in my constituency. I'm delighted to say she must have enjoyed it, because she came back again in 1977 on the Silver Jubilee Tour. She visited Warsaw and then headed off to Blockswich, another one of the towns in my constituency. She hadn't had enough, though. She came back again <laughs> in 2000 for the opening of our iconic art gallery. Now, I have to say, Madam Deputy Speaker, I was slightly distracted on this occasion because my friend Simon was her close protection officer on that day. So as we toured the gallery, I was very slightly distracted by the fact that he had a gun in his pocket. <laughs> now, I'm delighted to say, the visit passed off without incident, and we sent Her Majesty safely on her way. It was lovely to have her there. But that doesn't end Warsaw's association with Her Majesty, because, and I'm seeking to address an omission in a number of contributions this evening, because we've all talked about how lovely her humorous double act was with Paddington, but it seems to me that nobody has referred to the fact that that handbag from which she withdrew that marmalade sandwich, was made in Warsaw. <laughs> Madam Deputy Speaker, the affiliation that we feel in Warsaw and right across the country is incredibly, incredibly warm. We will all miss her. May perpetual light shine upon her, and may she rest in peace. God save the King. Yeah. Emma Hardy. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and it is an honour to pay tribute to Queen Elizabeth on behalf of myself and the constituents of Hull West and, ha and Hesel. And it is with deep sadness that I make my contribution. Because you could see how loved the Queen was actually in the Hull West and Hesel. And you can see this on the day of the Jubilee celebrations when we had the very youngest people out there celebrating, babies in prams and mums enjoying themselves right the way up to our older residents as well, celebrating the reign of the Queen. And on the way down today on the train, I spoke to my mum and, and she said to me that she was feeling really unsettled and she'd been a bit upset. And she's never met the Queen. To be honest, I've never met the Queen either. But the fact that my mum was feeling unsettled by her death, I think, illustrates what a constant she has been in each and all of our lives, how she's been relied on. And, and my mum said to me, she says, Emma, she went, I was one and a half when the Queen came in. It's all I've ever known. And through everything that my mum has lived through in her life, there's always been the Queen. And she said, I almost felt that she'd always be there. And we know now, of course, no one can always be there. 
and her passing has touched us all in Hull Western Hesel, in the UK, in the Commonwealth, but I'm very pleased to see internationally as well. I truly believe that having the Queen as our Head of State has enhanced our reputation as a country. Just look at those front covers around the world. Look at the tributes coming in from world leaders. What other world leader would have the number of tributes and the real adoration that our Queen had? You could rely on her. You knew if we were sending the Queen to go and meet uh, other dignitaries around the world, you knew it was going to go well and you knew it was going to make our country look good and that gives you that sense of real pride. And that came from her and what she did. So she was our queen, but she was, of course, as many have said, the royal family's mum, their grandma, and their great-grandma. So God bless the queen as she is now reunited with her beloved husband. Yeah. And God bless King Charles III. Yeah. Raymond Chisty. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. My thoughts and those of Gillingham and Raynham are with His Majesty King Charles III and the rest of the royal family. Madam Deputy Speaker, I refer to a prayer from St John Henry Newman, a great British saint with global impact. And for me, it was a real privilege and an honour to be part of a delegation led by His Royal Highness Prince of Wales in 2019 for the canonisation of John Henry Newman, representing the Prime Minister as his special envoy for freedom of religion or belief. The prayer which I wish to share with colleagues today by John Henry Newman is this, the mission of my life. God has created me to do him some definitive service. Her Majesty's selfless commitment to public service is an example to us all of definitive service. He has committed some work to me which he has not allocated to another. My God, he gave Her Majesty all our work. She did it with complete distinction and commitment with grace, always giving without any expectation of any return. Goes on to say, I have my mission. I may never know it in this life, but I shall be told in the next. I am a link in a chain a bond of connection between persons. Her Majesty was most certainly an amazing link that brought us all together from all parts of the United Kingdom, from all parts of the Commonwealth, from all parts of the world, from all faiths and none, based on her values of kindness, of compassion, of respect, of acceptance of one another. John Henry Newman goes on to say, he has created me from naught, I shall do good. Her, Her Majesty certainly did that. I shall do this work, I shall do his work. I shall be an angel of peace, a preacher of truth in my own place, whilst not intending if I do but keep his commandments. Her Majesty was most certainly an angel of peace and a preacher of truth. Your Majesty, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Your values, what you stood for, will forever live on and are an inspiration for us all. And I say this, there could be no one finer than His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, now King Charles III, to take our great country forward with his values and what he stands for. One thing which has not been mentioned so far. For decades, decades, His Majesty King Charles III has been committed to interfaith dialogue. He has been committed to bringing people together for, for faith and none. 80% of our world has one faith or the other. And if you have somebody like His Majesty King Charles III committed to bringing people together, and people know his commitment to interfaith, then I know our world can be brought together for the common good by him. God save the King. Liz Twist. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I rise this evening to pay tribute to Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II on behalf of myself and my constituents in Bladen. My memories of the Queen will be shared by so many people. I remember poring over those royal photo books that my aunties had, showing uh, her work during and after the war years. They meant so much to them. My mum, just three years younger than Her Majesty, 
and her sisters not much different. I was so pleased to hear a few weeks ago that my youngest aunt still has the books. Lining the streets as a school child, enthusiastically waving a flag at the royal car as it drove past, and the huge anticipation of that fleeting glimpse. Seeing Her Majesty from a distance or on TV at those great state occasions over so many years. So many of us will have personal memories from across the 70 years of her reign. And just recently, I had the real pleasure of joining so many of my constituents, young and not so young, celebrating her Platinum Jubilee. Starting the weekend with a Jubilee breakfast in Kibblesworth, instructed in advance to wear red, white and blue. Lighting the Jubilee Beacon at the Land of Oak and Iron Heritage Centre in Le Leighton Mill in the rain. Being wa waited on by our young carers group in Highfield for lunch in the sunshine with flags and bunting. Taking part in the Jubilee picnic in Crowcrook in the sunshine. So many loyal toasts and celebrations to mark Her Majesty's 70 incredible years and to thank her for her service. Her Majesty was no stranger to the North East, visiting us often, and she was always welcome. And now I think of her personal connection with Bladen constituency through her mother, through the National Trust Gibside Estate and the Bulls Lion family connection there. <coughs> Madam Deputy Speaker, I don't have those wonderful personal stories of Queen Elizabeth to share, but like so many of my constituents, I know the tremendous regard in which Her Majesty was held and the impact she had on the life of our communities. The high esteem and affection in which she was held by so many of us for her dedication, sense of duty, and her willingness to join in, to be part of our occasions, whether it was the James Bond helicopter flight at the Olympics or taking tea with Paddington for the Platinum Jubilee. So I say, thank you, Your Majesty, for your steadfastness and work over 70 years, and may you now rest in peace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Duncan Baker. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. On behalf of my constituents in North Norfolk, I rise to pay our respects on the 70-year reign of our sovereign, Queen Elizabeth II. Uh, we've been asked not to repeat other stories that have been told by other members, and so I think I'm on fairly safe ground to be able to talk about carrots, coconuts and Her Majesty all in the same speech. Um, of course, Norfolk uh, has a very special and enduring memory for Her Majesty, thanks to Sandringham located just outside my constituency to the west of the county and in my uh, friends, the Honourable Member for North West Norfolk. Although I've never met the Queen myself, I share with you a simple anecdote and story uh, which involves Sandringham, Her Majesty, and one that I was involved in many years ago. It provides, I think, a, a wonderful insight into the personal character and a touching human story of a remarkable and wonderful lady behind the scenes. As many back home know, my uh, family business uh, was run from Holt, uh, famed for many royal visitors across the years, and we ran the town's supermarket. We were supplied with vegetables by a company which very proudly had a royal crest for doing so. <coughs> now, this story involves Christmas and why our supplier was late one year with the Christmas vegetable delivery. You can imagine the scene, can't you? The good burgers of my constituency lined up to get their carrots and uh, their coconuts and of course their Brussels sprouts all looking a little bit frantic on Christmas Eve morning when the vegetable delivery had failed to turn up. When it of course did eventually turn up, uh, a rather stressful delivery driver who was also the owner uh, relayed at length how tired he was because he had personally been up all night scrubbing the Queen's vegetables ready for that royal household delivery. But he had done one huge mistake. He had forgotten the Queen's very special order. And he had had to turn around to go back and get it himself. Well, as a little upstart, of course, I had to know what this special delivery was. And he said, well, every year the Queen asks us to put on side ten carrots and two coconuts, halved, drilled, and hung with some string. 
Well, of course, I looked rather quizzical at this. I wondered how the royal family would share two coconuts all round the table for their Christmas lunch and eat it from a piece of string with the husk still round it. But, of course, I was told that, of course, what the Queen likes to do is on the cold, crisp morning of Christmas Day itself, she steps out from her bedroom into her private garden to hang the coconut on a tree to then retire to her bedroom to watch the birds eat the coconut herself. And then I said, what about these carrots? Ah, oh, yes, he said, they have to be particularly, particularly of a certain size, absolutely cylindrical, so that they fit into the Queen's jacket. Now I thought, what is going on with this? Well, of course, he said, it's her special treat to the royal ponies. Every single Christmas morning, it's her treat, traditionally, to feed them with those carrots. So there was this man from Norfolk, up all night, scrubbing the Queen's carrots. Little did he know they were for the royal ponies. I think that story just shows the human, touching and loving side of the Queen, who not only loved her family, her nation, but also her animals. Her Majesty, the Queen, dedicated her life to service of others. She was an example to us all and will be remembered eternally. God save the King. Yeah. Chris Evans. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. In a world which is often confusing and unsettled, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II charted a course through stormy weather, not simply as the mother of our nation, but as the keeper of the flame. In the darkest of times, when hope was seemingly lost, she cut a reassuring figure. In 1966, when a landslide smashed into Pantlas Junior School in Aberfan, killing 116 children and 28 adults, she visited the village and openly wept, for she too was a young mother. 51 years later, in 2017, after a terror attack in Manchester at an Ariana Grande concert in Manchester, the Queen provided comfort to the survivors and families, visited them all in hospital. During lockdown, when many of us were missing our loved ones, she moved the nation to tears with a simple message. We will meet again. In doing so, she gave us all hope that in the end, it was all going to be all right. All of us want to be reassured that whatever we are doing, whatever we feel, whatever we are going through, it's going to be all right in the end. But now, with her passing, it feels it's going to be a long time before it's all right again. Madam Deputy Speaker, historians often cite powerful monarchs like Henry VIII, who ruled the country with an iron fist, or his father, Henry VII, who took the crown on the battlefield, or his daughter, Elizabeth I, who saw off the most powerful navy ever assembled in the form of the Spanish Armada. Our Queen simply gave her heart to this nation for 70 years, proving beyond doubt love is a far more powerful weapon than any used in any war. Her passing is another loss to the generation who lived through the Depression of the 1930s. So the rise of fascism in Europe, and knew the horrors and hardships of war, then, without complaint, rolled up their sleeves and got to work rebuilding this bomb-damaged country. The work of the Queen, and millions like her during those years, means we can enjoy the freedoms we do today. When we came together to celebrate her 70th Jubilee in June, we all knew in our heart of hearts her long reign was drawing to a close. But we all hoped we would have a few more years with that glorious smile of hers. There are those of us who thought somewhat irrationally she really was immortal. And for as long as the Queen was in our world, everything was going to be all right. Now she belongs to the ages. In times of sadness, Madam Deputy Speaker, I've always found great comfort in the words of Alfred Lord Tennyson, who wrote in the poem Ulysses. We are not now that strength which in old days moved her earth and heaven. That which we are, we are. One equal temper, heroic heart. Made weak by time and fate, but strong in will. To strive, to seek, and not to yield. As the Elizabethan era draws to a close, let those words guide us and our new monarch, King Charles III, in all the hard days ahead. As we grieve as a nation, let us celebrate the life of the Queen Elizabeth II and draw comfort in the knowledge she is safe 
in the hands of Almighty God. God save the King, and God bless the new Prince and Princess of Wales. It is an honour to follow such an inspiring speech by the Honourable Member. And I speak on behalf of myself and my constituents in Devizes, and particularly of the many members uh, serving and former of the Her Majesty's Armed Forces who served under her colours and swore their oath to her. President de Gaulle said that he had a certain idea of France. We have no need of such abstractions. We don't need an idea of the United Kingdom. We have had for 70 years an actual person who represented the best of our country and its character. And others have spoken of the character of the late Queen, and not knowing her, I, I can't add anything to that. Those primary school visits were an absolute agony uh, for me. I just go from one classroom to another, disappointing the children that I have not <laughs> met the Queen. Um, but I want to talk briefly about, about what she stood for. And Philip Larkin's poem has been quoted often uh, today with its perfect line, she did not change. She did not change, even as we did. Uh, and as we've heard, she presided over the most extraordinary period of change. And yet she was emphatically not a relic of the past. We loved her and valued her because she was a conduit of something precious from the present to the future. And the member for Birmingham Yardley said earlier that we can find what we want in the Queen, whether a modernist or a traditionalist. And of course, we find both in her. And this is the real value of tradition, not because it fossilises the past. A real traditionalist, as someone said, is someone who tends the flame of their culture, not someone who worships its ashes. And those of us with conservative instincts need to remember that. The Queen was a great futurist, as was the Duke of Edinburgh, of course. Uh, but as the Honourable Member for South West Devon said, and others have made the same point, if modern Britain was founded on the rock of Queen Elizabeth, that is because her life was founded on the rock of ages, on her Christian faith. And I read today that as the country became more secular in recent decades, she became more publicly religious. And I think it's worth noting that while she dedicated her long life to the service of the people, she held herself accountable, not to us, but to a higher power. And this was the source of her joy and her goodness. And so my sympathy to her family, to her friends, and to her, her household in their grief, and my thanks to her. And she is doing in death what she did in life, bringing us together, making us smile, reminding us of the things that really matter, making us proud of our country and grateful for her example and her service. May she rest in peace. Yeah. Yeah. Rosie Duffield. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy, Deputy Speaker. We've heard so many incredibly moving and unforgettable speeches today about Our Late Majesty, and we'll certainly hear many more. It's of course impossible to pay full tri tribute to 70 years of continuous public service in just a few minutes. So I wish to focus briefly on Canterbury, the heart of the Church of England. We've had the honour of welcoming Her Majesty to Canterbury Cathedral on numerous occasions in her role as Supreme Governor of the Church of England, where she's well represented on all occasions by her Lord Lieutenant of Kent. And it is in that light that I share the tribute paid by Justin Archbishop of Canterbury, who said, through times of war and hardship, through seasons of upheaval and change, and through moments of joy and celebration. We have been sustained by Her Late Majesty's faith in what and who we are called to be. In March 2015, Her Majesty the Queen visited the cathedral accompanied by her husband to unveil statues of them both. Although the memories of Her Late Majesty will live on in the hearts and minds of all of us, it's those physical tributes which will retain her legacy for generations to come. No matter one's political persuasion, occupation, way of life, she commanded respect from people of all backgrounds and was an inspiration to women the world over. She focused on the good things in life, the characteristics and experiences which unite us, as well as the issues which need to be tackled in a collegiate fashion. And some of us here can relate well to that apparent rebellious streak we saw when she left the palace and walked among the crowds with her sister or drove herself around in her Land Rover. That humour and wit which allowed us to relate to the greatest diplomat in our recent history, the stability that allowed us as a country to have certainty at times when it was desperately needed. The remarkable thing about Her Majesty was that this was never a burden to her. 
Her tremendous experience allowed her to guide the United Kingdom, the Commonwealth and also the world through tough times and her dutiful actions. The messages she conveyed to us have undoubtedly made this world a much better place. So rest in peace, Your Majesty. The nation will never forget our favourite grandma and God save the King. Yeah. Craig McKinley. Deputy Speaker, it is a true honour to be able to be here at this time in our nation's history and to be able to speak my sorrow and the great grief from my constituents of South Thanet uh, through my words. Yesterday was a day we all knew would come, but I think we all hoped that it never would. We're all trusting that that, that huge longevity of uh, uh, the Queen Mother, who died at 101, would give us more years of the Queen in her place, giving her powerful and steady service to our country and to her realms overseas in the Commonwealth, more years of certainty and calm. But as that day developed yesterday, a day I will never forget from mid-afternoon, I felt a, a deep sadness. And with that emotion overflowing, I will tell you, as that official announcement came out at about half past six. And I asked myself, why? A 96-year-old, a life well lived, dying peacefully in a home that she loved, surrounded by family. Why did I have this emotion, this love, for a person I'd never met? There were few in this house that would have met her properly, apart from prime ministers. Most interactions had been brief and fleeting, uh, moments that everybody cherishes uh, with that most remarkable lady. I was saddened because she'd been ingrained in my life, in all of our lives. She was that true and reliable person that this country had grown to rely upon all of our lives. We'd grown up knowing that every day when we looked at banknotes, coins, and stamps. That image had been replicated literally hundreds of billions of times in this country, in our overseas realms and the Commonwealth. We knew her on a daily basis. Now across those 70 years, this remarkable woman had seen new nations form. She'd seen empires collapse. She'd seen governments here and abroad come and go and she'd met most of those characters involved. And at times of this nation's great crisis and great joy, it was to her that we, that we looked. And Madam Deputy Speaker, consider this. Her first Prime Minister that she called upon to form a government was Winston Churchill, who was born in 1874. Her last Prime Minister, our current Prime Minister, was born in 1975, a period of over 100 years. That's quite staggering. And she was on the throne for close to 30% of the entire existence of the United States. Quite staggering, those changes that she lived through. And yet she adapted seamlessly to each and every one. She was the rock that we thought would stand forever. She was our head of state. She was the queen in many other realms and dominions and head of the Commonwealth. She was more than that. She was, I feel, the, tr the true matriarch of the world. And I think we're seeing that in the grief and the tributes that were being seen uh, across virtually every country in the world today. And there is no part of this United Kingdom, no constituency that she didn't touch with either a visit or a patronage. And I know in my patch in South Thanet, people still talk about that visit to Ramsgate in 1993 and to Margate in 2011. But it's at times like this we see our constitution in play. All roads of that continuity, the community, government, our armed services, our police and justice had led to her. And now we see a smooth transfer of the crown to her dear son. She managed to keep the magic and mystery of monarchy whilst being taken into our hearts of our country, everybody around the world. And in our dear Majesty's words, after 9-11, she said, grief is the price we pay for love. We grieve now, and we look to a new era under Charles III. Rest in peace, Your Majesty. Thank you for your service, and God save the King. 
I do need to remind colleagues again that the speaker has asked if um, remarks could be confined to three minutes, because if they're five minutes, it means that somebody else isn't going to get in. So I think it's important that we think of others. Christine Jardine. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. And it is with a very sad sense of pride that I rise to speak on behalf of my constituents in Edinburgh West, many of whom I already know have visited the Palace of Holyrood House today to lay flowers and pay their respects to Her Majesty in Edinburgh, a city she loved, and was at one of my first, very first events as um, an MP when she opened our magnificent Queensferry Crossing, um, and most recently was celebrated in Jubilee parties across the city. But I confess, Madam Deputy Speaker, my first thought when I heard the confirmation on Thursday that we had lost her was of family, first her family, of course, but then of my own family, my grandmother, who I remember as a child when I was going to my first sighting of the Queen at the launch of a ship in, the, in Clyde Side. She told me how wonderful the Queen was, tried to explain to me about the war and the spirit and what her family had meant. And, you know, I thought I understood what she was saying. I thought I got that. Until that night in tw uh, 2020, when she spoke to us at the darkest moment of the pandemic and she gave us hope. She told us we would meet again. And it wasn't just that she empathised with our situation, it was that she shared it. And I realise now that perhaps the reason she held such a special place in our hearts was because she shared our memories, she shared our thoughts, she shared our pain, and she was also a link back to those loved ones that we had lost, who had been through difficult times before that she had also shared. And today, the speeches, the reminiscences, the memories that we have heard in this place have all been very moving. But they've all had a touch of gratitude, of thankfulness for having been part of those 70 years of her reign, and a heartbreaking recognition that that era has come to an end. But there was also a moment, I think, when Her Late Majesty would have been extremely proud to see our new King devote himself to the service of this country in the way that she had done before. And so while we might find this parting very sorrowful and indeed heartbreaking, we now know that there is a future when, although our country will change, we will not have the constant figure we have had for 70 years, the transition will be smooth. And there will be a future, and it will be good. So while we thank Her Majesty and wish that she rests in peace, we know that our future is secure. God save the King. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I rise on behalf of myself and my constituents in North West Cambridgeshire to pay tribute to the late Her Majesty the Queen. I think it's fair to say that all of us in this chamber have had Her Majesty as part of our lives, and I mean that quite literally, a part of our lives. She demonstrated an extraordinary sense of duty and commitment to public service. Her Majesty has left an imprint not only on our country and the Commonwealth, but also across the world. She holds the world record of being featured on the most global currencies, and her passing is being marked across the world. For example, in India, they are having a national day of mourning this coming Sunday. As well as being our queen, she was, of course, a global figure with a global understanding. And this was summed up when she spoke at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Kampala, Uganda, in November 2007, when she said, recognising that each one of us is made up of layer upon layer of identity and that each of our unique personalities has ties to culture, religion, community, country and beyond, is the essence of open and tolerant communities. Like many others, I was very fortunate to meet Her Majesty on a number of occasions. The last time 
was on 8th July of this year at Windsor Castle when I was sworn into the Privy Council before receiving the seals of office for Northern Ireland. I will treasure her wonderful smile to me as I shook her hand and as, as I took the oath of allegiance holding the Bhagavad Gita, the Hindu book used on such occasions. And after the ceremony, I was allowed to keep the copy on which I'd taken the oath. Madam Deputy Speaker, the occasion is all the more special for me because whilst there has subsequently been a swearing, whilst there was subsequently a swearing into the Privy Council done virtually, I was the last person to be sworn personally by Her Majesty into the Privy Council. It is extraordinary that so many global leaders confess in their, auto, in their biographies that on meeting Her Majesty, they were so, so nervous. And then they add that very quickly she put them at their ease, often with a joke. We will miss her, Madam Deputy Speaker. May I conclude by saying that my prayers and thoughts are very much with the royal family at this difficult time. And they are particularly with King Charles as he takes on his enormous responsibilities. God save the King. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, King Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And on behalf of my constituents of Weaver Vale, I pay tribute in this period of mourning to her late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. A tribute for a remarkable and constant presence that's the signature a signature of duty, public service and selflessness. A lesson to each and every one of us in this chamber and beyond. Those 70 years of public service commemorated by the Platinum Jubilee has touched every part of our communities, nation, commonwealth and globe. A sense of permanence, stability, and constitutional leadership, neutrality from this political sphere. That reassuring constant that honourable members have referred to and right honourable members have referred to this evening, provided by the late Queen Elizabeth II, has been an enduring feature in times of transition and of war and a figurehead of celebration where that's been the opening of the shopping city centre in Runcorn in my constituency in 1972, or the commemorative mug and the 50 pence coin that I received, as well as the fun street parties in 1977 at the Silver Oil Jubilee. As an 11 year old boy, you now I really appreciated that and still do to this day. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, more recently, that reassuring compassion was evident in the dark times of the COVID pandemic. We now enter another historical transition while we mourn the loss of the late Queen Elizabeth II. I and my constituents send our deepest sympathies to King Charles III and the royal family. God bless them all. May, um, may she, may um, the late Queen Elizabeth II rest in peace. Peter Alders. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. I rise on behalf of the people of Waveney to pay tribute to Her Majesty the Queen. With the nation's guiding light taken from us, there was last night, for a moment, from my perspective, a sense of helplessness. What do we do? How are we going to get on without her? The answer, Madam Deputy Speaker, is that we learn from the high standards of dignity, duty and humility to which she had adhered both throughout her life and her 70-year reign. We shall always fall short of the summit that she reached, but if we get to her foothills, we will have succeeded. Great Britain and the Commonwealth have faced numerous challenges over the past 70 years, and the world has changed a great deal. She was our shield to any arrows of adversity, 
and despite the enormous responsibilities that she bore on our behalves, she never, never put a foot wrong. Her Majesty was a family person, and in some respects we were all part of her wider family. She enjoyed those things, those aspects of life that we all enjoy. Animals and pets, whether corgis, ponies and horses, or racing pigeons. Family meals, whether that be barbecues, picnics or Christmas dinners. As we have heard, Her Majesty had a lifelong passion for horse racing. Back in Coronation Week in 1953, her horse, Oriel, ran second in the derby, the nearest she ever got to securing that cherished prize. One might have expected a hint of disappointment, but there was none. She joined the rest of the nation in celebrating the victory of national icon Sir Gordon Richards in his 28th and final attempt to win the race for the, fir race for the first time. An aureole, Madam Deputy Speaker, is a radiant light around a head or a body. Our aureole has been extinguished, but her legacy will endure forever. Madam Deputy Speaker, the Queen ascended the throne as we emerged from the ravages of the Second World War. As she departs, we face more adversity and uncertain and worrying immediate future. If we strive to conduct ourselves as she did, if we apply a mere modicum of her wisdom and sound judgment, then we will get through it. Your Majesty, on behalf of the people of Waveney, thank you for all that you have done for us. Our deepest condolences to all of your family, and God save the King. Yeah. Kirsty Blackman. Thank you very much for affording me the opportunity to pay tribute on behalf of my constituents on this sad day. Aberdeen's had a long association and with and fondness for the royal family. Beautiful granite statues of former monarchs can be found watching over many parts of our city. People across Aberdeen are feeling a profound sense of loss today. In 1964, Aberdeen suffered one of our darkest hours. A typhoid outbreak in the city hospitalised 500 people and led to three fatalities. Dr Ian McQueen, our chief medical officer, described Aberdeen as a sort of beleaguered city. Our reputation as a centre for tourism was badly damaged. Hearing of our local issues, and at very short notice, Queen Elizabeth diverted a planned journey to Glasgow in order to visit Aberdeen. This thoughtful gesture, which expressed the Queen's confidence in the safety of visiting Aberdeen, has been long remembered by our citizens. Throughout the years, Her Majesty has retained a relationship with our city. In 1970, she visited the VSA Children's Centre in Aberdeen's Hardgate. The Association of Social Service, VSA, has been honoured to secure the patronage of every monarch during their 150-year history, from their founding patronage of Queen Victoria in 1870. In 1990, Queen Elizabeth II opened the Bon Accord Centre in Aberdeen. The people of Aberdeen loved to turn out for a public event, and this one was no different, with crowds thronging to try and catch a glimpse of her. Even Aberdonians who were not present on that day will almost certainly have walked past the plaque that she unveiled to commemorate that. In 2017, the Queen again visited Aberdeen to open the Robertson family roof garden at Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. Like so many of my constituents, I've had occasion to seek solace in the roof garden while a loved one was in hospital and we very much appreciate that she came along to open that. I want also, Madam Deputy Speaker, to mention Her Majesty the Queen's long involvement with the Girl Guiding Movement. In 1953 she became Girl Guide's patron and has remained a stalwart supporter for all of her years. She first joined the guides age 11, taking part in camping trips and earning badges for swimming. Over the years, thousands of girls and young women across the UK and overseas have worked hard to achieve the highest award in guiding the Queen's Guides Badge. I want also to send my personal condolences to the Queen's family. In 2011, my great granny passed away, also well into her 90s. I well remember the devastation and sense of shock that we all felt. Somebody who had been there for so long, we had begun to think that she would be a constant presence in our lives and there would never be a day that we would be without her presence. I can feel, therefore, an echo of what the royal family of what the generations that followed her must be feeling today and I send out my heartfelt best wishes to them at this time for getting through this 
difficult moment. From the people of Aberdeen North, Madam Deputy Speaker, I want to thank Queen Elizabeth for her lifetime of service. Yeah. Felicity Buckley. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. On behalf of the residents of the Royal Borough of Kensington, I want to pay the deepest tributes to Her Late Majesty the Queen, who served our country and the Commonwealth with the most remarkable and selfless devotion. The Queen's life was interwoven with the Royal Borough of Kensington, and indeed, her coronation robes were actually woven in Kensington at the Royal School of Needlework, which was then in South Kensington. Many of the late Queen's family live in Kensington, at Kensington Palace, including her late sister, Princess Margaret, and of course, currently, it is the official residence of the new Prince and Princess of Wales. The Queen also sent her son, His Majesty the King, to his first school in Kensington, which is Hill House on Pont Street. We are delighted to have those associations with Her Late Majesty and His Majesty the King. There are so many things I could talk about the exceptional reign of Her Late Majesty. But I am going to focus on two things, the length of that reign and her incredible empathy with her people. Her first official visit to the Science Museum was in 1938 at the age of 11, when she visited with her sister and her grandmother. Her last visit to the Science Museum was in 2019. That is a relationship with one institution spanning a remarkable 81 years. And she had those relationships in my constituency, whether it was with the V&A, the Natural History Museum, the Commonwealth Institute, which she was so passionate about when it was in High Street, Kensington. Remarkably, someone said to me yesterday that the Queen's reign of 70 years is actually 30% of the existence of the United States of America. That is remarkable. And secondly, I want to talk about her empathy with her people. During the course of the last 25 years, sadly, my constituency has had two <coughs> tragedies the Grenfell Tower Far and the Ladbroke Grove rail crash. In both instances, the Queen visited very, very quickly, and she gave the most remarkable comfort and succour to the bereaved, to the survivors and the residents. She was so humble, and she only thought of those who were suffering rather than of her own emotions. So, I want to thank you, Your Majesty. I want to send all of the condolences from the Royal Borough of Kensington to His Majesty the King and his family, and I want to wish His Majesty the King a long and healthy reign. God save the King. Yeah. Yeah. Mohammed Yazin. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Watching our family rushing to the bedside of uh, the gravely ill Queen yesterday will have brought back traumatic memories for many of us who have received the heart-stopping call with the news of the imminent de death of a loved one. For as we remember, the 70 years of dedicated and loyal service from the Queen, we first pay our respects to a grieving family who have lost a mother, a grandmother, a great-grandmother, and a friend who was very special, and so has our country. This is a profoundly and moment, sad moment for the UK, the Commonwealth, and the world. Our Queen Elizabeth II is an icon 
throughout the world who makes our nation proud. He earned our respect and embodied all that is good about public service, duty, fortitude, and diligence. Her reassurance, her reassurance presence, her dignity and constancy, especially in terms of discord bound us in a way we may only be about to understand. She has been a role model throughout the ages. I pay tribute to her remarkable life's work, the legacy she leaves, the lives she has touched will echo through the ages. It was a delight to see our community come together to celebrate the Jubilee celebrations. The outpouring of love was heartfelt and enduring. The days and months ahead will be very difficult. May we come together in peace, kindness, and respect as we remember our Queen and prepare for the next chapter in our nation's history. On the behalf of the people of Bedford and Kempston, thank you, ma'am, and long, long live the King. Thank you. Andy Percy. Deputy Speaker, uh, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I rise to associate my constituents with the tributes that have been uh, made today to Her Late Majesty and to, on behalf of the people of Brigginghool and the Isle of Axholme, to swear our loyalty and commit ourselves to our new King. Uh, we've heard some fine tributes uh, uh, in this chamber today and from leaders around the world, and one which resonated the most with me was that of Her Majesty's 12th Canadian Prime Minister, who yesterday said of her, of her late majesty that she was one of his favourite people in the world. And that resonated uh, with me. Uh, I had, didn't know her majesty, uh, her late majesty, as obviously um, Mr Trudeau did. But it resonated with me because we all felt that she was somebody we knew and somebody who was, for me, um, one of my favourite people. And when I think of why, yes, of course, it's due to her constitutional role and her role in uh, this country and all of her dedicated service to this country. But I think for my generation, it is also because she represents the, our grandparents' generation. I was born in the year of her uh, silver jubilee. I look a lot younger. Um, but, it's, <laughs> but my grandparents were the generation who were coming of age in World War II as she was coming to age. And actually, yesterday was the uh, anniversary, some years earlier, of the very day that we rushed to my grandfather's bed uh, to say goodbye to him uh, uh, and he so loved the Queen uh, did uh, Donald Theakston and my grandma Betty who collected everything there was uh, to do with the Queen and as I say to my generation uh, I think she links us to uh, our grandparents um, I haven't as others have in this place perhaps this speaks to my failures as a politician or of lack of achievement haven't kneeled before Her Majesty or had a sword put on my shoulders or been provided with a KBE uh, or, or, or enter to the Privy Council. But I did this year, uh, for work outside of this place, receive the uh, Queen's Platinum Jubilee Medal. And it was one of the proudest thing I received. I didn't get it at Castle. I had to, well, we had to drive to Rotherham and pick it up from an NHS office. Um, but I was so proud um, to receive that medal. And I will cherish it forevermore with the image of Her Majesty on it. I did meet her just once in 2012 uh, here. I have no great story to tell of that because I'm afraid uh, I rather let myself down. We met her as new members when she came to address both houses and I was so flustered as this working class lad from Hull meeting the Queen. Uh, I didn't know what to do and we were given some protocol information beforehand and all I remember is Her Majesty, Her Late Majesty came up to our group and before I could say anything or before she could say anything I just in my humble tones shouted out Brigham Ghoul and she just looked at me, smiled and went, oh, and moved on to the next uh, <laughs> member. Um, so I do not have a, uh, a, a great story of our interaction. Um, but uh, it was a, a privilege and an honour of my life to have met uh, Her Late Majesty. And on behalf of my constituents, I just wanted to thank her for her service. And can I just say, as we say in the Jewish faith, may her memory be a blessing. God save the King. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And on behalf of the people of Cardiff North, it's a, an honour to rise to pay tribute and offer my deepest condolences to His Majesty the King, to the whole royal family, as they mourn the loss of their mother, grandmother 
and great-grandmother, Queen Elizabeth, our longest serving greatest monarch who devoted so much to our country throughout her long and exceptional life. And communities across Cardiff North share in their grief and as we all share in their grief. The magnitude of this loss cannot be understated. Through our lifetimes, through difficult times and upheaval, whether at home or abroad, the Queen has been our constant for 70 years. Her life of service, dedication and her love for all of us demonstrates her values. And these we must hold on to as we move into a new era, keeping her memory alive in our hearts through this historic moment of change. And as a loyal public servant, her bond with all four nations of the UK was unmatched. And of course, she loved Scotland, but I know she had a special place in her heart for Wales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was gifted a playhouse, a Boythin Bach from the people of Wales when she was six years old, and which still is apparently in the grounds of Windsor. And when the Senedd was established, she insisted on being there in person for every single royal opening, which is where I met her. And she surprised us all with her absolute encyclopedic knowledge of Welsh politics, of devolution, taking pride in the fact that she knew every single detail. And she understood that role and it, what it had and what it has with our constitution. And her connection to Cardiff was strong, visiting many times, not just to cheer on in the rugby and enjoy our music, Footage from 1971 shows her opening Wales' largest hospital, our University Hospital Wales, spending time chatting with patients, never holding back, always taking as much time as possible with people, her compassion shining through. And we've seen that passion. Her speech in COP26 last year was one of the most powerful speeches calling on world leaders to act with urgency on climate change. And her determination is only surpassed by our now king, a passionate environmentalist and conservationist. I'm confident that his passion for combating climate change will shine through his reign. Queen Elizabeth was our symbol, our leader for so long, but more than that, she was an incredible woman unassuming, principled, kind and loving. She was able to leave when times were difficult, but she showed a constant love for all of us, something we all felt. We will miss that. And as we mourn, we think of the loved ones we've lost, of loved ones we may not see. And today is a reminder to hold them close, to reach out, to mend scars and wounds and move forward with love. Life is short. And if nothing else, we must remember what's most important. So to end, I want to remember someone close to me and one of my late father's favourite quotes from Dylan Thomas. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Caroline Ansel. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise to extend the love and heartfelt condolences being expressed in Eastbourne and Willingdon today to His Majesty the King, the Royal Family and the Royal Household. How mightily our Sovereign Lady will be missed. Her legacy, of course, will be global in its reach, but will find form in very local ways too. In my constituency, one such way will be in the shape of the Queen's Green Canopy. This 10-year Community Jubilee project has a goal to plant 5,000 trees from the foot of the South Downs at Beeds all the way to the highest point in Eastbourne at Butts Brow. The project will regenerate and reimagine this beautiful, inspiring landscape for generations yet to come. It's very special too that it was Her Late Majesty's father, King George VI, who formally opened the town's downland in 1929, and perhaps rather poignant that it was Her Late Majesty who planted the first Jubilee tree at Balmoral. The project is a fitting tribute, as Her Late Majesty's love of the great outdoors is very well known. 
So too is her deep Christian faith. One of the very first messages of love and appreciation in Eastbourne's Book of Condolence today reads, in her wisdom, charm, devotion to duty and warmth, she was a guiding light for our country. And so she was. But in her humble and gracious way, the late Queen would have testified to the guiding light of Christ in her life. In the very last devotion she used to prepare for her coronation, she prayed, God, be in my head and in my understanding. God, be in mine eyes and in my looking. God, be in my mouth and in my speaking. God, be in my heart and in my thinking. God, be at my end and my departing. Elizabeth Windsor has run her race quite majestically. May she now rest in peace and rise in glory. And God save the King. Munira Wilson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. As we mourn the loss of Her Late Majesty and celebrate her extraordinary legacy, I wish to convey condolences on behalf of my constituents to the King and the entire royal family. We feel her loss deeply. Twickenham is home to a royal palace, a royal park, more Platinum Jubilee street parties than any other English borough, oh. and a rugby stadium whose rousing renditions of God Save the Queen have now been heard for the final time. I wanted to share three very quick stories of how the Queen's kindness and humility touched the lives of my constituents. Last year, Park Lane Stables, a riding centre for disabled people in Teddington, was facing eviction. Campaigners were desperate to keep it open. So, as the Queen's love of horses is well known, they went straight to the top. Natalie O'Rourke describes the letter they received back from the palace as like a modern day fairy tale. It was an invitation to the Royal Muse to visit Her Majesty's horses. One campaigner, Caitlin, said of the visit, we were drawn into their community. We mattered, we were cared for. The Queen could make everyone feel at home. Her late Majesty visited Twickenham many times during her reign. Most often, of course, it was for the rugby, as she was patron of the RFU for 64 years. Tom Gaymore remembers the Queen opening Twickenham Stadium's East Stand in 1994. Whilst he was a 13-year-old boy, ball boy, waiting in the players' tunnel, the Queen stopped, greeted them, and asked questions of them all. He told me her grace and genuine interest in each and every one of us said everything about her human side and her love for her role. My constituent, the Lord Lieutenant of Greater London, Sir Kenneth Olisa, accompanied the Queen to Grenfell Tower in the days following the fire. Despite the unbelievable tragedy, when the Queen arrived, the crowd broke out into spontaneous applause. He said she showed then, as she has so many times, her ability to unite, console, and bring hope to, the, to her people in their times of need. I want to finish by sharing what I personally most admired about her, her deep Christian faith. It underpinned her commitment to devote her whole life to public service, to her country and her commonwealth. During the Platinum Jubilee, the Vicar of St Mary's with St Alban in Teddington reminded us of the words of the Queen's 2016 Christmas message. Christ's example, she said, helps me to see the value of doing small things with great love. Whoever does them and whatever they themselves believe. Queen Elizabeth II did many things with great love. Few of them were small. May she rest in peace. God save the king. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And it is the greatest of honour to be here today to rise and pay my tribute on behalf of my constituents in Derby North and, of course, of myself. Since the heartbreaking news of yesterday that simply took my breath away, I have been reflecting on the influence you have had on myself and so many across the world. All of my life, I have known of the legacy that she has given us. All of my life, I have admired this amazing woman. And today, my heart is so sad to say goodbye to her. She was universally our queen, and she cared so passionately for us all, and truly embodied what it means to serve. She promised to devote her whole life to serving her people, and her generous heart never missed a beat. It was a heart of compassion, love and kindness, through joyous times and turbulent times, so difficult that I can hardly imagine, yet she carried herself with grace and dignity, a dignity, a role model for future generations, just like my wonderful granddaughter. She was the very best of all of us, the very best of humanity, strong yet compassionate, loving and steadfast, she laughed with us as a country, her fantastic smile lighting up our lives. She mourned with us and led us through the darkest of times. A great diplomat, leader, mother, wife, grandmother and great-grandmother, and like me, an animal lover. She carried us through the very worst of times and has held our hand through the very best. I know that my constituents of Derby North thank the Queen from the bottom of their hearts for a lifetime of service, for her guidance and for a never faltering service. To quote King Charles III, a life well lived. Thank you, Your Majesty. Rest in peace. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise to pay tribute on behalf of my constituents of Lewisham East and myself. Our late Queen Elizabeth II is the nation's longest serving monarch who reigned for over, for reigned for seven decades. She was for so many of us a constant, enduring and a reliable figure for our great nation. I was deeply saddened by the news that our beloved Queen had passed away. She served her country with dignity and grace and one of the finest quotes I've heard recently about her is neither did she explain herself and neither did she complain. She rose to each challenge with grace and she dedicated her life to her nation. She was a queen who loved and in return was loved. One of my earliest memories of meeting the queen was when I was seven years old. I met her during a visit to South East London. Strangely enough, my mother's earliest memory of seeing the queen was around the same age many years earlier in the Caribbean. My mother said in Jamaica, children used to run to her and nothing really changed there. She is adored by so many across the Commonwealth and indeed our globe. And of course, as a child, my greatest street party was in 1977, the Silver Jubilee. And I fear that many people are giving away their age because we all seem to remember the Silver Jubilee. She gave us all so much cause for joy and celebration. And I'm grateful that she was able to mark her Platinum Jubilee earlier this year. This brought together thousands of people from across Lewisham, where there were over 100 street parties that were held to celebrate her many achievements. Her departure reminds me that there is a time to live and indeed a time to die. But let's all do our very best to do what we can while we live to make a difference in the lives of others in this place. But in the meantime, my thoughts are with her family, with our nation, and for all who mourn, our beloved Queen Elizabeth II of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, but also across the Commonwealth and across the globe. May she rest in peace and long live the King. Yeah. John Howell. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, I recall my first encounter with the Queen's visit to a foreign country. This was in 1994, and this was the visit that she, that she did to Russia. She went to Moscow and St. Petersburg at the request of Boris Yeltsin. I'd been invited along uh, as part of this trip to conduct economic negotiations with Russia. It was based in St. Petersburg 
on board Britannia, a ship which thoroughly impressed all the Russian visitors. The press made much of the difficulty for the Queen of the trip. The press were, were uh, 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 obsessed with the details of which jewels she had brought and whether any of them had once belonged to Rus Russian duchesses. She wasn't in the slightest interested in this. And I must admit that she took Boris Yeltsin fully in her stride, which is something that, uh, that is quite remarkable to see uh, if, if you can remember what, what he was like. It was a great success for UK PLC, and the Queen took a great interest in what we were doing and the results of, 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 of that visit. As His Majesty said earlier, we remember a life well lived. We celebrate that life for all the human qualities as well as the duty and service which so many members have spoken about. God save the King. Yeah. Ian Paisley. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Forgetting the things which are behind us and reaching for the things which are before us, pressing on to the mark, to the high calling of God, through Jesus Christ. The words of the Apostle, I think, not only are the religious philosophy of our former monarch, but also indicate her style of leadership. She didn't allow the past to be a burden. She didn't allow the past to hold her back. She stretched forward constantly to the mark, shooing this country forward to a better place, to an ideal, to getting over a line, and indeed her Christmas speeches each year summed that up uh, as she witnessed for her Lord and Saviour and for her God. I must say I was deeply impressed and struck by the speech this evening by the King where he dedicated himself to his mother's God in a powerful way and in a singular way. And I think that that should be an encouragement to us all that if he learns from that example of urging this kingdom forward in all its strands and all its steps. My, my constituents are broken hearted, I'm sure like yours, Mr Deputy Speaker, with what has happened over the last few hours to our kingdom. But they will be emboldened by the memories of Her Majesty's visits. Certainly her last visit to North Antrim where she visited the Bush Mills. Bush Mills looked like the box of Quality Street, a contingent of the Irish guards decked out in red tunics. Seamus the dog walking through the village. Whenever the Queen arrived to unveil the statue of uh, the war hero Quig, uh, she, she said to me uh, as I welcomed her, is this all yours? And I hesitated and I said, no ma'am, this is yours. <laughs> and she twinkled in her eye, she said, quite. <laughs> I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. It was, it was a lovely moment. Uh, King Charles, when he was, Prince Charles was in the constituency also. He was way down in Grace Hill in Ballymena. But for some reason, he too made it to Bush Mills. I don't know what it is, but there's something about a liquid which sits in a barrel for 12 years that he seems to like. And uh, I know that my constituents there are delighted by his patronage of uh, Bush Mills. You know, but our kingdom is a lesser place. We have lost a wonderful sovereign lady. But I do want to repeat what the king said this evening. Let's draw strength from the light of her example. Let's draw strength from the light of her example. God save the king. Yeah. James Wilde. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And it's only three months ago that I stood here to join in the wonderful tributes to Her Majesty the Queen to mark her Platinum Jubilee. And today the House and the country feels immense sadness at her passing. But that is tempered by the opportunity to recognise her extraordinary life of service and by knowing that she witnessed the heartfelt displays of affection towards her in the 70th year of her reign. And that unprecedented occasion was celebrated passionately in my northwest Norfolk constituency, which is unsurprising as it's home to Sandringham, the much loved private retreat of the late Queen and her family for generations. And the continuity that that estate has provided to her family 
means her Norfolk home occupied a unique place in the Queen's affections. She loved the time that she spent there. Having ascended to the throne at such a young age, it offered an escape from the public eye. A place where she could relax with family, was often spotted behind the wheel of the Land Rover, and she enjoyed walking her dogs and, of course, the country pursuits and her prized horse stud. The people living in the villages around the Sandringham Estate have great affection for the Queen, as she was a very special part of those close-knit communities. They have happy memories of encounters with the Queen, because as well as the private time she spent there, she chose to undertake many visits over the years. And whether as a member of the Sandringham WI since 1943, and then as its president, taking tea and cake with ladies, or presenting local children with awards, or visiting charities and businesses, she was a constant and cherished part of life in West Norfolk. And perhaps surprisingly, she was even able to go about her life there without fuss. Indeed, famously, when out shopping one day, a woman remarked to her, you look just like the Queen. <laughs> to which the Queen is said to have replied, how reassuring. <laughs> <laughs> Presumably with a twinkle in her eye. And her affection with Sandra was matched only by that of the Duke of Edinburgh, who gave such love, support and service to Her Majesty. And it was from the Long Library at Sandringham that the Queen delivered the first televised Christmas message in 1957. But perhaps one of the most profound comments in recent times was her broadcast during the pandemic that others have referred to, that we all meet again. A simple phrase expressing hope that we all needed. And it was the immediate response to her passing yesterday. It was people coming together at Windsor, at Buckingham Palace, at Sandringham, at Balmoral and elsewhere to share their grief and give thanks for an amazing life. And on behalf of my North West Norfolk constituents, I offer the deepest condolences to the entire royal family. God save the King. Yeah. And I'm Kaiser. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I rise to pay my respects today on behalf of my constituents in Airdrie and Shots. It is, of course, with great sadness that we are here today to pay tribute to Her Majesty the Queen. Over her 70-year reign, she's been a figurehead across four nations and worldwide, and she has worked tirelessly, demonstrating an unwavering commitment to her role as head of state. Her Majesty, of course, took the throne in her 20s, and in the years that followed, she guided the four nations through monumental changes. She served as a pillar of hope, and stability during times of uncertainty. And she was a constant in the lives of many people, indeed the only monarch many of us have ever known. Mr Deputy Speaker, I was born in Scotland, but I'm also the grandchild of the Commonwealth. And I know that many, especially of the older generations, like my grandmother, Salamdi Begum, and my grandfather, Haji Abdullah, held the Queen in high esteem. And they often, when I was growing up, would tell us stories about when they moved from a small village called Sarabi in Pakistan to Rochdale, then settling in, in Scotland. They would tell us about how they found the Queen as an inspiration to them. And simply, Her Majesty meant so much to so many people. She was, of course, a mother, a grandmother, and a great grandmother. And I, along with the people of Airdrie and Shot, send our condolences to our family. They are in our thoughts and prayers. May she rest in peace. Flick Drummond. Thank you very much, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, for giving me this opportunity to pay tribute on behalf of myself and my constituents in Mian Valley to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth and to pass on our condolences to the, um, to the uh, Queen, sorry, to the King, the Queen Consort and all the Royal Family. This is one of the saddest times this, this country has faced. Yeah. We have lost our guide and we feel the strange sensation of being adrift that something is not quite right in the world, that our anchor has been swept away. It is an unease I know that will fade as life goes on and I know Her Majesty would want it that way. She was a woman without pretension solely dedicated to her country and the Commonwealth through her unstinting service up to her final days, as we saw. How we will miss her smile and her continuity. Mm. We knew this time would come, but it was a shock nonetheless. I want to thank Her Majesty for those 70 years of service. 
She will remain an example for everyone, in particular those in public service, about how we should serve. It has been a leadership which so many of us would like to emulate. The tributes from across the world show what an inspiration she has been, and they must be a comfort to her family and to the country as we come to terms with our collective loss. I was born ten years after the Queen came to the throne, and like many out here, I have only known one monarch. The monarchy has been part of our island's fabric for more than a thousand years. It has been left in good shape and with an able successor at its helm. I will be proud to serve His Majesty King Charles III as Member of Parliament and as a British subject. God save the King. Yeah. Ruth Cadbury. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I want to add my thoughts and condolences and that of my family and my constituents to the royal family today, a time of immense grief and pain for them as they've not only lost their sovereign but also the beloved head of their family. Few remember a time without Queen Elizabeth II, her Christmas messages, her visits and her presence at state occasions. For 70 years she was a beacon and guiding light for us all. And as a woman in the public eye, she was a perfect example of grace and dignity, often in the face of adversity. For many of my constituents in Brentford and Isleworth and Hounslow, Osterley and Chiswick, the Queen was known through her tireless work to promote and celebrate dialogue and tolerance between all faiths and cultures. That's why I particularly remember her 2004 Christmas message, where she described her visit both to a mosque in East London and to the Gurdwara in my constituency. In that message, she then relayed the story of a visitor to Britain who had described travelling from Heathrow into London on the Piccadilly line at the end of the school day and of being delighted that children from different cultures and faiths getting on and off the tube train could be at such ease with each other, something not possible in his own country. Many of those young people would have been my constituents and attending our local schools. In times of crisis, the nation turned to her for her compassion and her wisdom. From her speech to children being evacuated during World War II to her national message at the height of the coronavirus, the people of the UK turned to Her Majesty at the most testing times. She always upheld her promise to serve that she made when she was 21. She devoted herself to service, to our country, to the Commonwealth, and to us all. Today marks the end of the Elizabethan age, but Her Majesty's memory and her legacy shall live on. May she rest in peace. Long live King Charles III. Amen. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise to speak on behalf of the constituents of Loughborough, Shepshed, Quorn, Barrow, Salby, Hathen, Mount Sorrel and the Wolds Villages to express their deep sorrow at the loss of our Sovereign, Her Majesty the Queen. Loughborough had the privilege of hosting Her Majesty on a number of occasions during her reign, including in 1996, when she opened the new English and Drama Building at Loughborough Grammar School, which was named the Queen's Building in her honour. Her Majesty also visited in 1966 when she signed and sealed the Royal Charter of Incorporation that granted university status to Loughborough College of Technology, becoming Loughborough University. We were also very proud to be involved in the Queen's Baton Relay in the lead-up to the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham this summer. I spoke on behalf of Loughborough constituency in the humble address speech for her Platinum Jubilee earlier this year saying that the Commonwealth is, of course, the jewel in the crown, and that throughout her reign, Her Majesty has overseen its modernisation to ensure that it represents everyone that brings together communities from across the world, and that is undoubtedly true. Loughborough will again be on the world stage this weekend, when bells will ring across the country and across the world. Many of those bells will have been made in Loughborough at Taylor's Bell Foundry, the world's largest working bell foundry, including the casting of the Great Paul Bell at St Paul's Cathedral. We will be filled with both sadness and great pride 
that our bells say goodbye to our sovereign queen and also welcome our new monarch, King Charles III. Loughborough is honoured to play its part in marking this solemn and moving occasion in British history. In closing, I quote Her Late Majesty when she said, Grief is the price we pay for love. There will be gr a great deal of grief felt over these next few weeks, and that is because there was a great deal of love for her throughout the 96 years of her life. Truly, Elizabeth the Great. May she rest in peace, and God save the King. Yeah. Sam Tarry. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'd like to place on record my tribute today, alongside so many that have spoken today already, and offer my personal condolences to His Majesty King Charles III on behalf of all of our communities in Ilford South. Mr Deputy Speaker, like many parliamentarians across the House, I have always had a profound respect for the Queen and for the role she has performed within our nation. I have admired the sage advice and wise counsel she gave to so many leaders over the course of the past seven decades. And as a son of an Anglican rector and canon of St uh, Chelmsford Cathedral, someone who has grown up in the church, someone who has grown up in the churches of Ilford, I have understood so much as part of my life the role that the Queen has performed as head of the Church of England. And in a constituency like Ilford, where people really do do God alongside their politics, with so many people of so many faiths attending religious institutions on a daily basis, she has been held so fondly in the hearts of so many with her religious beliefs and her faith, but also, of course, because of her public service. The Queen's longevity is perhaps encapsulated best in the fact that the first Prime Minister she saw in Winston Churchill was born in 1874, while the current incumbent of number 10, that she greeted just days ago, was born in 1975, a span of more than 100 years, an entire century, which is truly astounding. But she was also an inspiration to our nation, a steadying influence for millions to look up to amid the turbulence and flux so often in British politics. She was the anchor that so many needed during times of crisis. I remember very clearly witnessing the strength that she had in the wake of the seven seven bombings that hit London and the streets of our capital. She was able to show her tenderness in meeting the victims of the terrorist atrocities while at the same time stating defiantly, and I quote, that those who perpetrate these brutal acts against innocent people should know that they would not change our way of life, and they did not. She was also an inspiration for our war generation, my great-grandparents and grandparents who served fighting the Nazis, a shining light on the role that the woman performed tirelessly in those war years. Reading the story about how he aged just 18 in 1944, she begged her father, King George, to let her join the war effort. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the king resolutely refused to let her do so. However, undeterred, she continued to plead with her father until he finally relented and let her to join the auxiliary territorial service. She was soon donning a pair of coveralls, driving a military truck and working as a mechanic. In doing so, Queen Elizabeth became the first woman in the royal family to join the armed forces and the first serving monarch to do so in over a thousand years. And in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War, in fact, the day after VE Day, in 9th of May 1945, Elizabeth took part in a tour of some of the bombed areas of Ilford in recognition of the terrible conditions that East London and that part of Essex had endured under the relentless bombing raids of the Luftwaffe. On her walkabout, where she joined by King George, the Queen Mother and Princess Margaret, she was sewn Lay Street, not far from my constituency office in Ilford, next to, at that time, the bombed-out local cinema. Throughout her time as the monarch, Elizabeth was always supportive of the people of Ilford. I recall one of her last trips to Ilford when she visited Valentine's Mansion in Valentine's Park to mark her Diamond Jubilee in 2012. Crowds thronged to that park and it was abundantly clear the love and respect that people from every generation and across every community had for the Queen. And as head of the Commonwealth, the Queen was held in particularly high regard by my constituents in Ilford, many of which were represented by her with their origins and heritage in the 54 countries that our Commonwealth now extends to. And, Deputy Speaker, I will quickly relay one very quick uh, memento of my meeting with the Queen. As I was a young scout in the 2nd Seven Kings Troop from Milford, where I saw first-hand the work that Elizabeth did as the patron of the scout movement, 
I recall very fondly actually climbing to the top of a tree in Gilwell Park so I could actually walk her, see her walk past. And my scout master asked me to come down and to speak to her directly. Because even at such a young age, the work she did with the movement of scouts was its patron was an inspiration. So in closing, I would like to send my heartfelt condolences. Her death cast a long shadow over our nation and all within the Commonwealth, but the lessons that she taught us will live on for many years to come. God rest the Queen, God bless all at home mourn her, and long live the King. Simon Baines. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Across the length and breadth of my constituency of Cluid South, people have paid heartfelt tribute to Her Late Majesty the Queen. Part of what made the Queen so special was her combination of majesty and modesty, which made her both a remarkable head of state and an approachable person who millions have enjoyed meeting or seeing at close quarters at home and abroad. In Cluid South, people have been recalling her many visits over the years, including to Corwin in 1949, when she was still Princess Elizabeth, and then to Tlangothlin in 1953, in her post-coronation tour, when she attended the Tlangothlin International Musical Eye Stedford and took a trip on the Tlangothlin Steam Railway. These visits continued over the years to Overton on Dee, Wrexham and elsewhere, and in all cases, people felt a special connection with this smiling, friendly and unassuming monarch, supported so magnificently by Prince Philip. Unlike many other speakers here today, I've never had the honour of meeting the Queen in person, but I am proud to say that both my mother and I shared the same birthday as Her Majesty the Queen, yeah. namely the 21st of April. Perfect. Also, as a small boy in 1964, I remember the excitement in my own family when my father, um, who commanded the Queen's Guard at Balmoral, and we all spent the summer staying in Ballater while he carried out his official duties, supported by my mother. Like everyone else that I have met who served the Queen in an official capacity, my father thought the world of her. As has been mentioned many times, yesterday there were rainbows over both Buckingham Palace and Windsor Castle. And I like to think of her reign as a rainbow of dedicated service overarching my life and that of the nation. And I felt this most strongly in the wonderful address she gave to the nation April two years ago, which again many members have referred to at the start of the COVID crisis, in which she said, the moments when the United Kingdom has come together to applaud its care and essential workers will be remembered as an expression of our national spirit, and its symbol will be the rainbows drawn by children. The Queen embodied our national spirit with her great sense of community, kindness and dedicated service, for which we are eternally grateful. My thoughts and prayers and those of my constituents in Cluid South are with her beloved family. God rest her soul, God save the King and bless the Prince and Princess of Wales. Here yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. On this sad day, I rise to pay tribute to Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. We are a nation in mourning, and I know I speak on behalf of my Bath constituents when I say we will all sorely miss her. Whether you had met Her Late Majesty in person or not, we feel we knew her. She had a personal relationship with all her subjects, and she managed to combine her office as monarch of an ancient and great kingdom with the warmth and personal touch of a wonderful human being. And her great personal qualities of empathy, integrity and humility stood as an example to us all. She, of all persons who could have been pompous, was never pompous. She saw herself as a servant all her life. That's rare, and we all owe her a huge debt of gratitude for that unstinging service. She was not just a British monarch, she was a world leader, renowned and respected throughout the world. I grew up in Hanover in Germany, and there were no more monarchs. Actually, everybody was rather squeamish about tradition. But with a royal connection between Britain and Hanover, people were perfectly happy to adopt Queen Elizabeth 
as our queen. And indeed, when I was young, uh, she was perfectly useful um, to correct our manners. You better learn to behave in case you meet the queen. Apart from her undoubtedly impeccable table manners, she represented to the core the best of British. In time of great turbulence, the late queen stood as a unifier and a peacemaker. She clearly <coughs> loved people and respected each and every individual for who they were. Her legacy must live on as we enter a new chapter. May she rest in peace and long live the king. Mr. Graham. Some wonderful tributes, Mr. Deputy Speaker, being given today from across the House to a simply amazing woman. Our nation's unshakable rock in storms, our favourite granny, and above all, our queen, much loved and now deeply mourned in Gloucester as across the United Kingdom and abroad. For her late majesty touched lives not just in the 14 countries for whom she was head of state, or even the 54 countries that make up the Commonwealth family, but across the world. On July the 1st this year, I, representing Her Majesty's Government at the inauguration of President Marcos of the Philippines, passed congratulations from the world's longest serving head of state to its most recently elected. The President's face lit up. The Queen is amazing. He said, we all watched the Platinum Jubilee celebrations and she has set the platinum standard for heads of state. Now, whatever our individual memories of Her Late Majesty, whether of individual meetings or seeing her at visits like those to Gloucester in 2003 and 9, or simply watching her smash hits on TV with James Bond and Paddington Bear, the President was right. The Queen is, was, the platinum standard. The extraordinary example of leadership through service to which we all aspire. So in offering my and Gloucester residents sympathy to the royal family, we are all grateful for that extraordinary legacy. None of us will ever forget our world's queen or her second great Elizabethan age. And I believe King Charles's own long record of service and his moving speech this evening should give us all great confidence for the future. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. God save the King. Yeah. James Murray. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, this morning I left my constituency of Ealing North to come into Parliament by boarding an Elizabeth Line train. As we know, over time, Queen Elizabeth II's mark on our banknotes, our coins and our stamps and so on will gradually give way to the mark of King Charles III, but in our part of the country, those stations and trains mean that my constituents and I will always have a physical tribute to our greatest monarch running through our borough. Mr Deputy Speaker, to the great disappointment of the countless primary school children who have asked me since I was elected, I never had the chance of meeting the Queen as an MP. But I know that I was not alone in feeling her presence across Greenford, Perivale, Northolt, Hanwell and Ealing during the Platinum Jubilee celebrations in June. In our diverse part of London, people of all ages, of all backgrounds, of all faiths and none, came out to celebrate the reign of our Queen and our love of our community and our country. After the separation of the pandemic, we were celebrating the Queen's Jubilee with our neighbours, and that celebration itself helped the Queen's assurance during lockdown that better days would return come true. And at those Jubilee celebrations, as in the House of Commons today, everyone had their personal reflection on the Queen and what it was about her they most admired. For me, what stands out above all else was her most incredible sense of duty and her awesome devotion to service that quite simply was her life. Mr Deputy Speaker, on behalf of the people of Ealing North, I offer our deepest condolences to the King and the Royal Family, and our most heartfelt thanks for the life of Queen Elizabeth II, whose legacy will live on forever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Paul Bristow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's my solemn honour to pay tribute 
to Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II on behalf of the people of my city, Peterborough. Peterborough loved and mourns her. Her reign managed, somehow, across its seven decades, to penetrate each of our lives and bring us together. Now we are brought together in grief. My constituents come from across the Commonwealth and beyond it. She mattered to each of them. That was her magic. And I saw it at work myself throughout the Jubilee celebrations in my city just a few months ago. Different cultures, religions, creeds, different nationalities all coming together to celebrate a truly remarkable woman. For our armed forces, for our public servants, for organisations, charities and families, and for me, there is one less certainty in an all too turbulent world. She visited Peterborough in 1952, while still Princess Elizabeth, attending the agricultural show at the old showground in Eastfield. And as our Queen, she visited on four more occasions. In March 1975, the Maundy Thursday service was held at Peterborough Cathedral, where she distributed the Royal Maundy coins to 49 men and 49 women in a ceremony attended by more than 3,200 people. She later went for a walk in Bridge Street and dined with her husband, the late Duke of Edinburgh, and with city councillors at the Town Hall. The Queen returned to Peterborough for her Silver Jubilee, again arriving to crowds of people at Peterborough Station. She opened our Magistrates Court and the Cresset in Breton, while not forgetting to make a detour to the National Shire Horse Society's <coughs> centenary show. Another decade on, when she returned for the 750th anniversary of our cathedral. She also opened the Edith Cavell Hospital, now Peterborough City Hospital. Her final visit was to the East of England show, where over 3,000 visitors made their way through the turnstiles, an extra 3,000, to catch a glimpse of Her Majesty. Sadly, she will never return. I find it difficult to put into words. It feels like losing a family member, even though I never met her. The institution is far more than the individual, but the crown was greater for resting on her head. No monarch brought such selfless dedication to the role asked of them. Few before held the strings to our country's heart. With Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, the most tangible connection to our history is gone. But with His Majesty the King, Charles III, her legacy will continue long into our future. Peterborough proudly proclaims, through its tears, God save the King. Alex yeah. Davis Jones. The yeah. Honourable Mr Deputy Speaker, I am saddened but truly grateful and humbled to have the opportunity to add to my tributes here today to commemorate the extraordinary life of Her Royal Highness Queen Elizabeth II on behalf of my constituents and my community in Pontypridd and Taffili. May I first echo the sentiments of colleagues across the benches in offering my sincere condolences to the Royal Family and to all who knew and loved her. While we all know what it may feel like to lose someone close, it is difficult to comprehend the loss of such a central figure, knowing fully well the whole world outside is watching. Mr Deputy Speaker, I share the sentiments of a huge number of local residents who have been in touch to share their sorrow at the news of Her Majesty's passing, mainly my mam, but then she did name me Alexandra Mary. <laughs> Many of my constituents also have great pride in working at the Royal Mint in Llantrisant, and they have spent their working lives ensuring her portrait is nothing short of picture perfect on all of the coins in our pockets. They have expressed their admiration for Her Royal Highness's lifetime of dedicated public service and her commitment and devotion to this great nation. As history's longest serving monarch, Her Majesty played an incredibly important role in uniting the nation through turbulent times. Her Majesty loved this country, she loved Wales, and we all loved her in return, which is why we all grieve today and for what I imagine will be some time to come. All of us here in the UK and across the Commonwealth are indebted to Her Majesty. We have so much to be grateful to her for. And for that, I say thank you to Jochen Vaudenham. Her Majesty was committed to the demands of duty, the sacrifices of service, and understood the responsibility bestowed upon her. 
Listening to colleagues across the House today recount stories and tales of meeting Her Majesty in person, I too would like to share with you all my most cherished memory of my encounter with the late Queen. As a little girl who always dreamed, like so many, of one day becoming a princess, having the privilege of singing for Her Majesty as part of her, globally, of her Golden Jubilee tour in Trehavad is a day I shall never forget. Waving my paper flag a dry goch, belting out Callan Lan with Hoyle, and getting to see with my own eyes the actual, real-life Queen was nothing short of magical. She had a natural sparkle, a wicked sense of humour, and the ability to make everyone she spoke to, waved at or simply smiled at, feel like they had the most treasured interaction. We may never see another monarch like her. As a nation, we will miss Her Majesty enormously. May she rest in peace and rise in glory. God save the King, and God bless the new Prince and Princess of Wales. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Grief is the price we pay for love, Mr Deputy Speaker, as the Queen herself so memorably said. And as I laid flowers outside Buckingham Palace this morning, I was struck by the scale of the grief felt at her passing. For as my honourable friend, the member for Loughborough, has said, the greater the love, the greater the grief. In some ways, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Queen was an ordinary woman, a person like us. She loved dogs, marching about in wellies, horse racing, a gin and dubonnet, a good wind-up, and sporting the ultimate rainbow-hued wardrobe. If I wore beige, no one would knew who I was, she is reported to have said. Like us, she suffered grief, loss, and family troubles, but had to endure them being played out on the pages of the world's press. She did so with great dignity. We felt we could relate to her, that we knew her, even though many of us may never have met her, she held a special place in our hearts. And in many ways, of course, the Queen was also an extraordinary woman. There can't be many who can pull off walking in a one kilogram crown, but also claim to know their way around a car engine or who have let Brian May serenade them from the roof of their house. Few could have provided such stability and reassurance through seven decades of the greatest social, economic and technological change, adapting to that change without letting it change her. Her reign saw the first man on the moon, the invention of the internet. When she ascended the throne, Great Britain had an empire. When she passed away, she was the head of a family of nations. And she was head of our national family. Constituents in Rushcliffe have told me her loss feels personally, more perhaps than they imagined. Whatever our politics or creed, from the youngest to the oldest, from the most remote corners of our islands to the bustle and clatter of our biggest cities, the Queen bound us together the thread through our national story. In triumph, she was our anthem, through trials, our strength, her courage and steadfastness an example to us all. Who will ever forget her message to the nation at the height of the coronavirus pandemic, her reassurance that we would meet again. And we meet here today to remember a woman who lit people's faces with joy to remember a sovereign whose reign is one of the greatest in history, and to remember a public servant who gave her whole life to us, her people, her country and her commonwealth, right until the very end. Daisy Cooper. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Throughout her extraordinary reign, Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II was a beacon of stability, duty and selflessness, and many of my constituents in St Albans will find it impossible to imagine Britain's public life without her. On a personal level, I met the Queen a number of times when I worked in Commonwealth Affairs trying to advance democracy and human rights. The Queen wasn't just a constant, but a few times a year she was literally part of the day job. Commonwealth Heads of Government meetings, Commonwealth Youth meetings, the annual multi-faith, interfaith, Commonwealth Day service and reception. The Queen and Commonwealth were inseparable, the only modern intergovernmental organisation like it. 
Each year, we Commonwealth Secretariat staffers used to love celebrating the, the diversity of the Commonwealth on Commonwealth Day, but sometimes it was slightly surreal. The annual Commonwealth Day reception at the Secretariat was rumoured to be the only event in the Queen's Diary where she didn't know who she was going to meet. There was no official line-up, it was all organic, not organised, and there was no protocol on ordering people and guests by rank or into different rooms. As a result, it was not unusual to see the Queen greeting a disorganised throng of diplomats, high commissioners, often with their husbands and wives, jostling to a backdrop of Fijian dancers in coconut bras, Ghanaian acrobats and British pop stars from the 1980s, all jockeying for position to get a glimpse of the Queen or to shake her hand. On another day, I was tasked with taking a group of dignitaries to Buckingham Palace for an audience with Her Majesty. One such dignitary had just got a new smartphone and he was particularly keen on telling all the other group members about the merits of this phone in spectacular levels of detail. When we arrived at the palace, we were all told, quite rightly, to turn our phones onto silent and to put them away. But during our polite conversation with the Queen, this particular person tried to persuade Her Majesty that she should get a phone just like his. So he proceeded to take his phone out of his pocket, start pressing buttons and thrust it under her nose. And he plucked up the courage to say, Your Majesty, I think you should get a phone like mine. We all stood there, stunned in silence. And she just said, Who do you expect me to text? <laughs> it was fantastic. He blushed like a schoolboy. That one-liner was wildly refreshing, and the rest of the group were incredibly grateful. I know that so many people who have met the Queen have many memories and stories to share, including many of my own constituents. And many of them will remember the three occasions that the Queen has visited our St Albans Cathedral and Abbey, where a book of condolence is now open. The Queen's passing feels like an end of an era, but on behalf of myself and my constituents in St Albans, I would like to extend my thoughts and prayers to the Royal Family. Rest in peace, Your Majesty, and thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I rise to speak on behalf of my constituents in West Dorset to pay tribute to our late Queen, whom we have loved and admired for our entire lives, to share in the deepest sorrow of the nation, and to send our deepest sympathy to King Charles and the royal family. Queen Elizabeth has been one of the few constants in our transitory life. The past 24 hours has truly brought home to us not only the life and service of our Queen, but also our own service to our community and nation. Queen Elizabeth was a woman of great kindness and faith, of incredible inspiration, of steadfast leadership, and was a family role model for all of us. The Queen was of my grandparents' generation. Their sense of selfless service and duty, particularly during times of difficulty, has allowed us to lead the lives of freedom and democracy that we enjoy today. Her late Majesty's generation is one of selflessness, not of entitlement. Her generation is one of tenacity, of character, and of wisdom that we must look to continue in our own lives. And since my own grandparents passed away, I and so many have looked upon our Queen as the grandmother of the nation. And that is why the loss we feel is so sad and so difficult to describe. I am not able to put it better than Martin Lee, the rector of Sherborne this morning, when he said, our country has been held in her hands. With gentleness and firmness, she has never let go, always putting the needs of the nation before herself. In West Dorset, we have the fondest memories of many occasions that the late Queen Elizabeth visited us. First in 1952 in our county town of Dorchester, she visited my hometown of Sherborne twice, once in 1998, when the Queen unveiled the Great West Window at Sherborne Abbey, and again as part of the Queen's Diamond Jubilee tour in 2012, returning to Dorchester in 2016 to open Queen Mother Square in Poundbury. Those fond memories have endured with us for many years and will continue to do so. We, 
the people of West Dorset and the citizens of the United Kingdom mourn our Queen, but our new King and his family are mourning his mother. It is therefore with profound affection and the greatest sympathy from West Dorset that I wish His Majesty the King to know that he, the royal family, and the late Queen Elizabeth remain steadfastly in our thoughts and prayers at this very sad time. God save the King. Yeah. Yeah. Gerald Jones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. On behalf of myself, my family and my constituents in the county borough of Merthyr Tidwell and the Upper Rumney Valley, I send my sincere condolences to His Majesty the King and all members of the royal family. As we know and as we've heard most of our fellow citizens have known no other monarch. Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II has been an ever-present rock of stability throughout our country, the Commonwealth and around the world. Her presence has indeed been the glue holding our country together for so long. And as we've heard, it's so difficult to think of our country without her. I feel there is no greater example of unstinting and exemplary public service anywhere. We have been so lucky to have lived during these times to have witnessed her service, her grace, her dignity, which was an example to us all. We will undoubtedly never see her like again. From an early age, Her Majesty followed her parents' example of duty that was so important in holding the country together during World War II. For over 70 years, she has been a constant. She has demonstrated a lifelong commitment to the service of the nation and Commonwealth. She was the longest reigning monarch in British history, the longest reigning female monarch, and the second longest serving monarch in world history. She served right to the very end, as she declared that she would do on her 21st birthday in 1947. Just a few short weeks ago, communities across all four nations of the United Kingdom and across her other realms, the Commonwealth and the world, were all celebrating the first ever Platinum Jubilee. I hope that as she appeared on the Buckingham Palace balcony for the last time and witnessed the outpouring on the Mall, that she was in no doubt just how much she was loved. I know that we all have examples of Her Majesty's links to our communities, and in my constituency, the most poignant is the community of Aberfan, a place where Her Late Majesty visited following the tragedy in 1966, and visited a number of times during her reign, something that was a comfort to many in the village and beyond. Her last visit to the community was part of her Diamond Jubilee tour in 2012, when she opened the brand new Anis Owen Primary School. So, Mr Speaker, on behalf of the people across my constituency, I say thank you for your life of service, ma'am. May you rest in eternal peace and rise in glory, and God save the Queen, and God bless the new Prince and Princess of Wales. Thank you, Batty. Thank you, thank you, Mr Speaker, and that was an excellent tribute, like so many tributes today, as we, and it just goes to show how we are all united in our grief. The heartfelt speeches from across the House have echoed the pain and sorrow which has been felt across the country and the Commonwealth since that devastating news yesterday. On behalf of my constituents in Meriden, I'd like to express my heartfelt condolences to the royal family as they mourn the loss of a beloved mother, grandmother and a great-grandmother. Our nation weeps with them and for them. And Her Majesty does hold a special place in the hearts of my constituents, because for it was on a spring morning in 1971 when Her Majesty opened Chelmsley Wood Shopping Centre, and most of the village of Chelmsley Wood turned out to greet her. In fact, that day the royal party was uh, running on a late schedule but the Queen was undeterred, and she took her time to speak to local residents. That same day, the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh were also shown the proposed site of the National Exhibition Centre. They would return five years later, in 1976, to open the NEC, where excited members of staff stood in a line to greet Her Majesty. And this is particularly apt, because the NEC was a major venue for the Commonwealth Games. Her Majesty always demonstrated kindness, generosity, and dedication. And I have my own experience of this because in March 2007, when I was finishing off my degree at the London School of Economics, I was invited to meet Her Majesty on Commonwealth Day. I was nervous and I was excited. And she was very gracious with her time. And it was only later when I asked a friend, how did I do? He said, you said a lot, but none of it made any sense. <laughs> I hope my tribute is better today. But Her Majesty never let on and, she, um, and wished me all the best in my endeavours. For decades, Her Majesty has been a cool-headed, constant steward of our great nation. She was always there when we needed her. She showed us what it meant to keep calm and carry on. I'll never forget how in the pandemic, 
she gave reassurance to the whole nation and told us that we would meet again. We were blessed to have her, and she really was the best of us. She lived a dedicated life of service and devotion to her husband, her family, her country, and the Commonwealth. And every single one of us in this house would do well to emulate her lifetime of selflessness and public service. Today, we mourn a monarch and we pray for her. And as we reflect on her legacy and we look to the future, I say only this, may she rest in peace, May we always be grateful to have experienced her reign. To God we belong and to God we return. God save the King. Chris Law. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And it's a pleasure to follow uh, the, the delightful tribute given to the Queen by Right Honourable Member from Meriden. Um, on behalf of myself, my constituents in Dundee West, and all peoples of the Royal Ancient Borough of Dundee, I'd like to pay tribute to Her Majesty the Queen and send my deepest condolences to the royal family at this difficult time. Her Majesty dedicated her life to public service and having acceded to the throne at an unexpected young age, she has reshaped the monarchy in the changing generations that she has reigned and she'll be remembered in history as Britain's longest serving monarch. Throughout her reign, she served with dignity and compassion. Everyone that I know personally that has met her has spoken of her real and genuine warmth. The Queen, of course, had a strong Scottish heritage. The Queen Mother's home was Glam's Castle in Angus, not far from my city of Dundee. As a result, Her Majesty frequently visit, visited her maternal grandparents there as a child. Indeed, one of the earliest photographs of the Queen visiting Dundee is as a child shopping in Webster's toy shop in Whitehall Crescent with her grandmother, the Countess of Strathmore. Throughout her lifetime, she continued to visit my city, and many of Dundee's parks and public spaces were officially opened by Her Majesty. As then Princess, she officially opened Camperdown Park in 1946, and seven decades later, 70 years, she unveiled a plaque to officially open Slessor Gardens at our city's redeveloped waterfront in 2016. Buckingham Palace was, of course, not the only balcony that the Queen waved from. In 1969, she arrived by train into Dundee and visited Dudhope Court, one of the city's 44 multi-storey blocks. While there, she was welcomed by a local Dundee family and waved from their balcony to the crowds that gathered below. I'm also told uh, that she stayed back for a cup of tea. <laughs> Thousands of people gathered to watch the Royal Yacht Britannia birth in the city when she made her first royal visit to Dundee as Queen in 1955 with the Duke of Edinburgh, and I know that thousands will now wish to sign the book of condolence that has been opened at Dundee City Chambers to allow members of the public the chance to express their feelings at the death of Her Majesty. She will always be remembered in Dundee, in Scotland, the Commonwealth and the world for her unwavering service that has never ceased until the end. Thank you, ma'am, and may you rest in peace. Yeah, yeah. David Johnson. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. When the announcement was made yesterday of Her Majesty passing, my tears started immediately. There's been lots of euphemisms for that in the House this, the, this afternoon, but I cried in the way that I would someone that I was close to. And of course I'd never met her. I wish I had met her. I'd once been in the same room, that was as close as I got, but it was too big a room, there were too many people. She entered at the opposite end to, to where I was and everybody swarmed and I, and I didn't stand a chance. But I did have the privilege of meeting two members of her family, including um, our new king, who spoke so movingly earlier this evening. And in them, we saw what she had inculcated in her family and in the nation. We saw the example that, that she set. And it's no surprise that the same words are used over and over again in the tribute about duty and sacrifice and dedication and selflessness. She personified them. <clears throat> but we have also heard about passion. We've heard about her passion, of course, for her family, for her country, for horse racing, for, for her dogs, but about humour, about mischief, which we saw at the Olympics and which we saw quite recently in the Platinum Jubilee celebrations with Paddington Bear and in those celebrations, which were just a few weeks ago, of course, we all rise to speak on behalf of our constituents. And my constituents of, in, in Wantage and Didcot showed the great love and devotion they had to her with street parties all across the four towns and 64 villages I represent. Far too many for me to get to all of them, although I, I tried to do my best. 
We have been blessed, and it's a constituency with a long royal history, the birthplace of, of Alfred the Great. And we have been blessed with visits like every other part of the country, to Wallingford, to Harwell, to open the diamond light source. However good any of us think we are at visiting things in our constituency, none of us are anything like Her Majesty in 70 years of day after day visiting things, openings, ceremonies. At the peak, she was patron of more than 600 charities that she supported. And we have lost the most impressive servant to our nation that we will ever see. And we should be forever thankful for what she has given to us. And Mr. Mr. Speaker, Winston Churchill, and, and in saying that, that should give you an indication of how early that was in her reign. But Winston Churchill said, if all the film people, all the film people in all the world, if they scoured the globe, would not find someone as suited to the part. How true that was. May she rest in peace and God save the King. Mr Speaker, I'd like to pay tribute to Her Late Majesty the Queen on behalf of myself and my constituents of Enfield Southgate. In our grief, we remember a lifetime dedicated to extraordinary public service. Her steadfast commitment to the values of duty, public service and family provided comfort to so many here and around the world. And my thoughts and condolences and those of my constituents are with the King and the Royal Family at this most difficult time. As we all know, the Queen was the one constant in our lives. At times of incredible change, at times of crises and during good times too, she was Britain's reassuring and constant presence. In 1953, the whole country joined in celebration to mark the Queen's coronation. Uh, in Enfield Southgate, I'm reliably informed there were many local events to mark the occasion, including a local parade procession and athletics games in Broomfield Park. Footage from this time is incredibly poignant after Thursday's news, but also after this summer's Platinum Jubilee, where communities were able to come together once again to celebrate the Queen. In 1953, the Queen's coronation speech was broadcast over loudspeakers in Broomfield Park, but because of the rain, many listened at home on the radio. This summer, we had no such problems. We had street parties across the borough with bake-offs and crown competitions, and it was wonderful to bring the community together in this way 70 years later. Now, today, those events are all the more moving as we pay tribute to the Queen's life and her service to our country. And I'm sure we will see the same sense of togetherness again as the nation mourns over the coming days. As our longest ever serving monarch, like most of us, I do not remember a time before Queen Elizabeth II. In this time, she saw 15 prime ministers, but somehow managed to stay above party politics. As we know in this house, that is no mean feat. <laughs> and for 70 years, she embodied and represented the nation with an unwavering duty on the international stage, a symbol of stability when things were changing. The outpouring of emotion internationally we have seen since the news is a testament to her success in achieving this. She was not just well regarded, but loved around the world. And this is something that I've witnessed again and again while meeting foreign representatives from other nations, who without fail will always pay, pay tribute to the Queen. And those who had the pleasure of meeting her will always share stories of her kindness and warmth and her sense of humour. As we remember Her Late Majesty, I will personally remember how she continued to serve her country with duty and kindness until the very end. The Queen was an example for us all. May she rest in peace. God save the King. Yes. Yes. Richard Cubs. I rise to express the admiration and deep love of the people of Rutland, Melton, the Vale and Harbour Villages for Her Majesty and our heartfelt sympathy to the Royal Family. Since her death, our communities have been sharing their stories of her and their love. And we have been blessed with three visits. First in 1967, where she travelled on the Royal Train with her beloved Philip. 3,000 children awaited her and she visited our Oakham Castle. There she presented a ceremonial horseshoe because our tradition is the first time a peer of the realm or a majesty or any member of the royal family visits our county, they must present a horseshoe. She gave us an enormous horseshoe and in the heart of it, a small horseshoe from one of her racehorses, which was very touching. It now hangs upside down, which some say is unluck, unlucky, but in Rutland we say it will stop the devil from bedding in. And it is now on display in our castle. 
The second time in 1984, where she visited Uppingham and Oakham schools and the Hospital St John and St Anne. And finally, in 1996, where to enormous crowds, she visited Melton Mowbray, walking up Nottingham Street. And of course, she did stop at ye old pork pie shop. She then fi finished her visit by going to RF Cotsmoor. And these visits remain in the hearts of our communities. I have to confess that over the last few days, well, the last, it feels a lot longer, doesn't it? It was only yesterday. My tears have fallen most when there have been stories of joy shared, because I think then it is that we see the great love that we feel for her. But it was also when His Majesty uses the word mama, which I think touched so many of us. But I also believe that this Christmas we will all shed tears again, because no Christmas will ever be the same again. And I hope we will all raise a drink for her at Christmas. But finally, my overriding memory of yesterday, and one that will save me for my life, is that double rainbow that we saw. And the reason for that is I see it as a sign of Her Majesty returning to her love, to Philip, to the side of her beloved husband and him showing her the way. Because, Mr Speaker, as with all ages of history, the end of an era brings a new dawn. And on behalf of all the people of Rotten to Melton, I say simply, thank you, ma'am, and God save the King. Stephen yeah. Kinner. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr Speaker. I rise today on behalf of the people of Aberavon to pay tribute to our late Queen and to send my deepest sympathy and condolences to the royal family at this time of loss and grief. The Queen will always be remembered by our nation and by the world as the epitome of loyalty, humility and grace. She always put service to her country above all else, and we shall never forget her duty-first, no-nonsense approach to everything that she did. Her unique talent lay in her ability to connect with the nation and to reflect our thoughts, our hopes and our fears. She inspired affection and respect, and she was a source of comfort to us all. The last seven decades have been times of seismic political, economic and social change. And throughout these turbulent years, Her Majesty was a beacon of consistency and stability. She never failed to steady the ship. She was the personification of keeping calm and carrying on. Indeed, her leadership during the pandemic was testament to this. In echoing the immortal words made famous by Dame Vera Lynn, we will meet again, she evoked in her typically understated manner the stoic spirit and measured optimism that guided us through that period of crisis and hardship. On behalf of my Aberavon constituents, I thank the Queen for all that she gave to our country, and I convey my very best wishes to King Charles as he assumes his new responsibilities and begins writing the next chapter in our national story. Long live the King and long live the Prince and Princess of Wales. Yeah. Marco Longley. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Her Majesty the Queen has been a given in our lives, an anchor, as certain as the sun setting each day, but her star has set for one final time. And there is no worldly scale big enough to show the weight of our loss. I, like many, felt that she would always be there. On behalf of my Dudley North constituents, I wish to express my sincere and deepest sympathies to His Majesty, the Royal Family, and indeed, the entire, entirety of the Royal Household. Mr Speaker, her Majesty embodied everything we all aspire to stand for in this place. Dedication to public service, dedication to family, dedication to people. The magnitude of what Her Majesty delivered in her time for us all is impossible to measure. And, I, and while I never had the privilege of meeting her, I felt a presence there, a guiding hand, one that was available to us all, including Paddington Bear. In Dudley North, I mourn alongside my constituents, a community united in grief. Her Majesty first visited Dudley in 1957 as a relatively new monarch to view the beautiful coronation gardens dedicated to her, which coincidentally my constituency office overlooks. So I will always have a physical reminder to follow her example of dedication and public service. Fast forward some decades to the 70s, but ultimately the 90s, and Her Majesty found herself in Dudley once again, 
although a little higher in altitude at Dudley Castle on Zoo, making her, fir- making her the first monarch to visit the castle since her, first, since her namesake, Elizabeth I, in 1575. Her Majesty was given a tour of the centre before unveiling a piece of commemorative glass and receiving a crystal key to the castle as a gift of the borough. Many of the messages I have received are those of constituents reminiscing her visit. It is clear she left a lasting impression. What is also clear is that when God made our Queen, he certainly broke the mould. We all take comfort in coming together to remember the guiding light Her Majesty has been to us all. Long live the King. Ella Morgan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As as one of the most recent MPs to swear allegiance to the Queen, I'm saddened and humbled to have the honour of paying tribute to her once again um, on behalf of my North Shropshire constituents. And on behalf of them, I offer my condolences to the King and to the rest of the Royal Family for their sad loss today. Many constituents have been in touch over the last 24 hours to share their sense of love, their sense of loss, but most of all, their gratitude for the Queen's devotion, her leadership and her warmth during her 70 years of public service. While the nation is united in sorrow, the anecdotes shared here today and by my constituents from North Shropshire have shown me that as well as the sorrow, we can celebrate her life with joy as we remember her today. I've smiled as some of the more senior of my members, uh, neighbours have shared memories of the com- coronation back in 1953. These memories are vivid and are still fondly thought of seven decades on. Every television wheeled out so that neighbours, friends and family members could huddle together for a glimpse of the gracious young Queen and a whole programme of celebrations in the, in the town of Wem, at which I was recently shown an original programme in perfect condition. I'm thankful that the Platinum Jubilee provided the chance for these communities to unite once again and show the Queen just how much she was loved and continued to be into her 70th year. She was celebrated across North Shropshire, from the soldiers of the Royal Irish Regiment, based at Turnhill, to the helicopter pilots being trained at RAF Shawbury, including her grandsons, the new Prince of Wales and Prince Harry some a decade ago. We're very grateful to have welcomed her to both sites. But from Wem to Whitchurch, Ellesmere to Oswestry and Market Drayton, we, we lit beacons across the countryside as a symbol of gratitude to our longest serving monarch. And how appropriate this was for Queen Elizabeth was a beacon of stability to us all throughout these seven decades. But now a new era begins. Christmas this year will be very different. We will gather round our televisions again, but this time it will be the the speech of King Charles III and not that of our Queen. In North Shropshire, we will raise a glass to both of them. In 1957, the 31 year old Queen promised to give these old islands her heart and devotion. She stayed true to her word for every minute of her 96 years, and for this we are all grateful. We hope she rests in peace. God save the King. Sarah Brettel. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I just want to join colleagues in expressing my deeper sorrow at the passing of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, and the sorrow of my constituents of Highburn and Haslund, and our condolences are with the King and the Royal Family. It is difficult to be able to put into words the grief and profound loss that is felt. But after the rainbows that has been mentioned, as I paid my own tribute last night at the gates of Buckingham Palace in the darkness, the heavens had opened and the rain poured. It felt as though the weather portrayed our grief. The nation's heart was broken. For many of us, the Queen is the only monarch we've known. It's hard to underestimate the value of the stability she gave this country and the nations around the world for which she was head of state. When our politics or our society seemed so fraught, the Queen was a constant in our lives, a reminder of strength, dignity and stability, a reminder of what unites us. In 2012, we had the privilege of a royal visit from Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth and the Duke of Edinburgh during her Diamond Jubilee. I remember my own personal memory of that day stood on the balcony of Accrington Market Hall at the age of 17 years old, outside my dad's cafe, Millie's, as she came to greet us. Her eyes twinkled and her work warmth shone through. The crowds gathered in the thousands. They smiled, 
they sang, and one feeling that could be felt within the crowd, they loved. During her 1957 Christmas address, the Queen said <coughs> that while she cannot lead us into battle, give us laws or administer justice, she could give us her heart and her devotion. All these years later, we can surely all agree that she did just that. Yeah. She was our greatest public servant, our greatest diplomat, and our stability. She has been the true light in our lives that none of us really believed would ever go out. May she now rest in peace. Thank you, ma'am, and God save the King. Yeah. Christian Wake. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I'm both proud and sorrowed although delighted to follow my honourable friend, and I emphasise that word friend, because grief does bring people <coughs> together. I imagine I speak for many when I say I've taken some solace in hearing some of the tributes today from those who've actually got to meet and know Her Majesty. I was never fortunate enough to have met her, but it almost feels like I had, just like everyone else in this chamber, because there was something similar and familiar to all of us, and we all take a bit of her with us. But I, I like to think that bit I take is the humility and the kindness that everyone speaks about. This great and proud country went through many trials and tribulations during the Elizabethan age, but she was one of the constant, providing stability through wartime as much as in peace. And as many have already alluded to, regardless of your political, political views, her sense of service to this country she loved is something to be admired treasured and something we should all be proud of. I know what I was doing when I was 25 years of age and I know I would not have been able to take on the responsibility of a country, let alone a whole host of them like a commonwealth. I certainly couldn't have helped strip an engine either. But I'd also like to put on the record the condolences of my constituency of Berry South, the townships of Radcliffe, Whitefield and Presswich along with myself and my family and I particularly think to this year's Jubilee celebrations when my daughter at nursery at the time came back home from nursery so proud that she had learnt the national anthem. So she did her rendition for daddy and she sang God save our normal queen. <laughs> Unfortunately, Lavinia, the words weren't quite, quite right, but, but the sentiment was there. She was no stranger to Bury either, was Her Majesty, visiting as a young girl herself in 1938 and visited a further six times after that with her most recent visit in 1992, where she opened St. Peter's Square Metrolink station and took a ride to visit Berry Town Hall, which she had opened 38 years prior. What stood out for me most, though, about her service wasn't just for the length of what she did, it's for the fact she seemed to genuinely enjoy every single moment of it. From historical meetings with world leaders right down to visiting primary school children, she made everyone feel like they were the only person meeting her. She was a mother, a grandmother, a great-grandmother, a wife, a sister, a rock to the nation, but more importantly, a grandmother to the nation. She was all sorts to everyone, but she was always a queen. The saddest thing is that there are children born today that will never know a queen, let alone the queen. Finally, I think all of my constituents will agree with one simple message. Thank you, ma'am. May our queen rest in peace and long live the king. Instance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I rise in deep sadness, but with immense gratitude for the life and the service of our beloved late sovereign, Queen Elizabeth. I firstly want to place on record the love and respect of my constituents in Wolverhampton North East for Her Majesty. Many have already contacted me about the devastating sense of loss and grief they feel at Her Majesty's passing, and I thank them for sharing their thoughts with me. It is an honour to pass them on in this place. It's extraordinary that so many of us who never met Queen Elizabeth can be so affected by her death, but for everyone in Wolverhampton, in the United Kingdom and across the Commonwealth, she was a huge presence in our lives. The Queen visited Wolverhampton several times to our schools, our factories, and I think my favourite story is from a visit before I was born in 1962, her first visit to Molyneux. Uh, she was presenting colours to the North and South Staffordshire regiments and the Staffordshire Yeomanry. And she did apologise to Wolverhampton Wanderers for her high heels making marks on our hallowed turf <laughs> at Molyneux. 
Uh, 30,000 Wolfrinians cheered her that day, and I know the strength of feeling for our monarch is, is still as, as deep today as it was then. For millions of us, Her Majesty was a constant presence at so many events in our lives, and every Christmas, I, like millions of people, felt the Queen was in my living room when, surrounded by my family, we waited for her words every year, words of wisdom, of comfort. Um, last year, at her last Christmas address, she spoke about her upcoming Platinum Jubilee and how she hoped it would be an opportunity for people everywhere to enjoy a sense of togetherness. At so many Jubilee events for Her Majesty, my neighbours became my friends, and she certainly succeeded at all the events I attended in Wolverhampton this year for her Platinum Jubilee. She brought us all together. Because of Her Majesty's age and because we knew she was struggling with some ill health, I think the celebrations this year were poignant as well as joyful, and I'm sure I'm not the only person who, through our smiles, also shed a tear when Paddington Bear thanked Her Majesty for everything. She has united our nation once again um, on this sad occasion. She now unites us in national mourning. Our thoughts must be for her beloved family, uh, the royal family and especially our new <coughs> King Charles III as he takes on such responsibility. I hope the outpouring of love for Her Late Majesty will bring the royal family some comfort over the coming days and weeks. I want to express immense gratitude for her life, her many qualities. She was a shining example of strength and of selflessness in public service. May our beloved Queen Elizabeth rest in peace and rise in glory. God save the King. Yeah. 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 Th thank you, Mr Speaker. This day is a day many of us wish would never come, but many of us believe it also never happen. I need not remind members of Her Late Majesty's unwavering service as Britain's longest serving monarch. Her calmness and stoicism during difficult times and the continuity and stability she offered our country and our people. She personified the virtues of loyalty and humility, never complaining and setting a towering example for world leaders, future monarchs and ordinary people alike. Her Majesty was the embodiment of our nation's identity and for many people she was the United Kingdom, with the uncanny ability to appear unchanging yet also move with the times. She epitomised the concept of a constitutional monarch and took this responsibility seriously, thus cementing the role of the constitutional monarchy in this country. Remaining above politics is imparting profound wisdom to innumerable prime ministers and parliamentarians over several decades. But it was not her constitutional link to the lawmakers of this land that made her one of the greatest monarchs in our history, but it was her affinity with every single man, woman and child in Britain and across the Commonwealth. Nowhere is this better exemplified than during her visits, for it was in places like Rother Valley that Her Majesty excelled. Her visit to Rother Valley in 1977 was an arrival success. She was greeted by over 7,000 children from across Rother Valley at Maltby Comprehensive School, and on the Maltby Fields, more than 20 schools and youth organisations put on displays. Countless Rother Valley children would cherish the memories of this visit, but my favourite story is about a ten-year-old girl from Letwell who was dressed in a purple velvet cloak with a plea for the Queen written on a cardboard sign. It read, Dear Queen of England, please crown me Queen of Aston French School, Love Alison. <laughs> As the Queen passed, she duly obliged. Taking the sign, Her Majesty asked Alison, So you want to be crowned, do you? Then, carefully picking up the homemade crown, held on a velvet cushion by Alison's page boy, a seven-year-old boy called Matthew Alton from Woodhouse Mill, Her Majesty regally placed it on Alison's head, thus crowning her the Queen of Aston Fence School. <laughs> but this anecdote, like many across the country, encapsulates what Her Majesty meant to Rother Valley, the United Kingdom and the world. Despite all the grandeur, the pomp and the ceremony and the serious constitutional role she played, Her Majesty's most winning qualities were humour, her kindness and a famous mischievous twinkle in her eye. She was a cultural icon, but beneath it all, she was the nation's grandmother. She loved all of us and was beloved by all of us in return. I send my deepest condolences to the royal family, 
behalf of my own family, Natalie, Persephone, Charlotte, and of all the people of Rother Valley. Eternal rest grant upon her, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon her. May she rest in peace. And I offer my humble allegiance and loyalty to His Majesty, King Charles III. God save the King. Yeah. 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 Thank you, yeah. Mr. Speaker. Um, her late Majesty was always warmly welcomed to Northampton, and so the town mourns her passing most sincerely. And looking over some of the old coverage of royal visits to Northampton since the sad news yesterday, it's clear how much joy she brought on every occasion. So many speakers from across the House have succeeded in communicating the almost magical combination of majesty and personable friendliness, and yet within that one was always aware of her sheer presence. Presence even stood in a lay-by with my dear mother, Mrs Sandra Lua, as an infant in 1977, waving a dock leaf and getting a wave from the limousine in return. <laughs> Two of the occasions upon which I met Her Majesty illustrate this duality. The 800th, 800th anniversary of the Maundy service in 2010, where she presented the ceremonial money to another inspirational woman, the late Sister Merle Wilde, one of the last of the Methodist order of deaconesses. Tradition, dignity, majesty. The Diamond Jubilee, two years later, there I met Her Majesty at a much less formal event, and when introduced, I, I found myself, for reasons uh, uh, too obscure to detain the house with tonight, talking to her um, about donuts. Um, her Majesty took it in typically good part, thankfully, but I sensed, rather than saw, uh, a certain look between the then Lord Lieutenant, also thankfully a friend of mine, and my wife, um, who had much to say about this afterwards. Um, personable, cheerful, filled with humanity. Blending this with her dignity and bearing was brilliantly described as alchemy by a colleague earlier today. So I thank you, Mr Speaker and Mr Deputy Speaker, for your indulgence tonight. It really is appreciated and that of the House staff as well. Yeah, 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 it's yeah, meant yeah, a lot yeah. to us to be able to do this this evening. And in conclusion, may God bless Her Majesty the Queen and keep her safe, and God save the King. Yeah. Jerome May. Speaker, I add my name to the outpouring of love, affection and gratitude for the life of Her Late Majesty on behalf of the people of Broadland. It's a sombre day as we grieve. So who would have thought that we would have laughed so much as we've remembered her extraordinary life? I've loved listening to the speeches of colleagues as they've recalled their mishaps with Her Majesty. And through those stories, I've learned so much about her deep graciousness. I have never been lucky enough to meet her, but I still grew up with her as part of my family, for that was the impact of her life on all of us. Through her service, she reached into our homes and our hearts. Whatever else was going on in our lives or in the country, the Queen was always there, a steadfast anchor of, of rightness. She did not represent the people, she embodied them. Embodied them through her steady, selfless service, year after year, decade after decade. By her life and how she lived it, she pointed out to all of us the real values by which life should be lived. Integrity, devout faithfulness, duty. We, in return, have, our, have demanded constant attention, constant attendance, constant access, irrespective of any difficulties in her own life, often demanding the most at the hardest times. And yet, she never faltered, never stepped back, stayed true to her young oath. What a wonderful woman. What a wonderful monarch. Her heavy burden which she somehow managed to wear so lightly, has now passed to the king. His wonderful speech to his peoples today shows how he has shouldered it. May she rest in peace. God save the king. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It's a solemn honour to rise in this debate to pay tribute to Her Late Majesty the Queen, both personally and on behalf of my constituents in Hertford and Stortford. And it's humbling to follow so many 
very wonderful and fine tributes that we've heard throughout the day. The King himself, in his moving address, made reference to the speech many others uh, in this chamber have mentioned, where his mother, the late Queen, made on her 21st birthday a declaration that her whole life, whether it be long or short, be devoted to our service. We know now that her life was long and that for every day of her 70-year reign, she magnificently honoured that solemn vow. In that same speech, she also said, I am thinking especially today of all the young men and women who were born about the same time as myself and have grown up like me in the terrible and glorious years of the Second World War. And it is also this, alongside her vow of devotion to duty, which resonates with me today. Perhaps it's because she was speaking about those like my own parents, now themselves in their 90s and children of the East End and of the Blitz. And I'm struck more than ever that Her Late Majesty, both as a person and as a monarch, represents a link between our generations. She's a tangible human link to our nation's past, its struggles, but most of all to its finest hour. And she's also a link to our own individual pasts, our personal and our family's histories, and we've heard many of those stories here today. Her ability to evoke the spirit of what we rightly call the greatest generation gave us what, in my view, was the finest speech of the COVID crisis. She said that she hoped those who come after us will say that the Britons of this generation were as strong as any. And of course, she said, we will meet again. Her late majesty personified that link with our past and with the greatest generation. We shall not see her like again. Arthur Balfour was prime minister in 1901 and addressed this chamber on the death of Queen Victoria. He said then that the end of a great epoch has come upon us. With the passing of our queen, the end of a great historical epoch has indeed passed. But we are all privileged to have lived at least some of our lives in the great second Elizabethan age. We mourn her, but we cherish her memory and her lifetime of service. God bless Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, and God save the King. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It is humbling to take part in this very special session as we mourn Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. We have heard powerful tributes. We have heard wonderful words spoken. And as I have sat and reflected through what is coming on ten and a half hours of those wonderful tributes, the thought that actually there may not be the words in our language, there may not actually be the phrases powerful enough to express the sheer scale of the significance of the reign of Her Late Majesty to our country, to the overseas territories, to the Commonwealth, and to the whole world. But on behalf of my constituents, the towns of Buckingham, Princes Risborough, Winslow, and the villages that surround those ancient market towns to make up the Buckingham constituency, I wish to pass on my condolences to the whole royal family, to our new King, His Royal Highness, Charles III, to the new Prince of Wales, for the profound loss that they feel as a family and that we share as a nation. Her Majesty was gracious to visit my constituency on a great number of occasions as I look back through the history books. Special occasions that when you look at the pictures, you see the joy on people's faces as she joined them, as she greeted them, be it a walkabout in the town of Buckingham, when she visited the University of Buckingham whilst Lady Thatcher was its Chancellor, her visit to Wadston, the pictures that hang on the newly reopened Stag Pub in Mentmore of her, village, of her visit to the village of Mentmore some time ago, 
you could see the joy in people's faces as she joined them. We have lost a most incredible lady, a world statesman, someone whose like I fear we will not see again. But from the great privilege of watching His Royal Highness King Charles III on the screen in this chamber earlier, I am full of hope and confidence that he will carry on her legacy, that he will be a great king. And so I say, on behalf of all of my constituents and myself, may Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II rest in peace, and God save the King. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker, and thank you for your indulgence post 10 o'clock for those of us who've been here. It's really appreciated. It's a privilege to follow so many incredible tributes to Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth. She was a committed public servant, fulfilling her promise to our nation to serve us her whole life. Service that was delivered with honour, duty and integrity. She stood as an inspiration to us all. On behalf of the people of Darlington, I want to send sincere and heartfelt condolences to His Majesty, King Charles III and the whole royal family. Throughout her long reign, Her Late Majesty travelled more widely and met more people than any other monarch. And her travels included two visits to Darlington. The first, in 1967, Her Late Majesty and the Duke of Edinburgh visited Darlington on the 100th anniversary of the town being awarded a royal charter by her great-great-grandmother, Queen Victoria, and at the time granted supporters on the town's coats of arms. At this time, there were plans to concrete over much of the town and remove much of its Victorian heritage. I understand that the royal party asked a number of probing questions of these plans, which included the removal of our clock tower. A clock tower which was inspired by the Elizabeth Tower of this palace. I am pleased to say that the plans were largely dropped and our clock tower still stands proudly <laughs> over our town today. Her late majesty returned to Darlington again in 2002 as part of her Golden Jubilee tour. And the town turned out in force to line the streets and welcome her. There were so many floral offerings that members of the Scouts were needed to help carry them all to the car. The crowds were so big that the palace issued a statement the following day, noting the unexpectedly large crowds in Darlington. The Queen was truly loved by the people of Darlington and she will be deeply missed. Just yesterday morning at Auckland Castle, I attended a ceremony for the presentation of the Queen's Award for Voluntary Service to the community peer mentors in County Durham and Darlington, recognising the public service and duty in my constituency that Her Late Majesty embodied. We mourn her. We miss her. Her place in history and her lasting legacies are rightly assured. Now reunited with her husband, may she rest in peace until she rises in glory again. God save the King. Yeah. Luke Evans. Thank you, Mr Speaker, for allowing us to sit late tonight. Bosworth has an affinity, an eternal history with the monarchy. After all, we had the Battle of Bosworth in August 1485, where we saw the death of Richard III and the crowning of Henry VII. So my constituency has a palpable, visible history with the monarchy, and it's still there and proud today. And we've heard the description over and over of duty, and I challenge any member in this house to find a better person in British history that personifies duty. To me, it's Queen Elizabeth the Dutiful. Now, as a Member of Parliament, we have the honour of rep representing and reflecting the opinions and feelings of our constituents. And something that's never happened over a thousand years of monarchy is the ability to feel that immediately due to social media. That is the chance for us to reflect the feelings of the nation. And I've been struck by a poem that's been sent to me by several constituents and many councillors, and I'm sure 
it will have graced your screens too. And I'd like to read it to you because it's visceral and encapsulates the feelings of the nation. Philip came to me today and said, it's time to go. I looked at him and smiled. And as I whispered, yes, I know. I then turned and looked behind me and saw I was asleep. All the family were around me. And then I could hear them weep. I gently touched each shoulder with Philip by my side. And then I turned away and walked with my angel husband as a guide. Philip held my hand and he guided me on the way to a world where kings and queens are monarchs every day. I was given a crown to wear or a halo known by some. The difference is up here, they're worn by everyone. I felt a sense of peace. My reign had seen its end. 70 years I'd served my country as the people's dearest friend. Thank you for the years, for all your time and love. Now I am one of two again in our palace up above. Rest in peace, Your Majesty. Long live the King. Shall they unharp? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and on behalf of the people of Hastings and Rye, I express our sadness and grief at the death of our beloved Sovereign, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. Her late Majesty came to Hastings and St. Leonard's 25 years ago, filling local residents with pride and joy, and she visited a number of places, including West St. Leonard's Primary School, the, the Fisherman's Museum, an opened Priory Meadow shopping centre. She was presented with a winkle by the Winkle Club. <laughs> Our Queen spent her whole life dedicated to her people of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth, a life she did not choose herself, but one which she was born to, and the burden of her birth with one which she carried so diligently, dutifully and lovingly with the support of her faith in God, her beloved late husband, Prince Philip, her family and her people. I want to thank Her Late Majesty for her life of selfless public service, her love, her dedication, her stoicism. Her Majesty shone a light to us all, a light which gave comfort to those in need, a light which gave hope to those in despair, and a light of unity to all her peoples from across our four nations. She brought light where it was most needed, a beacon of stability to us in this place. And I speak on behalf of the people of Hastings and Rye when I express my deepest sorrow at Her Majesty's passing and extend our prayers for and condolences to her family, our royal family. With his accession to the throne, His Majesty King Charles III will bring in a new era and we offer him our loyalty and love for a long and happy reign. Long live the King. Yeah. Rob Butler. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. On behalf of the constituents of Aylesbury, I convey deepest condolences to His Majesty the King and all members of the Royal Family following the death of Her Late Majesty the Queen. She played a huge part in the lives of each and every one of us. She was the constant through good times and bad celebrations and crises. Her tireless dedication and unwavering service to our nation, her realms and the entire Commonwealth are unparalleled and they will never be forgotten. Her late Majesty visited Aylesbury on several occasions during her 70 years on the throne. She came in 1962 as part of a celebration of the 10th anniversary of her accession, when pavements thronged with well-wishers and she popped into the homes of two residents. She visited again in 1969 to open Stoke Mandeville Stadium, the birthplace of the Paralympic movement. And Her Majesty came to Aylesbury once more to mark her golden jubilee in 2002. The love and affection that we feel for her in Buckinghamshire was vividly demonstrated across our county time and time again, and most recently during the Platinum Jubilee celebrations. Coming together for parades and picnics, dog shows, tugs of war, three-legged races, from the youngest child to the most senior citizen, people the length and breadth of my constituency wanted to demonstrate their gratitude and appreciation for the commitment and duty shown by the Queen throughout her incredible reign. Mr Speaker, my own memories of Her Majesty are, I suspect, very similar 
to those of the vast majority of the public, because I never met her. And yet, she was always there. I remember making a scrapbook on the Queen and her family for a Cub Scout badge, a tea party in my village for the Silver Jubilee, watching her name, HMS Duke of Lancaster in Glasgow, and seeing her on the Royal Barge during the Diamond Jubilee Flotilla. Snatched glimpses, modest memories, yet the loss is still felt keenly. One singular honour that I was extremely fortunate to receive, though, Mr Speaker, was to gain royal assent for a private member's bill I'd taken through this place. I was humbled to have that privilege just a few months ago with the passing into law of the Approved Premises Substance Testing Act, a prorogation. In some ways, the words La Reine Le Vault are a small formality, but in others, they represent great moment, symbolising the relationship between Parliament and Sovereign, a relationship that we celebrate today. Mr Speaker, we have heard wonderful and eloquent tributes, but no words will ever adequately encapsulate Her Majesty's reign, let alone the profound loss and deep sorrow that we feel today. Our nation is poorer for having lost her, but oh how much richer for having known and loved her. May she rest in eternal peace. God save the King. Mr Speaker, I think um, if one wanted to look at an example of how much affection the people of Ipswich had for Her Late Majesty, you would have needed to have been in Ipswich on the weekend of the Jubilee. We've heard today that apparently there is the most parties in Twickenham than anywhere else in the country. Well, I'm not entirely sure about that. I think, no, I mean, I'm not sure what the measurement <laughs> was, but I think Ipswich is definitely strongly up there. All communities came together. I remember my Jubilee card competition. I thought my Christmas card competition was popular until I had the Jubilee card competition, where we had over 1,000 entries, and the winner from Ranley Primary School um, was incredibly proud to uh, receive her, her, to have her card go to the Queen. Um, the, um, Her Late Majesty visited Ipswich many times, but there was two visits that really stand out for me. One of them was in 1961 to Chantry. At the time, it was a fledgling housing estate. It's now it became the largest housing estate in Europe. It now is a community of 15 to 20,000 people, and it's a beating heart of Ipswich and our town. And I also think of 2002, her Golden Jubilee, where she visited the Ipswich waterfront. That just indicates how much the town has changed in her reign and also her uncanny ability to time her visits, which gave a sense to the people of Ipswich. She was monitoring closely the town's development and cared passionately about her subjects who lived within that town, and that care and love was reciprocated. I must admit, Mr Speaker, that I'm a big fan of I Vow to Be My Country. I'm also a big fan of Jerusalem. On occasion, I have speculated that perhaps those anthems should have been our national anthem. Right now, Mr Speaker, there is nothing I wouldn't give just to have sung God Save the Queen a few more times, maybe a few more years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Nothing I wouldn't have done. But right now we need to ask ourselves what Her Late Majesty would want us to do. And what she wants want us to do is unify as a country and come face the challenges ahead. And she wants want us to proudly, proudly say, God Save the King. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Yeah. Dr Burns. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I rise to speak on behalf of my constituents in Rinnymead and Weybridge as we and the nation mourns. Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II was an inspirational figure who embodied selfless service. She provides stability, support and succour in challenging times. Rinnymead and Weybridge has the privilege to be neighbour to her home in Windsor and my constituency is adorned with plaques inscribed with her name. We have a statue of Her Majesty at the Rinnymead Pleasure Grounds unveiled at the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta, which shows just how far we've come in Runnymede since 1215. Her first public visit following lockdown in March 2021 was to Runnymede and Weybridge, where she attended the centenary of the Royal Australian Air Forces and the Air Force Memorial itself opened by her in 1953. This is a fitting example of her commitment to duty and service throughout her reign. I sought the recent jubilee, what she meant to my constituents, with all the celebrations, garden and street parties, and the lighting of the Chertsey Beacon. One of the highlights of the jubilee for me was my school visits, where I saw countless portraits of the Queen created by local school children, mostly Da Vinci's, some Picassos, <laughs> and everyone demonstrating Her Majesty. And now, as we mourn her passing, the scale of the impact on all of us 
the UK and the Commonwealth is clear. I believe that if we all aspired to have even a fraction of the compassion, integrity, dedication she displayed for the world, we would be in a much better place. I hope that part of her legacy is that each and every one of us use this time to reflect on her example and what this can teach us. Her attributes will live on in the long tradition of the monarchy, in the reign of our new king, King Charles III. Runnymede and Weybridge sends its love, its fault, its prayers to His Majesty the King and all the royal family. If our grief is raw, I cannot imagine the pain her family are feeling. Our Queen was loved throughout the world. Her legacy lives on. God save the King. Scott Benton. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I rise with great sadness to pay tribute to Her late Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II, on behalf of myself and of all of the people of Blackpool South. Throughout her long reign, Queen Elizabeth was a figure of national pride, a symbol of stability, of continuity, and an inspiration to so many, myself included. But just as importantly, we must not forget she was also a loving mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother. It was just a couple of months ago that I attended street parties across Blackpool for the Platinum Jubilee. The celebrations brought together people from all backgrounds, all faiths, people old and young, a testament to her ability to unite the whole country and to keep the monarchy at the forefront of our nation's life during a reign that saw unparalleled social change. She opened up the family to the general public and made us feel as though we knew her personally. And in return, over the decades, we loved her and shared in her joy and in her grief, most notably on the sad loss of her rock Prince Philip only last year. Those constituents of mine who had the privilege of meeting her always, without exception, spoke about her warmth, her humility and how she made them feel so special. Her late majesty was not likely to be queen when she was born let alone to become Britain's longest reigning monarch. But from the very beginning, service to her country was in her DNA. Her devotion to this country is encapsulated in a remarkable speech on just her 21st birthday, when she stated that, we must give nothing less than the whole of ourselves. And when she took on the noble motto, I serve, unquestionably, she gave the whole of herself to this country, epitomised by serving it to the very end and swearing in her 15th Prime Minister just three days ago. It will take a long time for the tremendous sadness felt by us all to pass, but we can be comforted by the way in which she touched the hearts of so many and served our glorious nation so well. The example that Queen Elizabeth set has been instilled in King Charles III's own sense of duty and service. At a time of immense sadness for him personally, he has taken on the responsibilities of the Crown and the leadership of our nation and the Commonwealth. Our thoughts and prayers are with him and we offer him our loyalty and devotion at this difficult time, just as we know he will give it to us. As we move into a new era in this great country's history, Her late majesty will always remain in our hearts. God rest her soul and God save the King. Yeah. The Carter. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I extend my thanks to you for allowing this uh, sitting to be extended for members who want to pay tribute to do so. And I know I speak on behalf of all of my constituents in Warrington South when I extend my heartfelt condolences to His Majesty King Charles and the royal family on this deeply sad occasion. Yesterday was a day we all knew would come, yet still can never quite envisage happening. And I think it's a testament to Her late Majesty's longevity, both in life and as our Queen, that all of the United Kingdom and throughout the Commonwealth, we are deeply moved by the loss of the one constant in our life. Indeed, last night when I walked along the Mall to Buckingham Palace, that affection was really evident. Young and old, different languages, all coming to lay flowers 
lighting candles, spontaneous rounds of applause, the national anthem being sung, people paying their respects, truly a queen for all the people. We are fortunate in Warrington to have had Her Late Majesty come to visit on no less than four occasions. Way back in 1968, she was given a tour of the newly refurbished Bridge Street. In 1979, when she and her late husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, toured the new Golden Square shopping centre. And most recently, in 2012, when she and the Duke opened the Orford Park Jubilee Hub in the year marking her 60th anniversary on the throne. Many members today have talked about the twinkle in her eye. And I have to say, looking at the photographs from those visits that have been republished today in the Warrington Guardian, it's the impression that she leaves on other people's faces that is really striking. And the true legacy of our Queen is the impact she had on so many people. We will now inevitably look back at 2022 with great sadness. But we must also reflect on what joyous occasions it was to mark the historic Platinum Jubilee. And each one of the many events I went along to in Warrington, it was clear how deeply she was held in affection by the whole nation. A mother, a grandmother, a great-grandmother, and the Queen to each one of us. That celebration of her long reign over us allowed people to come together and be part of a community and share a special time. For now, as we mourn the passing of a truly great monarch, we wish our new king every success as he assumes the mantle of responsibility that has so diligently been carried out by our late queen over the past 70 years. On her 21st birthday, then Princess Elizabeth declared before us all that her whole life, whether it be long or short, would be devoted to our service. That life was long, and that service was certainly devoted. God bless Her Late Majesty, and God save the King. Yeah. Dean Russell. Thank you, Mr yeah. Speaker, and um, also may I thank you for extending the day and, and to your team for staying so late in the evening to allow these speeches. It is with great sadness that I rise to pay tribute to Her Majesty the Queen on behalf of myself and my constituents across Watford. We have heard loving tributes from across the House today, and we all mourn her loss and will grieve together. But what is grief if not a reminder of the strength of our everlasting love? And we did love Our Majesty, the Queen. Many of us never met her, but as we have heard today, we all felt we knew her. In fact, we loved her as if she were a member of our own family. And many of us, as we know, often invited her to our own Christmas Day after dinner. Her image is a, has been ever present in our lives, like family photos on our fireplaces. We may not always look at them, but we're reassured that they are there. And now she is gone, but her legacy will last forever. For every tear we wipe away, a precious memory remains. As we've heard, many of those memories are from visits to our own constituencies. And I have stories from my own constituency in Watford too. In 1946, when she was still a princess, she visited the Hart Casio show, uh, Hart show in Canterbury Park. In 1962, she alighted the Royal Train at Watford Junction, and in 1981, she visited Palmerton School. But in 1977, for her Silver Jubilee, she visited the Rolls-Royce factory in Leavesden. And Mr Speaker, I admit to having a special family connection to that uh, factory, because that is where my wife's parents first met and I share this because I still recall the excitement and pride my in-laws had when they received a letter from the Queen when they reached their diamond wedding anniversary. Now, sadly, my father-in-law, John, who was married to Pat, has since uh, passed away and is always sadly missed. But I can still vividly recall the image of his proud smile when he showed me the letter from our wonderful Queen. So perhaps therein lies the truth why our grief is so strong for Her Majesty. It is because she connected with us so personally and our memories feel like those of family. She was yet a constant in a world of change. And yes, her compassion brought us humanity even when the world could seem so cruel. And yes, her words of wisdom brought hope even when all seemed so lost. But perhaps Her Majesty's true majesty was that her unbounding kindness 
made each of us feel like we mattered to her. And that is why she mattered so deeply to us. She was loved not just because of what she was, but because of who she was. Our nation's very own great-grandmother, our compass, our matriarch, our guiding light. So I say thank you, Mom. You were loved by us all. And in your honour, we lovingly support your son and heir, King Charles III. God save the King. Yeah. Virginia Cross. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Today we are united in mourning our beloved Queen Elizabeth II. For 70 years, she has been a source of stability and comfort. She's the only monarch that many of us have known. I begin my tribute by remembering the warmth and joy that she brought to so many of us. Our Queen, she knew how to have fun and make us smile. Remember when, joined by her beloved corgis, she teamed up with 007 to parachute into the opening ceremony of the 2012 London Olympic Games, or when she took tea with Paddington Bear earlier this year. I attended Jubilee events across Honest Morn and saw there the joy that the Queen brought to people's lives, with people coming up to me from Amloch to Pentrith, sharing their personal experiences of meeting the Queen. As their head, Her Majesty was immensely proud of the professionalism and dedication of our armed forces. And I know that the team at RAF Valley, where the Queen came to visit her grandson, and Honest Morn's veteran population will feel immense pride in fulfilling their oath of allegiance to her. The Queen was a frequent visitor to Wales. She visited the port of Holyhead and Bumaris Castle, opened Oriel Morn in Clangevny on Anglesey, and was awarded an honorary doctorate from nearby Bangor University. During her Diamond Jubilee visit to Wales, she said, I've travelled the length and the breadth of this country during my 60 years as your Queen. Prince Philip and I have shared many of the joys and sadnesses of the Welsh people in that time, and I have always been struck by your sense of pride and your undimmed optimism. Her Majesty's dedication to service and her contribution to public life are unparalleled. She provided inspiration to millions of women aspiring to the highest offices. She was a patron for girl guiding and a long-serving member of the WI, which had its first meeting on Anglesey. We've shared the ups and downs of her life as she danced with us in victory and success and mourned with us at times of grief. Her sorrow at the loss of her devoted husband, Prince Philip, was felt by us all. And although our sense of loss is immense, we must take comfort that she is once more at his side. And as our United Kingdom moves into a new era, I welcome the announcement by our new king today that his son, Prince William, who began his married life on Anglesey, where he was stationed as an RAF search and rescue helicopter pilot, will become our next Prince of Wales. Yeah. On behalf of the people of Arnest Morn, may I say, Jochenbau, and express my sincere thanks for a life well lived and send our condolences to her family. God save the King, and God bless the Prince and Princess of Wales. Yeah. And we finally have Louis Fletch. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker, very much. Um, a wonderful life of duty and service, and an inspiration to generations of people across the world. It is a huge honour for me to stand and pay tribute to the Queen on the behalf of people in Old Bexley and Sidcup, and also my family here in the UK and overseas in Canada. As a community, country and commonwealth, we now come together to mourn the loss of our Queen, the ever-present in our lives, whether that be on national occasions, singing the national anthem at public and sporting events, or my personally fondest memories of watching the Queen's speech over family Christmas dinner. We all have our own personal and shared memories of the Queen who will let forever be in our hearts. I'm immensely proud to have discovered in the build-up to the Platinum Jubilee, that an online poll confirmed Old Bexley and Sidcup, my home, as the most royalist constituency. <laughs> now, when the French journalist asking for an interview told me this, I stopped and thought about my own experiences locally, both growing up and now. Similar to colleagues, at every primary school visit, the first question asked, have you met the Queen? At most community events, as far back as I can remember, what do we do? We stand together and we sing the national anthem, experiences which I'm sure are shared across the country. And little did I know when I sung the national anthem with the ambassador from Nepal last week at a community event with our brilliant Bexley Nepalese Gurkhas and Nepalese community 
Little did I know that was one of the last times that I would have the pleasure of singing God Save the Queen. During the wonderful Platinum Jubilee celebrations, there were over 140 official street parties in Bexley, which I understand was one of the highest in London, reflecting her, how cherished Her Majesty is locally. And it was my immense privilege to attend many of these community events. I also remember the excitement when the Queen last visited the London Borough of Bexley in 2005 to officially reopen Danson House, which is in my right honourable friend for Bexley Even Crayford's constituency, just over the border from mine, where she was greeted by crowds of well-wishers. But it's also important to remember a previous visit to Bexley, which was in 1953 to Erif, the honourable member for Erif and Thamesmead's constituency, after the devastating floods, which is a reminder of how the Queen was there for us throughout the good times, but also the bad, and the way her presence brought both comfort and hope to people at times of concerns in an ever-changing world. The Queen was an inspiration to millions around the world, a fashion and sporting icon through her love of the horses, the mother and grandmother of our great nation, and who can forget the corgi emojis from the Platinum Jubilee, which highlighted the evolution of technology during her reign and how she embraced it. I think I found something no one said so far in 11 hours there, <laughs> uh, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Rest in peace, Your Majesty. As a working class lad from Bexley, it was my greatest honour to swear an oath of allegiance to you when entering this place. And you make us all proud to be British, and in my case, an Englishman. We will continue to serve loyally your heir and son, King, George, uh, King Charles III, and all the royal family are in our thoughts and prayers. On the behalf of the people of Old Bexley and Sidcup, I say, God save the King. Thank you. Yeah. Can I just say, this is when the House is at its best, when it is united in grief that brings us together with so many stories and memories that's been paid in such moving tributes. Can I say we've had 182 contributions and tributes today. And it's a big thank you to you all, but it's a big thank you to the staff of this house, yeah. the police, the security, the catering, and everybody involved, and especially the clerks in their fine wigs today. <laughs> and can I say thank you to you all for what you've done. I now come to the motion on the sittings of the House, Minister to move. On this sad day, Mr Speaker, I beg to move the sittings of the House motion. The question is, on the order paper, as many of that opinion say aye. aye. The ayes have it, the ayes have it. Order, order! A German? Yes, no. Okay. I think it's going to be German. Okay. I think it's German. No, there is no German. As many of that opinion say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it, the ayes have it. Thank you, Sergeant. <laughs>